This is the multi-voice text-to-speech podfic reading of Dignity Be Damned by Violet Thistle, composed by Burning Aurora. Chapter 1. A Row. May 25, 1994. The dawn broke through the oppressive tree canopy in shards few and far between. Remus woke up shivering and naked on the ground. His body felt like it had been torn apart and then shoddily put back together again. This was far from the first time he had woken up after a full moon in the wilderness, but this didn't feel right, and his mind was too foggy to quite piece together why. He wasn't sure how long he stayed lying on the ground, curled up in a ball. He tried to push the intense pain he was feeling to the back of his mind for just a moment, and when he finally succeeded, the memories of the night before came flooding back to him in a rush. Sirius was here, and he was innocent. Remus tried to stand, but quickly abandoned that plan. He would normally apparate straight to his bed after a moon. It was painful, sure, but over quickly. However, he couldn't apparate out of the forbidden forest. It was too close to Hogwarts. He took a moment to assess the damage of the night before and discovered that he was bleeding. It looked like there were a number of scratches all over his body and were those bite marks. In addition to this, he had several large bruises developing on his arms, chest, and legs. He had definitely gotten into a fight with something last night. Thankfully there were no broken bones. There was nothing for it, he would have to send a Patronus to Poppy. Even if he could get to the castle, there was no way he would get up all those stairs, especially since he had no idea where he had left his cane. He closed his eyes to focus as he wandlessly summoned his wand being sure to do it slowly, so the wand wouldn't slam into a tree and break during its journey from wherever he had dropped it the night before. This was a complicated task first thing in the morning, but it was one he had a lot of practice in, given this was a monthly predicament. A moment later his wand floated through the air to his hand, unscathed. It has been many years since you have graced this forest with a transformation, werewolf. As soon as his silver Patronus had disappeared through the trees, a voice spoke to him from behind. Remus whipped his head around to see who was speaking and then let out a cry as a jolt of pain coursed through his body from the sudden movement. There behind him was a large chestnut centaur with golden blonde hair. He strode closer to Remus, but stopped about ten feet away. Hello, do I know you? Remus pushed himself into a sitting position and scooted back until he was resting against a tree, which caused shooting pain through his hip and back. He flicked his wand and a blanket covered his lap. I suppose you wouldn't remember me, but I've met your altar on many occasions when you were a student, I believe. Oh, I'm sorry if I ever I didn't know what I was doing, I- Remus stuttered before the centaur interrupted. I never came to any harm, though I'm sorry I can't say the same about you. Well whatever it was, I'm sure I deserved it. Remus muttered under his breath, then looked back up at the centaur. I'm Remus Lupin. Glad to finally meet an old friend. The centaur laughed at this. I am far ends. I followed you last night to make sure you didn't get into any trouble, since your usual companion was otherwise occupied, and there were students loose in the forest as well. My usual companion, Remus repeated, trying to understand. He tried desperately to keep his attention on the conversation, but the pain ebbed and flowed like the tide, threatening to pull him under with each wave. You mean Padfoot? Did you see him? Is he okay? Our paths parted ways quickly after you transformed. He went down to the lake and you went further into the forest. I chose to stay with you, so I am unaware of your companion's current condition. Forens explained. Thank you for keeping an eye on me. Do I have you to thank for these? Remus gestured to his cuts and bruises. Forens smiled again. No, those are the result of your altercation with your companion. Ah, I see. Hopefully I came out worse than him. Forens did nothing to alleviate his fears as he spoke again. The stars were brighter last night than they have been in years. I'm sorry I missed them. They cast deep shadows over the castle. The alignment of Canis Major with the moon hasn't been this close in nigh on thirteen years. Forens continued. Remus was so tired. He tried to pay attention to what Forens was saying, but it wasn't making a lot of sense. Yes, if this continues, it could mean safety and survival. But if they fall out of alignment, the way forward would be treacherous and lonely. That's interesting. Remus had given up trying to follow his thought process. 
He leaned his head back against the tree and closed his eyes. Ferenza's head quickly cocked and he turned to the side. Someone is coming, a witch. It's probably Poppy. I asked her to come help me. Then I will bid you farewell, Werewolf Lupin. I do not wish to meet any more humans today. Remus opened his eyes at this. Farewell, Ferenz. Thank you for your help. Ferenz was already disappearing into the shadowy forest. Anything for an old friend. A few moments later, on the other side of Remus, Poppy appeared in her dressing gown. A few stray twigs snagged and her graying golden hair braided over her shoulder. Her wand was extended and lit at the tip. She spotted Remus and rushed to him. Oh, there you are, dear. Well, you're in a right old state, aren't you? What have I told you about spending the night gallivanting? It's no good at all. Remus blushed and smiled at the gentle chiding. I must apologize, Poppy. I was distracted and forgot to take my wolfsbane last night. Well, I would scold you, but I know you had good reason to be distracted, and you saved young Potter, Granger, and Weasley despite everything so I won't get on your case, this time. The children are all right then, Remus asked, wanting to ask about Sirius, but unsure how. Yes, thanks to you and Severus they're safe. Honestly, I don't know what to do with the three of them. While they talked, she gave him a quick examination to see what damage had been done. Looks like you escaped with minor injuries. I'll have you all patched up in no time, but I'll have to insist on a locomotor charm to get you into your room. I agree, there's no way I'll make it up those stairs. Remus hated to make a spectacle, but at least it was early enough that hopefully no one would see. The pain was constant. There was no way he could stand, let alone walk. Poppy did what she could to heal his wounds and bruises and gave him a potion for the pain before bringing him up to his room. She finished her ministrations and helped him to bed where she provided him with a sleeping potion. Thank you, Poppy, but I must talk to Dumbledore before I can take that. Remus waved out the potion. You can talk to him when you wake up, you need rest. I'm very sorry but this cannot wait. Before Poppy could object further, there was a knock at his door. Come in. Remus said loud enough for the visitor to hear. The door creaked open revealing Dumbledore standing in the doorway, holding Remus's cane. I'm sorry to interrupt, but I wanted to return this, and I wondered if I could have a word with you Remus. His blue eyes peered over the rim of his half-moon spectacles at where Remus lay on his bed, propped up against the headboard in his pajamas and at least four pillows. Of course, come in, Remus said, ignoring Poppy's indignant glare. Dumbledore really, I must insist that this wait. Poppy please, I must talk to Dumbledore, otherwise I won't be able to rest properly. Remus pled. This is the thanks I get for dragging you out of the forest. She muttered under her breath, then turned to Dumbledore. Fine, but make it quick, he needs his rest. Of course Poppy, I won't take long. She returned her gaze to Remus. Be sure to take that potion when you're done. I promise. Remus replied. They both watched as Poppy left the room, shutting the door behind her. Dumbledore pulled Remus's desk chair up to his bedside and sat down. How are you feeling? Dumbledore started. Terrible, but that's not important right now. What happened last night after I transformed? Now that Dumbledore was in front of him, Remus realized it was crucial that he tread very carefully. He wasn't sure what Dumbledore knew about last night or what he would do if he did. I promised Poppy I'd be brief, so perhaps you'll forgive me for my bluntness. I know Sirius Black was on the grounds last night. He was captured by Snape after Sirius and Harry were attacked by Dementors and brought back to the school. Harry, by the way, produced a corporeal Patronus, quite impressive. Sirius then escaped again, and it's a lucky thing for him that he did because he was going to be given the Dementors' kiss. Remus's breath was completely knocked out of him when he heard that Sirius had almost been killed last night. But he's alive, and he's escaped again. He's okay. He finally took in a breath, then turned his attention back to Dumbledore. Listen Dumbledore, I know what I'm about to tell you may sound far-fetched, but you have to believe me. Sirius Black is innocent. He wasn't the traitor, it was Peter Pettigrew, and what's more, Peter is alive. He's alive and he was here at the school this whole time, and Sirius was trying to get to him, not Harry. 
extraordinary, and I would be quite shocked if I hadn't already heard it first from Sirius and Harry last night, along with the detail that Peter is an Adamagius, as are Sirius and James. Quite extraordinary indeed. I'd love to know why you didn't share that with me at any point in the last year since his escape, given we were all still under the impression that he was guilty, but perhaps that can wait until you've had a chance to recover from last night. Remus squirmed a little from the reproach but moved right past it. So you believe that he's innocent? Indeed I do. I'm just happy that he was able to escape again before the Dementors returned to the castle. So you don't know where he is? I'm afraid I don't, Dumbledore replied. Well, we have to find him. We have to find Peter, and prove Sirius is innocent. Have you talked to the minister? What can we do to fix this? Unfortunately, the minister isn't going to believe us without any evidence, and without Peter, I'm afraid there's no proof, Dumbledore said. So, what then? What about Sirius? He's innocent, Albus. Remus dropped all pretense of formality, and addressed him by his first name. He was innocent, and sent to jail with no trial and rotted in prison for twelve years, and now we know. We both know he's innocent, and the real traitor is still out there, and what? You're going to tell me that there's nothing we can do. We have to help Sirius. We can't let him down again. What if he agreed to take Veritas Serum, or you could extract the memories from his mind? It may be worth a try, but given that they weren't open to such measures when he was first arrested, I imagine it would be very difficult to convince them to agree to them now. I have every intention to do anything I can to prove Sirius is innocent, but it's going to take time. Dumbledore sat there frustratingly calm. Remus gripped the blankets with white knuckles, leaned his head back, and closed his eyes, unable to believe what he was hearing. I just got him back, and now he's gone again. He barely whispered it. I can't just let him go again. I have to go to him. I really think it would be best if he's on his own right now. He can disguise himself easily, and survive in the shadows. If you were there with him it would only draw more attention. Albus, if there's one thing I know how to do it's survive in the shadows. I've been doing it all my life, most of the time under your express orders. Remus responded. I don't seem to recall you disagreeing with the idea at the time, Dumbledore said. You had me so convinced it was the only way, but I know now that you don't know everything. You were wrong then about Sirius, you were wrong not to let me raise Harry, and you're wrong now, and I'm not going to let this happen again. I take it you are resigning. I am, Remus exclaimed. That's probably for the best. You see, after last night, I received a letter from Lucius Malfoy. Apparently, the school governors have become aware that you are a werewolf, and are demanding you be fired. I could fight them on it, but since you're resigning, that makes it unnecessary. I'm so happy that I could tie up that loose end for you. Remus wished he could stand up and make a dramatic exit, but this was his room and he was in no fit state to stand let alone stomp out. Now if you would please leave so I may finally get some rest. Of course, I wish you a speedy recovery, Dumbledore said as he stood from his chair and headed for the door. As soon as the door was closed behind him, Remus let out a sob. He had just lost the only job he had ever really liked, lost his temper in front of the most powerful wizard alive. The love of his life was on the run, all alone, and he had no idea where he was. He hadn't even been able to say goodbye, not back then and not now. He had been lying to himself and Poppy. No potion could give him a decent sleep after that. He took the potion on the nightstand anyway and tried not to focus on the waves of pain coursing through his body or the hot tears running down his cheeks as he pulled the covers over his head. Chapter 2 Reunion Dear Padfoot, I've started this letter over about a dozen times now, and I'm just as unsure how to begin as I ever was. What can I say? I'm sorry. I'm so sorry for a million things, but perhaps I should start with the most recent offense if only so that the owl will be able to carry the letter. I put you and Harry and the others in danger last night. I'm sorry my transformation led to Peter's escape and your recapture. I'm sorry that I wasn't there to help you, again. I'm so relieved you managed to escape, although I'm still a little confused on the details. You see, I got in a row with Albus and resigned from my position. I want to help you, to find a way to prove your innocence. Please, let me know where I can meet you, I must see you again. 
The time we had last night was so short, I need to see you again. Yours, Remus. Dear Remus. I was so glad to receive your letter. Please, don't apologize for the other night. None of what happened was your fault. There is much to say about the events of that night, but it's probably best not to put the details of my escape down on paper, especially given the entangled timeline. When I see you in person, I can fill you in on the whole story. How about we meet where we would spend the full moon after we graduated, on the anniversary of Prong's stag. Hopefully you remember the date. I look forward to seeing you again. Yours, Padfoot. P.S. I'm sorry to hear of your resignation, I'm sure you were an amazing teacher. Dear Padfoot, yes, I recall the date and location, I'll make this a short letter, as much of what I want to say to you would be best done in person. I'll be counting the minutes until I see you again. Yours devoted, Remus. Remus sent the short reply when he had received Sirius's letter days ago. Now it was the day of their meeting, and he realized they hadn't set a time. Knowing Sirius, he probably wouldn't be there before noon, but Remus decided to go at eleven and bring a book, in case he had to wait a while. It was June 1st, and a nice day, so he wasn't concerned about being outside for a long time. He packed a large picnic basket, thinking that Sirius was probably not eating regularly while on the run. He tried to distract himself all morning by reading. When he had read the same paragraph three times and still couldn't remember what it said, he moved on to finally unpacking his trunk which was still half full and resting in the middle of his bedroom where he had left it the day he had arrived back from Hogwarts. Finally it was time to leave, so he grabbed his things and apparated to the meeting place. His hands shook from the nerves. When he arrived in the forest that the marauders would visit for his full moons after leaving school, his anxiety lessened. It had been twelve years since he had been here last, but it was like stepping into a memory he had tried desperately to forget, especially when a large black dog appeared from among the brush. Remus stared stunned for a moment, then tore his eyes away, did a quick scan of the area, and began casting protective spells. When he turned back around the dog was gone and a thin, pale man stood in its place. He had long wavy black hair falling in tangles just past his shoulders and graying at the temples. His beard was patchy and matted. Remus took a step toward him, and then stopped abruptly. He wasn't sure what Sirius thought of him after so much time had passed. He didn't want to scare him off. I'm so glad you are okay, Remus finally managed. Sirius didn't say anything but took slow steps closer to Remus. Once he was within a foot of Remus, he stopped. Remus looked at him closely and saw that his gray eyes were glassy with unshed tears. Remus closed the remaining distance and enveloped him in an embrace. His cane fell to the ground. He was trying to be gentle, but he wasn't quite successful. He settled on trying to be strong and supportive instead. It's okay, it's okay, I'm here, I've got you. He tried to comfort him as best he could, but Sirius started weeping. He returned the embrace, but soon his legs gave out beneath him as sobs racked his body. Remus couldn't quite support them both, so they slowly melted to the ground, still holding on to each other. I thought I'd never see you again. Sirius finally managed as his sobs wound down. I know, I'm so sorry, I'm so sorry. Remus said over and over as tears streamed down his face as well. It was several more minutes before they were able to calm down enough to part and look at each other. Remus reached up to wipe the tears from Sirius's eyes and pushed his stray hair behind his ear. Sirius leaned his cheek against Remus's hand and closed his eyes, savoring the touch. Remus didn't know what to say or do next. I brought food, if you want to eat, I know you must be starving. Sirius looked at the basket next to them and nodded his head. Remus brought the basket closer and opened it, offering all the contents to Sirius. Their moment of initial intimacy was broken, but it had been so fragile it was impossible to sustain it for long. Remus watched as Sirius scarfed down his food, obviously famished. He had eaten a whole sandwich and was starting in on a second when he paused and finally looked back at Remus. You're not eating. Sirius observed. No, I want you to have as much as you can, I brought this mainly for you. I'm fine, I ate a large breakfast before I left. Which was a lie, 
Remus had been so nervous that he hadn't been able to eat much of anything before he came. Well, if you insist. And Sirius finished his second sandwich. He stopped and took stock of what was remaining in the basket. Ate more sandwiches, some fruit, carrots, crackers, cheese, nuts, a thermos of tea, and a bar of Honey Duke's dark chocolate. He grabbed the chocolate and thermos and closed the basket to save the rest for later. Thank you, Remus. Of course, it's the absolute least I could do, really. I want to make sure you're okay and not roughing it too much. I also brought you some clothes. He brought forth a backpack with two changes of clothes. Sirius opened it, then did a double take. Remus, Remus these are my clothes. You held on to my clothes. He pulled out a faded black shirt with the Ziggy Stardust lightning strike on the front. Remus could feel his cheeks turning red. He wasn't sure what to say. Yes well, I had boxed them all up and stuck them in the storage closet, and then I... He was about to say he had forgotten about them, but he knew he wouldn't be able to pull that lie off. I just couldn't stand seeing such great clothes going to some brat who didn't appreciate Bowie like we did. He finished. Sirius smiled at this. Thank you, truly this is amazing. He immediately removed his tattered shirt to change into the fresh one. Remus gave an involuntary gasp at the sight of Sirius's ribs easily showing through his sallow skin. Numerous scars covered his body, leaving Remus's imagination to fill in all the many horrors that brought Sirius to his present state. Crossing over and under the scars was a network of black tattoos. Remus's eyes traced over the path of them, identifying many of them as ancient runes. Sirius heard his gasp, and their eyes briefly met before Sirius quickly pulled the clean shirt over his head and glanced away in embarrassment. I, Remus stuttered, trying to get up the nerve. I'd like to join you, I, I don't want to leave you. He winced at the vulnerability of that statement. Sirius had every right to turn him down. Remus, it's a rough life living in exile. I'm a werewolf, Sirius, I know a thing or two about exile. Why does everyone think I don't know how to live rough? I've been living rough my whole life, I can help you. Ten minutes together, and they were already bickering, Remus thought. Apparently, some things never change. I know you're capable of living rough, but I don't want you to have to. I don't want you to live like this anymore. You're finally in a better place, I'm not going to drag you back down. A better place? Remus scoffed. I don't know what you've been imagining my life has been like these past twelve years, but it hasn't been a steady rise to a successful career, not even close. I still live in our flat, the only reason I have that is because both our names were on it and you bought it outright so now I'm the caretaker. I go from one lousy job to the next, never able to hold it down. The best one was teaching at Hogwarts, but did I mention I just quit? I have nothing keeping me anywhere, I can go anywhere you want, we can leave the country, and visit the coast. I'm sure the sun would do my old bones good. Just, don't send me away from you. He realized just how desperate he sounded. Maybe Sirius still doesn't trust him. I, I understand that you might not want me around. No Remus, no that's not it at all. Sirius was quick to quell Remus's fears. He paused and searched over Remus's face with his stormy gray eyes. I want to be with you, but it's more than just roughing it. If you're caught helping me, you'll go to Azkaban too. I can't put you at risk like that. I'll be okay. We can still write to each other. Remus wasn't willing to give up that easily, especially not after Sirius admitted he wanted to be together. We can leave the country. We'll go where no one knows anything about you. It'll be better that way. I was planning on leaving the country. I would have gone sooner, but then I got your letter, and I just had to see you one more time. Sirius said the last bit almost under his breath. Once he said it his eyes went a little more sunken, as if remembering he was still on the run alone. Let's table this issue for now, I want to hear more about you, about your life. Remus looked down at his hands and picked at the dirt with a stick. Oh, there's not much to say about that. He looked for a different topic. First, can you fill me in on what I missed when we last saw each other? I feel like there's more than what Albus told me, how did you escape? Sirius filled him in on how he and Harry were attacked, then Hermione used a time-turner to save them and set Sirius free to escape on the back of a hippogriff. Hermione has been using a time-turner. 
You know, that makes a lot of the events of the past year make sense now. But how fucking dare Albus send those kids out into the night to illegally edit time when Dementors and a werewolf were out there? What was he thinking? He is absolutely senseless serious, and I'm beginning to wonder why the hell we ever trusted him in the first place. Yeah, I try not to think too hard about Harry's safety at the school, or anywhere for that matter. It's enough for me to want to go back and take him with us too. Sirius said. Remus noticed him mention us but decided to not draw attention to it. He didn't know what to say about Harry. Remus knew he should have done more for him, but Dumbledore had pushed for Harry to be placed with family rather than Remus. He had tried to convince him at the time that Lily and James wouldn't have wanted that, that Lily's sister had never accepted her, but he had little sway over the final decision. After that, there had been so little for him to live for, he had always thought Harry had been better off not being pulled into his disastrous life. Now he wasn't so sure that was true. He's got, he's got the Weasleys looking out for him, he spends most of his summers there from what I've heard. He'll be okay, I think, Remus finally said. Well, there's not much I can do for him now, Sirius sighed. Are you, are you going to go after Peter? Remus hated to bring it up, but couldn't smother his curiosity. Don't see how I could find him again. I only knew he was at Hogwarts because of that profit cover photo. Besides, that's twice now I've been arrested after chasing after that rat. I don't think I should risk it a third time. The conversation lulled and Remus looked up from his scratching in the dirt to look at Sirius, to try to tell what he was thinking. He was a little surprised to look up and see him staring at him. Have I mentioned, I like the moustache. Sirius finally broke the silence. Remus blushed. I was going for Freddie Mercury, but I think it's more like Paul Simon. Sirius laughed. It was an amazing thing to hear, although it was different than Remus remembered. His laugh used to be so light and carefree. Now it sounded more like a bark. Like joy finally ripping free from its confined restraints. Remus loved to hear it just the same. Anyway, I can bring you a razor, and you could trim yours, we could have matching ones. Remus continued. What? Are you telling me you don't like my beard? Sirius asked. That, I'm sorry to say, is exactly what I'm telling you. Sirius looked at him with mock shock, and now it was Remus who was laughing. It's just a little unkempt at the moment, if it was trimmed a little, I think it would be great. Don't worry, we'll get you cleaned up, and put some meat back on your bones. You'll be as handsome as you ever were, maybe even more so, with all those tattoos. You're such a mother hen, Sirius said, but he couldn't hold back his grin while he said it. Something about the way he said that sent a ripple of an old memory through Remus. He could tell Sirius was joking, but it reminded him of moments when Remus's attentiveness was less welcome. That's right, you don't like it when I pester you, I remember. Sirius looked at him and grew more still. I'm sorry. You don't have anything to be sorry for, I'm the one that, that betrayed you. They had taken a hard turn into unsafe territory. Remus wasn't sure he was ready for this conversation yet. He cleared his throat and looked down again. He tried to find a way to retreat but before he knew it, words were tumbling out of him. How could I believe you betrayed me? Why did I believe it? I spent the last twelve years convinced I could never forgive you. Now that the tables are turned, how could you ever forgive me for betraying you? Remus could feel Sirius's eyes on his face, even though he didn't meet them. You didn't betray me. Sirius spoke softly, as if calming a scared child. But I did. I betrayed the trust you put in me. I should never have believed it was you. I should have fought for you. I should have just at least pushed for a trial, if you had a trial. Now Remus was the one sobbing. You're forgetting something. What? Remus finally looked up. Concern, guilt, and regret were reflected back at him from Sirius's expression. I betrayed your trust in me first. If I had trusted you, that you weren't the spy, that you could never be the spy, then none of this would have ever happened in the first place. This hung in the air between them as Remus realized they were both blaming themselves for this betrayal of which either of them was actually guilty. Maybe we should just agree that there's enough blame to go around and give each other permission to start again. We were never very good at that were we? Sirius sighed shaking his head. We always got in each other's way just as it was getting good. 
Do you think we can stop repeating history? Can we start a new page? No. Can we burn the whole book and start something new? If it was all written down, it would probably be more than one book, Remus said. Like maybe seven, Sirius replied. And they'd be pretty thick. We could have a whole bonfire. Yeah, I'd like that. Let's start something new. If we left now, we could probably be on a beach by sunset. Just a few apparition hops away. Remus held his breath waiting for Sirius to say no again. Honestly if I never see the ocean again it'll be too soon. Just the smell of sea air is enough to send me back to, well. Of course, we don't have to go to the beach. How about Paris? Remus cut him off so he didn't have to finish the sentence. I need to get my money somehow. I managed to get some money out to buy Harry a new broom, but I don't think I could pull that off again. Sirius said. Hmm, interesting, see, I might just have a key to your vault. I'm sorry what? Yes, well, when you went to Azkaban, Albus pulled a few strings to put me as caretaker of your fortune. I'm not entirely sure how he did it, I would have thought it would go to the Malfoys or the Lastrangers, from a legal standpoint, and I think a good chunk of it is still locked away, but I was given a key to a vault with your name on it. Albus thought I could use it to take care of myself. Remus chose not to mention that he had always had the impression it was actually out of guilt at how much the war had taken from him, and how much of what he really wanted that Albus still refused to give. You're telling me you've had access to my money this whole time, and you're still dressed like this. Tell me you've used some of it, please. Remus sighed. I didn't use a single nut. And really, Sirius, how could I take the money from one of my best friends without permission, or admit I needed assistance from the man who betrayed us all? Really, either way you look at it, it was a no-go. Remus, you're an absolute masochist, why didn't you take the damn money? It could have been a way to get back at me for all the stuff you thought I did. Yes, well, I didn't see it that way. I couldn't bring myself to take it, and aren't you glad now? I survived just fine, I had the flat. I didn't need anything more. Now we can use the money for our escape, I knew there'd be a good use for it in the end. In truth, Remus's stomach had always turned at the idea of using that money, not only because it belonged to Sirius, but because it had once belonged to the noble and most ancient house of Black. Sinking so low as to use the fortune of blood purists and death eaters, of the one who at the time he had been convinced had never really loved him. No matter how bad it had gotten, he had always found a way to continue without it. Perhaps if he was really being honest with himself, he could acknowledge that he was saving it for a time when he couldn't take care of himself anymore. When the morality of using blood money would be a factor he couldn't afford to consider. A time that loomed over him, approaching at an ever-increasing rate as the years wore on. It was never an if, but a when. For now, though, it had almost become a point of pride for him, proof that at least at present, he could survive on his own. Which was an absolute lie, of course. Sirius still haunted his every step in that old flat that he had never been able to afford to move out of. He had constantly relied on any friends he had managed to keep. He borrowed money he couldn't pay back, and he called in favors he was never able to return. His friends had picked up the broken pieces of his life more times than he could count but try as they might, they couldn't put him back together again, because pieces were missing. Gaping pieces that no one could find, and eventually Remus had to learn to survive as he was. Now Sirius was back, and the money that had once disgusted him transformed into something else entirely. He found he wasn't opposed to using it at all now because it would make it so much easier to protect Sirius. The morality of helping Sirius by whatever means necessary was never in question for Remus. Sirius rolled his eyes at Remus but didn't argue. He continued, pulling Remus out of his reverie. Okay, you need to go to my vault and get as much money as you can without drawing suspicion. Try to exchange it for a few different currencies while you're there. Then we can flee the country. There you go saying we, have I convinced you then? Remus finally pointed it out. Yes, fine. You can come with me, but only so that I can finally spend some money on you. Whatever you have to tell yourself, Remus bantered. Sirius stood up and then helped pull Remus off the ground. There's one more thing you need to know. Blimey, what is it now? Remus sighed. We won't be traveling alone, 
Sirius said as he pointed behind Remus. Remus whipped his head around and saw a giant hippogriff walking towards them. Remus, have you met Buckbeak? The magical creature that was sentenced to death for injuring a student. No, can't say I've had the pleasure. Well, here's your chance. I'm afraid I've become quite attached to him. We're a bit of a package deal. Sirius said. Then I suppose introductions are in order. Chapter 3 Adrift Plans quickly came together for their escape to the continent. Sirius had wanted to go to the flat with Remus, but Remus insisted it was too dangerous for him to return to his former home. Instead, Remus quickly packed everything he had kept of Sirius's, and as much of his own belongings as he thought necessary or important. This consisted of a few personal items and as many books from his library as he could shrink down. For a moment he had considered trying to figure out how to get the motorbike back from Hagrid, but decided traveling with a motorbike and a hippogriff would be an absolute nightmare and didn't mention it to Sirius when they next met up. Next was the tricky business of entering Sirius's vault for the first time. They had made every arrangement they could before they visited Gringotts. It was bound to be noticed by someone at the ministry, so they planned to make their exit immediately after the withdrawal. Remus happened to have an account at a bank in Germany. He had spent some time there after the war with a pack and brought what little gold he had at the time and put it there. It currently had maybe a galleon or two's worth in it, but it was enough to keep it open at least. He never bothered to close the account and was glad for it now. The majority of Sirius's vault was transferred to that account and he withdrew the rest in cash. Sirius was waiting for him on the other side of London. When Remus found him, he was sitting on a bench in a transfigured disguise. If he hadn't already known it was Sirius, Remus would have walked right by the grunge man with red plaid pants and a leather jacket. However, since Remus was aware, he took a seat next to him. Remus also noticed that he had several shopping bags added to their luggage. What's this? Oh, nothing. I just picked up a few essentials for our trip. Sirius explained innocently. Remus pulled out a crimson velvet duster and smirked. My God, I can't believe we almost left without this. We would have been sunk. Sirius put on a new pair of shades. It's a good thing you have me around to remember these things. You ready? Absolutely, Remus said with a grin. With that, they both took their leave of the city for quite possibly the last time. France was their first stop, but they never stayed in one place for very long. Remus was right, though. They stayed to the Muggle side, and no one had ever even heard of Sirius Black. They may have been blasting his face on British television, but on the continent, he was a nobody. They still did their best not to draw attention to themselves. However, they did allow themselves to stay in furnished rental cottages out of the way instead of really roughing it. This was partly because they were also accompanied by a giant hippogriff. Sirius and Remus alone could have skirted the edges of society in a big city, but that was impossible to do with Buckbeak. However, after only a week, Remus began to realize how much they had both changed. He didn't really know what he was expecting. It would have been basically impossible to pick things up where they had left off under the best of circumstances, and these were definitely not the best circumstances. Prior to the events of Halloween 1981, Remus and Sirius had barely been on speaking terms. They had still technically lived with each other, but Remus had more often than not been on a long-term assignment with the pack, and even when he wasn't, Sirius had still been going out on dangerous top-secret missions with James. Sirius had begun to suspect Remus as the traitor and had talked to him less and less. In return, Remus had been angry and bitter and had grown a little suspicious of Sirius himself. After parting in such a way, was it any surprise that coming back together after twelve years, and while on the run, things were a little rocky? Sirius spent a lot of time outdoors. Remus supposed he might not have been outside at all until he escaped Azkaban. Their first cottage was on a lakeshore in the south of France, and Sirius would spend hours lying in the sun, looking up at the sky. He was much quieter than Remus ever remembered him being. Remus would join him, not usually lying on the ground, but in a lawn chair beside him, reading whatever book he had handy. On one such occasion, 
Sirius had asked him to read aloud to him, so Remus did so, in much the same way Sirius used to read to him in first year when Remus was a moody delinquent who could barely read. Over the years, Remus thought of a thousand things he had wanted to tell Sirius or ask him if only he had the chance to speak with him again, and if he hadn't been the traitor he thought he was. But now, Sirius was right in front of him, and all those things had faded into the ether of time, forcefully forgotten. Sure, he remembered the big ones. Like what the hell happened that night? That was a big one, or why the fuck didn't James just name himself Secret Keeper? That one had kept him up on many a night. Although there was always the old classic, did you ever really love me at all? Remus didn't dare bring those up now though. There may be a time in the future when those questions were finally laid to rest, but for now, he could wait. Being with him was enough. Looking over and seeing his pale skin finally tan under the warm summer sun, hearing Padfoot run and chase after squirrels, glancing up over dinner to catch a peek at him, to have their eyes meet as Sirius did the same. Who needed words, really? Remus woke in the middle of the night to see Padfoot in dog form, sleeping on the floor, whining and twitching, obviously having a nightmare. He went over to wake him up, to tell him he was dreaming. When he reached out to gently shake him, Padfoot startled awake, and instinctively pushed Remus over, landing hard on his chest. As soon as he realized what happened he jumped off of him and transformed back into Sirius. I'm so sorry Remus, I thought I was being, I didn't know it was you, I'm so sorry. He shrunk away from Remus, shaking. Remus groaned and with some effort came to a sitting position. It's okay, I shouldn't have approached you like that, your response was completely understandable given everything you've been through. He paused to catch his breath, every time he inhaled a sharp pain seized his left side. No no no, it's not okay, it's not okay. Sirius had tucked his knees up against his chest, his face was turned away from Remus, and he was rocking back and forth. Remus wasn't sure how to help him. He also wasn't sure how much he could move, let alone get up off the floor. Sirius, please, come here. Sirius remained curled up out of reach. Please, carry on. Sirius turned his head toward Remus, and after a moment he crawled to his side. Remus suppressed his groan and slowly reached out to gather Sirius into his arms. I'm so sorry. Sirius kept repeating while coming apart in Remus's arms. This time Remus tried not to say it was okay. It clearly was not okay. Hush hush, I'm here, I'm not going anywhere, we're going to figure this out together. After a time, this seemed to help, and Sirius finally stilled. They sat there for a long time like that until finally, Remus broke the silence. Do you want to get into the bed? We don't have to sleep or anything, we can just talk, or be together. Sirius didn't say anything but finally nodded his head yes. Okay, don't freak out, but I'm gonna need your help getting up off the floor. Sirius looked at him with wide eyes, finally realizing that he had actually hurt Remus. Remus watched his face, convinced he was going to dissolve again, but he pushed it all aside and stood up. He then reached down and gently, carefully helped Remus to a standing position, and then over to the bed. Remus took his wand from the nightstand, and quickly cast a healing spell on his ribs which had definitely been bruised. There see, nothing a little magic can't fix, I'm good as new. Sirius looked at him as if he didn't believe him. We just have to get used to each other again, that's all. Sirius, listen to me, you haven't been around people who haven't wanted to do you harm in twelve years, your reaction was completely understandable. I shouldn't have approached you in such a way. I just couldn't stand seeing you hurting, and I tried to help but didn't think it through. That's all, that's it, so don't beat yourself up about it. I'm okay, I promise. Sirius's hand went to reach for Remus's, but then he seemed to think better of it, and stopped. Come to bed, Sirius, Remus pled. I can't, I can't, what if I do it again? What if I wake up next to you and attack you again? Sirius shook his head. I can't sleep on this bed anyway, it's too soft, I feel like I'm being swallowed. Remus's heart sank but tried to appear understanding. He nodded his head. Okay, whatever you like, Sirius. Sirius nodded and walked out of the room. 
Remus heard the clicking of paws on the hall floor and knew he had transformed back into Padfoot. Remus worried about him sleeping out there. What if he had another nightmare? Then he reminded himself that he wasn't very good at helping him with this nightmare, and he was probably better off without him intervening. He tried to go back to sleep, but couldn't stop his mind from reliving the event. Not to mention, despite what he said, while his ribs were healed, they were still sore. Remus was sore for days, and Sirius couldn't look him in the eye for a week. Sirius needed space to adjust, but they were often in new locations and small living quarters. Just as Sirius adapted to a new cottage, they would move and have to start over. He seemed to recede into himself and had been even quieter since the incident, which hadn't seemed possible to Remus. There were times when Sirius would seem fine, but there were other times when he would detach and it was hard to get more than a few words out of him. It was in those moments he would think about James. If Remus and Sirius were the moon and stars, James was the sun. His friendship had always been a buffer between Remus and Sirius when things got hairy. James had a way of knowing exactly what Sirius needed. If Remus was ever at a loss as to how to help Sirius, all he had to do was call James and he would come and fix things, patch it all up so it worked again. When James was talking to Sirius, Remus would be doing the same with Lily. He would vent and complain, and she would do some complicated reverse psychology maneuver, and in the end, Remus would be defending Sirius to Lily. He'd be home and made up with Sirius before he realized that it was probably all on purpose. There was no one to call now. It was up to the two of them to figure it out. It felt to Remus as though he'd been in the cold dark night for ages with no hope of a sunrise. At least now he wasn't alone. Where did you find that book? Sirius asked Remus as they sat in the sitting room together after dinner one night. It's a muggle book called Watership Down. For a brief time I worked for a muggle bookshop, but it was a particularly bad time for me, so it didn't last long. I picked this book up while I was there. I always thought you would be good in a bookshop, Sirius said. I did enjoy it, yes. Terrible for my take-home pay. I spent half my paycheck on books I wanted to read. That got a chuckle from Sirius. It's good to hear, you know about your past. You haven't said much about what you've been up to, since. Sirius's voice trailed off. Remus was quiet while he thought of what to say. Yes, well, it was a bit of a mess, really. I'm not proud of much of it. What parts are you proud of? The question caught Remus off guard. He took a moment to consider before answering. Teaching at Hogwarts. It was so hard to go back and walk those halls every day. Even harder to see Harry again, and have this boy I held hours after he was born stare up at me and not even know my name. Not even know I knew his parents. Remus's voice cracked a little. I can imagine, Sirius said. They sat in silence for a moment, each thinking and processing difficult emotions. What else are you proud of? Remus was quiet even longer. It was embarrassing how hard this question was to answer. There were times he was happy, or things he accomplished, but they never stayed that way for long. He could tell him he was sober, but then he'd have to mention that he was an alcoholic and that wasn't a conversation he was ready for quite yet. The room felt stagnant and murky as the time grew longer. All he had accomplished in the last decade was to royally screw up any good thing he still had in his life, and somehow piece together some sort of existence. He still woke up every day. I suppose I'm proud I'm still here. I carried on. I know it's not much, but there were times it seemed impossible. Remus, that's huge. I know how hard that is. I'm proud of you for that too, Sirius said. Sirius entered the house after taking a ride on Buckbeak to find Remus at the dining room table. He was scrawling in a journal with at least five open books around him and a stack of books beside. Remus didn't even look up as Sirius picked up the top book and examined the cover. It was an old text with a stained cover that looked like it could fall off at any moment. Across the front was the title The Lost Curses of the Ancient Greeks. Doing a bit of light reading I see. Remus finished writing down his thought and finally looked up at Sirius. I was doing some reading while you were out and I found a connection to some other theories I've observed in my studies. 
I'm almost done. He looked at the table around him, and then said, Sorry about the mess. Don't apologize. Sirius was glancing at the titles of the other books in the stack now. I knew you were carting an entire library across Europe, I just didn't quite realize the subject matter. Why did you bring so many? Surely they aren't all necessary for a summer abroad. Remus looked uncomfortable and fidgeted in his chair. Well, I thought their contents might prove useful. A lot of them are incredibly rare. I didn't want to need something I left behind and not be able to find another copy. They're mostly pertaining to the dark arts. It's a good thing your house has never been raided, with a collection like this. It's grown substantially over the years. Still as studious as ever, I see. Seems a particularly heavy topic to devote so much time to. Yes well, after, everything, I ordered books when I could afford, scoured libraries and old estates, and convinced friends to keep an eye out for anything of interest to me. What are you looking for? Sirius asked. No one could explain how it happened. How Harry survived and Voldemort didn't. No one could even say for sure he was gone for good. There wasn't even a body. It made no sense, and I tried to move on, to not think about it, but I couldn't let it go. So I did the only thing I was ever very good at and started to research it. And what have you found? Sirius asked. I have a lot of theories, a few hunches, and a lot more questions than when I started. Care to share? Remus sighed deeply. When I can make any of it make sense, you'll be the first to know. This is why Albus asked you to teach. He knew about your continued studies. Perhaps. I figured I was at the bottom of a long list and my name was finally up. It's no secret they have difficulty filling the position every year. You're selling yourself short. Even without all this extracurricular study, you were always good at this. Sirius insisted. Remus shook his head. I was the only one with my particular set of skills, and I did hold a place in the war. I'm not sure how many would agree with you that I was good at it. I did learn by the end. How to lie to someone's face and not give a tell. How to do the right thing even when it breaks the rules. How to disguise any skill and knowledge behind low expectations. How to convince my enemies I was on their side. It was tricky though, if you do it too well you end up convincing more than your enemies. Remus wasn't looking at Sirius anymore. His eyes glazed over and his last words hung in the air met with only stunned silence. Finally, his eyes focused again on the page before him. I won't be too much longer. I need to finish this line of thought. Of course. Sirius answered quietly. He stood there another moment still holding the book he had picked up. He put it down and picked up the one next to it, Blood Purity's role in magical potency. He opened the cover and found a handwritten inscription on the page. From the Library of the Noble and Most Ancient House of Black. He nearly dropped it in his haste to set it down. One morning... Two weeks into their travels, an owl interrupted their breakfast, tapping its beak on the kitchen window. Sirius jumped at the loud noise, while Remus quickly got up to open the window and retrieve the letter attached to the bird's leg. He offered the owl a crust from his toast, which the bird had an obvious disdain for, but finally took it before flying off into the forest and out of sight. Remus returned to the kitchen table and looked at the envelope, which was addressed to R.N.S. It's addressed to us both, Remus said. Well, there's only one person who knows we are together. It must be Albus, Sirius replied. Remus opened the letter and read it aloud. My dear friends, when I last spoke with both of you, I promised to do all I could to assist you, and I am a man of my word. I have reached out to my contacts in the ministry, and a quiet investigation is being conducted to track the true traitor's movements and to uncover evidence of what really happened. As I shared with you, it will take time to gather this evidence, but I wanted you to know that every effort is being taken. In addition, I have taken steps to ensure the safety of the students in the coming year, with the recruitment of the new defense against the dark arts teacher, Alastair Moody. I'm sure he will find no fault in the foundational administrations of their previous instructor. I will say it again, I very much appreciated your acquiescence to step in as professor last year, and I was sad to see you go, especially under such circumstances. Please do keep in touch. I will reach out if anything of value is discovered regarding your case. Yours sincerely, Albus P.W.B. Dumbledore.
Remus tried hard to resist the urge to crumple up the letter and toss it into the bin. Sirius reached over and took the letter from his hand. That was kind of him to reach out, Sirius said half-heartedly. After a moment of silence, Sirius tried a different approach. I can tell you're upset, but I don't fully understand why. Remus tried to pinpoint exactly what was making him so upset. I don't know. Maybe it's the way he doesn't even apologize for practically firing me, but merely tries to feed my ego by complimenting me. He paused as he thought over the letter. It feels like he's trying to keep on our good side, so he can pull us out as the ace in his pocket when he needs us most. Sirius's eyes widened at this interpretation. He fired you. I thought you said you quit. Oh, yeah, I did quit, but he said that it was a good thing because the Board of Governors was asking for my resignation and he could try to fight them on it, but since I was resigning anyway, he wouldn't need to put in the effort. Merlin, that's harsh. Sirius responded. Remus looked at Sirius, who didn't seem nearly as upset as he was. Why does it feel like you had a different take on it? Sirius was silent for a moment. I suppose after twelve years of having no hope my name would ever be cleared, it's nice to have people, powerful people, who believe me and are actively trying to help me. It most definitely is some sort of play on Dumbledore's part, but maybe it's worth it, to have people on my side. Remus slumped a little in his chair and closed his eyes. Oh, Sirius. You're right of course. I'm glad he's looking into your case. I just, we've both been burned by standing too close to Albus when things start to catch fire. I'd hate to see it happen again. It won't. This time we'll be there to pull each other back if we get too close. Chapter 4. Old Habits The next week they moved to a new location, this time to a small cottage just outside Landkern, Germany. Sirius went down to the town to get some groceries. There had been an argument about Remus going instead, but Sirius was tired of being cooped up, and he insisted he would be fine. Remus reluctantly agreed. Remus landed after taking a flight on Buckbeak to clear his head and get the lay of the land. He immediately regretted riding him. His hip was twinging worse with every step, and he wasn't due for another pain potion for over three hours. Remus entered the house to discover that Sirius had returned, and was sitting on the floor propped up against the wall with a half-empty bottle of whiskey and a haze of cigarette smoke hovering around him. He was wearing one of Remus's old sweaters. Mooney, there you are. Come on. Have a drink with me. Sirius's words slurred together, and his jovial tone clashed with the wet streaks down his cheeks. A cigarette in his hand came up to his lips and he took another drag then exhaled slowly. Hey Sirius, I don't think I had cheap whiskey and cigs on the list I sent with you to town. Remus joked, but his heart was in his stomach. He hadn't had a drink in two years but had failed to tell Sirius about that yet. He had figured it probably wouldn't be an issue, what with them not frequenting any bars. The smell alone was so enticing. He knew a swig may not numb the pain, but it might make him forget about it for a while but seeing Sirius in this state reminded him why he had stopped in the first place. It was a bit of an impulse buy. Sirius laughed at his own joke, even though it wasn't that funny. Remus opened a window to let out the smoke before approaching him, finding the lid to the bottle on the ground. He used his wand to summon it from the floor, took the bottle Sirius was holding out to him, and sealed the cap on the bottle as quickly as he could, handling the bottle as if it may explode at any moment. He put it on the far end of the dining room table, well out of reach, leaned his cane against a dining room chair, and slid gracelessly down the wall to join his friend. His cane slid off its perch and clattered to the ground. Shit! Remus muttered to himself, but he left it where it lay. Well come on Mooney. Have a drink with me. Drinking alone is always so pathetic, but when we drank together it was always a party. He was speaking louder than strictly necessary since Remus was right next to him. Yes, I'm well aware how pathetic drinking alone is. I've had a lot of experience with that since you went away. And I have been painfully sober the entire time. Sirius held out his hand with the cigarette, offering Remus a turn. Time stood still for a second as he considered taking it. It was the drink more than the cigarettes that ruined his life after all. Wizards had ways of counteracting the damaging effects of smoking. But he thought, what's a smoke without a drink along with it? 
No, he couldn't go down that road again. With an enormous amount of effort, Remus shook his head and brushed Sirius's hand away gently. You may drink if you wish, but I'm sorry I won't be joining you. I've discovered over the years that it's not as comforting a habit as it seemed when we were young. Sirius was much too drunk to grasp the complexities of what Remus was trying to tell him. Oh but we had so much fun when we were young, don't you remember? All those times we smuggled booze into the castle through the tunnels, and the parties. We threw the best parties. Even after we graduated, we would go bar hopping, and see shows. Merlin, I miss the fun we used to have. Remember? Sirius stopped as he was overcome with a fit of laughter. Remember in sixth year when James got McGonagall a cat tower for her birthday? Remus did remember, and despite himself, he started to laugh along with Sirius. And she acted all surly and put out, but the next time we were in her office we saw it peeking out of her sitting room. Did I ever tell you about the time I walked in on her playing with it? Sirius excitedly shared. No, really? Yes. Well, I'm happy to report that it's still there. Poor thing has seen better days though. Remus paused for a moment, getting swept up in memories he so rarely let himself go near. Do you remember that time we crashed a muggle university party? Sirius shared another memory. Ugh yes, vaguely. You all were so embarrassing, honestly. Remus said in feigned annoyance. Wasn't James in a chicken suit? No, you were the one in the chicken suit. James and Lily were in some kind of sci-fi costume. Remus remembered. Star Wars, I think. Why was I in a chicken suit? Sirius asked, still piecing together the story. I have no fucking idea. I was just as drunk as the rest of you, so I'm a little hazy on the details. They chuckled at that and then shared the silence as they both remembered the moment. It was a costume party. I think it was Halloween. Remus said it without thinking, then realized it had been Halloween 1979 three years to the day before James and Lily died. Merlin, I miss them. Sirius sighed and leaned his head on Remus's shoulder. I do too. Remus leaned his head against Sirius's, both lost in their own thoughts. I'm really fucking this up, aren't I? Sirius finally broke the silence. What do you mean? You this. Sirius paused before saying, Us. You're not fucking anything up. We can take time to get used to each other again. But sometimes I feel like, like. Sirius cut off, unable to put into words exactly how he felt. Like what? Like I'm so behind, I, was stuck at one phase, for the last twelve years, revenge, and anger, and just agony, it was sheer agony. Sirius hadn't talked much about what it was like in Azkaban, and Remus had only an inkling of the terror it must have been. And now we are here together, and I want this to work, I want it to be like it was but I'm not the same. Sirius went on. I can't ever be the same person I was. I don't know how to move on. I don't know how to. Heal. Remus supplied after Sirius trailed off. Yeah. Can I tell you a secret? Remus whispered. Of course you can. I don't want it to be like it was. We loved each other so much, but we were so bad at showing it. Remus explained. I don't want it to be like that again. I don't want to hide things from you. I want to be able to talk about stuff. Everything. It's going to take time, but like I said, you and I, we can help each other. I can't say that I've been through anything like what you have. Listen the truth is, I haven't really healed as much as I should have done either, and I wouldn't suggest any of the methods I've tried so far. Maybe just being here for each other will make a difference. I just know that when we are apart, bad things happen. I should have waited for you. Sirius barely whispered. His words still slurred as he snuffed out his cigarette in the ashtray. Despite the abrupt transition, Remus knew exactly what he was referring to. I wasn't due back for a month or more, and you had no way to contact me. Of course you didn't wait. I should have gone to Dumbledore or Mad-Eye. It's okay, you were in shock, you were working off instinct, of course you went after him. If it had been me instead of you, I would have done the same thing. You didn't do anything wrong. Sirius started to mumble something unintelligible, and Remus knew it was time to get him to bed. He leaned him against the corner, grabbed his cane from where it landed under the table and got himself up off the floor first, then he helped Sirius up while saying whatever came to his mind in a calming voice, 
trying to bring him back from the storm he had worked himself into. They took a few steps toward the bedroom, but Remus thought better of it and guided him to the couch instead. Sirius hated sleeping in a bed, and frankly, he was a little nervous about what Sirius would be like when he woke up and didn't want to be right next to him when he did. Once Sirius was settled on the couch, Remus took the blanket that was folded over the back of the couch and tucked him in. Sirius was already asleep when Remus started to make his way slowly to the bedroom since his hip was still in terrible pain. He passed by the dining room table and locked eyes on the half bottle of whiskey, no longer out of reach. He switched directions and made his way to the bottle. Picking it up, he took it into the kitchen where he shut the door and unscrewed the lid. Standing in front of the sink, he paused for just a moment before pouring the contents down the drain, vanishing the bottle for good measure. Then he took a seat at the kitchen table because he was shaking. He ran his hands over his face and through his hair. This was something he truly had not been prepared for, and he was kicking himself for not seeing it coming. Once he was finally in control of his body again he took the painful, shuffling journey to bed, truly shocked that he had managed to avoid drinking the remaining contents of that bottle. Sirius awoke extremely hungover and with a patchy memory of what had happened the night before. Remus made him breakfast and took it to where he was still lying on the sofa in his old sweater and sat down in the chair beside him. Then as he watched him eat he started to talk, even though he really didn't want to. After everything that happened, he faltered and tried again. I, when you were taken away, I was so, I didn't handle it well. Remus paused, trying to arrange his thoughts into what he was actually trying to say. Sirius looked at him, obviously still hungover, and unsure of where this was coming from. Remus finally continued, I didn't handle it at all, and instead just drowned myself in a bottle every night, and chain-smoked like it was going out of style. I avoided my feelings, and pushed people away, except for, except for a few people who wouldn't let me. I finally dug myself out of that hole, and I've been sober for two years now. Sirius stilled at this, and stared him in the eyes. So when I say I understand, it is with my very being. Remus continued. I understand how easy and even necessary drinking can feel. I get it, I do, but I also know that the next day I was left with less than I had before and it never made me feel better, not in the long term. It didn't fix anything, and I'm not saying this because I am against alcohol, really, I'm not. I just know that I can't be around it without it ruining me. Remus, I'm so sorry, I didn't. You didn't know, how could you? I didn't tell you like I should have. I know that. I just hope you will understand, I get it if you want a drink, but I can't be around it, I just can't. Remus's nerves were on edge. Alcohol had always been a part of the Marauders' friendship, especially after they left Hogwarts. It had been in the background of many of the happiest memories of his life. He didn't want to take something else from Sirius, but he wasn't strong enough to do what he did last night again. I'm so sorry, I don't really remember, did you? Are you okay? I didn't know. Sirius looked stricken. I didn't drink last night, I took the remainder and poured it down the sink, sorry about that. But I just, I don't think I'm strong enough to do that again. Remus finished. I won't do that again, I promise. Okay, okay good, thank you. Relief mixed with guilt flooded Remus's heart. Besides, I think twelve years of sobriety has fucked with my constitution, I used to be able to bounce back in the morning but this hangover is a nightmare. I think it's more being 34 than the lapse in practice. We're no longer the spry spring chickens we once were. They finished their breakfast, and then Sirius lay back down on the sofa with an arm draped over his eyes to block out the light. Remus dimmed the lights, and brought him some tea and a large glass of water to keep him hydrated, then went for a walk. His mind suddenly flooded with memories he had forced behind a dam years ago a dam that Sirius was dismantling piece by piece. He hadn't meant to walk so long, but eventually, his hip could no longer be ignored. However, he didn't return home, but instead apparated to the village and found the nearest payphone. Closing the doors on the cramped booth, he leaned against the windowed wall putting his weight on his good hip as he slipped the coins in and dialed the number he had memorized with shaking hands. Instead of hearing ringing on the other end, 
The phone gave him a series of tones and a message in German he didn't understand, but he got the gist. The number you have dialed is unable to connect. Of course it is, he's in a different country. He had forgotten that there were extra steps to call out of the country. He had never done that before and had no idea how to do it. He slammed the receiver down and banged his palm against the window in frustration. Looking around, there were several shops nearby. He could go in and ask, but that felt rather stupid and embarrassing. It's just as well, he hadn't talked to Grant since last summer, and it would have been an awkward conversation now that he was thinking about it. It was just that after last night, he felt the need to talk to his friend again, not just because he was also his sponsor. Grant had always been willing to at least listen even after they had broken up. They still remained friends despite everything. Suddenly Remus felt every last kilometer between him and his former home. Serious, and he were truly alone. He was pulled out of his reverie by a hand banging on the door of the phone booth. An older man stood on the other side of the glass looking annoyed and started excitedly talking to him in German. Again, Remus got the message without having to understand the language. Make a call or get out, there's someone waiting. Remus took his coin from the return slot and left the booth, narrowly holding back the urge to flip him the bird as he walked by. As soon as he was out of view from anyone, he apparated back to the cottage. Sirius was still asleep on the sofa, not even aware he had been gone. Chapter 5 June Moon The front door swung open in haste as Sirius practically bounded through in excitement. I found the perfect spot. For what? Remus asked in bewilderment, as he looked up from his journals and books sprawled across the table. The moon of course. No one around for miles, and plenty of room to run. Oh, wonderful then. Remus tried to match his energy, but his stomach dropped at the reminder of what was to come tomorrow night. So you're coming then? Of course. Sirius finally registered Remus's unease. A bit of his confidence drained from his voice. That is, if you want me to. Of course I want you there. He still couldn't keep his anxiety out of his voice. Sirius finally walked over to Remus and sat in the chair next to him at the dining room table. He regarded Remus's face and demeanor in silence as he took a deep breath. Finally, he spoke. Everything okay, Remus? Remus looked at him, and a million thoughts crossed his mind that he wanted to say, but he didn't say any of them. Instead, he forced a smile and just said, Everything is fine, just pre-moon jitters, you know. Some of the worry melted from Sirius's face. Of course, but I'll be there this time, you've nothing to worry about. Remus only nodded, unable to find a way to say what he should say to prepare him for what the day after would look like. Instead, he returned his gaze to his books, but soon abandoned them, completely unable to focus. He eventually retreated to the bedroom where he tossed and turned in bed, then paced the floor in equal measure. The wolf was itching to be free. Remus's whole body ached. The closer the moon came, the more his anxiety rose. June 23, 1994 The next afternoon, they apparated a mile or so from the cottage, just as the sun began to set. He had again tried all day to get up the courage to talk to Sirius about this moon. He should have said something to prepare him for what tomorrow would be like. After all, they weren't spring chickens anymore. Sirius thought his hangover was bad, but that was nothing compared to what twelve years of transformations do to a man. Remus just couldn't get it out, couldn't think of the right way to say it, so he hadn't said anything, and now they were here and the sun was low in the sky. I need you to promise me you will leave me if I start to attack you. Mooney hasn't seen Padfoot in over a decade, I don't know what his reaction will be. This was most important to Remus, more than how he felt tomorrow, Sirius's safety was first. Don't worry about me, I can take care of myself. Besides, Pad's made friends with Mooney once, he can do it again. Sirius was almost vibrating with anticipation. But you had the others to help you then, it might be too much for just you. It took all of Remus's focus to stay cognizant of the conversation. His skin was hypersensitive to the clothes on his skin, his every movement magnified by sensation. Even the wind on his face felt like being pelted with sand. Nonsense. 
We'll be okay. I've got you. Remus looked up at him when he said this and drank in the look of security, safety, and excitement Sirius had on his face. It had been a long time since he'd seen this face, and he loved it. He almost believed him when he said it would be okay. But he knew better. His transformations were much worse than they were when Sirius was around last, and he was running low on pain potions. They hadn't found anywhere safe to buy more, and he had tried to ration them, but his hip had been worse since the last moon. Despite this, all he could think to say to this was, Okay. Just as he said this, the moon rose in the sky, and the transformation had begun. Remus let out a cry and quickly sat on the ground as pain ripped through his body, the wolf escaping from his internal prison. He felt every bone in his body morph and grow. Hair sprouted over his whole body, and sharp claws forced their way out of his fingertips, which were changing rapidly into paws. His vision went white as his whole sense of self was pushed to the back of his mind. His mind now taken over by instinct, hunger, and thirst. It's okay, I'm here. I've got you. Sirius yelled before he transformed into Padfoot. Mooney the werewolf now stood before Padfoot and they started to circle each other. Padfoot bowing his nose to the ground to show submission, Mooney snapping at the air around him. But soon they found their balance, and it did seem to Padfoot that the wolf remembered him. Mooney sniffed him, and then the air around him, as if looking for something, or someone else. When he couldn't find what he was looking for, he whined and let out a howl, which Padfoot echoed. Then Mooney was off on the run, tracking rabbits and playing in creeks. Padfoot kept pace with him, and even corralled him towards the center of the forest, away from any wandering souls. They ran and played all night, then the sun began to rise. Mooney slowed down, exhausted from the night's activity. He laid down, panting heavily and Padfoot came up to him and whined. Then the wolf arched his back, and writhed, letting out a howl that became a scream as he transformed back into Remus as the sun began to peak above the hills. Once fully transformed back into himself, he was curled in a fetal position on his side, unconscious. Padfoot turned back into Sirius and came to Remus's side. He was still working off the adrenaline rush from being back with Remus during a full moon. Good morning. He smiled down at Remus, who was just opening his eyes. He opened his mouth to return the greeting, but it ended up coming out as a sob. Sirius's face immediately fell into concern. What's wrong? Are you hurt? I didn't notice any injuries. No, it's just, harder for me now, that's all. Remus managed to eke out the explanation between short gasping breaths. It's more painful, in the morning. He closed his eyes as his head started throbbing. It felt like the pain couldn't be contained by his body. Surely it was radiating off of him. How could Sirius stand so close to him? and not be overtaken by the torrent. He tried to roll onto his back, but let out a gasp before quickly stopping. His body began to tremble, from the cold or the pain, or both. Oh, it's okay, don't move, I've got you. Sirius tried for a melodic calming tone, but his concern and anxiety bled through. With a few wand flicks, he did what he could with healing charms, then prepared to apparate them both back to the cottage. Wait, my wand. He gripped onto Sirius's arm for dear life. I've got it, and your cane. He assured, then apparated him straight back into his bed. Remus hated apparating when he was in this much pain. The quick spin magically catapulting him through space felt like it would tear his already fragile frame apart, but there was no helping it. They had been much too far from the house to walk. He gritted his teeth but couldn't stop from crying out through the pain as it sharply peaked and then ebbed, then peaked again worse than before. Remus was adrift in the turbulent waves of pain crashing over him. Sirius's presence slowly brought Remus back from where he was lost in the pain that surrounded him. Sirius found a pain relief potion and a sleeping potion and gave them to Remus who drank them down. He flicked his wand, and Remus was then wearing the softest pajamas. He tucked him under the blankets and cast a warming charm on the bed, which felt so good against his screaming joints. Sirius ran his hand over Remus's forehead and through his hair. Now, rest, I'm right here. Remus wanted to thank him, 
to reach out and take his hand, but didn't get the chance before the potions kicked in and sleep claimed him. Chapter 6 Recovery Remus slept fitfully through the entire day, ebbing towards consciousness when the pain throbbed too much, then the medicated sleep would reclaim him. Sometimes he would notice Sirius in the room, other times he would be alone. When he did finally wake, it was to find Sirius asleep in a chair next to his bed, a cup of tea that had gone cold next to him on the nightstand. Remus could tell by the dim light streaming in the window that framed the chair that it was evening again. He watched him for a few minutes, not wanting to move, both because he was afraid of the pain, and because he liked seeing Sirius like this. It made him feel guilty, but he liked it when Sirius took care of him. It's the way it had always been between them. Sirius the attentive boyfriend of his chronically ill lover. These last few weeks, the dynamic had been flipped, and it hadn't worked at all. Remus had tried to be attentive but failed and Sirius wanted nothing to do with being on the receiving end. Maybe that's why they were struggling. Sirius shifted in his chair, and woke, looking over to see that Remus was watching him. He leaned forward and for the first time since their embrace in the forest, he took Remus's hand, so gently in his. He stroked the back of his hand with his thumb. Hey, you feeling any better? Sirius spoke softly, as if he were afraid speaking any louder might hurt Remus. Better now that I have you. Sirius furrowed his brow and shook his head as if he didn't agree. I was too rough last night. I got Mooney all riled up. We ran too much. I was just excited to spend a moon with you again. Which, now that I think about it, is a really messed up thing to be excited about. I'm sorry I hurt you. What? What are you on about? You didn't do anything wrong. You kept me from hurting myself and others, and even if you hadn't been there, Mooney only gets out once a month, and he always makes the most of it, there's no slowing him down. Honestly, because of you last night was better than a lot of the moons I've had recently. Other than with the wolfsbane potion I suppose. Sirius's face fell into even deeper concern. It's been like this a lot. Remus immediately regretted telling him this. Uninvited memories of his worst moons over the years washed over his mind. The terror of waking up alone with broken bones, or animal bites from fights he didn't remember having. Once, the animal in question was still nearby, and he had to apparate away right after he transformed before he could even cast a healing spell. With magic, these injuries weren't lasting, but he usually had to take care of it himself. Other than Poppy, he'd stayed away from professional healers afraid they would report his status to the ministry. Remus couldn't bring himself to describe the worst, but he realized it was important that he knew the broad strokes. Yes, worse some nights, when I get injured or have a run-in with a larger animal. There was a small gasp from Sirius, who even without the details was disturbed by his response. He closed his eyes and took a deep breath before opening them again. And you've been doing this alone. How? Remus paused before answering. The truth was he'd had help off and on over the years, but wasn't sure Sirius would like who had been helping him. He decided that it was best not to harbor any secrets. Sirius would just have to deal. Well, I haven't been alone for every full moon. There's been the occasional help. Thanks Cersei for that. Sirius said genuinely, but looked him deep in the eyes, trying to decipher the reason for his vague answer. Want to tell me who? Well, these last nine months I was back under Poppy's care. He paused. Right after the war, I was pretty much alone for a while. After a few months, I ended up seeking out a pack where I knew one of the members. It was good for a while, but they eventually kicked me out for not joining them permanently. And after that you were alone? For a while, Molly or Poppy would check in on me occasionally. Remus took a breath, and let the silence linger between them. Sirius seemed to understand that he needed a moment, so he didn't press him to continue. Finally, Remus continued. Sirius, there were others. Since we were together, there were a few others. Then, I got together with Grant and he moved in, and he finally found out what I was. He helped take care of me after my moons for a while. But eventually, I fucked that up too, and I was alone again. We're still friends, just friends now. Remus looked up to meet Sirius's eyes, there was a flash of coldness and hurt, 
but it melted away after a second as he looked away. Sirius finally responded. I'm glad you had someone to take care of you, at least some of the time. Sirius. Remus started, but Sirius cut him off. You thought I betrayed you. A pained expression covered Sirius's face as he shook his head a little. I never expected that you wouldn't move on. You had every right to move on. I said there were others. I never said I moved on. Sirius took that in, then let go of Remus's hand and pulled out something from his pocket. Here, take this. He held out a potion bottle. Remus recognized the strong pain reliever from the color and smell. Where did you get this? Remus asked. You gave me the last one I had this morning. I went and found a potion maker. Today, you specifically sought out the wizarding world. Alone. It came out more confrontational than Remus had intended. Sirius huffed. It's not as bad as all that. I wore a disguise, I had my hood up, and we're thousands of kilometers from anyone who knows my name. I just stocked up on potions, that's all. No one even said anything to me, I only interacted with the board shopkeeper, I promise I was careful. Remus could tell he was annoyed he had to explain himself. He took the potion from Sirius's hand, again savoring the brief touch of their fingers. Sirius, thank you. Sirius's face relaxed. Anything for my Mooney. Now, try to get some rest. I wish I could just stay here, but I really got to pee, Remus said. Okay, want me to apparate you there? No, Merlin, please no. It's more painful than just walking over there, Remus said. Really? I didn't know. I could hover you over there, Sirius offered. It's most painful when I first wake up, but once I move around a little it gets better. I just have to try to keep moving, or it won't loosen up. Okay, that makes sense. I've got your cane right here, do you need help getting up? Remus nodded and with Sirius's help, he slowly moved his aching joints and made it to a sitting position on the edge of the bed. He took his simple but appealing wooden cane with an L-shaped handle, examining it for a moment as he prepared himself to get up. Its coloring reminded him so much of the hand-me-down broom James had given him so the marauders could fly together. The simple carving along the handle reminded him of Lily's wand. He smiled fondly at the memories and reached out his other hand to Sirius, who grabbed it and put his arm around Sirius's waist to help him stand. He didn't let go but paused for a moment for Remus to get his balance. Help me to the door. Sirius stayed with him and supported his weight to the door of the adjoining bathroom. Thankfully it was close. Once Remus was at the door he let go of Sirius's hand and put it on the doorframe. I'll manage it from here, thank you. Sirius looked like he wanted to argue, but instead just nodded as Remus shut the door. When Remus finished he paused at the sink and washed his hands, then looked at his reflection in the mirror. Despite sleeping for the past eleven hours, he had dark circles under his eyes. His greasy unwashed hair was sticking up in every direction. Thankfully, there didn't seem to be any new scars, at least not on his face. After he washed his hands, he ran his damp fingers through his hair to make it stick down in place. He splashed his face with water and dried it with a towel. Even having done those little acts of self-care, he felt better. When he opened the door, Sirius was standing there and aided him back to the bed. Remus didn't lie down but propped himself up against the headboard with three pillows. Comfy. Yes, thank you. Remus reached for his wand. Do you need anything? I'm gonna make you some dinner, you must be starving. I'd like that, thank you. Could you also bring me my book? I think I left it in the living room. I can always summon it though. I'll get it for you. Sirius quickly offered. It was rather ridiculous when he could have summoned it, but Remus decided it was good to let Sirius do these things for him. It made him feel useful when there was so much either of them could fix. Sirius brought his book, and a little while later, a toasted cheese sandwich and tomato soup. Remus ate it all, then got as comfortable as he could while he opened his book. Sirius had eaten his dinner and the chair next to him. Now that Remus opened his book, he seemed unsure what to do with himself. Remus put the book back down. Everything okay, Sirius? Remus could tell that he had something on his mind. Was there something you wanted to talk about? Oh, I don't know. Nothing to say, really. 
There was a pause as he seemed to gather his thoughts. Was it better with the wolfsbane? Yes and no. I was less of a danger to others. Just that alone should be enough motivation for me to take it every month. But I still transformed, and I think the transformation is really what causes my pain. I didn't run wild, or break any bones, but I would still be in tremendous pain the next day. In addition, it made me nauseous as well, like I was coming down from a terrible hangover. Sirius looked thoughtful. Still no easy answers then are there. I had thought, with Wolfsbane, it might be better, but it sounds like trading one problem for another. Most of life's problems don't have easy answers. He looked at Sirius, and saw the worry behind his eyes. Don't worry about me, I'm used to it, this is just how it is, for now at least. No use wishing it was different. I don't understand how you do it. Sirius couldn't help but say. What exactly? You seem to be able to maintain your dignity, while still relying on others. For me, it always feels like a slight to my character. Sirius said. I wouldn't describe myself as dignified, but I'm glad you think so. Remus paused to consider his response. He was tired, not from lack of sleep, but from facing day after day of pain and hardship with no end in sight. So maybe that's why he said what he did next. It's a facade. The truth is I try very hard to look healthier than I am. I don't tell people every time I'm not feeling well. I bite back cries of pain, so that I don't worry you. I know it's a losing battle, it's very obvious to everyone who sees me that I'm in pain, from my cane to my scars, my disability is very visible. I can't stop trying to appear as normal as I can. But I don't have the luxury of turning away help. I need help, and when I don't get help, it gets bad for me. Thankfully, I do have people in my life who help, but I've lived alone for a while now, and even those close to me have busy lives of their own. I know what it's like to need help and not get it, so I will take all the help I can get. Needing help isn't shameful, but even if it was, I'd still take it, dignity be damned. Remus could tell that Sirius wasn't expecting such a raw and honest answer. He was a bit speechless. I want to be here for you, to give you all the help you deserve. As long as I live I'll be here for you. Remus wanted to respond, but there was suddenly a lump in his throat. Sirius continued. Is there something you need now, that you don't have, that would help? Remus cleared his throat to try to speak past the tears he was holding back. I should really be looking for a wheelchair. You know how much I fought against the idea of a cane. Even in school, it would have helped. But I didn't want to draw attention to myself. I didn't want people to think I was milking my disability for sympathy. I put it off for far too long, and when I finally did get it, it was so shocking to me how liberating it was. I kicked myself for being so stubborn, and counted myself as enlightened, now that I was past that phase of denial. Yet here I am, avoiding activities because they will cause me too much pain, relying on a cane that doesn't do as much as I need it to some days. Trying to convince myself that I don't need a wheelchair because I can still walk. Most days, the very fact I have to put in that caveat is reason enough. It won't be necessary every day, but it would make my bad days easier, and give me more freedom in where I go and for how long. Sirius nodded his head, as he reached out for Remus's hand. Okay, let's see what we can do to get you a wheelchair. Remus took Sirius's offered hand and nodded back at him. Then as Sirius started to look away, he pulled his attention back. Sirius. Yes. What about you? Do I need a wheelchair? Sirius said sarcastically, not quite tracking where Remus was going. Remus didn't let himself get sidetracked. This was too important. Is there anything you need that would make your life easier, but that you don't have? Sirius was a little startled that the conversation had turned back on him. His lips cracked into a smile, but his eyes were still sad as he said, I've got everything I could need, I have you. Remus held his gaze undeterred. That's wonderful to hear, but be serious. I'm always serious. Sirius's smile widened as he said it, but there were now tears in his eyes, probably because the last time he had made that joke was before. Before his whole world fell apart. His smile finally broke. Remus didn't say anything else. He just squeezed the hand he was still holding, and held Sirius's gaze now with tears of his own in his eyes.
Sirius paused and took a breath to keep away the tears. Remus could tell he wasn't blowing him off. He was really thinking about his answer. I, I don't know if I even know what I need. I'll have to think about that. When you have an answer, tell me. Okay. You promise? I promise. Sirius said, starting to chuckle again, then composed himself. I promise I will tell you. Good. The next day, Remus's pain was improved, but still bad enough that he stayed in bed again. Remus woke the third day after the moon feeling a little better. He was always in pain, but this was a better day than the two before, for which he was grateful. He rolled over and was surprised to see Sirius asleep next to him. Sirius hadn't done that since the incident. He always ended up in a chair or on the floor transformed into Padfoot. Remus soaked in this moment, waking up in bed next to Sirius. He missed this. He wanted to snuggle up next to him but didn't want to wake him, and he definitely didn't want to startle him. Sirius's eyes fluttered open, catching Remus staring at him. Sirius smiled. What a lovely face to wake up to. Remus couldn't help himself. His hand moved up and lightly combed the strands of hair that were in Sirius's face back behind his ears. Sirius's hand came up and rested on his, holding it against his cheek. He moved his face closer to Remus, and paused a moment just inches away. It was as if he was giving Remus a chance to push him away, but Remus wanted to do the opposite, to pull him in closer. As if Sirius could read his mind, he moved the final distance, capturing Remus's lips against his own, slowly, delicately, and then he backed up again. It wasn't very long, but it was filled with a thousand unspoken words. Good morning. Remus sighed, a smile curling the edge of his mouth. Are you hungry? I can bring you some breakfast. I'm starving, but I think I can get out of bed today. I'm feeling much better. As if to prove himself, he scooted into a sitting position and grabbed his cane. He paused there for a moment seated on the edge of the bed, until the initial wave of pain washed over him and ebbed away. He groaned as he stood up, pausing a second to steady himself before he slowly walked to the bathroom. That's great. I'll go start the kettle, meet you in the kitchen. Remus took his time getting ready and decided to do his morning stretches, which he had fallen out of the habit of doing since he had started traveling with Sirius. His joints were stiff and out of practice, but he always found that though they may not be very enjoyable to do, it helped him feel better over time. The trouble was you had to do it regularly to get any benefit and he wasn't very good at that. As he finished he turned around and saw Sirius watching him from the doorway. He was leaning against the doorframe, arms crossed, and a smirk on his face. I thought you were making breakfast, Remus said as he walked toward him. I was, I just came to see what was taking you so long, and then got a little distracted when I saw you. Hem, like what you saw, Remus replied. Always. It's a pity I missed the first half. Remus was right next to Sirius now and practically whispered in his ear. You'll have to join in next time. Oh, I'd like that. Sirius whispered back. They enjoyed breakfast together, then Remus went to the sitting room, where he picked the comfiest chair, and read his book. It wasn't long before he fell asleep again, book in hand, reading glasses still on his nose. When he woke, his back was screaming from the awkward position he had fallen asleep in. The book he had been reading was on the table beside him, with a bookmark in the spot he left off, and his glasses folded and resting on top. There was a blanket draped over him, keeping him warm. Sirius wasn't in the room, but that didn't change how cared for he felt, waking up like this. Remus looked around for Sirius after waking from his nap, and eventually found him outside brushing Buckbeak. Remus waved to him and sat down on the bench on the deck. Sirius gave Buckbeak another pat, then went to sit next to him. I've been thinking about what you asked, about what I need. Sirius paused. Yes, Remus prompted when he didn't continue. Sirius sighed and looked out at Buckbeak. The thing is I can think of a hundred things I need, but none of them are very tangible. Can you give me an example? Remus prompted. I need to be able to go to sleep without being plagued with nightmares about Dementors and Azkaban. I need to find a motivation to continue that isn't revenge, because that was it for so long. 
I need to go through a day without being afraid that someone or something is going to come in any minute and take my freedom away from me. I need to stop my brain from taking a thought and spiraling in on itself tighter and tighter until I'm just a ball of anxiety. You can't help me with that. There's not a single thing we can find that will help me with that. Sirius was shaking, and tears had come to his eyes. Remus put his arms around him and pulled him in close. Sirius rested his head on Remus's shoulder. I can't take away your pain, any more than you can take away mine. But you don't have to bottle it in. When you are feeling like that, you can tell me and we can talk it out. I know it's hard to share that part of you, but maybe it will help. Sirius squeezed him back and then nodded his head and backed up. It's worth a shot. You know what else might help? I used to see a therapist for a little bit. I wonder if there's a way we could find one for you. A shrink. Sirius looked unsure. Hey, don't knock it till you've tried it. Maybe, but I think you're forgetting the part where I'm still a fugitive. Yeah I know, it will take some consideration on how we do it. Remus said. Sirius sighed. Okay, let's work on that. Okay. Chapter 7, A Date After a few more days of recovery, Remus was back to his baseline, much more manageable pain. He was getting restless, having been at the cabin for a whole week. Sirius noticed and suggested a trip to the village. Despite his concerns about going out in public while on the run, he agreed. Sirius transfigured his face and hair to be just different enough he wouldn't be recognized. They operated just outside the village and walked the rest of the way. It felt so good to be outside, Remus was able to push aside his anxiety about being around people. They did some window shopping, taking lots of breaks to sit and enjoy the beautiful day. Sirius dragged Remus along into a clothing store and bought them both new clothes. Sirius chose a deep maroon velvet suit jacket and black slacks with a corresponding maroon pinstripe down the side. He tried to get Remus in a suit as well, but Remus refused, insisting there was no chance he would find himself in a situation that would warrant a suit. Sirius had to settle on buying him a new sweater and slacks. They changed back into the clothes they came in, and Remus secretly thought nothing Sirius wore could be hotter than his old leather jacket over a white shirt and jeans. Sirius shrunk their purchases down and placed them in his bag for ease of movement, and they continued to explore the town. There was a record shop that had music and movie paraphernalia, where they spent a few hours looking at everything and reminiscing. Remus spotted a movie he had seen a long time ago, scooped it up, and added it quickly to the small pile of records he wanted to purchase. After they finished making their purchases, they made a necessary stop at the grocery store, then carried their bags back out of town where they apparated again to their cottage. That evening after dinner, Remus went into the kitchen and inexplicably started to pop popcorn. Sirius followed the sound and stared at him quizzically. As Remus finished salting the popcorn, he pulled the movie he had purchased earlier out from the bag on the counter. I have a surprise for you. A surprise for me? What is it? His face lit up with excitement and confusion. Remus handed him the movie without comment, grinning and watching his reaction closely. Sirius read the cover. Labyrinth where everything seems possible and nothing is what it seems. That's David Bowie on the cover. It is. Remus beamed at Sirius's excitement. I saw it at the shop today, and knew you had to see it. Yes. I want to watch it right now. How do we watch it? Sirius took the VHS tape out of the sleeve and examined it, lifting the flap to look inside. Stop, stop, don't lift that. Remus said laughing. Here, I'll get it set up on the telly. He pointed to the black box in the corner of the living room that had remained unused so far. Sirius handed it to him in exchange for the popcorn and followed him to the TV, watching in fascination as Remus took the remote, pressed a button, and on came a static screen. He changed the channel a few times and pushed the VHS into the VCR player. They both sat down on the couch as Remus pressed play, but it picked up at the credits. Remus paused it and sighed, picked up his wand and aimed it at the TV. The past owner of this movie was not kind. He muttered to himself as he magically rewound the tape instantly, then pressed play. They snuggled close together, 
sharing the popcorn and enjoying the movie. Remus even sang along to some of the songs, to Sirius's delight. Sirius loved it, and afterward they also played some of the records they bought, singing along loudly to the songs they already knew, and dancing together to the new ones. Remus leaned on Sirius for support but danced nonetheless. David Bowie's wind came on and they slowed their steps to match the new rhythm. Sirius pulled Remus in close and they began to slow dance. Remus rested his head on Sirius's shoulder and closed his eyes, soaking in the feeling. Just two months ago he thought he'd never get this back. Sirius slowly turned his head into Remus's neck and kissed him at the crease of his jaw, then again, and again, slowly moving up his jaw to his lips. Remus turned to face Sirius and returned the kiss, long and slow. His hand came up and held the back of Sirius's neck, and cradled it there, allowing his fingers to comb through his hair. Sirius groaned at the feeling of Remus's hands on him, and he ran his hands down Remus's back and under his shirt. Their kiss became more desperate in response. Their hands started moving freely, exploring each other's bodies, each remembering just exactly what the other liked. They began peeling off layers of clothing in turns as they moved towards the bedroom, where Sirius leaned Remus back onto the bed. He paused there, staring at Remus's body, drinking in the sight. His gaze paused on each of the scars, many of which were new since they had last done this. His expression became unsure. Remus sat up and reached for Sirius's hand as if to make sure he wouldn't run away. It's okay, we don't have to do this if you don't want. I know, everything is so different now, Remus said softly. Sirius shook his head. Oh Mooney, I want this, I do, I just, I don't want to hurt you. You're not going to hurt me, Sirius. I know you, I know how gentle you can be. You're gonna make me feel so good. But I have already, I've hurt you. His eyes clouded over. Remus wasn't sure if he was thinking back to his reaction to Remus waking him from his nightmare or to distant memories of all the ways they had hurt each other in the past. Not on purpose. You've been so attentive this last week, since the moon. Maybe it's my turn to pay you a little attention. Remus pulled Sirius onto the bed and climbed on top of him, pinning him down by the arms. They both knew that Sirius could break free in an instant if he wanted to, but he let Remus hold him, reaching his face toward Remus's for a kiss. Remus accommodated his wordless request, and Sirius's mouth opened as the kiss deepened. Remus slowed the kiss and broke apart from Sirius. Still feeling apprehensive. We can always stop, if you want, but don't stop on my account. You are such a tease. That's one of the many things I love about you. Sirius was kissing him again before Remus had a chance to react to that confession, but he poured his response into his actions. Afterward, they both lay on their sides facing each other and cuddling each other close. Remus reached up and ran his fingers through Sirius's hair, pushing it back from his face, behind his ear. I'm so glad I could make you feel as good as you make me feel every day I'm with you, Sirius said while fighting back tears. Remus kissed his cheeks, where the tears had started to fall. You do, oh Merlin, you have no idea how good it is to have you back. I think I have some idea. They lay like that together for a long time, in comfortable silence, with their arms tightly around each other. Do you need anything? Sirius said after a while. Some water. He paused, then said. Do you need a pain potion? Remus's eyes had been closed, but he hadn't been sleeping. He almost waved off the offer, wanting them to stay like this together forever. But if he was being honest with himself, his last potion was wearing off and he was thirsty. I'll take you up on both of those, actually. Sirius shifted in the bed but didn't go far. He grabbed his wand, summoned the potion from the bathroom, and filled the glass on the nightstand with water from his wand. He watched Remus closely as he slowly shifted into a sitting position, but didn't say anything, just offered him the potion and water. Thank you. He took the potion and downed it in one, then took a large gulp of water. He closed his eyes and rested his head back against the pillows and headboard. When he opened them again, he took another sip of water, then set it on his nightstand, and turned to face Sirius, who was still watching him. Sirius, listen to me. You didn't hurt me, I loved every second of that. 
Remus addressed what he thought Sirius was thinking. I'm so glad. I loved it too. Sirius said. He reached over and took Remus's hand in his. I know we both had a good time. I just want you to know, if in the future, you ever aren't up for it, I don't want you to worry. He paused, then looked Remus in the eyes. All I need is to be near you. I don't need anything else, I just need you. If we need to change the way we do it, or we don't have to do it at all. It's you I want, and I'm happy with whatever that looks like, going forward. Remus sat up and took Sirius's face in his hands and kissed him long and hard. That's the sweetest thing anyone's ever said to me. Thank you. He whispered when their lips finally parted. But just so you know, that is a long way away. Chapter 8 Moving On The next morning, after they had woken and had breakfast, Remus broached the topic of changing locations. I think it's time we move on, don't you? Sirius looked up from the book he had borrowed from Remus's traveling library. You think so? I was just getting used to it here. Yes, but we've already been here too long, because of the moon. I think it's for the best if we keep moving, just in case, Remus said. I suppose you are right. Got anywhere in particular in mind? Oh I don't know, I was going to ask you the same thing. Anywhere you've always wanted to see. We could make it happen. Remus was trying to make the idea of moving on exciting rather than what it really was, a continuation of Sirius's never-ending flight. Remus had only been with him for a month so far, but he was already getting the feel for how draining it must have been for Sirius this last year. Hmm, I'm afraid I'm fresh out of ideas. We could go to Venice, oh, or Amsterdam, Remus suggested. So you want somewhere with a lot of canals? But what about Buckvig? We can't exactly walk into Amsterdam with a hippogriff. Sirius reminded him. Hmm, that's true. Maybe we forget canals for now. He paused to think. You know where we should go. Grimmauld. I'm sorry, what? You want to go to Grimmauld? Are you mad? Sirius looked incredulous. But Remus's eyes were sparkling. No not Grimmauld place, Grimmauld, Switzerland. I remember reading about it a few years back. It's supposed to be a beautiful mountainous remote village, plenty of space to hide a hippo griff, and I am sure it's absolutely stunning. I don't know, that sounds picturesque and all. But why don't we go somewhere warmer? It is summer after all. We could go to Greece, oh. Or Tuscany. Sirius said, finally getting into it. Tuscany sounds amazing. Remus was happy to see Sirius happy about moving for once. That sounds absolutely ideal. Let's do it. Remus and Sirius went to their bedroom after breakfast to start packing. Although it had been his idea, Remus was getting nervous at the idea of finding a new place. There was so much left up to chance when you were unfamiliar with an area. Sirius picked up on Remus's nerves. Mooney, darling, if you don't stop worrying I'm gonna have to sedate you. I'm sorry, this is still so new. I haven't traveled in a long time, Remus admitted. Don't worry, I'm a pro at traveling, remember all those trips to France my family dragged me on during summer breaks. Not to mention all the traveling during the war. Just leave it to me, I've got it handled. Sirius said. Remus looked at him quizzically. Sirius had never gone into much detail about what his secret missions had been. Of course he hadn't back then, seeing as he suspected Remus was the traitor. Remus was never around for very long anyway, usually out on long-term missions to the werewolves. What do you mean during the war? You traveled during the war. Sirius stilled, realizing what he had said. Oh yeah. James and I and sometimes. He stopped abruptly. Remus easily filled in the missing information. Peter had gone with them too. Sirius restarted. We were sent to other countries, just a few times. Dumbledore would set up port keys and connections. We tried to drum up support, and get intel on Voldemort's activities abroad. Wow, Merlin, I was really out of the loop wasn't I? Dumbledore never told me any of that. Not that I spoke much with Dumbledore himself, my main contact was Moody. The tight-lipped old bat never told me anything I didn't absolutely have to know. Remus started to open his luggage and pack his clothes. He suddenly felt the need to be doing something with his hands. Sirius watched him. Mooney. Hem. Remus acknowledged him but didn't stop what he was doing. Remus, stop. Sirius said. Please stop. 
Come here so we can talk about it. Now you want to talk about it. Remus bit back, but he knew that wasn't fair. He stopped packing and came to sit next to Sirius on the side of the bed. Sirius slowly took his hands in his. I get that it's hard to talk about. For the last few weeks, I've been avoiding it, but I think I might be ready, if you are. Remus stilled. He had wanted to do exactly this for weeks, to connect with Sirius about what happened. Now that the opportunity was here, everything within him wanted to run. He leaned back against the headboard. I thought I wanted this, but maybe I'll never be fully ready to talk about it. That doesn't mean we shouldn't try though. Sirius nodded. He took that as an invitation to start talking. When we started out, they sent us on low stakes errands and watch duty. But there were a few times when we were in the wrong place at the wrong time and we held our own. So they sent us on bigger and bigger missions. Do you think that was why? Or was it that all of their frontline fighters kept dying and they needed fresh blood? Remus asked, truly not trying to be hurtful, but with twelve years of hindsight to understand. Perhaps. You're right, of course. Sirius admitted before continuing. Anyway, you knew all that, we could still share information with you. But that last year before James and Lily went into hiding, you were sent on a long-term trip to the werewolves, and things started happening things that only a few of us knew about. Remember the Pruitt twins, and how they died shortly after you left on your mission. I had filled you in on the details of that mission right before you left, against Albus's instructions, and then the mission fell apart, right after you left to go to the pack, and it just, the timing of it was so. Suspicious. Remus filled in for him. Yeah. He took a moment to gather himself. Dumbledore began to close ranks, only sharing specific information with certain people. He and Moody were cautious about you. They said you were unpredictable, that you would go off script. They didn't say outright that they suspected you because they knew how close we all were. They framed it in such a way, like, we needed everything to be controlled, and you were a wildcard. They said that, because you had long periods where you were in enemy territory, you could be discovered and tortured or imperioused, and so they began to leave you out of the loop. They said it was to protect you as much as us. And we were so young, and quite honestly in way over our heads. We didn't think to question what they said. We took it at face value. They couldn't control me. Remus scoffed. That's so rich, since I've never once been out from under Dumbledore's thumb. They were the ones who told me I was the key to getting the werewolves' support. They just never understood what it was like for us. They would give me specific instructions, but they had no idea of the inner workings of the pack. If I had followed their instructions to the letter, I would have been kicked out or killed by the pack in the first week. I knew it bothered them that I was always improvising, but it was absolutely necessary. I thought after saving so many people from attacks I would have proved myself. What do you mean? Sirius looked at him after his last comment as if that was new information to him. What do you mean, what do I mean? Remus said incredulously. You said you saved people from attacks. You mean you think over time your actions had an indirect effect on the other werewolves that led to them not attacking people? Sirius sounded confused. What? No, I mean I was there when attacks were planned and set upon, and I physically put a stop to those attacks. Remus articulated. I personally took down werewolves who were about to attack Muggleborns and their children. You knew that didn't you? No I, you never talked about your time with the pack, and Dumbledore and Moody certainly didn't fill us in. If I had known that, I had no idea. Sirius seemed to be at a loss for words. Remus sighed. It doesn't matter anymore, I guess. Anyway, you were talking about traveling abroad. Sirius seemed to snap back into the conversation. Right. They only sent us on a few trips abroad. Most of the time, it was riskier missions in Britain. We would guard safe houses and muggle-borns. We broke into Death Eater homes, tried to steal information, and root out plans. James and I were good at dropping false leads and creating confusion among the Death Eaters. There were a lot of close calls and a lot of unexpected battles. Why did they send you? Wouldn't it have been better to send a more experienced Wix? I think they specifically sent us because we could fly under the radar in certain situations. Plus, everyone that was experienced was already being pulled in three different directions. And Peter would go with you, Remus said, somewhat incredulous. James was always advocating for him to be included. I always thought he would be happier left behind, and at first, he was. His motivation, well, he just never seemed to be as determined as we were. 
But then, he trailed off, and his eyes glazed over. Sirius. Remus squeezed the hand he was still holding. It's okay, you don't have to tell me everything right now. Sirius's attention snapped back to Remus. I was just thinking. You know for 12 years I replayed the war in my mind and tried to pinpoint the exact moment he betrayed us. Was he immediately taken in by Voldemort? Or was it when we started losing? Or did we start to lose because he was already spying on us? Was it something we did that pushed him away? That made him feel like a fourth wheel? Or was he just always a little opportunistic, and when the opportunity came, he took it? Did it bother him all along, that Lily was a muggle-born? That you and I were gay? Is that what pushed him away? So you don't even know, not even now? Remus asked. He played us all for fools Mooney. Dumbledore and Moody, even. No one suspected the little, trembling, quiet rat. Sirius sighed. Anyway, we got word back from one of Dumbledore's contacts that Voldemort was targeting James and Lily, and by then they had just had Harry, so James had been trying to go on fewer missions anyway. And the rest you know, except that when we discussed the secret keeper, James, Lily and I were talking about who it should be, and for some damned reason Peter was elected instead of me, or for fuck's sake instead of James himself. We were bloody idiots. I think that James was trying to make a show of it, like, see, there are some things, some people you can rely on, and they aren't always the strong leaders. He wanted to demonstrate to both of us that he trusted us. And instead of telling you the truth, I believed the lies that surrounded me, that you were being sneaky and acting off, that you were a risk to us all. But if I had trusted you, like James trusted Peter, then Lily and James may still be dead, but I wouldn't have gone down for their murder. And you and I would have been able to face that together, and Harry, I could have raised Harry. Tears were streaming down both of their faces now. Remus pulled Sirius in and rested his head on his shoulder. They clung to each other, both reliving their regrets from the past, both so desperate never to lose each other again. Their tears eventually slowed, but they still held on for dear life, never wanting to let go. Eventually, they did get around to packing but it took them the whole day to plan their trip. By the next morning, they were leaving their cottage for the last time, but not before much debate on their means of travel. Obviously at least one of them would need to ride Buckbeak. It's not like they could just tell him to meet them in Italy. However, Sirius was concerned the travel would be too much for Remus. He was insistent that Remus apparate there ahead of them and Sirius would travel with Buckbeak. At first, Remus balked at this idea, but in the end, he had to admit it made a lot of sense. Remus could go into town and easily scout a place to stay without causing any suspicion. He also knew that although he wouldn't admit it to Sirius, he was right. They had ridden together on Buckbeak from England, and Remus had been miserable. Just the thought of another long trip on a hippogriff gave him hip pain. They stood outside their cottage to say goodbye before separating for the few days it would take for Sirius to make the trip. They had shrunk their supplies down and split it between the two of them. Remus reached his hand up and ran it through Sirius's hair before kissing him softly but not without a hint of desperation. They parted lips, but their foreheads rested against each other. Their eyes closed, each of them not wanting to part. Sirius reached his arms around Remus and embraced him tightly, before finally parting. I'll be okay. I'll meet you in three days, in the forest outside Tuscany. We can survive three days apart, Sirius said. Remus wasn't sure who he was trying to convince more. Remus kissed him again before Sirius mounted Buckbeak. Three days, he repeated back. Day safe, carry on. Sirius smiled, before squeezing his legs to get Buckbeak to take off. Remus watched him fly away until he couldn't see him anymore, then took a deep breath as he prepared to apparate. Before he could do so, he felt more than heard someone approach from behind him. He gripped his wand as he turned to face the unexpected visitor. I should arrest you for aiding and abetting a fugitive, Moody said. Chapter 9 An Unexpected Visitor If you had wanted to arrest me, you wouldn't have announced your presence, and you wouldn't have waited for your fugitive to get away. Plus, I thought you were retired, old man, Remus said, although he still held his wand up ready to defend himself, or apparate away. This is true, Moody said and his face broke out in a smile. 
You should count yourself lucky that Albus filled me in on the events at Hogwarts in May. It was easy to pick up your trail once I knew you were traveling together. I suppose I should thank Albus for letting that sensitive information slip as well, Remus said still with a little ice in his voice, despite Moody's calm demeanor. Moody laughed at this. Well he didn't tell me that, but once I knew Sirius was innocent and you had resigned, it was easy to guess you would be together. Suppose it's not much of a leap. So you found us then, I'd love to know how, but I think the more pressing question is why, if you believe Dumbledore and aren't here to arrest me. Yes, well, Albus said you haven't responded to his letter, he wanted to make sure you were all right. Ah, so you're stalking us. Well, you can see that we are both fine and off to another destination, where we will be sure to be more careful to cover our tracks. Now run along and report back to teacher. Remus wasn't sure why this was so annoying to him. He should be glad he wasn't being arrested, but instead, he was seething that he and Sirius couldn't have a moment to themselves without someone peering in and making it their business. Why the hostility? We're on the same side after all. Oh really, that's news to me. Up until this moment, I was under the impression that if you hadn't been retired, you'd be leading the manhunt against my friend. He had almost said boyfriend, but on the off chance that was still private knowledge, he didn't want to give it away. Well, now you know that that's not the case, obviously. If it was, you'd both already be on your way to Azkaban. Moody responded. You know, that's the second time you've mentioned arresting me, and I'm beginning to take it as a threat. Moody sighed and rubbed his temple with his left hand. You're right, we've gotten off on the wrong foot. I'm sorry to sneak up on you, but Dumbledore was trying to contact you, and this was our last resort. Remus relaxed minutely. So you've made contact, you see that we're fine, was there something else you needed? Can't an old friend just stop by to see how you're doing? Remus took in a deep breath and exhaled, trying to calm down, trying to think. He and Moody were never what he would call friends. During his time in the Order, Moody had been his handler. There were many occasions where they butted heads, particularly when Remus had been unwilling to follow direct orders. If he had wanted Remus in custody, he would have given no warning before he had attacked, so that wasn't his motivation. He remembered Sirius's reaction to the letter from Albus how grateful he was to have Albus helping him. Remus had to at least pretend like they were allies for Sirius, if for nothing else. He took another deep breath and lowered his wand a little more, as a show of trust. Of course, you surprised me is all. I apologize for being defensive. No apology necessary, I understand. So, how are you and Sirius doing? Oh, seriously. Remus was again surprised that Moody was keeping pretenses up for so long without getting to the actual reason he was here. Seriously? Moody said and his etched face cracked into a gnarled smile. Well, being on the run tends to drag on one's nerves, as does twelve years of imprisonment in Azkaban for a crime you didn't commit, but all things considered, we are doing well, he said, trying to maintain a bit of critique in his tone, but it faded at the end as he reflected on the last few weeks. It had been hard, but he was back with Sirius, and that made up for any hardship. He found himself trying to disguise a smile and failing. Do you mind if we have a seat? I've been on my feet all morning, Moody said as he walked to the chairs on the porch. Once he was seated, he looked back at where Remus was still standing. Come join me, my friend. Remus paused another moment to consider, then went over to sit across from Moody. Once he was seated, Moody spoke again. How was your last moon? We made sure I was far from any civilization. I wasn't a danger. I assure you we are taking precautions. I'm glad to hear that. I figured you didn't have a supply of Wolfsbane with you. With all your traveling in unfamiliar places, I would hate to hear you stumbled upon someone by accident. In all my 28 years as a werewolf, I have never attacked someone during a moon. Rest assured I, more so than anyone else, understand how important that is, Remus said. All right. How was your recovery? Remus paused as he remembered the days he had spent in bed recovering. No broken bones and no new scars, I'd say it was fairly mild. Right. Good. 
Moody said awkwardly as if he wasn't sure of the best response. He switched subjects then. I was in Albus's office the day after your resignation from Hogwarts. Albus filled me in on the events of that evening, Sirius's innocence, and your resignation that morning. We discussed strategies for keeping Sirius's whereabouts disguised and ways of opening up investigations into any possible evidence that would corroborate his story. Kingsley started working on that immediately. Then the next week my old connections at Gringotts let me know that you had been in and withdrawn a considerable amount of money, not from your vault, but from Sirius Black's vault, which is the very first time you had ever done that. Well, we knew that was going to be suspicious when it was discovered, which is why we left the country the same day. Remus said, feeling the need to defend himself. Right, which is exactly how I knew you were abroad, and verified that you were together. Listen, Remus, I could lay out exactly how I tracked you, but that wasn't my point. My point was, I buried that information, and any other information I found and only used it to track you today. I am not here on ministry business, I am here to make sure my friends are safe. Albus and I were truly concerned when you didn't respond to his letter. We began to worry that you had been found by someone else. Sirius and I, you don't have to worry about us. We know how to take care of ourselves. I mean, he did get caught twice. Moody said. That's because we weren't together. In the end there, no one trusted anyone, and I was hundreds of miles away with a pack of my enemies. You were there this time? Moody pointed out. I was a werewolf. I was a bit distracted. Remus closed his eyes and took another deep breath. Sirius and I work better when we are together. When we trust each other and are by each other's side, we can take care of each other. All we are doing is trying to find somewhere safe that we can be together without having to constantly be on alert. I realize that there might not be a single place on earth where we can do that, but we will keep looking until we find it. Moody looked at him for a long time, as if trying to decide something. Albus had wanted me to bring you back in, to convince you that Sirius was better off on his own. Now I'm reconsidering that move. Please Moody, let me stay with him. He needs me and, and I need him, Remus said. Also, if you try to take me in with you, know this, I will not go without a fight, and you don't want to fight me on this. Moody chuckled. You think you can take me? Moody, I know I can take you. Remus stared him down to make sure he knew he was serious. Moody's laugh was gone now, but he still had a wry smile, despite the threat that hung in the air. All right, we'll have to get to the bottom of that some other time. Right now, I have to come up with what I'm going to tell Albus when I come back without you. Remus smiled. Tell him I overpowered you. I don't think that will do you any favors, even if he did believe it. Moody replied. Remus was still smiling. Then tell him the truth. That I wasn't going to come back willingly, and you realized that if you took me back unwillingly, you would be causing harm to an already tenuous alliance. That listening to us when we say we need time and space, instead of forcing us to do your bidding will build bridges for when we are ready to come back. That was very good, thank you. Don't ever say I didn't do anything for you, Remus said. I'll be sure to remember. Now it was Remus's turn to size Moody up. He stared at him intently as he tried to discern if he could be trusted. I have a question for you, he said finally. Go ahead. Do you think there would be a safe way for Sirius to be interrogated under Verita Serum to prove his innocence? It would take some doing to convince the Ministry to slow down enough to interrogate him rather than just take him in, Moody said. That's what Dumbledore said. I'm a little surprised it didn't come up in your strategy session. I'll look into it. I would be nervous to bring him in without any other supporting proof because the Ministry might go back on their word and then Sirius would be imprisoned again or worse. Remus nodded his head. Thank you. Moody stood and held out his hand, which Remus took and shook. All right, I should be off. Next time Albus writes, do us both a favor and respond in a timely manner so that I don't have to come find you again. Keep Sirius safe, and have a good time in Tuscany, I hear it's wonderful this time of year. Moody apparated away before Remus could process his last words. He sat alone, one hand gripped his cane and the other his wand, and there was ice in his veins. Remus apparated a kilometer away.
Hominum Revelio, he shouted as he scanned the woods. He did a quick search, just for good measure, before casting a Patronus to send a message to Sirius. We are being tracked. Tuscany is no longer safe. Fall back to our mountainous option. Do not return to our last location. I am safe, and will meet you in three days. He waited for the return message, which wouldn't be that long in coming. Sirius hadn't had much time to travel. The large silvery shadow of a dog appeared finally, and he heard Sirius's voice in response. Message received. Continuing to secondary location. Stay safe, and send for me if you need help. Remus sighed in relief that Sirius was still out there and safe, and not on his way to Tuscany. He apparated after a moment to center himself, and found himself in the woods lining a road next to a sign that read Gimmelwald. Chapter 10 Blossom of Snow Remus walked into the new town, trying his best to shake off the feeling he was being followed. He reminded himself that there was no way they knew where he was. The only reason Moody had known about Tuscany was he had obviously been hiding watching them as they said goodbye, and they had mentioned Tuscany. But that only fed his nerves. How long had Moody been following them exactly? Surely Remus would have smelled or sensed him if he had followed them for longer. Had he possibly heard them making plans the day before? He so clearly had been there in time to catch Sirius, so why did he wait till they were separated? If he were to take Moody at his word, it was because Albus had wanted to convince him to leave Sirius alone. However, Remus wondered if the answer wasn't more strategic. Never ambush two when you could ambush one, the risk of being outnumbered in a fight was too great. If Remus had even an ounce of respect for Moody, he may have thought he wouldn't want to startle Sirius and add to his stress or trauma, but Remus wasn't willing to give him that kind of credit. It was clear he thought Remus was the weaker opponent of the two and was trying to limit his risk. If they had both been present for that conversation, it would have been difficult to try to convince Remus to part with Sirius. But if they were caught apart, he could play on Remus's self-doubts and try to get him to see reason. So they were still underestimating him. Good. Remus thrived in an atmosphere of low expectations. What he had said to Moody wasn't a bluff. You don't survive as a werewolf all on your own in a wizarding war that claimed all your friends without being able to defend yourself, but he didn't need to show off. His ego wasn't bruised by their low impression of him. He would use these scraps handed to him and turn them to his advantage like he always did. So he shuffled as fast as he could into town, keeping an eye out for anyone who was watching or tailing him. He turned the corner and stopped on the edge of the main street which sat on the side of a hill that opened up to the most picturesque view he'd ever seen. For a moment, he drank it in, but only for a moment. He only had a few days to find a place and get settled before Sirius arrived. He continued on, unsure at first what to do, until he noticed something odd. A door which had not been there a second ago, just appeared in the wall in front of him. There was a sign hanging above the door, which said Eight of Ice Tea House. He paused to think for a moment, but having no better ideas, entered the mysterious door. If the door suddenly appearing wasn't clue enough, it was clear the second he entered that this was a magical shop. There were floating candles, and a waiter hovering teacups on saucers to a table. To his left sat two wicks in robes playing wizard's chess. He took a second to reconsider. He was just tracked down by Moody, should he really be in a wizarding establishment. Guten Tag. Remus was shaken out of his indecision by the witch behind the counter with curly black hair and a streak of white running through, pulled up in a messy bun with a quill stuck in it. She had square tortoise shell glasses and dangling crystal earrings. She was looking at Remus, after greeting him in German. Oh, Guten Tag. I'm so sorry, I don't speak German. Remus fumbled awkwardly as he approached the counter. Well, that's okay. I won't hold it against you. She said in accented English. Not from around here, are you? No, I'm traveling. I just arrived and was getting the lay of the land when your door appeared in front of me. Oh, wonderful. We don't get too many travelers coming in that direction. Well, you are welcome to have breakfast here. And then if you continue through the back door, it will take you to Iger Street, which is an all-wicks community with portals connecting from all over Switzerland. 
Remus seemed to remember the building he entered being practically built into the hillside. He briefly wondered if the magical community was subterranean, or if the portal opened up to another part of the country entirely. Oh, that is brilliant, wonderful. Remus paused, not wanting to sound ungrateful. I actually have lodging in town already. I just realized I'm late to meet my friends. He looked at his wrist before realizing he didn't have a watch. The witch let out a giggle. All right. Well, don't be a stranger. I didn't catch your name. The witch asked. Jareth. Remus said the first name that came to mind. They shouldn't be using their real names. Nice to meet you, Jareth. I'm Helena. Thank you so much for your help. I may see you around, Helena. Auf Wiedersehen, Jareth. Auf Wiedersehen. Remus returned as he left. Remus found a muggle travel agent further down the street and secured as remote a cabin as he could. He operated there and as soon as he entered the door, he closed the curtains and cast every protective spell he could think of. He finally began to unpack his possessions and unshrink his luggage. The cabin was on the side of a mountain, with the nearest house a kilometer away. The view from the large windows in the sitting room would be spectacular if the curtains had been open. He sat down on the sofa to gather his thoughts. Not three hours ago, he had been with Sirius, and then with Moody. His hands started to shake thinking about it. They had to be more careful, he thought. Part of him wanted to stay in this cabin until Sirius came, but he knew that would drive him wild, with nothing to pass the time but worry. He figured he should stock the house with groceries, and although everything in him was telling him to stay away from the wizarding village, he also knew it would be good to stock up on potions and the like since he had stumbled on a likely source. As much as he hated the idea of entering a magical community when he was on the run, it felt like it would be better to do it now, without Sirius. Besides, he was extremely curious about that portal. He made his way back into town by operating to the same location he had earlier, just outside, and walked in. Upon entering Edelweiss Tea House, Helena greeted him again. She took his order and shared awkward small talk with him as he ate lunch at the counter. He felt obliged to try the namesake tea and was pleasantly surprised by its fresh herbal quality. After he finished, he continued through to Iger Street. The door at the back of the shop, which should have led into the side of the mountain, instead led to an open street with similar awe-inspiring mountain views. Iger Street was remarkably similar to Diagon Alley aesthetically, though not as large. All of the signs must have been bewitched to appear in the language of the reader because they all appeared to be in English. He walked for a few blocks before he spotted a potion and apothecary shop where he stocked up on pain relief and sleeping potions. They had a few blood replenishment potions and pepper-up potions that Remus purchased as well. Now that he had accomplished his goal, he ambled back toward the tea shop, worried that he had already been out in public for too long. However, he was distracted when he saw a library. His heart leapt at the idea of a new book. He'd been deep in study among the ancient texts he had acquired, but the few books he had packed for light reading had been thoroughly read and reread, and there was not much left to be gleaned from the experience. Surely one more stop wouldn't hurt. Upon entering the library, he immediately knew there was an expanding charm, as it was much more spacious than it appeared on the outside. The signs continued to appear in English, and after conversing with the librarian, he discovered that the majority of the books in the library had been put under a similar charm. Remus was fascinated by this inclusive design, and knew it must have taken hours of spell work to keep up. He perused the shelves and pulled a variety of books, fiction, non-fiction, and other. He was fully distracted by the spell theory section and added several to the growing pile he had hovering beside him. On his way to the checkout, there was a selection on display of autobiographies and memoirs, one of which immediately caught his attention. The title read, Overcoming Societal Discrimination of Werewolves. He turned the book over and was shocked when he saw that he recognized the author pictured on the back, Sarah Quinn. He had spent some time in a pack with her after the war. He immediately took the book and the others he had selected and approached the librarian. After a brief discussion about library cards, due dates, and late fees, Remus filled out a form with the name Jareth, and soon he was outside with his books. 
He rushed home as fast as he could, all other tasks on his list forgotten. As soon as he was back in his cabin he made himself comfortable in the sitting room and began to read. Remus read through the afternoon, and late into the night until he had finished the book in one sitting. Then he took out some paper and wrote a letter to Sarah. He'd have to find an owl the next day to send it. He finally climbed into bed, where his thoughts returned to Sirius. Remus could hardly believe it had only been this morning they had parted. They were supposed to meet in Tuscany, and now he was on the side of a mountain. He hoped Sirius was all right. He debated sending a Patronus message, but he was likely too far away. He tried to convince himself he would be fine and get some rest, but it took some time for him to finally fall asleep. Chapter 11 Delayed The next two days went by slowly, as he tried to find things to occupy his time. He sent off his letter and bought groceries and hay for Buckbeak. He explored the muggle side of town a bit more and studied the spell theory books from the library. Eventually, he found himself where he inevitably did when given too much spare time, bend over his journals with at least five magical theory books open on the dining room table. After dinner on the third day, as he was doing dishes, a large silver dog appeared in the kitchen, and the voice of Sirius filled the room. I've hit a bit of a delay. I won't be there till tomorrow evening. I'm fine. Don't worry about me. I'll message you tomorrow for location details. Remus didn't like the sound of that. He debated on what to reply, but decided on. Let me know if you need any help, otherwise, I will see you tomorrow. Sirius didn't reply further. Remus spent a sleepless night, despite Sirius's reassurance, worried about what could be causing a delay. Eventually, after lunch the next day, he got another Patronus from Sirius asking for the rendezvous location. Remus replied with specific instructions on where to meet him. He had decided it would be best to meet him a kilometer or so further into the woods and walk in together. The cabin he had rented was fairly far from other houses, but a flying hippogriff could still be spotted from some distance. At long last it was evening, and he apparated to the meeting spot. He transfigured an old stump into a chair and sat, unsure of how long he would have to wait. He pulled out his book but couldn't focus on the page and instead stared at the sky which was ablaze with red, pink, and orange as the sun set over the mountains in the distance. It was quite a while, maybe an hour before he saw anything. Finally, he spotted a tiny speck in the sky, which grew larger as it got closer. He stood up from his chair and waved his arm trying to get its attention. He lit the tip of his wand as a signal. The winged creature almost flew right past him but doubled back into a tight circle coming in to land in front of him, about thirty feet away. As soon as Buckbeak landed Remus bowed his head and Buckbeak returned the greeting and let out a screech. Remus then focused on Sirius, who was slumped over Buckbeak's back. Sirius. His heart plummeted into his stomach as he rushed over to Sirius as fast as he could. Sirius. Answer me, Sirius. Remus was at Buckbeak's side now, but in the dim light, even his lupine eyes couldn't make out any details. Remus directed his wand light on Sirius and saw a red stain on Buckbeak's feathers where Sirius was lying. Sirius, are you hurt? Stupid question. He reached out his hand to pull back Sirius's clothing. He wasn't sure of the extent of the injuries and didn't want to try to move him, but examining him while he was six feet off the ground was not easy. He listened closely for Sirius's heartbeat, and relief flooded his heart when he heard the steady beat. He found no open wounds, but a gash in his shirt, and a fresh pink scar on his stomach indicated an attack that had managed to be healed by magic. Mooney! A raspy voice finally came out. Remus's head snapped back to look at Sirius's face. His eyes were open. Thanks, Cersei, you're alive. Don't scare me like that, Sirius. I'm sorry. I promise I won't do it again if I can help it. Sirius answered in almost a whisper. Are you still injured? I can heal you. What happened? Were you followed? Remus immediately took a quick scan of the woods around him. He cast a few detection spells that confirmed they were alone. I'm okay, I'm just a little tired is all. Sirius managed to get into a sitting position. I, I can't reach you from down here. As if in response, Buckbeak bowed low, 
and Remus scrambled onto his back, riding backwards so that he could face Sirius. Now that they were on the same level, he cast a larger light spell for better illumination and examined Sirius thoroughly. There were no open wounds or broken bones, but if the blood stain on Buckbeak was any indication, Sirius might have lost a lot of blood. You may be anemic from loss of blood. I have a blood replenishment potion back at the cabin. I'll survive till then I think. Sirius smirked, obviously trying to lighten the mood. Remus turned around on Buckbeak's back and summoned his cane from where he had dropped it on the forest floor. Sirius grabbed him around the waist from behind and leaned his weight against him, using Remus to keep himself upright. Remus guided Buckbeak through the forest to their new temporary home. Once there, he asked Buckbeak to lower them down again, and he complied. Helping Sirius down, they grabbed onto each other to steady themselves. Remus did his best to guide Sirius back into the house relying heavily on his cane to keep them both upright. They barely made it to the sofa, where Remus sat Sirius down as gently as he could. Just a walk into the house had Sirius shaking. His usual porcelain complexion had gone jaundiced, and the whites of his eyes yellowed. Remus went searching for the potions he had just purchased, and then rushed back to Sirius once they were located. Here, take this, it's a blood replenishment potion. Sirius looked as if he was about to protest. Don't look at me like that, you're taking this potion. Okay, okay. Sirius didn't have much energy to put up a fight, so he took the potion in one gulp. And this pain potion? Remus handed it to him. I'm not in pain, Sirius said unconvincingly. His voice was still raspy and weak. Like hell, you're not in pain. I've been cut open like that before, I know it hurts even after the healing spell. Fine. Sirius took the second potion then laid down on the cushions. Remus pulled a throw blanket from the chair next to them and covered him up. Do you need to rest, or can you tell me what the hell happened? It was poachers, they were trying to get Buckbeak. Sirius said, not providing much detail. Remus thought he could cut him some slack, given his current state. Your message said you were fine. You should have told me, I would have come and helped you. I was fine when I sent the message. We had gotten away without taking any blows, and I thought it would be best to do a large loop before I came to you, so I didn't lead them right to you. Sirius took a deep breath and let it out, like talking this much was a struggle. He reached out a hand, Remus took it and squeezed it. Sirius closed his eyes but continued his story. I thought we had lost them but they must have found our trail during the night and gained ground, because after we stopped for dinner they ambushed us. But they bit off more than they could chew with Buckbeak and me, given we are hardened fugitives. He chuckled softly. We got away, but not before one of them hit me with some kind of slashing spell. I had to heal myself while in the air, which wasn't easy, as I was getting pretty lightheaded. I ended up laying flat on his back, so I wouldn't fall off. I'm a little surprised we found you, I wasn't much help in guiding Buckbeak. He must have been close enough to catch your scent. Remus's head was reeling at the recounting. The idea of Sirius falling off of Buckbeak was too much for him to handle. Remus softly ran his hand through Sirius's hair and kissed him on his forehead. Hush, rest. Then he got up and walked towards the door. Where are you going? Sirius sounded worried. I'm going to cast every protective spell I can think of on this place. Remus replied. What about Buckbeak? There's not much I can do about him. There's a shed out back, but I don't know how comfortable it would be for him. He'll be okay, he can take care of himself. Remus tried to assure. Try to coax him into the shed, he won't draw as much attention then. Sirius said. Are you sure you lost them? Reasonably sure. If you think I look bad, you should see them. He said with a wink. I think we convinced them we weren't worth the trouble. Let's hope so, we are running out of backup locations. Remus walked out the door and did as he said he would. He had already cast the normal spells on the place, but he broke out every protective spell he could think of and used them. He managed to coax Buck Beak into the shed and brought over the hay he had purchased in advance for him. As he entered the house again, he cast Hominum Revelio again, but it only indicated Sirius and Remus were present. Feel better. Sirius said, looking up at him briefly from where he lay on the couch before closing his eyes again. He was already looking a little bit better, his cheeks were a little more rosy. A bit. 
your turn, who was tracking us that made you change our plans to this place instead of Tuscany? Sirius asked. As soon as you were out of sight, Moody showed up. Sirius's eyes shot open at this. No. I'm afraid so, but he obviously didn't want to capture us, or we would have ended in a duel. He had to have been there before you left, and decided to reveal himself to just me. Remus filled Sirius in on their conversation. Remus, you have got to learn to have a better poker face, play along a little. I know, my anger always gets me in trouble. I did try, I managed to rein it in at the end. I think you better write to them, just so they will back off a little, Remus said. So, Albus thinks we should go our separate ways. Don't go getting any funny ideas. You're stuck with me now, Remus said sternly. I wouldn't dream of it, Sirius replied, holding back a smile. Do you think there was more to the visit than just that? I don't know, but with Albus, you can always count on there being something held back. You don't trust him? Sirius asked. I don't trust him to tell us his full plan, no. You were literally working for him for the past year. Sirius reminded him. Right, and then I found out he was instrumental in deceiving me and keeping me from my friends when they needed me most. Then he encouraged a miner to fuck around with time just to take more classes, and also sent miners on a dangerous mission to save a hippogriff and a fugitive from dangerous wizards and dementors. Right. I see your point. But I really don't see any alternatives to working with him, given he is one of the few people who believe I'm innocent, and they are always going to be at the center of any resistance. We don't have the luxury of bowing out of any fight that may come, given how much we both care for Harry and the fact that he will be the most targeted. Remus sighed. No, I'm not suggesting we don't be a part of it. I just think we should explore other options. Other options? Sirius asked. Yes, there may be other allies we haven't considered. I'm writing back to him in the morning, just to ease his mind. If you find other allies, I'm all ears, but in the meantime, we can't alienate the ones we have. Sirius was looking better but still looked exhausted. Okay, but for now. I'm taking you to bed. Oh, please do, Sirius said cheekily. No, not like that, to sleep and rest. You still look a mess, Remus said. If I wasn't so exhausted, I'd be offended. Remus and Sirius made their way down the hall. At one point, Sirius paused and reached out a hand, which Remus immediately grabbed to support him. I just got a little lightheaded, that's all, Sirius said. The potion takes some time to have a full effect. You'll feel better in the morning, Remus assured. Sirius just nodded slowly as he entered the bedroom and crawled into bed. That pain potion sure works quickly, huh? I can't even feel the pain anymore. Yeah, Remus said, but realized internally that so often those potions merely take the edge off his daily pain. Whether he built up a tolerance to the potion or his pain was just more than the potion was able to have an effect on, he didn't know, and he wasn't sure which was worse. Remus adjusted the covers and tucked Sirius in, then sat there watching Sirius with his eyes closed as his breathing leveled out. He was asleep within minutes. Chapter 12 Old Friends Sirius was feeling much better the next day. His dizziness was gone and his energy had almost fully returned. Remus made him breakfast, and still insisted he take it easy. After they finished eating, Remus handed him the book. While I was in town I came across this book at the library. You've been in this town for four days and you already have a muggle library card. Some things never change. Sirius rolled his eyes but smiled. No, it's not a muggle library, it's a magical library. There's a magical community here. I stumbled on him on my first day, Remus admitted. You specifically sought out the wizarding world. Alone, Sirius said in a mocking tone, mimicking Remus's reaction to Sirius's similar actions just a few weeks prior. His voice returned to normal but he continued. You stumbled into a magical community and instead of avoiding it, you joined the library. Whatever happened to keeping a low profile? You have to keep a low profile, I'm not the fugitive, Remus defended himself. But they know we are together. You told me yourself that Moody said it was easy to track us because they knew we were together, and then you go leaving a paper trail. Sirius said. Merlin, did we get hit with a switching jinx? 
How are you the one lecturing me to be more careful? Remus said. Doesn't feel so good being on the other side of it, does it? Sirius smiled. It doesn't matter. I didn't use my real name. I'm not an idiot. Oh yeah. What's your cover? Sirius asked. Jareth. Ah yes, very original. No detective looking into every detail of our shared past will ever be able to uncover our mutual love for David Bowie. Sirius laughed. Shut it, would you? Remus tried to act annoyed but he couldn't help being a little entertained by the playful banter. He gave Sirius's shoulder a soft shove. Sirius looked over at him and couldn't help but smile. All right, all right. You were deep undercover at the library. Go on. Sirius said. Remus rolled his eyes but tapped the book and continued. This book, I knew the author. We were briefly in the same pack. And she wrote a book, he said incredulously. Yes, believe it or not, I'm not the only one of my kind who is literate, Remus said sarcastically. Oh come off it, that's not what I meant. I just meant, in Britain it wouldn't get through the publishers is all, Sirius said. Yes well, you should read it, the rest of Wizarding Europe isn't quite so stuck in the past as we are. She touches on more than just werewolf rights, there's a whole chapter on how inhumane it is to use dementors in prisons. Really? This got Sirius's attention. He flipped the book over to read the summary. Does she mention you? Remus paused. Not by name, but yes. Really? Now Sirius was flipping it open to start reading, fully invested in figuring out which of the unnamed werewolves was Remus. I wrote her a letter, she's in Switzerland too, working for an organization that helps minorities, refugees, asylum seekers, that kind of thing. I hope she writes back. Sirius said, only half listening as he turned a page. Remus smirked. I'll leave you to your book then. There was no response as Remus walked out to the front porch. He took a deep breath of fresh cool mountain air as he took in the view of the valley below. For the first time in over a month, he felt some of the tension in his shoulders release. Despite the events of last night, there was a sliver of hope on the horizon, and he wasn't going to let it slip by. Much like Remus, Sirius read the whole book in one sitting. He only stopped to confirm his guess as to which of the werewolves referred to Remus. The one in the old sweater who would often go off on his own, returning with chocolate bars and new books. Since finishing, he hadn't stopped talking about it. It's like I never knew how enmeshed in the problem I was until she pointed it out and now, I just cannot believe how blind I was. I mean, I thought I was enlightened, throwing out the whole pure blood nonsense, but that's barely scratching the surface, are you even listening? Sirius looked over to see Remus's eyes glazed over. Hem, oh, sorry, I zoned out a little there. Remus shook his head to clear his mind. Am I boring you? No, well. Ha ha. Sirius rolled his eyes. There was a tapping at the sitting room window, and they both looked up to see an owl. Remus almost tripped over his cane in his rush to retrieve the letter. He brought it back in, and read it out loud. Dear Remus, it was a delight to receive your letter. I am so glad you are well. I often wonder about the friends I lost touch with back then and hope they are still all right. The world can be cruel, but of course, I don't have to tell you that. I would love to meet with you while you are traveling through Europe. You mentioned in your letter an interest in my work. I can fill you in on the details then. How would you like to visit me in Geneva? Does July 19th, at 2 o'clock work? We'll meet in the place du Borg de Four. Your old friend, Sarah Quinn. Remus reread it silently, then looked up. Sirius was beaming at him. Well, should I go? Remus asked. What do you mean, should you go? Of course, you should go. Sirius was pulling out paper and pen as if he were going to write the response himself. Remus giggled as he took the stationery from him and penned his response. Tell her you are bringing your dog, Sirius said excitedly. Do you think that's a good idea? I mean we just had a run-in with Moody, and he likely knows you are an animagius now thanks to Albus. It's not a great cover anymore. Oh come on you said it yourself, if Moody had wanted to capture me, he would have done so before I took off, Sirius said. I suppose so. Okay but you have to stay as Padfoot the whole time, Remus insisted. Of course. 
There was still over a week before their plans with Sarah. They used this time to get settled in their new location. Sirius would spend whole afternoons in the shed working on one project or another. He was often vague when Remus pressed for details, but Remus rarely ventured out to investigate. It was good seeing Sirius excited about a project. It didn't matter much to Remus what the project actually was. Remus, on the other hand, had already made a second trip to the library and spent most of his afternoons deep in study, scrawling notes in various journals. July 19th finally arrived, and Remus was getting cold feet. Before they left for Geneva, he voiced his concerns. Do you think we should be taking more precautions? I feel like we aren't being careful enough. Remus asked. Says the man who just wandered through a random wizard portal and got a library card. Sirius said sarcastically. Yes, exactly, I shouldn't have done that. Remus said. Okay, library card aside, what other risky behaviors would you have us forego? Well, we could probably get an enchanted tent instead of renting furnished cottages. Then we wouldn't have to have as much contact with the outside world. We could keep to ourselves and go to larger cities when we need necessities where a strange traveler is less noticeable. We could cancel our meeting with Sarah. It's an incredibly risky step, Remus answered. All of that sounds devastatingly boring. Why should we spare the expense of a tent when we could sleep on the side of the road? Should we go full hermit and never speak to anyone other than the two of us? We could sneak around at night and take what we need, then we would never have to see another human soul again, Sirius said. You're mocking me, Remus replied. I would never. Joke all you want, but Moody found us once, and he can do it again, Remus reminded him. Let him, Sirius said. You said he's on our side, remember. What does it matter if he knows where we are? I've been on the run for over a year now and I'm tired of eating out of trash bins, begging for scraps, and sleeping in random muggle family dog beds. What was that last one? Remus cocked his head with curiosity. Sirius blew right past Remus's interruption and continued. Look, the point is, I don't want to rough it anymore. I know we could be more strategic about this, but I think we can risk a few creature comforts. I don't want to sleep in a mildewy tent, I want four walls, a door, and a roof. I want a paddock for Buckbeak to run around in, and a porch with rocking chairs. I want to stay in one place for more than a week at a time, I want to go on more dates with you and see people again. I want to make friends. Do you remember friends, Mooney? I don't want to be alone anymore. Okay, you're right, I agree. Remus walked over to where Sirius was sitting on the sofa and held out his hand. Let's go make a friend, shall we? With that, they apparated to the coordinates Sarah included in her last letter and Sirius transformed into Padfoot. They had agreed to go without a leash to start and see if they were confronted about it. Remus had a leash in his pocket just in case it was an issue. They walked together out of the alley and traveled the few blocks to the place du Borg de Four and the agreed-upon café. Sarah was already there, sitting at a secluded table outside, drinking a coffee. He recognized her blonde hair pulled back into a sleek ponytail. She had a new scar running down the left side of her face, from temple to chin. The rest of her fair complexion was peppered with freckles. She wore a violet pantsuit, over a white blouse. She looked up and saw the two approaching, and smiled. Remus. Oh, it's so good to see you, Sarah said as she got up to greet him. She immediately opened her arms for a hug, which Remus returned. Look at you. You look so good. Sirius had insisted that they buy him a new outfit, as all of his current clothes had been mended multiple times. Remus had gone along with it but had pretended it was too much. He wore a new pair of slacks and a button-down shirt under a maroon sweater with a Nordic knit pattern around the neckline. It was new, but still fit his relaxed academic style. Oh, I don't know about that, but you. I was absolutely delighted to find your book. I'm so glad you've done so well, Remus replied as they pulled apart from their hug. Padfoot was pacing excitedly beside them, panting. This must be your dog. What's his name? Can I pet him? Or is it a her? Sarah said finally. This is Padfoot. Remus turned his attention to Padfoot as well. Let's ask him, Pads, can Sarah pet you? He asked. Padfoot immediately stopped pacing and sat down, holding up his front right paw in invitation. 
Oh, how delightful, Sarah said as she shook his paw, then scratched behind his ears. Padfoot closed his eyes and his back paw started to twitch. Remus laughed. Well, I will leave you two to get to know each other while I get a coffee. Padfoot barked at him as he turned. Don't worry, I won't forget your biscuit. He returned shortly with a coffee for him and the promised biscuit for Padfoot. They then sat down and chatted a bit, getting reacquainted. Sarah told him about her work with magical minorities and refugees. During the war, many people fled from Britain into other countries. Some were more welcoming than others. And if those refugees happened to be a minority or a half-breed, heaven forbid a werewolf, oftentimes there was nowhere to go that would help them. I decided to work towards a better future for everyone, not just pure bloods. That's incredible, Remus said genuinely. What about you? What have you been up to? Sarah asked. Oh, well, as you said, it's not easy being a werewolf in Britain. I got work where I could. Last year Dumbledore even gave me a teaching job at the school. I taught defense against the dark arts. But then it came out I was a werewolf, so I had to leave. Remus explained. Oh, that's terrible to hear. I'm so sorry. I'm sure you were a wonderful teacher. You were always so kind to the younger members of the pack. Do you keep in touch with anyone from the old days? No, I cut ties with them and never looked back, but occasionally I do see familiar names in the paper. I'm sorry to say most of those I know about are either in prison or... Remus didn't finish the thought but took another sip of his coffee instead. Sarah sighed. I was afraid that would be the case. That's why I was so thrilled to hear from you. I'm so glad to see you're doing okay. Remus paused and looked into his cup of coffee, weighing his next move. He had gone back and forth over the last week on whether he was going to go through with his plan, but with Sirius's reassurance this morning he decided he would go for it. He looked down at Padfoot then returned his gaze to Sarah. I didn't really come here to talk about myself. I must tell you I had a bit of an ulterior motivation. Really? Because you would be a prime candidate for my organization. We could help you transition over to living in Switzerland if that's something you would want. Sarah offered. That's very kind of you, and I'll consider it. But while reading your book, I realized that there is another person who you could help who needs it more than me. That is, if you would allow me to presume upon our friendship. Good old Remus, always putting others before yourself. Go on, tell me who it is. Sarah smiled. Sirius Black. Padfoot had been lying on the sidewalk next to Remus's chair, but he suddenly stood up and barked at Remus. It's okay, Pads, Remus said and reached out his hand. Padfoot rested his face in it for a second, then sat down, closely watching the two of them. Of course, I've heard of him. He escaped from Azkaban. Didn't he murder a bunch of muggles? Wasn't he a Death Eater? Sarah said dubiously. Allegedly, Remus said. Allegedly. Yes, see, he wasn't given a trial. The crime occurred, he was found at the scene of the crime, and there was barely any investigation then he was shipped off to Azkaban. Remus explained. How is that possible? No trial. But there was evidence, surely. Sarah asked. That's what I thought. He was found at the scene of the crime, dozens of muggle witnesses, and he was half mad. Sure there wasn't a trial, but it was obvious what he did, so obviously he's guilty. Until a few months ago when I found out something that made everything I thought I knew fall apart. Which is? Peter Pettigrew, who Sirius was allegedly after and murdered, is alive. I saw him myself, until he got away again, Remus said. Okay, so he didn't murder Peter, he still murdered all the muggles. No, Peter murdered all the muggles and framed Sirius. Sirius was after Peter, but that's because Peter betrayed our friends, James and Lily. Wait, I'm confused, I'm going to need you to start from the beginning, Sarah said. So Remus explained it all, about how he used to have three best friends, about the war, and the fear and the spy, about the secret keeper, and the betrayal. He even told her about Peter being an animagus, but left out the part about James and Sirius also being animagus. Wow! If all of that is true, you are absolutely right, he would qualify for asylum. The problem is we don't have proof that Peter is alive and was the real traitor, Remus said. 
Leave that to me. I will start a proper investigation. She paused. So, have you been in contact with him? And if I said I was? Remus asked. I'd ask you to reach out to him and ask him if we could meet. Sarah said. Forgive me, but how do I know you won't just turn him in? We don't have to meet right away, but it would be helpful to hear his side of the story from his own perspective. It would also be helpful to hear from him about Azkaban. My organization has been building a human rights case against that place for years, and hearing his first-hand account would be a huge help. I'll see what I can do, Remus said. Before you go, I wanted to ask you what your plans are for the full moon, Sarah said. Oh, I have a remote place. It won't be a problem, I assure you, Remus said as he looked around to see who may be listening. I'm not concerned. I was just curious if you wanted to join me. I am a part of a small pack that gets together for the moons. When was the last time you were with a pack? Sarah asked. When was the last time I saw you? That long, huh? Listen, the moon's in two days. You don't have to decide now. Sarah handed him a paper with apparition coordinates. Join us if you want. There's no commitment necessary. I know that's what got you in trouble in the past. We all just go for the moon and leave after. I'll think about it, Remus promised. After that, they said their goodbyes and left. Sirius was silent until they were back in the cabin. Once they were inside, he went straight to the bathroom and slammed the door. Remus dragged a dining room chair over to the door and sat down, prepared to be there for a while. Sirius, I'm sorry. Why the hell didn't you tell me you were going to do that? Sirius shouted through the door. I thought you might tell me not to. Remus was desperate to find a way to help Sirius find somewhere he could be at peace, where he didn't have to run anymore. He had convinced himself it wasn't worth the risk Sirius would say no. So instead of listening to my opinions and respecting them, even if you don't agree, you just decided to take matters into your own fucking hands. I thought we were past that. You're right, of course you are right. I'm so sorry. Remus leaned his head against the wall, feeling awful. This was the kind of shit they had pulled on each other when they were young and stupid. Trying desperately to protect the other in the worst possible ways. You can't do that again. We have to be a team. No secrets, remember. Sirius said. I won't do it again, I promise. No secrets. Remus answered. Sirius didn't respond and the silence dragged on. Remus's chest constricted in fear. When they used to rile each other up, one of them would eventually go to James who would talk some sense into their thick skulls and tell them to apologize, kiss, and make up. They didn't have that anymore. It was all up to them to make this work. After what felt like ages, the door suddenly opened, and Sirius took Remus's face in his hands, leaned down, and kissed him. What was that for? Remus asked. That was a thank you. I thought you were mad at me. I was mad at you for not telling me your plan, not for the plan itself. Sirius explained. So you would have gone along with it if I had told you? Remus asked. Probably not, but I would have been wrong. Sirius, you know how utterly confusing you are sometimes, right? Sirius kissed him again. I know, I'm still a dramatic bitch, but someone's got to put up with me, and I'm so glad it's you. Sirius looked down at the chair. You dragged over a chair. I wasn't sure how long you would need, and I didn't want to leave you. Remus leaned up to kiss Sirius again. But I also didn't want to sit on the floor. He finished, his mouth failing to hold in a chuckle. Sirius rolled his eyes and kissed him again. Maybe they would be okay on their own after all, Remus thought to himself. Chapter 13 Old Wounds so, are you going to go with Sarah on the full moon? Sirius asked. It was the day after their meeting with Sarah, and Remus hadn't said anything about the moon yet. Oh, Remus paused. I guess I haven't decided. I mean, the moons are something you enjoy being at, and I like spending them with you, so I don't want to leave you out of it. Yeah, I do enjoy them, but it's more that I enjoy making sure you're safe. If you'll be safe with this pack, and it would be better in some way for you to be there. Then I think you should go, Sirius said. Remus nodded but still didn't say anything. Mooney, why did she ask how long it's been? Sirius asked. I mean, 
I know that werewolves are drawn to spend time together because it's a community of people with a shared experience, which is great, but, but it felt like there was more to it than that. Yeah, I guess I never really went into much detail with you about what it was like when I was in the pack. Of course, that pack was not very enjoyable to be with for other reasons. Remus collected his thoughts. There is more to it. When I'm with a pack, the transformations are easier. There is a shared magic that allows for quicker recovery afterward. Well if that's the case then you should definitely go. Remus shrugged. I can do without it. Mooney, I was with you after the last moon. You were bedridden for two days, and it took you almost a week to recover. If she can help you recover faster, you should go. Sirius insisted. But what about you? What about me? I'll be happy knowing that you will be in less pain for less time. Much more happy than if you stayed and were in pain just for my sake. Okay. Remus sighed. Okay. I'll try it. But my history with Pax has not been the best, so it'll likely be a one-time thing. Sirius watched him closely. I remember when you came back from the pack back then. It was like you were confused about who you were. Are you afraid of that happening again? Remus didn't reply right away. I never told you about it, because I didn't want you to know how much it affected me. He took a deep breath before he continued. The truth is, the few times I've been with a pack, when I returned to the wizarding world, it left me feeling empty. It was like I was only half of my potential when I was away from the pack. I hate to think of that feeling returning, but in some ways, it hasn't ever gone away. Over time, I suppose my memory of what it was like with a pack faded, so the comparison is less stark. I'm not looking forward to the reminder that the only time I ever felt whole was when I was with other werewolves. I hate myself for feeling like that. Oh, Mooney. Sirius went to where he was seated on the sofa and gathered him in his arms. Merlin, that must have been so confusing to feel like that back then, especially about that pack in particular. To be so at home when you were surrounded by people we had labeled as our enemies. Remus sighed. It may make my physical recovery faster, but I'm afraid it will rip open old wounds in my soul. Sirius pulled him in tighter. I completely understand if you don't want to go. Maybe Sarah has found a balance to it. She seems well adjusted. Sirius finally said. You're right, I think I should try it. Remus had decided. He was still unsure, but he longed for the completeness that he felt with a pack, even though it had always come with more trouble than it was worth. The day of the full moon arrived. Despite facing the usual pain before the moon, Remus still finished the dishes from breakfast. It was something to do to keep busy at least. He came out into the dining room to find Sirius writing. Writing a letter. Kind of. Sirius paused and looked up at Remus. I'm writing a letter to Sarah, for you to take with you. Good idea. Remus looked at the table and realized that he had already written three full pages in his small, neat script before he had interrupted. That's a long letter. Yeah. Sirius looked down at them then back up at Remus. I'm giving her what she asked for, a detailed account of my experience at Azkaban. I know I haven't told you much about it, and, I know it's not fair, but... Sirius stopped mid-sentence as his voice cracked, and his face crumpled. Remus went to him and sat in the chair next to him, reached out, and pulled him into his chest. I'm going to ask you not to read it, at least not yet. You don't need to know about all of it, it won't do you or me any good. You don't have to tell me anything you don't want to. Remus held on to him tightly. You also don't have to tell Sarah anything you don't want to. If it's too much, you don't have to do it. I, I need her to know. If she can help me, if she can shut the place down, then it will be worth it to me to document it. Only if you're sure, and you don't have to do that all at once, you could just give her a summary to start. Remus insisted. Sirius shook his head. No, I think it's important that they get the full picture. Remus loosened his grip on Sirius as he straightened back up. I'm not going to insist you share your trauma with me, and I completely understand why you want to protect me from that, but I want you to know if you ever change your mind, I'm here, and I'm ready to listen if you want. If you ever think it will help you to tell me, I can take it. Sirius just nodded his head. Thank you for understanding. Remus leaned in again and gave him a kiss. Of course. Then he stood up. I'm going to go sit on the porch with my book if you need me. I seriously can't get enough of this view.
Remus spent the rest of the morning outside, mostly reading in the overcushioned porch chair. Eventually, he felt the need to stretch his aching body, so he visited Buckbeak grazing in the meadow behind the house. When he finally went inside, he found Sirius transformed into Padfoot curled up on the couch. Remus went to the couch and sat on the opposite side as Padfoot, but Padfoot immediately scooted over and rested his head in his lap. You okay? Remus said as he started to scratch him behind the ears. It had been weird when he had first learned that Sirius was an animagus, but any awkwardness had long ago melted away. Now it was completely normal for Remus to scratch his boyfriend behind the ears when he was in dog form. Sirius whined a little in response. Remus knew it was easier for him to experience strong emotions as Padfoot. They were less intense and took on an ephemeral quality that he could separate himself from, at least for a while. They stayed like that for a long time, until finally Padfoot sat up and turned back into Sirius, and then resumed leaning against Remus's shoulder, and started to sob. Remus turned and pulled him into a tight embrace. They didn't say anything, there was nothing to say. They just held on to each other for dear life riding the waves of grief together until they finally calmed. Remus ran his hands through Sirius's hair as he calmed down. I can't. Sirius tried again. I don't want you to read it. Hush, don't worry, I already said I won't. I know, I just, I thought after it was down on paper I'd feel better, or different, but it's just so much, I didn't realize how much until it was all right there in front of me, and it makes it worse, it's so much worse. Sirius said, tears still falling down his face. Remus wiped away the most recent tears. Oh Sirius, I wish I knew how to make it better. I'm so sorry you have to relive it. I just hope that Sarah can help us. Just you being here makes it better. That's good because you're stuck with me now, Remus said, and they both tried for a laugh. I'm sorry you were getting this version of me. I wish I could be like I was when we were first dating. Now I'm just holding you back. Sirius whispered as he leaned his head on Remus's shoulder. What do you mean? I'm a shell of who I once was, and we both know it. I used to be strong, carefree and wild. I was the life of the party. You are still one of the strongest people I know. You survived Azkaban and escaped. That was because of Padfoot. Sirius dismissed. You are Padfoot. Padfoot wouldn't exist if you hadn't created him. The very fact that Padfoot still exists is proof that you are the same strong, wicked smart, wild person you were back then. But it's not just that. You escaped Azkaban, infiltrated the most heavily magically protected place in all of Great Britain, and attacked a known killer. You would have brought him in if it hadn't been for me. That wasn't your fault. Sirius was quick to correct. And as far as carefree, I don't know. At the end of the war, there wasn't a lot to be carefree about. I'm certainly not as carefree as I once was. I don't think anyone can maintain the youthful innocence for long when they are fighting a war. Remus paused for a moment, mulling over his own insecurities. It's crazy that you think for one second you could be holding me back when I was always the one holding you back. That's not true. It was true then and it's true now. You were an athlete, top of your class, the most popular kid in school, running all kinds of adventures. I only ever slowed you down. I was always trailing behind you and James trying to keep up. Doing everything I could not to spoil your fun. And now I, this is exactly what I was worried would happen to me when I was younger. I would get older, the moons would be harder, my body would fail me and then all your time and energy would be sucked into taking care of me, instead of being who you were meant to be. Even Dumbledore told me not to join you, he said I would slow you down. The only reason I was on the Quidditch team was because you convinced me to try out again after I didn't get on the team second year. You and I were dead even at the top of the class, you gave me the competition I needed to take my studies seriously, and you were always the one that motivated me to learn new and complex magic. You say Padfoot wouldn't have existed without me, he wouldn't have existed without you. You were the reason I became an Animagius, which when you think about it means you are the reason I was able to escape from Azkaban. And that map of yours was central to all of our wild pranks in school. You have always pushed me to be better than I thought I could ever be. You were my greatest adventure, getting to know you, how you let me be my true self, falling in love. Knowing you has always been the highest joy of my life, and that is just as true now as it ever has been. 
If it weren't for you I would probably be back in England stalking Harry from afar and eating rubbish. Remus stared at Sirius. We truly are better together. Our lives when we are apart are terrible. The way we feed off each other, becoming greater than the sum of our parts. I'm never letting go of you again. Good because I'm not going to ever let you. Chapter 14 New Pack The rest of the day, Sirius was in a bit of a daze, which Remus found completely understandable. He didn't like the idea of leaving him like this, but the alternative was spending the moon with him, which he also didn't think was fair. He hated how much the moon demanded their attention. It so often forced Sirius to push his emotions and focus away from himself and to the side so that he could care for Remus. It wasn't fair to him. There was nothing to be done about that, of course. Whether or not they were ready for it, the moon came anyway. Sirius had transfigured some of the extra parchment into a manila envelope for his letter to Sarah. It was much too thick to fit into a standard envelope. He sealed it with a wax seal and handed it to Remus before he left. Stay safe tonight, Sirius said. I will, Remus said, taking the envelope and tucking it into his satchel. He leaned in for a goodbye kiss. I'll send you a Patronus in the morning. I'm not sure what the plan is, afterward. That's okay, just let me know you're safe, and take your time in the morning. And... Sirius paused as if reconsidering, but then continued. If you need me at all, I can be there in a second. Remus held back a laugh. I'll be okay, really, he said, as much for himself as for Sirius. They finally parted after a few more kisses and goodbyes. Remus stepped back and apparated to the location he had memorized. When he opened his eyes, Sarah was there, along with five other people he didn't know. Even if he had not known they were werewolves ahead of time, it was apparent immediately. The magical draw of Pack was so strong. Even his body instinctively relaxed in response. The anxiety and agitation of the transformation diminished when he joined the group. They were inside an old stone house, almost like a ruin. It brought back memories of his time with Fenrir, which he was not keen to remember. Sarah turned around at his appearance. Remus, you made it. She came over to hug him. Let me introduce you to the others. They walked over to the other werewolves, and Sarah went around and introduced them one by one. This is Ian, Greta, Wilson, Martin, and Lena, everyone. This is Remus. He's the friend of mine I was telling you about. Remus greeted everyone, forgetting their names almost immediately, then turned back to Sarah. Before we go too much further, I have an important package for you. They stepped away from the group, far enough that they couldn't be heard. I was able to get a hold of my friend I told you about, and he wrote this for you. Remus pulled out the manila envelope. Is there somewhere we can keep this safe while we transform? Oh my goodness, this is incredible. Of course, we actually have lockers over here where we can magically lock any of our belongings for the night. I'll put it in mine, it'll be safe there. I can't believe you got this to me so quickly. This is substantial, she said as she felt the weight of it in her hands. She didn't open it, but walked him over to a wall of lockers opened one, and placed it in along with her bag and coat. She then magically sealed it and turned back to Remus. Is there anything you want to lock up? Remus removed his bag and coat and locked them in one of the available lockers as well. So, how does this work? Where are we? This is a plot of land a few of us went in together to buy, far outside of the city. There's a barrier that goes up right before the moon rises and stays up until daybreak. I'm sorry, what? So I'll be trapped in here, Remus said nervously. Well, the barrier is quite large, about five kilometers in diameter, but yes. Is that a problem? Sarah asked. I suppose not, Remus said, but his heart rate picked up a little. As long as it's just for the night. It is, Sarah assured. It drops 15 minutes after the sun rises. It's a safety precaution so we don't come across anyone we may unintentionally harm. All of us have tried Wolfsbane and for one reason or another decided it wasn't meeting our needs, so we devised this plan instead. In the morning, we tend to each other until we are all well enough to return home. The youngest of the group approached them as they were talking. 
The sun low in the sky shone through the window and highlighted his chestnut complexion. His deep brown eyes met Remus's, then glanced at Sarah. Sarah, it's almost time. All right, Wilson, let's go outside, everyone, she said, speaking to the small group. Outside of the ruin was a picturesque wood with a stream that ran right past the old crumbling stone building. The sun was almost below the horizon. See you on the other side, Sarah said, just before the moon came up and their transformations began. The wolf was surprised by the company he found himself in. It felt great to be with other wolves again. It had been so long. Finally a pack. They ran and hunted all night, and when the sun was about to come up, they gathered back near the stone building where they started. Mooney lay down, and as the sun came up, his body convulsed as the transformation came over him. He was Remus once more. Remus came to consciousness on the floor of the forest, in a world of pain. Soon he realized that there was a magical presence around him, and his own magic reached out to it, making it stronger, and in turn making him stronger. His pain slowly subsided. It was still there, but it was much less prominent than the last moon. He rolled onto his back, closed his eyes, and took a deep breath. After a minute more, he heard the others moving around him. Rimas, are you okay? One of the others asked. Remus thought it might have been Ian, but he couldn't quite remember. Remus opened his eyes and sat up slowly, expecting pain that wasn't there. He wantlessly transfigured a blanket to cover up. Yeah, I'm good, surprisingly. Ian reached out a hand to help Remus up. He was tall and slender, with salt and pepper hair that was in a trim, handsome cut. His dark olive skin was interrupted with scars along his face and arms. They were close to the stone building, and Ian thankfully offered his arm in support to Remus. Let's just stay here for a moment, Sarah went to retrieve our canes. Werewolf healing magic could only do so much, and it certainly couldn't do anything to get rid of his bad hip. Sarah was already walking towards them and handed them their canes. She turned and led the way back to the house, but Remus could tell she was limping more than she had last night. Once they reached the house, Remus opened his locker and retrieved his wand and a pair of clothes he had packed in his bag. No one was in the room with him, so he shot off a Patronus message to Sirius after getting dressed, letting him know he had a good night and was not in as much pain this morning. Then he went to join the others in the large front room. There were soft chairs and several beds set up with the group spread out on them. Remus sat on one of the beds, but didn't immediately crawl under the covers. He was definitely tired, but while around the others, there was an energy he was feeding off that compelled him to stay awake. How long have you been together? Remus asked the group. We all met at different times, I've known Sarah the longest, for almost five years, Ian said. He was seated next to Sarah on the sofa. Sarah was leaning against him, their hands resting together on Ian's knee. Sarah has a way about her that tends to attract wayward souls, Greta said a twinkle in her deep brown eyes. Her tight curls framed her round mahogany face. My brother Wilson and I met her through her work, and she invited us to join them around three years ago. Wilson nodded from where he sat across from Greta. Martin and I met her similarly. We were a part of another pack, but were rejected. Sarah invited us to join her last year, Lena said, speaking softly. She had short brunette hair, and wore glasses that made her blue eyes look abnormally large. Her face was much more scarred than the others, other than perhaps Martin's. She and Greta were curled up next to each other on another sofa. Martin didn't say anything, but gave a curt nod, watching Lena as she talked. Martin was older than Lena, but not by much. His red wavy hair was just long enough to brush the top of his ears. He ran his hand through it pushing it from one side to the other so it was out of his heavily freckled face, making the white scars across his cheeks and nose that much more prominent. He sat on one of the beds, back resting against the wall and feet up on the bed so that his knees were against his chest. His other arm was resting on his knees, and Remus realized it was amputated just below the elbow. What about you? Greta asked. Sarah and I met ten years ago, Remus asked. Unsure if that was right. 
When Sarah nodded he continued, We were part of a pack for a while, but I was rejected from them, and we lost touch. Until I stumbled across her book a few weeks ago and wrote to her. Remus was rejected because he refused to fully cut ties with the wizarding world, something I know we all can relate to. Sarah filled in. So, you all only get together for the moons? Remus asked. I wouldn't say only. We're all friends and get together regularly. Ian and I live together in Geneva. Greta and Wilson live together as well, but if you mean to say we are not living together as a pack full-time, then yes, we only come together as a pack on the full moon. The best of both worlds, Wilson said. Indeed, Sarah said. I hate to break up the party, but I know we are all exhausted. As long as everyone is feeling well enough, I'd say we are fine to travel to our own homes. Is anyone in need of extra healing? Now that she mentioned it, he could feel the energy calming down in intensity. He was beginning to feel the effects of a night with no sleep. He felt strangely sad at the idea of going back to Sirius. He wanted to stay here as long as possible. He felt safe and whole in a way he hadn't in years. However, the rest of the group took this as a cue that it was time to go home. They each said their goodbyes, some more slowly than others, lingering over side conversations. Eventually, it was just Sarah, Ian, and him remaining. Remus hadn't gotten up off the bed and had even laid down on top of the covers, resting his head. Sarah pulled up a chair and sat next to him. Ian had wandered out of the room, but Remus could sense he was still in the building. How are you feeling? Sarah asked. Good, tired, but good, Remus answered. We're a small pack, not nearly as powerful as the last pack we were in together, but I trust you still drew some benefit from being with us. This is the best moon I've had in a long time, Sarah. I, I hadn't forgotten, exactly, but I had forced myself not to think of it. It hurts too much to remember, I think. I can understand that. Sarah paused, then pulled out the envelope Remus had given her. We didn't get much chance to talk about this last night. Remus pulled himself into a sitting position at the side of the envelope. Yes, I haven't read it, he, he didn't want me to. But I know that it was difficult for him to write this. He said it was important that he do what he can to help you. So please, please, we are both trusting you with this. Don't take it lightly. And please, if there is anything you can do to help him. His voice broke, and so he stopped before he lost control. I promise you I will do everything I can to help your friend. This is my highest priority right now. Sarah said, reaching out a hand and resting it on Remus's shoulder. Do you need to stay here to rest before you travel? We could both stay a while with you. No, I think I'd best be going. I don't want, I would prefer my own bed. Remus had almost said he didn't want Sirius to worry but pivoted mid-sentence. Sarah didn't seem to notice anything. I can understand that too, she said smiling. They walked outside together and said goodbye before they all operated to their respective homes. Remus appeared just outside the house they were renting. The familiar intense yank still left him shaking. Immediately, Remus noticed a change in how he felt. It was as if he left a part of him behind. The feeling was so intense, he ran his hand not holding the cane over his body to see if anything was missing or if something had splinched until he realized it wasn't physical. This was the feeling of missing his pack his family. Sirius opened the front door and ran out to him, taking his free hand in a supportive stance. Mooney, you're back so soon. Can you make it inside? I can help you. Sirius stared at Remus, who was so far not responding to anything he was saying. Mooney, what's the matter? Are you hurt? Remus finally shook his head to clear his mind. I, I'm fine, he said, trying to convince himself as well. I'm not in a lot of pain, I can walk, he said and started moving to the front door, which Sirius had left open. Sirius followed close behind. Are you sure? I have a pain potion here, were they okay? Did something happen? Remus was already on his way to the bedroom. I'm okay, they were great, I'm just tired. Here, I'll take the potion. Remus took the potion quickly and set the bottle down on the nightstand as he crawled into bed. I'm sorry Sirius, could we talk about this after I've slept? I'm just very tired. 
Of course, of course. I'll just leave you alone then. I'll be in the other room if you need anything. Remus listened to him close the door and walk down the hall, then cast Silencio as he covered his face with the pillow and let out a sob. He cried until he finally fell asleep, his pillow wet against his cheek. Chapter 15 Longing When Remus awoke, it was still light outside the window. He got up to use the bathroom, then crawled back under the covers. He wasn't tired, and his pain was already back to normal, but his heart was still aching as if he had just been torn away from his family. He lay there for an hour before the door slowly opened, and Sirius peeked his head in. Oh, you're awake, he said, speaking softly. He opened the door and came into the room then took a seat in the chair next to the bed. Remus didn't say anything. He didn't know what to say and still didn't feel much like talking. Are you hungry? Sirius asked, probably trying to coax him out of his shell. Remus was usually starving after a moon. Remus saw this as a possible way to get Sirius out of the room. Yes, he said. Of course you are. I'll go get you some dinner. Stay right there. I'll be back soon. Sirius left the room and came back altogether too quickly with a bowl of shepherd's pie. I made it while you were resting, and just held it under a stasis charm, he said looking entirely too proud of himself. Remus sat up reluctantly and took the bowl. Thanks, he said and took a small bite. It was amazing, of course, so he started to eat it faster, finally realizing just how hungry he was. So, Sirius prompted. So what? Remus said and took another bite to keep his mouth occupied. Come on, Remus, give me something, I'm dying of curiosity here, Sirius said with a smile. It was fine, Remus said and paused. He was doing it again, hiding away this part of him that brought the most shame. He had thought after all these years he had accepted this part of himself, but he had actually ignored and starved it into a more palatable form. Well, last night he finally fed it, and it came back just as strong as it ever was before, and it scared him. Now, I'm not going to call you a liar, but if it was so fine, it seems strange that there would be tears in your eyes, Sirius said. Remus reached up and wiped his wet cheeks. He hadn't even noticed them. He laughed bitterly. Can't pull a fast one over on you. Did they hurt you? Do I need to go find them and challenge them to a duel? Sirius had started this conversation in jest, but the longer it went the more his face filled with concern. Remus put his empty bowl on the end table and brought his knees up to his chest, wrapping his hands around them and hiding his face between them. No, they didn't hurt me, I just, just give me a second to try to figure out how to tell you. Sirius moved to sit across from him on the foot of the bed. He ran a hand through Remus's hair. You don't have to tell me anything you don't want to, but I'm here, and I'm ready to listen if you want. If you think it will help you to tell me, I can take it. Remus recognized the words he had said to Sirius just yesterday. Remus looked up at Sirius, and tried to clear his throat past the growing lump there. I want you to know, he said, but it was still a moment before he gathered his thoughts enough to start. It was great, being with a pack again, and they were different from any other pack I've ever been with before. We were in a forest, and they said that there was a barrier put in place to keep us from hurting anyone, just for the night. And it felt so good to run with him, Mooney was so happy. He's always his happiest when he's with other werewolves. He likes Padfoot, and running with him, but I don't know how to describe it. It's more than happiness, or joy, it's, I belong, and finally, I'm home. And I feel whole and alive, and free, and safe. I just met these people yesterday, and they are like my family and I absolutely hate that. Remus's words started to drip with disdain. I just met these people yesterday, he repeated. But when I left them, it was like a part of my heart was splinched as I apparated away. He took a deep breath, trying to steady his voice, and failing. It's not me feeling these things, it's the wolf. I am being coerced to feel these magical attachments and losses of a wild animal who I am forced to share a body with. He already gets my body on the moon and destroys it to the point it's beyond repair, and now he gets to rule over my emotions. To make me feel like this. Why can't I feel like this about? He stopped short. He had let loose and started speaking as the thoughts were entering his head 
But that thought was too much, he couldn't say it out loud. He couldn't say it out loud, but Sirius could. About me. Remus broke down then, hiding his face in his arms again. How could he think such a thing? Why couldn't he just for once be happy? Sirius was right in front of him, and Mooney had him in a full depressive episode for some people whose names he barely remembered. Mooney, don't. It's okay. I said I can take it. He tried peeling Remus's arms apart to crack the protective shell, but Remus closed and tighter on himself. He flopped over dramatically onto his side, maintaining his fetal position. Okay, okay. You don't have to look at me, Sirius said, but he laid down on his side behind him, wrapping his arms around Remus as best he could. I'm so sorry you are going through this. I wish I could make it go away, but I can't. But I can be here with you. And I can let you know that what you just said, speaking what you truly feel in this moment, it didn't hurt me, I promise. Like you said, that's the wolf. The wolf is allowed to have his emotions, his heightened magical tugs. They can be strong, but they're shallow. Our love. Our love is a calm surface that hides a deep current. It's more than just an instinct. It doesn't have to be propelled by magical forces, it's built on a foundation of shared history. It's not drowning in a storm, it's the lighthouse that guides us to safety. It doesn't need to be in the same vicinity to be fueled. It survived twelve years apart. It fought through a war, and it will fight through another one if it has to. Our love. It isn't carried by a whim, it's intentional. It's not easy. It's saying day after day I don't care what the world throws at me, I'm going to love you anyway, because you're worth it, because we're worth it. While Sirius was saying this, he could feel Remus's muscles relax. He unfurled his body from the tight position he was holding, rolling over in Sirius's arms so that they were facing each other. At those last words, Remus pulled him into a strong kiss. Sirius could taste Remus's salty tears on his lips like the taste of ocean spray. When their lips finally parted, Remus whispered, I love you. I love you too, Sirius whispered back. Remus woke earlier than he would have liked the next morning. He slowly shifted position under the covers in an attempt to not wake Sirius lying beside him and closed his eyes to try to fall back asleep. Ten more minutes passed until he admitted defeat and slowly sat up, stretching his aching back. He grabbed his wand and put it in his pocket then grabbed his cane from where it was leaning against the nightstand and stood, pausing for a minute to steady himself before moving to the bathroom. The cold mountain air gave him goosebumps, and his whole body started to shiver. Once in the bathroom, he turned on the heat and relieved himself, then turned on the water for a shower. Taking the wand out of his pocket, he cast a spell, making grab bars in the shower wall appear, and a shower chair. He set aside his wand and cane and took off his clothes, then used the bars to climb into the shower where he sat and took a minute to let the hot water and steam penetrate his cold skin. He was about to start lathering up his hair when there was a knock at the door. Mooney, you almost done in there. I gotta go. Sirius yelled through the door. Just starting, actually. Remus called back. Oh, screw it. Sirius said. I'm coming in. It's nothing I haven't seen before he said as he walked through the door that Remus hadn't bothered to lock. Remus had to laugh at the intrusion. It reminded him of how it used to be, back when they lived in the flat in London together. In the beginning, they had nothing private and more often than not, even shared showers and baths. His eyes opened wide at the memory of how different his current shower looked than those of a decade ago, and he was suddenly very aware of Sirius, just on the other side of the curtain. His first instinct was to want to hide this, as he had been doing, vanishing the handrails and chair after each shower, but that was exhausting, and they had moved past keeping up appearances. There was something to the vulnerability of revealing the most private things about you, and letting someone carry that with you. So he said, When you're done you're welcome to join me. I was hoping you might say that. I didn't want you to use up all the hot water before I got any. Sirius said, as he finished up and pulled back the curtain. He peeked his head in, his torso already unclad. Remus watched his face for a reaction. His eyes darted from Remus seated to the grab bars, then back to Remus. And a smile curled the edge of his mouth. Do you create and vanish those each time you take a shower? 
he said as he took off his remaining clothes and climbed in. He leaned down, resting his hand on one of the bars, and kissed Remus. Maybe, Remus said between kisses. Somewhere in the void, there is just a pile of once used grab bars. I like to think it's just the same set every time. Sirius gripped the bar tighter and gave it a pull. I think these ones are pretty good, might be able to leave these up for longer. Remus laughed, as Sirius kissed him once more, then took some shampoo and started to massage it into his head. Remus closed his eyes and relaxed. Sirius always gave the best scalp massages. After a moment, Remus responded. I don't know why I did that. You sure? No, you're right, I know exactly why. I think I do too. It's okay Mooney, you don't have to explain yourself to me. Remus took a moment to let that sink in. It wasn't just because Remus was a grown adult who could do what he wanted without having to account for his actions to his boyfriend, although that was true. It was more that Sirius understood him, as a person, his motivations, his insecurities, his fears, hopes, and dreams. Sirius got it, he didn't need Remus to explain it because he already knew. Calm waters over a deep current. Chapter 16 Choices That day, over breakfast, they received another letter from Sarah, this time addressed to Sirius. Remus handed him the letter, and Sirius held it in his hand for a moment without opening it. I'm going to go start the dishes, Remus said as he reached over and kissed him, trying to give Sirius privacy to read the letter. Remus was finishing up the last few dishes in the sink when Sirius joined him in the kitchen, the letter still in his hand. You can read it if you'd like. Remus took the dish towel and dried his hands before reaching out his hand to take the offered letter. You're sure? I don't have to if you don't want. No, it's okay. I'd like you to read it. Sirius took a seat at the kitchen table as Remus read the letter. Dearest B, I am so thankful for the trust you have placed in me by sharing such a difficult past. I know that must have been overwhelming to document. After reviewing your recounting, I have found multiple violations of international wizarding human rights. Some have corroborated other first-hand accounts, and others are new infractions of which we were not yet aware. I have not shared your recounting with anyone else, because I know this is extremely personal. I ask your permission to bring it to my team at Wizards for International Justice. I would like to officially take up your case for asylum and add your first-hand account to our case against Wizarding Britain and Azkaban. If you grant us permission, we would grant you temporary asylum while we complete our investigation. You would be required to stay in Switzerland for the duration of the investigation, as we cannot ensure your safety while you are not on our soil. We would need to meet with you to fill out the formal request for asylum and issue you documentation. I understand this is a lot to process and likely not something you had even considered, but I do hope you will take the time to consider this offer. I am eager to hear your response. Sarah Quinn Remus finished reading the letter then came and sat across from Sirius at the table. He set down the letter and reached out to hold both of Sirius's hands in his, looking him deep in the eyes. Wow, was all he could think to say at first. Yeah. That's, well, that's amazing, Remus said, doing everything he could to hold back a grin. He could tell Sirius was still processing. What are you thinking? I don't know what to think. Sirius lowered his gaze to the hands he was holding. It's rather intimidating to think of the process. It could take months or years more likely, and then there's all of the times I may be called on as a witness. Sirius paused then, for much longer. You do realize that this probably would mean I could never return to Britain. If I'm instrumental in the downfall of Azkaban through international law as a primary witness, there is no way they would ever let me back, even if I was allowed at some point by Switzerland. I hate to break it to you, but you technically aren't allowed to go back to Britain as a free man now. Yeah, but I always thought, I just always pictured somehow proving my innocence in Britain and staying there. Sirius explained. I get that desire, of course. And what about Harry? Sirius continued. I need to be there for him. I know I can't be there for him now, but I was working towards the goal of proving my innocence there so we could be together. I can't just abandon him. He's been through too much already. Maybe if you get asylum here, he could live with you here. It could be safer for him. We should ask Sarah about what wizarding schools are around here. 
Wait, you think we should pull him from Hogwarts? From his friends? It was just a thought. Remus paused. Except yes, that's exactly what I think. And before you get all defensive, I think I should review for you what his first three years at Hogwarts have actually been like, because it's wild. First year, Albus hid the Philosopher's Stone at Hogwarts to protect it, but instead, it drew Voldemort himself to the school where he was hidden on the back of a professor's head the entire year. Harry then fought his way through a defensive maze to make sure Voldemort didn't get the stone. He survived, but Ron and Harry ended up in the hospital wing. Sirius's eyes were wide, but Remus didn't even pause before continuing. Second year, there were attacks on Muggleborns all year by the heir of Slytherin, and the Chamber of Secrets was opened. Harry, once again found himself the only person willing and able to rescue his friend's sister from some kind of ghost memory turned younger version of Voldemort and a giant basilisk. Again he ends up in the hospital wing, as do Ginny Weasley, and Hermione who was petrified for half the year. And I don't have to tell you about last year, you are well aware. So yes, I do think taking him out of that school deserves a bit of consideration. First, what the hell? How did it take you this long to tell me that? I'm definitely going to need to circle back around to get the full story behind all of that. Sirius made a circular motion with his hand. But how would that even work? He's one of the most famous wizards in Britain, and I'm a fugitive. Even if I do get granted asylum, there is no way anyone in Britain will agree to me removing Harry from Hogwarts and moving him to a new country. That's impossible, and you know it. Well, when you put it like that, Remus said. So our options are, stay here, and be completely cut off from Harry, or give up on the asylum plea, and instead go back to Britain and try to guide Harry as best we can from afar. I hate both those options, Remus said defeated. As do I, but they are the only ones we have at the moment. Sirius got up and started pacing. I suppose it wouldn't hurt to explore the option of asylum a little further. I mean, you're right, there's not much I can do for Harry as a fugitive. I don't have to agree to anything just yet. Thank you. Remus stood and pulled Sirius into an embrace. What about you? Me. When you first met with Sarah she mentioned getting you an asylum application as well. Sirius explained. Oh, well, my focus has been on getting you somewhere safe. I suppose I haven't given my own case much thought. Remus's thoughts went back to his last moon, and his mood immediately fell. If he applied for asylum, would he be expected to join Sarah's pack each month? Not that he didn't like the pack, but the way it had made him feel afterward wasn't something he wanted to experience again any time soon. I, I am more than a little apprehensive at the idea of formally documenting my condition with the government. In Britain it was always such a stigma, I swore to myself I'd never willingly make myself vulnerable like that. Then there are the regulations, I'll have to ask Sarah more about what the regulations are here. She and her pack don't use Wolfsbane, but they do isolate themselves each month. It would take some consideration. He had taken a step back from Sirius as his mind raced with the idea of any kind of documentation of his condition. Of course, no need to decide now. I, I was just being a little selfish is all, wanting us to be together here. Sirius rushed to assure him, he wrapped the hands that had been around Remus tightly around himself. Of course, that's what I want as well. Remus's head whipped up from where it had been looking at the floor, desperate to see if he had hurt Sirius with his indecision. I just hadn't pictured making it official with a foreign government is all. I... Hush. I wasn't. I know you want us to be together, and we will be. We just have to figure out what that actually looks like. Sirius comforted as he took a step closer to Remus, closing the gap until Remus was right next to him. They reached for each other at the same time, Remus leaned down for a kiss, and they stayed in each other's arms for a while. Chapter 17 Surprise Sirius and Remus wrote back to Sarah that same day. Over correspondence, they arranged to meet up at the beginning of August in Geneva, this time at Sarah's office downtown. Sirius had spent a lot more time than normal in the shed since then. Remus figured he was seeking some sort of distraction from what lay ahead of him. The day before they were to meet with Sarah, Sirius asked Remus to come out to the shed with him. Remus followed along, curiosity piqued. Are you finally going to show me what you've been working on out here? 
Remus asked. His hip had been bothering him more lately so he was walking slowly up the paved path to the shed relying heavily on his cane. He hadn't bothered to mention his pain to Sirius, but he suspected that he may have caught on anyway. Yes, just wait right there, Sirius said as they made it to the entrance of the shed. Remus could tell he was nervous. Okay, would you like me to transfigure a blindfold? He said with a smile. No, no, that won't be necessary. Sirius waved him off as he walked into the shed, his voice trailed off. A few minutes passed before he reappeared, pushing a wheelchair in front of him. Surprise, he said as he pushed it through the door and to a stop just in front of Remus. Oh, Merlin. Remus's hands were covering his mouth as he stood there in shock. You built me a wheelchair. Sirius laughed a little. No, not exactly. I bought it when I was traveling over here and shrank it in my pack. I've been modifying it in my spare time. I know your last moon was a lot smoother, recovery-wise, but I know you still have your bad days, and it could be good to have for longer trips into town, or tomorrow for our trip to Geneva. I noticed you've been favoring your hip more the last few days. And it's more of a prototype, if you don't like it, we can chuck it right in the bin, and find you something proper. Remus stopped his rambling with a kiss. Thank you, Sirius. He cried as they parted. He took a seat in the chair and Sirius started up again. I got it second hand at a muggle shop, but like I said, I've been adapting it. There's a spot on the back for storage and a place you can put your cane. I kept the handle so we can use it when muggles are around, and if you want someone to push you. But I also made it so that it's self-propelled by using your wand, like this. He demonstrated how Remus could drive the wheelchair around himself. And, if we are in like, Diagon Alley or with wizards, it also has a hovering charm that you can turn on, and it will hover, which I thought would be less jarring on your hip. He showed Remus how to activate the charm, and the chair hovered six inches off the ground, then how to deactivate it, and it landed smoothly. Remus sat in the chair as Sirius finally ran out of things to say. He stood there expectantly, nervously watching him for his reaction. Remus was hit with a wave of conflicting emotions. He was amazed by Sirius's thoughtfulness and care to provide something he truly needed. When was the last time anyone else had so quickly and thoroughly met one of his needs? It was so generous and so specific. It made him feel warm and fuzzy. In contrast, as he sat in the chair for the first time, the necessity of it washed over him. He pictured using the chair in public and seeing people's reactions. He imagined using it tomorrow to see Sarah. Would she ask about it? How would he explain it? Then the last wave was the slow realization that this was real. He really needed this. It would be an amazing tool of freedom, giving him options that had previously been closed to him, but he couldn't ignore the feeling of despondence. He was losing something too, and he couldn't quite put a finger on it. Was it hurt ego, or pride? Was he embarrassed? No, he wasn't embarrassed. Fuck them all if someone looked down on him for this. He still couldn't pinpoint exactly how to describe it, other than it was a clear marker of the deterioration of his health. He couldn't hide it behind a forced smile. Of course, he had used a cane for a while now, but this just felt like a progression. He knew he shouldn't think like that. This wasn't a defeat, it was an accommodation, a tool to hold on to life, not a letting go. It didn't stop the feelings overwhelming him, or the tears springing to his eyes. He brought his hands up, covered his face, and rested his elbows on his knees, trying desperately not to completely lose it, and failing. Sirius's face fell a little as he quickly said, Oh Mooney, you don't like it, that's okay. We don't have to use it, like I said, no harm done. Remus couldn't say anything around his constricted throat, so he just shook his head and held out his hand to Sirius, who came over and took it and wrapped his other hand around Remus's head bringing him close so that his head was resting on Sirius's chest. Remus cried into his shirt, but didn't take too long to rally himself back to composure. He finally found his voice again. I do like it. It's brilliant. You're brilliant. You're sure you like it? Sirius was bewildered and completely unsure how to interpret Remus's reaction. Remus got up out of the chair and hugged Sirius again. He couldn't find the words to fully express what he was thinking, but he tried. Thank you, Sirius. It's exactly what I need. 
I just wish I didn't need it, and the reality of it just kind of hit me. He cleared his throat in an effort not to cry again. Sirius gripped him tightly, with no indication he would ever let go. Oh Mooney, I get it now, I understand. That's okay. The next day, they prepared to go to Geneva. They both apparated to the same spot they'd done before. Only this time Sirius was not in dog form. Remus opted to use the wheelchair Sirius had given him the day before. They made their way downtown following the directions Sarah had given them. Before them was a huge mural of the city of Geneva 200 years ago. They made sure no one was watching before walking into the mural, which took them to the headquarters of Wizards for International Justice. Sarah was waiting at the entrance to greet them. She was in a gray robe with a crimson blouse. Once they were close, Remus introduced them. Sarah, I'd like you to meet my friend, Sirius Black. Sirius, this is Sarah Quinn. The second part was a mere formality since Sirius had already met Sarah as Padfoot and was well aware of who she was. Sirius didn't let on to this. Instead, he put out his hand to shake Sarah's, which she took. Very nice to meet you, Miss Quinn. The pleasure is mine, Mr. Black. Please, call me Sarah. Then you must call me Sirius, please. Sirius had pulled all the stops out for this meeting. He had purchased new dark maroon velvet robes specifically for this, which he wore over black slacks. He shaved his beard off, much to the displeasure of Remus, who had grown to love the beard. Remus had been able to prevent him from cutting his hair, thankfully. He instead had pulled it half back into a neat ponytail. The rest hung in neat curls over his shoulders. Sarah then turned her attention to Remus. It's good to see you again, Remus. They shook hands. She noticed the chair but hadn't said anything, for which Remus was grateful. Let's go into my office. They followed Sarah down the hall to the door at the end. Remus lowered his voice a little and said to Sirius, Do you want me to wait outside to give you some privacy? I'll do whatever makes you most comfortable. I, I would rather not be alone but, I don't know what to do. Sirius was trying very hard to hide his panic, and for the most part, his pure blood training was kicking in. It was only evident to Remus because he knew him so well. I'll go in with you to start, and then if it gets into anything you don't want me there for, I can leave, no problem. Remus wanted very much to reach for Sirius's hand but glanced at several office windows, and other wicks walking by and thought better of it. One thing at a time. Yeah, all right. By this time, they were entering Sarah's office, which had a view of the street, as well as a park across the way. There were two chairs opposite Sarah's desk. She pulled one out to the side to make room for Remus's wheelchair. She then took a seat at her desk and pulled out a folder. She covered the basics of the process going forward and handed Sirius a stack of paperwork to fill out. I realize this is a lot of information all at once, and you can take your time to process this and decide what you want to do. However, I must make something very clear. If you choose to go forward with this, it's very important that you don't leave anything out. The document you provided me was substantial and a great start, but it was informal and written before we had this conversation, so if there is anything you left out, or any discrepancy you would like to fix, I'd suggest you do it now. Because going forward, any omissions or falsehoods could have an impact on your case. I realize that, Sarah. Sirius replied. I provided that document in good faith, and it was a show of trust in you, but because it was such a risk on my part, there were things that I didn't include, as a way to protect myself. I fully understand that if I choose to continue, those things will need to be disclosed as well. However, I do have a few questions about the process before I disclose those things. I would be happy to answer any questions. Sarah leaned back in her chair and crossed her legs. Great. Am I right in my understanding that the offer of asylum is contingent on my willingness to testify against the injustices at Azkaban? Yes, that would be the condition. And if I do so, I wouldn't be allowed to leave Switzerland or return to Great Britain. Sirius continued. Yes, but I don't see how that's much different than your situation now. If you return to Great Britain, you will likely be caught. That's part of the whole case of asylum, that you are at great risk if you were to return to your home country. Sarah explained. Which is true, but there are things to consider other than my own safety. Such as? Sarah asked. 
I have a godson back in England, and if I agree to this, I will likely never see him again. He could come visit you. Of course there are people you won't see, but I'm sure he is in good hands. Sarah persuaded. I'm not convinced of his safety, to be honest. Sirius said solemnly. Does he need to be included in your plea for asylum? Sarah asked. I would love to say yes, but the way I see it, that would be almost impossible. Could you elaborate? Sarah continued. My godson is Harry Potter. There was a moment of silence as that piece of the puzzle snapped into place. I'm sorry, your godson is Harry Potter. Sarah repeated. Yes. The Harry. Yes. The Harry Potter. Sirius cut her off. And you're not convinced of his safety. Surely Dumbledore and Hogwarts. Yes, despite all that, we could go into quite a lot of detail on how exactly we know that Harry isn't safe. Remus was the one to cut Sarah off this time. But unfortunately, none of that would convince you to allow him asylum, even if we could somehow smuggle him away from Dumbledore. Sirius explained. You see, if he came to Switzerland, he may be safer than he is now, at least for a time, but unfortunately trouble will seek him out wherever he is, and if he is in Switzerland when trouble finds him, Switzerland may not be safe for anyone. I see. She took a sip of her coffee. Well, no I don't think I do see, I am in fact, more confused than ever. I can and I will fill you in on everything, but suffice it to say, we are in a bit of a dilemma as to the best thing to do. Stay here, and save both our lives, and possibly do a lot of good to reform Britain albeit from afar, or go home, and do whatever we can to help protect Harry, and quite possibly die trying. Remus said, looking her straight in the eyes. Okay, I once again am going to need you to fill me in on everything, and this time, don't leave anything out. Sarah said. Right, then there's something else we should mention before we get started. Sirius said. Of course there is. Sarah sighed. I'm an animagius. Sirius said, at the same time that Remus said, We're gay. Bugger, we hadn't mentioned that yet either. Remus said, bringing his hand to the bridge of his nose. Sirius looked at him in shock, then let out a laugh. Remus, believe it or not, that is the least shocking revelation I've heard today. She said, almost laughing. Piece that one together already, had you? Sirius asked, still smiling. Well, I'm not blind. Sarah said. But you're an animagus. Yes, I turn into a black dog. Sirius answered. You're... Padfoot. Padfoot. Sirius and Remus said in unison. Chapter 18. Daily Life I think that went well, Remus said jovially, as they entered their cabin after a long day spent in Geneva. Were we in the same meeting? Sirius asked incredulously as he threw himself onto the sofa, exhausted. Except for that bit in the middle when I wasn't in the meeting, yes, Remus said, smiling. Then how could you say that went well? It was a rocky start, for sure, but I think Sarah came around in the end. Around to what? Sirius asked. Our way of thinking. Mooney, I came out of that meeting less sure than ever what we should do, and you think we somehow convinced her of something? Sirius asked, annoyed. I think we convinced her to help us. Great. Now if only we knew what exactly would help us. Sirius said in frustration. I think she likes us. Remus replied, nonplussed. I think she thinks we are hopeless. Hopelessly in love. Remus teased. Gag me. See, I'm learning new things about you too. I didn't realize you were into that sort of thing. Remus grinned. Good God, why are you in such a good mood? And could you take it somewhere else? I'm trying to mope here. Sirius covered his face with a throw pillow. Fine, I'll go start dinner, shall I? Remus laughed as he got out of his chair and levitated it into the corner out of the way. He summoned his cane and walked towards the kitchen. In their next meeting together, Sarah brought up the idea of an alias. She thought his name would be too recognizable. Remus had wondered if his face was too recognizable as well, but Sarah said his face hadn't been plastered over the news here as much as in England. There were articles about Sirius Black but no wanted posters on the street corner. What do you want to go by? She asked. Is Aladdin sane too on the nose? Remus laughed. That's only slightly worse than Jareth. Sirius rolled his eyes. 
How about Thomas Jerome Newton? Remus said, trying and failing to keep a straight face. I'm afraid I don't understand the joke, Sarah said. That's because it's not a very good joke, Sirius sighed. Oh, Jean Genie, Remus exclaimed. Ignore him, Sirius said to Sarah. He's being ridiculous. Remus was finding his stride now. Ziggy Stardust. Okay, that last one was a reference to Bowie, Sarah said. They're all a reference to Bowie. We had a thing for him in school, Sirius tried to explain. Had, I didn't realize your interest was past tense, Remus said, face full of shock. Well, there wasn't much time for Bowie in Azkaban. Well, seeing as you've outgrown your childish interest, I'm sure you won't mind if I just take your Ziggy Stardust shirt for myself. And those albums you've been carting around with you all over Europe. You wouldn't dare, Sirius said willingly falling for the bait. Remus laughed heartily in response. Anyway, a name, Sarah said, trying to force them back on track. Right. A name. Sirius looked at her blankly. Not so easy to come up with an alias on the spot, is it? Remus said pointedly. How about Asta? Sirius said after some thought. Asta Lovell. Hem, I like the sound of that. Remus said, finally sobering up. All right, I'll have the papers made up for you. Come on, Mooney. Please. Sirius pled. No, don't be ridiculous. Remus insisted. Let me have a cute little vest, please. I don't want to walk around with a dog in clothing. They were walking through a store and happened upon the pet section. While looking for a new toy for Padfoot, Sirius saw a display of dog clothes. But look at the sweater. It's so cute. It matches yours. Sirius persisted. I draw the line at wearing matching clothing with Padfoot. We used to match all the time in school. That's because they were uniforms, we all matched. Remus said exasperatedly. Oh, look at the little yellow rain jacket. It's practical, it would keep me dry. Sirius tried a different tactic. Remus rolled his eyes and sighed. Sirius gasped. It comes with a matching hat. I'm not letting you get a rain jacket. Sirius grumbled. But I want a cute outfit. Remus started walking away from the pet aisle shaking his head in exasperation. Sirius put back the raincoat and followed him in a huff. Sirius, I've been wondering, where did you get your wand? Remus asked one evening as they were relaxing in the sitting room. Oh, I nicked it off of a bastard wizard who tried to chase me away from digging in his dumpster. What kind of person chases away a dog? Especially one as cute as you, Remus added. Exactly. He had it coming, didn't he? What is it, do you know? Remus asked. Yeah, I was able to do a diagnostic spell on it. It's laurel and unicorn hair. How do you like it? There was an awkward pause as Sirius examined the wand in his hand. I, I don't know. My magic feels more difficult, slower, but I don't know if it's the wand or me. What do you mean? It's got to be that the wand is ill-suited for you. It can't be you, your magic is remarkable. Sirius was still eyeing the wand he twirled between his fingers. It certainly used to be. Sirius, you can wandlessly transfigure into Padfoot, you were still able to do that all through your stay in Azkaban. Sirius flinched at the mention of Azkaban. Sure, I'm still good at that because I never stopped doing it. Everything else though, I hadn't cast a spell in a decade, that much time passes, I'm bound to lose some of my skill. His eyes clouded over and his fingers stilled there fidgeting. It was almost as if he wasn't fully present for a moment. Remus almost reached out to him but thought better of it. Carry on, he whispered instead to regain his focus. Sirius's eyes cleared and he finally looked up at Remus. Once he had his attention, Remus reached out and took his hand. I'm telling you, if your magic is difficult, it's because the wand isn't suited to you. Perhaps, but what can I do about that? I can't go buy a new wand, they all have registration you fill out. I can't exactly do that, can I? Yes, you can. You have the new identification that Sarah got for you, you're officially Asta now. You can legally buy a wand any time. Aren't I still at risk of being recognized? We'll ask Sarah for a recommendation, if she says it's safe, we'll be okay. Sirius agreed, 
and only three days later they were standing on Iger Street meeting up with Sarah about to enter a shop with a large sign reading Ephemera's superior wands. She had insisted that Ephemera was trustworthy and capable of providing a fitting wand. They entered the store and a bell over the threshold rang out, announcing their entrance to an apparently empty storefront. They heard something fall in the back of the store, and a woman's voice could be heard in what Remus could only assume was a curse word in German. Then there were footsteps coming in their direction. Soon enough, a small elderly woman appeared in the doorway. She had long curly silver hair and cloudy brown eyes framed in wire spectacles with a gold chain dangling from them and around her neck. She wore robes of black with gold accents and a pair of gloves. Remus wondered absently why it seemed every wand maker was born in the last century. As she entered the room she spotted Sarah, and her face lit up as she brought her hands together in excitement. Sarah, so good to see you again. Ephemera exclaimed. The pleasure is all mine as always, Mara. Sarah went and greeted her friend with a hug and a kiss on the cheek. Are these some of yours? Ephemera asked, turning her attention to the men who were standing awkwardly behind Sarah. Sarah laughed. These are my friends, Remus and Aster, and Aster here is looking to purchase a new wand. I told him he had to come to you, the best on the continent. You flatter me, but it won't win you any points. Anyway, let's get down to it, shall we, boys? Remus and Sirius looked at each other. Either of them had been called boys since Hogwarts. But given the witch's age, they figured they would seem like boys to her. When they said nothing, she approached Sirius pulling out her own wand and a measuring tape and set to work taking his measurements while writing notes in a hovering journal. As she worked, she asked questions. What brings you in today? Did you break your last wand? No, my current wand is borrowed, and ill-suited to me, I should think. Sirius said as he eyed Remus. Ah, may I see it? Sirius cautiously handed over his stolen wand. Made by the great Ollivander himself. You know, he and I apprenticed together under his father. Laurel and unicorn hair, Bendy. 31 centimeters long. Hmm. Hmm. What is it? You said it was borrowed. Yes. Sirius answered at once, but he was nervous. Could she possibly know it was stolen? Hmm. She said again. Yes, well, it does seem rather dull. She handed it back to him. Go ahead and do a little magic for me with it. Sirius thought for a moment and aimed his wand at a book on the counter. He transfigured it into a bowl and then back to the book. Interesting, she said, and before they could say anything else, she wandered into the back room. After rustling in the back for quite some time, she reappeared holding about twelve long thin boxes, which she set unceremoniously on the counter. She reached for a box near the bottom of the pile and opened it, offering it out to Sirius. Go on. Sirius took the wand and gave it a flick, but nothing happened. The next wand emitted angry sparks from the end in protest, and the third wand was pulled out of his hand before he was even able to give it a flick. This continued until all the boxes Ephemera had gotten from the back were tried. All right, we've got a challenge on our hands. How exciting. She looked not at all perturbed, and even more excited than she had been when they started. You said this wand is borrowed. What happened to your last wand? It was stolen. Sirius said, glancing at Remus. Stolen, confiscated, same thing right. Mara's eyes flashed at this. Was it an Ollivander as well? Did you give him as much trouble as you're giving me? It was, but it was actually inherited from my uncle. Sirius smiled a little at the memory of his uncle Alfred. Oh, interesting. So you have never gone through a wand choosing before, no wonder. And what kind of wand was it? Walnut and Dragon Heartstring. Thirteen and a half inches, flexible. And tell me, was it ill-suited to you as well? Sirius smiled. No, it was a wonderful wand. I was perfectly satisfied with it. For you to be mated with an inherited walnut and dragon heartstring, you must be very powerful indeed. Such wands usually don't adapt to just anybody. It takes a special wizard to make that match. Sirius blushed a little. You flatter me, but it won't win you any points. He echoed back her earlier statement to Sarah, which made her chuckle. Let's try a walnut on then, she said as she disappeared again. Sarah and Remus had both taken seats in the comfortable sitting area to watch. As Remus took in the shelves packed with long thin boxes, trinkets, and clutter, 
his gaze stopped on a pile of books. He went over to peruse the stack. Ephemera brought back a selection of three wands, picked up the one in the middle, and held it up to him. Sirius looked at the proffered walnut wand with anticipation and took it in his hand. His face fell when nothing happened. Mera gently took it back from him, unfazed, even when the other two wands had similarly disappointing reactions. Not to worry. So it's not a walnut. You've already mastered a walnut. You need a new challenge, a wand suited to your individuality. She glanced at him from head to toe, as if having a new revelation. Your nonconformity. She muttered almost to herself as she disappeared, this time reappearing with a single box. Sirius looked at it with trepidation. Go on, give it a try. Sirius opened the box and pulled out a long, polished ebony wand. The candles immediately flickered, the book on the counter opened and the pages blew in a gust of wind that originated from Sirius's hand holding the wand. His hair blew back out of his face, and his robes fluttered behind him, finally settling back as the wind slowed. Whoa, Sirius said as he chuckled. My old wand never did that. No, subsequent owners hardly ever get the dramatic bonding experience of a first-time owner. Mara said with a smile, thrilled to have found a match. What is it? Ebony and Thunderbird tail feather, 34 centimeters, fairly bendy. Thunderbird tail feather, that's unusual, Remus said from where he stood reading. Yes, not many European wand makers use it. Ollivander limits himself to just three cores, calls them superior, a very Eurocentric way of thinking, if you don't mind my saying so. They of course make for very capable wands, but to say that they are superior in all the world. I think there is much to be learned from every international magical culture. I import cores from all over the world, including Thunderbird Tail Feather from Arizona. It's hard to come by, but makes for a powerful wand only a particularly skilled individual can hone and when paired with ebony, it matches with only the uniquely capable and courageous, though perhaps misunderstood or shunned by society. And since you chose a bit of transfiguration magic for your demonstration, I would hazard a guess that it's something you may do often, and the ebony is well suited for that as well. Sirius stood listening intently as he examined his new wand closely. The long tapered end spiraled to the hilt, and its polished surface was almost mirror-like, which highlighted the beautiful grain. It's perfect. Thank you. Of course, I'm always happy to help a friend of Sarah's. She turned to Remus. What about you? Looking for a new wand? Remus lifted his head out of the book as the attention shifted to him. He closed the book and joined Sirius at the counter. I've got a wand, thank you, but I wouldn't mind purchasing this book if it's for sale. Interested in wand lore? That's a fairly advanced text, not exactly the best introduction to the subject. I think I'll manage. I've dabbled in researching the basics of the craft. If I have any questions, I'll be sure to find you. She chuckled brightly. All right then, if you've dabbled, I'll let you take it off my hands. Now, if you don't need a new wand, maybe a tune-up of the one you've already got. Remus was shy all of a sudden. He hadn't been prepared to present his wand to her and was suddenly embarrassed. He cleared his throat as he stood next to Sirius and his shiny new wand. Oh, go ahead and look it over. Sorry it's a bit dinged up. I, well, I live a rough life most of the time. He finished by way of explanation, holding out his dinged, shabby, well-used wand for examination. Mara gave him a small smile of encouragement as she took the offered wand in her gloved hands. She examined it thoroughly and finally spoke. Fur and dragon heartstring. Brittle, 22 and a half centimeters. It's an Ollivander as well. Yes, I got it right after I graduated from Hogwarts. My previous wand broke during, well, it doesn't matter. It had broken during an encounter with another werewolf, but he didn't feel like sharing that. My first wand was inherited from my father, but this one chose me. This, this is a survivor's wand. Fur is resilient, and often wands made with it grow in strength and bonds strongest with wizards who carry it through peril and hardship. Unfortunately, many times the last ally standing will be holding a fur. It wears those dings and scuffs well, those don't affect the condition or power of the wand. Its core of dragon heartstring is strong and securely intact. It's in fine working condition. Anything I would do to it would be superfluous. She said, 
handing him back the wand with the same care she offered to the new wand she had crafted herself. A survivor's wand. Ollivander didn't say any of that when I bought it. Remus looked at his old wand with new appreciation and understanding, remembering all the tight corners he got out of with only this wand at his side, and how for many years he believed he was the last marauder standing. A little surprising, considering Ollivander has a flair for the dramatic. There are times when proclaiming such things can be seen as almost a prophecy. Wand making and the art of matching a wand to its wicks is so often shrouded in mystery, but it isn't prophetic. However, there are things I can tell about a person just from the match. It's a difficult needle to thread, knowing what words will be helpful and what words will be a burden, and even harder to know when those burdens are necessary to share and when they are best left unsaid. Are you leaving any burdens left unsaid today? Remus asked, not sure why he was pushing. Mara's gaze left Remus's face and shifted to Sirius's, gazing deeply into his eyes for a long moment before returning to Remus's. He could tell her eyes were taking in every scar on his face. There is plenty left unsaid, but I don't think any of it would be new information to you. Ah, okay then, thank you, was all Remus could think to say. Mara turned to Sarah and smiled again. And you, Sarah, your poplar and unicorn hair still up to snuff. Sarah also produced her wand for examination. Fit as a fiddle. Lovely. Mara gave it a cursory glance before handing it back to Sarah. Sirius paid for the ebony wand and left Yiger Street much lighter and happier than he entered. Remus, on the other hand, was still contemplating all that Mara said and didn't say. As soon as they were home, Sirius began to try his wand with a variety of spells, each more precisely executed than the last. So, it wasn't you, was it? It was the wand. Remus asked, knowing full well what the answer would be. Sirius tried to hide the grin on his face but failed. It was definitely the wand, it's all coming back to me. It feels like it used to feel, with my old wand. Good, Remus said smiling back. But his smile wasn't so free and easy, weighed down by the words from earlier today. That night, Remus lay awake in bed much longer than he normally did. He tried not to toss and turn, but just lay there, listening to Sirius breathing next to him, savoring it, and tucking it away in his memory, just in case, then hating himself for even thinking there may be another time when he would need to call upon the memory because it would mean there might be a night in the future when he didn't wake up next to this man again. Sirius shifted next to him. Mooney, you still awake? Sirius whispered. Yes. Remus's voice answered, almost shakily. Everything okay? Remus didn't say anything for a long moment, then he finally spoke. Do you think, do you think Ephemera was talking about the past or the future? What? When? She said, many times the last ally standing will be holding a fur. He gathered his thoughts before continuing. For the longest time, I thought I was the last one. The last faithful marauder, the last of our friends, the last good werewolf left. But I wasn't the last marauder, you're here with me, and I found Sarah and Ian and the pack, so it's not like I'm the last of anything. But that's good though, isn't it? I just can't help but worry that means there will still be a moment in the future when it all goes away again, for real. His voice cracked. And if it wasn't real the last time, I barely got through it, there's no way I'll survive being the last one standing, for, for real. Tears were rolling down his face, and he curled in tighter to hide it in Sirius's hair. Okay, she said many times not everyone, so it's not like it's destiny. She said it herself, wand makers aren't prophetic. Don't take this on as another burden, we've already got enough of those. She said I already knew. There was much left unsaid but I already knew. Oh, I think you were reading too much into that. I thought she was talking about the werewolf thing. She was eyeing your scars when she said that. I got the feeling she knew a lot more about us than we told her. Like I think she knew I stole that wand, and I think she knew my old wand was confiscated, not stolen. She knew I was shunned from society, I think she knew that since I came with Sarah I must be one of her clients. Yeah, maybe. Remus was calmer now that he was talking about it, but still full of worry. Promise me I won't be the last one standing again, he whispered. I promise, he said immediately. He didn't say I'll try, or I'll do my best. He didn't add any qualifier at all 
even though they both knew too well it was not in either of their control to keep such a promise. Remus reached out and brought Sirius into a hug, tightly wrapping his arms around him and not letting go. Thank you, he breathed, barely a whisper into Sirius's ear. They didn't let go until the morning, when they woke in each other's arms. Chapter 19 Uncharted Waters Over the next few weeks, they met with Sarah regularly. Much of those meetings were just Sarah and Sirius. He always came out of those meetings rather numb and refused to talk about them. Sirius's nightmares came back. They had never fully gone away but had been fewer and farther between. Now they were almost a nightly occurrence. Remus would wake up when Sirius would startle awake, oftentimes calling out for him. Sirius never did hurt Remus like that first time. He was more used to someone being in the bed with him now, so it wasn't a surprise. Remus would comfort him as best he could, but Sirius wouldn't ever tell him about his dreams. Remus thought that was okay. It was bad enough that he had to have them once, he didn't need to relive it again. Sarah set up Sirius with a therapist. Surprisingly, Sirius didn't argue much about this, which was a sure sign to Remus that he was struggling even more than he let on. They were in the middle of another meeting, this time at their cabin in the woods. Ian came along to see Remus, probably because Sarah knew how anxious he would get waiting. Remus offered to show him around the property, so they found themselves on the short path by Buckbeak's paddock. I don't really have a lot to say about the property, Remus finally admitted after quickly running out of things to say about the shed. I assumed as much, Ian smiled. What's on your mind, Remus? You don't have to go into any detail, but I know you went through the asylum process as a werewolf. What's that entail? Is there a register? What are the restrictions? Well, there is a record of my status, but it's much less controlled compared to what I hear England is like. They don't make me go into a cage every month. Except that you do go into a cage. It's a five kilometer cage, but it's still a cage. Do they know you do that? Did the government enforce that? No, they don't enforce that. It was more of a negotiation. Sarah and I were on Wolf's Bend from the first time it was available, but as I'm sure you are aware, it can come with some nasty side effects. We did that for months until we finally agreed we couldn't do it anymore. So, she approached some people about other options. They threw out several ideas, some better than others. We offered to purchase some remote land, but they were concerned about innocent people still wandering in. So we came up with the barrier. I know there are signs posted, but what's to stop a person from being trapped inside with us? The barrier starts at the ruins and grows out from there. It's magically set to detect werewolves and keep them in, but if it encounters a non-werewolf, it will stop the bubble at them until they move further out, then continue to grow as they move. It's paired with a maga repelling charm on the area already, so only magical folk could be there anyway. If they try to enter the barrier, they cannot physically move past it until 15 minutes past sunrise the next day. What about wildlife? They are unaffected, so we still encounter wildlife inside the barrier, and they can go in and out as they wish. We gotta let the wolves have some fun. He smiled at Remus. Remus was immediately curious about what effect the barrier would have on an animagus in their animal form but didn't ask. Surely your pack aren't the only werewolves in all of Switzerland. Ian laughed. No, not even close. So the others? The majority of them use wolf's bane. There are a few packs that have similar agreements with the government as us, they are on private land, and a barrier goes up each month. Those are all more permanent packs that don't want to interact much with wizards, but also don't cause any trouble. They have a tenuous, we leave you alone, you leave us alone, a kind of agreement. No packs that cause any trouble. Oh, of course there are rogue packs, but the government recognizes that a small part of the werewolf population causing trouble does not represent werewolves at large. I only wish the rest of the wizarding population was as understanding. I take it you face discrimination. Before Sarah wrote her book I would have told you differently. When I first came to this country, it was so much more welcoming than where I came from in Slovakia but maybe that's just because I was introduced to it by Sarah, so the circles we were in were already vetted. 
but since she's had her book published, she's been getting a lot of mail, and most of it ends up in the ban bin. She finally worked with some of her friends in law enforcement to install protection charms against the howlers. So far I haven't seen anything too threatening, but we don't open it all. I see, that is troubling. Obviously, you and Sarah are well versed in defensive magic, given the protection on the forest property, but Sirius and I know a thing or two, we'd be happy to see if there is something to be added. Remus offered. Thank you, I'd appreciate that. Remus and Ian were quiet for a moment until Remus changed the subject. I have a question for you about the pack. Everyone there seems very well adjusted to the arrangement. Yes, well, I assume Sarah explained that we all have a similar mindset to our lives and how we want to live them. Yeah, I get that, but how do you do that? How do you go from the rush, the high, the feeling of belonging one day, and then rip yourselves away from that the next? It felt so good to be back with others like me, but then I went home and I just felt empty. It's always like that for me when I leave a pack, like a part of me is left behind. Oh, I see what you mean. Yes, I had that experience too with other packs. I was a bit of a nomad before I met Sarah. I went from pack to pack with long stretches of solitude in between. So how do you deal with it each month? Remus asked. Over time, I found that if I spent time meditating and reaching out internally to the wolf to try to communicate, I was able to find a balance, a separation of self and wolf, an understanding between us. Once I found that, it was easier to come back to myself after the moon and fully separate myself from him. He paused and looked at Remus's incredulous face. I know that sounds really odd. I've never heard of anything like that. I must say, it is unique. Does the rest of your pack do this? I found that some have more trouble with this feeling you described than others. Greta and Wilson are siblings and they both transformed for the first time together. In a way, they have always been their own little pack and they have never spent a moon apart. That's protected them from ever feeling that loss. It's easier to adjust to a new way of life when you can go through it with family. Imagine all those times you felt like no one in the world understood you, they never had that. Don't get me wrong, they've had their struggles, but they face them together, which makes all the difference. The rest of us, however, have all been rejected from families, communities, and packs. We all have faced at least some internal rejection or turmoil. The more trauma experienced around that part of our lives, the more it affects our transformations and the wolves themselves. Think about it, the wolf lives one night at a time, a month apart, the rest is a fuzzy confusing dream to them. They don't understand why one night they are with their pack and the next they are alone in a strange forest or a new pack altogether. Their concern and fear bleed into their dreams and our reality and vice versa. If we are experiencing trauma and turmoil in our lives, the wolf can still sense that. We affect their moods and they in turn affect ours. In that way, it's no wonder we feel a deep sense of loss after leaving a pack. The wolf wants to hold on to the safety and belonging as long as they can, and they will try everything they can to influence us into staying. That makes a lot of sense. I try not to interact with that part of myself. I may think I accept it, but really, I suppress it into something that I'm more comfortable with. And what you say about trauma in our lives affecting him is eye-opening. I experience worse emotional effects when I am in a new situation or a traumatic experience in and around the full moon. That's exactly the same with me. But I found that suppression doesn't work. I had to face the wolf and understand that this was no more his fault than mine. He is not the darkness, nor is he my adversary. I accept him as who he is, and in turn, he understands that I am not the one who is locking him up each month. He is no longer my enemy and I am no longer his warden. Could you help me start, whatever it is you do, meditating? I'd be happy to. Thank you. Anything for an old friend of Sarah's? Ian said, looking pensive. Could you tell me anything about your time in the park with her back then? Remus's breath caught in his throat. He hadn't shared much of his experiences in packs with anyone. Then again, Ian was a nomad himself, he would understand. Has Sarah shared much about it? Yes, we've talked in detail about it, especially when she was writing her book, but I'd like to hear your perspective. They had walked back to the house, and both took a seat on the porch. That was, well, one of the darkest times of my life. 
I don't do a lot of reminiscing about it, but I'll make an exception, this time. Remus took a deep breath and let it out before continuing. After the war ended, I ran as fast and as far away as I could. I tried to find anything that would take away that pain, or at least bury it for a while. After some time on my own, I reached out to one of the better pack mates I had in England. I honestly don't know why I did it. The only pack I had ever known was terrible. After the war, I never wanted to go back to that again. Even so, I hated admitting it even to myself, but the feeling I had when I was a part of that pack, it was the feeling of a home I've never had before a feeling of belonging so deep. I was so desperate to escape my own mind, I hoped that maybe in a pack I'd be able to forget myself. So he told me about his new pack, in Germany. I stayed with them for some time, and it made life bearable, for a bit. Then I met Sarah. I was there when she first joined the pack. I was there for her first transformation. I hadn't ever been there for someone else's first. Were you there when she was attacked? No, no, I would have put a stop to it. How? You wouldn't have had any control over it. Remus shook his head. Not as a wolf, no. I had experience in influencing the outcome of a pack strategy, even without their knowing it. It happened on more than one occasion when I was undercover. I would be with the pack during a full moon, they would be set upon some innocent as a strategic target or some plaything, it didn't matter, the end result would be the same. I had a sense for when that was going to happen, and I was able to put Mooney in a position or mood to influence the direction the pack would take. I couldn't stop Mooney from attacking, but I could influence his motivation or willingness to follow the pack. To the other pack mates, it probably came off as a power struggle beyond my control, but Mooney was always subverting the will of the pack and would lead many of them away from the main target, usually in such a way that completely undermined the attack. I've never heard of anything like that. I wonder if it's because you turned so young. Perhaps there's a thing or two you could teach me as well. Maybe. I often wondered if it had anything to do with the moons I would spend with my friends in their animagious form, but I think it's like you said, our moods and motivations influence the wolf. I wasn't ever fully committed to that pack, and Mooney knew it. I still wonder sometimes if I had been there that night when Sarah was attacked, maybe I could have stopped it. That's not your burden to bear. Remus sighed. I suppose not. Anyway, I'd been with the pack for a few months. At first, it was all I could do to focus on merely existing, making it through one arduous day at a time. Being with a pack brought a level of peace and belonging that sustained me. They were a good pack. The leader was a little older than me, Antony. He had been turned much later in life than me. His pack was peaceful, but isolated. I had never been in a pack so cut off from the wizarding world. It was nice for a time, to shut it all out and try to forget, but I didn't realize until I was apart from it how much I would miss it. So I started going off on my own into muggle towns and occasionally into wizarding communities to find newspapers or people watch. That's what I was doing when I read an article in a magical newspaper about a werewolf attack. They named her and even put where she was hospitalized, right there in the paper for everyone to see. I couldn't get her out of my mind. So I went and visited her. I was worried I might be intruding on a very private moment in her life, but I knew she'd be scared, and I knew I may be the only one with the ability to help her. I should have expected it, but it was still a surprise to find her alone in the hospital room. I fumbled through an introduction, but she was so frightened, I think she was just glad to have someone to talk to. We became friends after that. I visited Sarah every day. I tried my best to ease her fears while also preparing her for what was to come. When I found out her family had rejected her, I even went and tried to talk to them, to convince them that there wasn't anything to be afraid of. Unfortunately, I was less convincing to them than I was to her, so I took her back to the pack. And it was okay for a time. Not perfect, but okay. I couldn't let go of my trips into civilization, and eventually, that became an issue. Antony told me I had to make a choice. The pack or civilization. But I had been in contact with an old muggle friend of mine from way back and he had recently tracked me down. I couldn't let him go. So I let the pack reject me. 
Sarah tried to stop it, tried to convince us all that I could live in both worlds, but in the end, it wasn't enough to convince the pack. I invited her to come with me. I said that we could find a way on our own, but she wasn't ready for that. One of my greatest regrets, Sarah said from the doorway. Remus looked up to see her and Sirius joined them on the porch. No, it wasn't your time to go yet, I understood. That was such a confusing time for me. I had already lost one family, I didn't think I was strong enough to lose a second one. You were the reason I finally found the courage to leave. You had told me of your time at school and among other wizards who accepted you, and I thought it might be worth the risk to go and try to find that for myself. Remus looked at her with sad eyes. I hope it didn't take you too much longer to find that. No, it didn't. I went back to studying law and started training with WIJ as an intern. Initially, I kept my condition a secret, but it wasn't possible to sustain that. Thankfully, they were welcoming. Remus nodded, so glad for Sarah and the community she had built. I always wanted to reach out to write, but I was too scared you would hate me for staying. Maybe I was too scared you might not be around anymore. If I didn't write, I could imagine you happy somewhere. Remus fidgeted with his cane as he listened to her, his expression pained. Well, I was still around, can't say I was ever very happy. Sirius came over and sat next to him, stilling his hand with his own. He didn't say anything, but his presence alone calmed Remus's nerves. He hadn't been aware of just how much the conversation had piqued his anxiety. Recalling those memories yanked him back under the waves of hopelessness he had barely survived. Sirius yanked him back from the edge with a hand over his shoulder, pulling him closer. I'm sorry, I shouldn't have brought it up, Ian said with a concerned look on his face. No, it's okay, Remus cleared his throat. Like I said, Sarah is a good friend, it's good to remember where we started. Over breakfast the next morning, Remus told Sirius all about his conversation with Ian, about how the dome works, and about Ian's meditation idea. Sirius watched him carefully as he spoke, then responded. That sounds like a good idea. You should give it a try. I've set up a time for us to get together today to start. They were interrupted by a white owl flying up to the kitchen window. That's Harry's owl, Remus said as Sirius stood to open the window and let him in. This time they had all treats to offer her that Remus had picked up from town. Sirius opened the letter and read it aloud. He had to find his seat halfway through. Remus took the letter from Sirius when he was done reading. When did you send Harry a letter? Sirius was staring off at the wall, not looking at Remus. When I was traveling here on Buckby. What does he mean when he says the bird was enormous? I transfigured the owl into a tropical bird. Why? I thought it would give Harry a laugh. Why is that the part of the letter we are focusing on? Sirius said, finally looking back to Remus. Well, I have other questions, but I thought I'd start at the top. Remus answered meekly. Right well the next part is talking about Dudley's diet, so do you have any questions on that or should we move to the part where he talks about his curse scar hurting? We can skip to that part. Great. Sirius paused and rubbed his face in his hands before continuing. Remus, what are we doing here? Sirius. We should be there. We should be the ones he's staying with. We should hear about this the night it happens, not three days later at the tail end of a letter. It does seem like he's trying to downplay it, Remus admitted. That's exactly what he's doing. He doesn't want me to know he's worried about it. At least he's going to be with the Weasleys for the rest of the summer. Yeah. Sirius brought his head down to rest on his arms folded on the table. I agree that in ideal circumstances, we should be the ones raising Harry, but these are not ideal circumstances, and if we were there instead of here, we still wouldn't be able to do anything to help him. What do you think it means that his scar is hurting? Sirius decidedly ignored Remus's last remark. Remus hesitated to answer. It could be that it's benign. Remus started. Or, it could be another in a long series of signs that Voldemort is not gone for good. Surely you don't think that he's back? Sirius looked up incredulously. He's already come back twice. I think that a guy is afraid of death as he was probably has a few more tricks up his sleeve to come back, and if he does, I'm sure many of his followers are ready and waiting to follow him again. 
Right, so how do we protect Harry? Well, currently I would tell him to go to Dumbledore if this happens again, Remus said. You don't trust Dumbledore? I don't fully trust him, no, but I think we both want to see Harry protected. We might disagree on the best way to do that, but seeing as I have no power over what happens to Harry, it would probably be in Harry's best interest to tell Dumbledore. He has the means to protect him. Right. I'll start a letter and we can send it off after the moon. He's safe now, with the Weasleys. Sirius decided. Chapter 20, Poachers Saturday, August 20th, 1994 Are you sure you want to go back there? We could just go back to the two of us for the moon. Sirius said for about the fifth time that day. Remus couldn't help but smile at him. I'm sure. I've been meditating with Ian and I think it's helping. How do you know? When we meditate, I feel the connection with him, with the wolf. It's already changing, I can tell. Changing how? Sirius asked. I don't know if I can describe it. It's still fragile, but I can tell that it's changing from animosity and resentment to a fragile understanding. I'm hoping that in time I will be able to heal and create a healthy distinction between him and me. That's incredible. I just hope it helps tonight. It will, and if it doesn't I will have you here to help me, Remus said. That's right. Sirius agreed. Besides, it's the Quidditch Cup and I know you want to listen to it on the radio. Yeah, but I'd gladly miss it if you needed me. Remus leaned in and kissed him goodbye. That's very sweet, but unnecessary. Enjoy your game. I'll send you a Patronus in the morning. Okay, I'll see you in the morning, and if you need me, I can meet you there. You gave me the coordinates. Remus smiled again. I'll be fine. The two finally parted after another kiss goodbye, and Sirius watched Remus apparate away before returning to the cabin and flipping the radio on to listen to the Quidditch World Cup. It was an exciting match, but it ended much faster than expected. Still, he would have given anything to be there with Harry tonight. Rather than listen to the after-game commentary, he turned off the radio and retrieved a pack of cigarettes from its hiding place under the kitchen sink. He walked outside and lit a cigarette with a snap of his fingers, then took a long slow draw and closed his eyes as he exhaled a stream of smoke into the fresh mountain air. He didn't smoke around Remus but one of the first things he did when he was free from Azkaban was filching a pack of cigarettes, and he wasn't quite ready to kick the habit for good. He was so impressed and proud of Remus for getting sober, but he wasn't quite ready. There was a freedom or a rebellious streak he couldn't let go of, not yet anyway. The sun had set hours ago, and the moon was high in the clear, warm August sky. Sirius stared up at it as he finished the last few drags wondering how Remus was doing. Even after the smoke, he couldn't shake his nerves. He was worried about Remus, and Harry, about the asylum plea and what would happen if it didn't go through, or maybe worse, if it did. He paced until he finally decided there was no way he'd be able to go to sleep any time soon, so he made his way to the paddock where Buckbeak was still wandering lazily. As he approached, Buckbeak came over to meet him by the edge of the field. What are you still doing up? Hmm. Sirius said as he raised a hand to the side of his head. They were so accustomed to each other that Sirius rarely felt the need to do the formal greeting anymore. He only did that if Buckbeak was distressed, or when new people were around. What do you say we go for a night ride? Sirius asked, and Buckbeak seemed to perk up at the suggestion. That a boy. Sirius climbed the fence and mounted Buckbeak who immediately took off at a gallop and launched himself into the air with his powerful wings. The second they leveled out, Sirius could feel his mind clear as the wind rushed through his hair. They flew for over an hour, and Sirius considered flying longer, but it was very late, and he didn't want Buckbeak to lose any more rest. They looped back towards home and he let his mind wander as they flew. His attention came back to his surroundings when he felt a curse narrowly miss him and Buckbeak. His ebony wand was in his hand before he even formed a defensive thought. Buckbeak reared left sharply to avoid another attack, which gave Sirius a better view of who his attackers were. Four wicks on brooms pursued them, trying to flank them. Stupefy. 
Sirius aimed his wand for the figure flying on Buckbeak's right side, but they ducked out of the way and the spell missed. They took a shot back at Sirius, yelling, Bombarder! Protago! Instantly a glowing blue shield appeared, protecting him from the explosive spell. Sirius used the seconds the shield bought him to bring Buckbeak higher, gaining a better defensive posture. He cast Stupefy again, this time hitting his mark, and the wicks fell off the broom, disappearing into the night. Buckbeak dove towards another wicks that flew too close. His beak clamped down on their shoulder and lifted them off the broom. He then tossed them away, where they fell into the forest below. Six more figures came flying out of the darkness to follow, sending spells whizzing past them as they took off into the air. One of them called out, Leave them. We know where the peck is, and they're worth more anyway. Sirius watched as they all vanished into the night in the opposite direction. He shot another spell at their retreating backs but wasn't sure if it met its mark. They had all flown down into the tree line. Flying as fast as he could away from an enemy that no longer pursued them, he tried to think quickly. Fuck. These were the poachers, and they knew about a pack. Surely they didn't know about Remus's pack. It had to mean something else. He tried to convince himself that Remus was safe, but he knew he couldn't take any chances. Remus and his pack might be surrounded by eight poachers any moment now. The barrier would protect them till the morning, but then they would be at their weakest and caught unaware. Sirius almost apparated away right that moment, but no. He couldn't leave Buck Beak. Buck Beak had saved his life three times now. He couldn't leave him defenseless. Besides, he couldn't apparate into the dome, and the dome would protect them long enough for him to get there. He had to think of a plan to get into the dome. If only he knew of anyone to call on as backup, but all of the people he knew who could help him were inside the barrier. Buck Beak could get through the barrier, and maybe if he was transformed into Padfoot he could too. Yes, there were seven werewolves on the other side, but Buck Beak could fly away from them, and he, well, he would just have to make friends with seven werewolves. Padfoot is good with werewolves. Or at least one specific werewolf. He could sense the moment he entered the muggle-repelled zone. It had a different feel to it, and he was familiar with the spell from being on the run. He would cast it over his campsites at night. He was hoping to be able to tell where the barrier started as well. He flew down low to the ground. After a minute, they found a creek bed and flew low over it to avoid hitting any trees. Then Buck Beak found the barrier by flying right through it, and Sirius ran into it as if it was a brick wall losing his seat on Buck Beak and falling eight feet into the freezing creek bed. He groaned as he rolled over and got to his knees, then looked up to see the poachers fast approaching. He instantly transformed into Padfoot and ran towards the barrier, and thanks Circe he made it through. He ran thirty more feet into the forest before turning around to see all six poachers hit the wall. They tried to cast spells on the barrier, but those were stopped as well. Padfoot took a moment to catch his breath then looked around for Buck Beak. He found him not too far away, drinking from the creek. He approached him cautiously, unsure how he would react to Padfoot. Buck Beak looked up as he approached, sniffed the air, and then having recognized his scent, walked quickly over to him and nuzzled his face. Padfoot returned the gesture, then started to survey their new surroundings. They may be safe from the poachers until daybreak, but they were in this bubble with seven werewolves. There was still plenty of danger to worry about. The good news was it was a large bubble. It could be that they spend the rest of the night in here without even seeing a werewolf. They likely stuck together as a pack, and sure, they could cover a lot of ground in one night, but they may be on the opposite side chasing squirrels completely unaware of them. This was his thought as he heard several wolves howl. If only he was ever that lucky. The howling grew closer and Padfoot took off for the center of the bubble. Sure, he could find some safety if he exited the bubble, but it was a choice between werewolves and poachers at this point, and he thought his odds of making friends with a pack of werewolves were slightly better than winning a duel against eight wicks. He couldn't apparate away, he could never leave Remus behind. His main concern now was Buck Beak. He was smart, but he was sure Buck Beak didn't understand the details of the barrier protecting them from the poachers. If the werewolves got too close, 
Buckbeak would fly away, which is great, but he needed to stay inside the barrier to stay safe from the poachers. So, to give him the best chance of staying airborne, while also remaining within the bubble, he needed to get him as close to the center as he could. He corralled Buckbeak into a run, guiding him as best he could. They had gone maybe a kilometer before he spotted the first werewolf. It was golden in color, and about sixty feet behind them. Soon, he saw two more, one on each side, either was the one he wanted to see. The one to the right of the golden wolf was black and gray, and the one to the left was mahogany in color. His only hope at this point was to get Mooney on his side and somehow convince the other werewolves he was a friend. Back in June when he ran with Mooney during the full moon, he wasn't as fast as he once was. It was probably safe to assume that he was slower than these other werewolves. So now he needed to get Buckbeak to the center of the bubble as fast as he could while also somehow reaching Mooney at the back of the pack. Or possibly getting his attention to make him move faster. Buckbeak was moving at top speed now, which was faster than Padfoot could run. He could only hope that it was faster than the werewolves too, because he was about to leave Buckbeak. Once Buckbeak had a good enough lead, Padfoot peeled off to the left, and as he did so he started to howl. It had the desired effect, at least in part. The werewolf to the left of the three he had seen turned and followed him, as did another werewolf he had not seen that was farther behind this one with chestnut fur. Good, this would take some of the heat off of Buckbeak at least. Padfoot glanced back to see that Buckbeak was continuing straight ahead toward the center. He hadn't yet realized that Padfoot wasn't behind him. Good. Padfoot risked another howl, as he tried to discern Mooney's howl from the rest that echoed behind him. It was too hard to do, but his howl did gain the attention of another werewolf, now following him instead of Buckbeak. This wolf had brown fur on its head and white fur with brown spots across the rest of its body. That made three, at least. Padfoot continued to arc his path toward the left, when another werewolf appeared, not behind him, but in front of him. It was a large, gray and sandy brown werewolf barreling right towards him, but he was actually thrilled to see this one. He would recognize that majestic wolf anywhere, that was his Mooney. He let out an excited howl as he came in range of the wolf, but Mooney ran past him and cut off the three other wolves with a defensive growl. Padfoot came to an abrupt stop and circled back to stand behind Mooney, unsure if he should have his hackles raised or take a more submissive stance. He quickly decided on the defensive and stood with his guard up ready to help Mooney in whatever came next. Mooney growled and barked at the other three wolves and soon there seemed to be some kind of agreement that he was no longer the enemy. The three wolves circled the two of them and then fell behind Mooney and Padfoot. This made Padfoot more than a little uncomfortable to be so close to those who a minute before had been out for his blood. However, there was no time for that. They had to get back to Buckbeak. Padfoot barked and whined at Mooney, then took off back in the direction he had just left, after the hippogriff. He didn't have to go far through. Buck Beak had taken to the air and was circling as if he were searching for something. Padfoot let out a howl, which got his attention, and he flew down towards them. Padfoot let out another howl, trying to keep him from landing, but it soon became clear that Buck Beak was done running away. He landed and let out a screech as he stomped the ground. All of the wolves and Padfoot stopped and backed up. Buck Beak screeched again and reared up on his hind legs, flapping his powerful wings then came down onto his front legs again. All of the wolves except Mooney fled into the woods. Mooney stayed because he had to protect Padfoot. Padfoot stood, making eye contact with the hippogriff, and bowed low to the ground. He whimpered in submission. Buckbeak let out another screech but bowed his head in return. Padfoot breathed a sigh of relief, if that was something a dog could do. He raised back up and slowly walked toward Buckbeak. Buckbeak reached down with his face and nuzzled Padfoot. Once Padfoot was convinced he was still in Buckbeak's good graces, he turned to survey the situation. Mooney was still there, albeit a fair distance away. Buckbeak may recognize Padfoot as Sirius, but Mooney was a little harder to recognize as Remus. Mooney the wolf had never met Buckbeak, so he was very unsure of how to proceed. Padfoot walked back to Mooney 
and they playfully tussled to greet each other properly. Then Padfoot nudged him toward the hippogriff and even managed to get him to bow in greeting somehow. Now Mooney and Buckbeak no longer wanted to kill each other. This was going well. Padfoot began to have hope that they might actually make it through the night, until the howling started again. The remaining six wolves had regrouped and made their way back to them. They had flanked all around the trio. Now three against six wasn't ideal, but as Padfoot tried to make himself look as big as possible, he remembered that one of them was a giant hippogriff. Buckbeak reared up on his hind legs again and charged the lead wolf. Padfoot and Mooney faced out towards the pack head to tail and circled slowly, growling and howling as menacingly as they could. Buckbeak pushed the lead wolf down and she ran off into the woods again. Buckbeak returned and circled Mooney and Padfoot until the rest of the pack retreated as well. It seemed at least for the moment that the pack would leave them alone. Now that he had a moment to collect his thoughts, he began to feel guilty for disrupting the pack like this. Thankfully so far, none of them were seriously injured, but that had been by no means a guaranteed outcome. If they were going to have any chance at all against the poachers when the barrier came down, they would need to all be filled in quickly and retrieve their wands so they could be ready to fight. Many things were standing in the way of this, the first of which was the recovery time they would need after their transformation. The second was how scattered and fractured the pack currently was. He would have to figure out a way to regather them, move them, and find some central place they could use as cover or shelter. What he wouldn't give to be able to communicate with Mooney in any significant way. Another concern was trying to figure out how much time had passed. It was around midnight when he had stepped outside the cabin, and probably another hour or so that he spent flying Buckbeak before the attack. How much time had passed since then? He looked up at the sky and tried to recall his astronomy lessons from school. That was useless. How many times had he complained that those lessons would never apply to his life? Look who's laughing now. He could recite from memory the full moons for the next decade but that wasn't very helpful. He figured it may have been around three hours since he left the cabin. So it's probably roughly three o'clock in the morning. The sun rose around 6.30 a.m. this time of year so he probably had maybe three and a half hours left. What a discouraging thought. Well, he might as well use all the time he was given. Mooney was pacing, unsure what to do now that Padfoot was here and the pack had scattered. Now that Buckbeak had scared off the pack, Padfoot felt better about his safety in the bubble. He got Mooney's attention and started forward into the woods again. It was time to get an idea of what was around them. They covered a lot of ground over the next few hours. He followed the creek and found the ruins of a stone house. As they approached, he realized that the pack had reassembled here. He saw four wolves in and around the ruins from where he and Mooney were. Buckbeak was some distance behind them. He had found some fish in the creek and was enjoying a midnight snack. Padfoot stopped his approach, and Mooney stilled as well. Now that he saw his pack again, he seemed torn as to what to do. He came over to where Padfoot stood and leaned his head into his side, as if to say, Come on, meet my friends, they aren't so bad. Padfoot returned the gesture to say, Lead the way. Mooney went ahead of Padfoot and re-entered the pack. They were wary of him and the newcomer behind him, but they weren't immediately defensive, so that was a good sign. Because of this, Padfoot felt it safe to take a submissive stance, showing no hostility. They circled Mooney and Padfoot, sniffing the air, then playfully tumbling with Mooney. After a bit of time, the introductions had been made and it seemed as if Padfoot had been accepted. Amazing. Padfoot took advantage of this uneasy truce to get a closer look at the ruins. It seemed to be a small dwelling with a partial roof collapse over the western half. Most of the glass windows were still intact, but he was able to easily get into the house through one that was broken in the same room that had the collapsed roof. He sniffed around, following the familiar scent of Remus, which led him to eight lockers. He recognized the scent of Sarah and Ian as well. He could only hope their wands were here. If they could all get to their wands quickly once the sun rose, they might have a shot at this. He went back outside, and the night had begun to slip away into morning. Dawn was not quite yet upon them, 
but it was rapidly approaching. Patfoot found Mooney and the others. They were all finding places to lie down, exhausted from an eventful evening. He ran to bring Buck Beak closer to the dwelling. As they started to transform he realized something he should have figured out hours ago. He would have if he hadn't been focused on keeping Buck Beak, himself, and the werewolves from killing each other. They would transform back, and even in their human form register as werewolves to the magical barrier, but he couldn't transform into his human form until the barrier dropped. He has to communicate the danger to them while in dog form. Chapter 21, Dawn Sunday, August 21st, 1994 Remus woke up after his transformation with a start. The events of the night were clouded in a veil like a dream quickly lost upon waking. He felt an urgency and didn't know why. He tried to hold on to it, but it was already gone. He sensed the rest of the pack around him and wanlessly transfigured a blanket for himself. Hey, there's a dog, Wilson cried out. Remus snapped his head around to see where Wilson was pointing. A large black dog sprinted straight to Remus and started barking. He stopped just short of colliding with where he was still sitting on the ground. Hatfoot, the dog barked again and nodded his head. He leapt onto his hind legs and came down onto his front. He nudged into Remus's side, trying to push him into an upright position. Hadfoot, what's going on? What are you doing here? He said, as Ian came over and held out his hand to help Remus up. Something was wrong, he knew instantly. Sirius wouldn't be here unless something had gone wrong. Is this your dog? Greta asked, voicing the confusion mirrored on the faces around her. How did he get here? Padfoot was ignoring all of them, eyes intent on Remus. He barked and even started to growl. He seems dangerous, Lena said as she backed towards the ruins. Padfoot jumped and barked at this. Dangerous, Sarah echoed, almost to herself as something clicked in her brain. Padfoot, are we in danger? Padfoot jumped again, wagging his tail and nodding his head as he barked. Remus felt his stomach drop. Oh, this is ridiculous. Lassie, did Tommy fall in a well? Martin said sarcastically. Greta gasped looking into the forest beyond. Oh Merlin, there's a hippogriff? She started backing up quickly to the ruins, joining Lena and clutching her hand. Remus shook his head as the scene devolved into chaos. They needed to focus, something was terribly wrong, and he didn't know what. Everyone shut up. This is important, we are all in danger, and not from the hippogriff. We have to get into the house. Get your wands. Quickly. Remus was still leaning on Ian for support, and they moved as quickly as they could into the house and to their lockers, getting their wands and other belongings. Why is he still Padfoot? Remus asked Sarah quietly. The barrier remains up for 15 minutes after we transform, just as a buffer of protection from any delay in the transformation. Padfoot must be able to enter as a dog, but if he were to transform back. Sarah let her last sentence trail off. What? What would happen? I don't know. The barrier may immediately shrink so that wherever he is located is on the outside, or it may somehow prevent him from transforming back, or somehow expel him from the bubble. I don't know. We didn't consider Anime Guy when creating it. Sarah answered, thinking through the possibilities as they came to her. Anime Guy. That dog is an Animagus. Is the Hippogriff an Animagus too? Wilson asked. The dog is, the hippogriff isn't, Remus said. He figured this secret would be revealed shortly anyway, no need to cloud the situation further. Padfoot started to bark again as he paced the floor, whining at them. Are we under attack? Remus asked him. Padfoot nodded his head and barked. How many? Padfoot barked eight times quickly. Eight barks, eight people. Another nod and bark. How long until the barrier drops? He asked, turning to Sarah. At this point, less than ten minutes. We can just apparate away when the barrier drops, Ian suggested. Padfoot shook his head and barked out the window. Remus looked up and saw Buckbeak, still walking on the edge of the forest. They are off to Buckbeak as well, he said, as he fit the pieces together, then looked at Sarah. It's the poachers. 
We could operate away, but they would get the hippogriff, Sarah said. Patfoot barked and nodded his head. You're all exhausted from the full moon, and we face eight unknown assailants. If you choose to leave when the barrier drops I completely understand, but Padfoot and I are staying. Remus explained and Padfoot barked an affirmation. I'll stand beside you, old friend, Sarah said. As will I, Ian said, resting a hand on Sarah's shoulder. Is there anyone you can send a Patronus to for backup? Any of you, call on anyone you can think of who may help us, Remus said. Sarah cast a Patronus and a silvery rabbit went bounding out of the room. Help is on the way. I sure hope so. Thank you, Remus said. We've only a few minutes left to prepare. Any defensive spells you can think of, cast them. Prepare yourselves for battle. Remus went out and brought Buck Beak inside to one of the less dilapidated rooms so he wouldn't be out in the open. As he went, he cast protective spells and put up magical barriers. Waves of pain radiated down his leg and up his back from his hip, but he had to push that to the back of his mind. There was no time to recover now. Everyone took up defensive positions, except Martin. Are all of you seriously ready to die to defend a wild animal? Martin was pacing the floor, panicked. We aren't going to die, and you don't have to stay, Remus said calmly, re-entering the room to join everyone. I wasn't planning on it. Who else is coming with me? There was silence as the rest of the pack watched him pace. Lena, come with me. He went over to where she stood next to Greta to plead with her. No pack is worth dying for, you always said that. That was before I had a pack like this. Lena whispered. Martin, I'm staying. You've all lost your minds. This stranger and his pet have brought the enemy to your doorstep, and you are handing yourselves over to them rather than saving yourselves. That's enough. Sarah finally spoke up. She stood from where she was sitting. Her breath hitched and came in shallow breaths, but she still commanded the attention of everyone in the room. Clearly you've made up your mind, and so have we. When this barrier falls you can leave. No one is holding you hostage. But you will not speak poorly of my pack. We don't have time for your foolishness. Now, everyone else, we run together, we fight together. If anyone goes after one of us, they have to answer to us all. I've sent out calls for help. We won't be fighting this alone. We just have to hold our ground until they show up. Everyone get ready. Spread out to cover all angles of attack. We've got about a minute to go. Sarah went back to her spot next to Remus and Ian. Sarah, to your bleeding. Ian whispered. Sarah looked down at her side where blood was seeping through her shirt. It's nothing. It's just a scratch. I'll be fine. Remus held out his wand. May I? She nodded and he cast a healing spell to stop the bleeding. Thank you. Soon enough, they all felt the barrier fall. In the next moment, Martin apparated away, and Padfoot transformed into Sirius. He joined Remus where he was sitting next to Sarah and reached out, then withdrew his hand. They were already coming for you. I didn't lead them to you. I would never. His voice cut out. I didn't lead them to you he said again. I know you didn't, Remus said as he reached out his hand and ran it through Sirius's hair. They attacked Buckbeak, and when we escaped I overheard them say they knew where the pack was and you were worth more, and then they vanished. They already knew where you were. I, Remus was interrupted by a blast to the exterior wall next to his head. He reeled back, and immediately shot a spell out the window as he ducked for cover. Flashes of light filled the morning air from all directions. They were surrounded. Remus's hands shook as he closed his eyes, but not from exhaustion or fear. He focused on the powerful strengthening magic surrounding and flowing through the pack, his pack. Instead of merely allowing the magic to ebb away at his pain and slowly strengthen him, he quickly and deliberately pulled as much of it into him as he could, his hands shaking from the effort. When he opened his eyes again, his tremors had faded. He stood, momentarily forgetting his cane and threw himself in front of Greta with a shield charm, intercepting a hex. In the same motion, he launched an attack. Petrificus Totalis. He shouted and the charging attacker collapsed. Without pausing he continued to cast shield spells to defend first Sirius, then Ian, then Wilson. He switched from defensive to attack as the poachers drew closer. 
He disarmed and stunned each in turn then pushed an approaching duo away by projecting back a shield spell with a surge of powerful magic. All around them, walls were blowing apart projecting shrapnel in every direction. One particularly close blow left his ears ringing. A sharp silver barb came whirling through a hole in the wall, hitting Ian in the arm. He let out a grunt as it knocked him back. The metallic, sickening smell was enough to twist Remus's stomach from across the room. Soon they heard more barbs flying towards them through the windows. Sirius closed his eyes and with a flick of his ebony wand, transfigured the silver mid-air into harmless dust, which impacted a second later, pelting against their clothes and stinging their eyes, but giving no lasting damage. Sirius focused again, kneeling to the ground and touching the floor, reaching out with his magic and with another flick of his wand transfigured all silver within the battle to mere dust including the barb that had hit Ian. Sirius immediately rose and met Remus in the middle of the room, where they stood back to back, flinging spells out of the growing holes in the walls and defending the pack with shields whenever possible. There's a lot more than eight out there, Wilson yelled from where he crouched behind a sofa. He stood to make another attack but was hit with a hex, pushing him to the ground with a cry. They've had all night to plan, there must have been more of them in a different location. Sirius shouted in between casting spells. He sent a powerful bombarda back at the wizards hiding in the tree line, and a large limb fell, followed by several screams. We don't have to beat them, we just need to buy some time, Ian said as a curse went flying past his ear. He dodged, and sent a hex back at his attacker, finding his mark, but another bombarda hit the wall and blasted rubble at Ian before he could duck behind cover again. He hit the floor unconscious. Lena screamed at the sight. How much time? Greta shouted just before she and Lena were hit with Petrificus Totalis, and froze where they were kneeling on the floor, holding each other's hands. Remus peered out the window as he cast a hex, hitting his target. They had made a dent, but there were still at least six of them standing. They weren't going to make it much longer, at this rate. He looked to see who was still standing and saw Sarah hit with a shove spell landing on the ground next to Ian. Sirius barely missed being hit by another stunning spell by throwing himself to the ground. Remus remained standing, glancing out and sending spells as often as he could. Just then they heard a booming voice ring out so all could hear. This is the Swiss magical law enforcement. Everyone put down your wands. God damn it, Eric. Sarah said from where she was lying on the ground, struggling to sit up. There were a few more flashes outside the building and then there was silence. Sirius crawled next to Sarah. Sarah, Buckbeak and I attacked and left two poachers when we fled. Do I need to get him and myself out of here? What? No, you aren't going to get blamed for this. Sarah said as she slowly sat up, looking around at the state of the rest of the pack. I'd love to believe you but this wouldn't be the first time I went down for something I didn't do. Come to think of it. It wouldn't be Buckbeak's first time either. Sirius's eyes were darting around the room, looking for the next source of danger. Listen to me. I'm not going to let you go down for this. This isn't ideal, but I know these guys. You're going to be fine. Yeah, that's what I thought last time too. Sirius said mostly to himself. As he glanced around the room, his eyes locked onto Remus. Remus was shuffling back to where Sirius was next to Sarah and made eye contact with Sirius just as the surge of magical energy he had harnessed suddenly ebbed away, leaving him exhausted. His whole body ached, and his ears were still ringing. Everything in the room was going out of focus. He could see the shape of Sirius shouting at him as he ran towards Remus, but no sound reached his ears. At least the terrible ringing was finally gone too. The room started to spin and he realized he didn't have his cane just as his legs buckled, unable to keep him upright. He oddly felt no pain as his knees hit the stone floor, his whole body was numb, and his clouded vision went dark as he crumpled to the ground. When he came to, the ringing came back first, then the muffled sounds of the others in the room. Then the terrible pain, torrents of pain. His head was in Sirius's lap, and he was lying at an awkward angle. Mooney, can you hear me, love? Sirius was trying to be calm for Remus, but he could still see the panic in his eyes. Mooney, talk to me. He was running a trembling hand through Remus's hair over and over. His other hand was straightening Remus's coat. 
He couldn't hold back a grunt of pain but was finally able to find words. What happened? Remus said, trying to remember how he ended up on the floor. Last he remembered they had finished the battle. You just got a little overexerted, that's all. Had a little fainting spell. Sirius gave Remus a shaky smile, and he continued to smooth back his hair. Remus tried to focus on his face, staring into his eyes, willing himself to get lost in their depth rather than the floods of pain threatening to take over. God, he was so beautiful, even like this. Sirius's voice was shaky when he spoke again. You were amazing, you protected us all, but you used up all your energy, I'm afraid. When Remus finally found the energy to speak, all he could think to say was, Fucking hell. He closed his eyes again, but he heard Sirius chuckle in response. There was a knock at the door, despite the fact that there were giant holes in the ruins that the wicks could have walked straight through. Everyone put your wands away. Sarah said as she stood up and limped to the door. Remus wasn't sure who she was talking to, as most of them were lying on the ground in no fit state to pose any threat. Who's there? She shouted through the door. Sarah, it's me, Natalie. Eric woke me up at dawn on a Sunday asking me to come rescue you. Now open the door. Sarah opened the door, and Natalie marched in, wand raised. Is everyone here with you? Yes, Natalie, you can lower your wand. Sarah said standing a little more tense than she was a moment ago. Did you secure the area? Natalie lowered her wand only slightly before going on. We detained ten assailants. Two of the assailants are dead. Do you have a medic? My pack is injured. We need medical attention immediately. Natalie looked at the wounded and called back to the other wizard in the room, sending him to fetch the medic. Are you okay? She asked Sarah as the wizard left the room. I'll be okay. I'm more worried about the others. She turned a concerned gaze to the rest of the room. The medic is on his way. As soon as you are healed, we will need to question all of you as part of our investigation. I understand that you have an investigation to conduct, but we all had a rough night. Could we do this tomorrow or even this afternoon after we all had a chance to rest and recover? Unfortunately, it can't wait. You may have valuable information that could help us track down those that escaped. I need to interview you each separately. It's vital to our recovery that we remain together after the moon, especially after we have sustained injuries. If you must interview us now, then it's together, or not at all. Sarah stated firmly, and you could tell in her stance that she wasn't going to budge on this. Fine. Natalie said through gritted teeth. I'm going to take out my wand and revive Lena and Greta now. Don't take out your wand. The medic will be here shortly. Fine. Sarah watched as Natalie left to see where the medic was. Once she was out of the room, she turned and went to Ian's side. What's happening? Why is she treating us like criminals? Wilson asked in a small voice. I don't know. We've had several interactions through my work with asylum seekers. She and I have always had a rapport. I don't understand her tone. She knew you were a werewolf, didn't she? Ian asked. He had regained consciousness at some point but was still lying where he had fallen. Yes, she's never been anything but accepting. It's harder for people when they have to face the reality of it. When it's just a fun fact they know about you, it makes you interesting and unique, but then they come face to face with it and it changes the way they think of you. Remus said weakly, still resting his head on Sirius's lap. I'd like to say it's different here, but I'm afraid you might be right, Sarah said. Why did you call her here? Sirius asked. I didn't. I messaged my boss, Eric. He must have called on Natalie to come here. It wouldn't be my first choice in a rescue party, but I know Natalie, she's fair. Aster, I know this is difficult, but I believe we can trust Natalie. If we try to obfuscate, I think it will make us look guilty when we did nothing wrong. Natalie re-entered the room with a wizard holding a leather med kit bag. This is Leo, he's a medic. Leo went straight to Lena and Greta lying on the ground. Did anyone see what spell hit them? It was Petrificus Totalis, Sarah said, moving out of the way so that Leo could work. That's easy enough to reverse, he said, then performed the simple counter spell, and they both woke up. Lena took a deep breath and looked around confused. Greta, where's Greta? I'm right here, babe. Greta bent over her and grabbed her hand to help her up. 
They tearfully clung to each other and went to sit on one of the sofas. Next, Leo moved to Ian, who was still lying on the ground, Sarah next to him holding his hand. Leo healed the wounds from where the rubble had hit him, and the injury to his arm from the silver shrapnel, which was red and blistered. Finally, he cast a spell to relieve him from the concussion. Help Remus next, Sarah said as she slowly helped Ian onto a bed. Leo came over to where Remus was still lying on the floor. He cast a diagnostic spell. You haven't been cursed, but it looks like you have a mild concussion, ruptured your eardrum, and exhausted your magical core. He paused as the diagnostic spell continued. You also have a tremendous amount of damage to your hip joint, but that's old. It's been like that for a while. Your other joints are in rough shape too, and... We'll be here all day if you list everything wrong with me. Remus cut the medic off mid-sentence. Let's just focus on the new injuries, shall we? Leo looked at Remus with concerned eyes, but nodded. He cast a spell to repair Remus's eardrum, then another to relieve the concussion. He then pulled a potion out of his bag and held it out to Remus. Here, take this. It's a strengthening elixir. It will shore up your magical core and give you increased strength for the next day. Maybe two. But you need to take it easy and rest so you can recover. After you are done here, I can help you get to a hospital. No, Remus said as he slowly came to a sitting position on the floor. He took the potion and downed it in one gulp. Thank you, but I'll be okay. I don't want to go to a hospital. Leo shook his head a little. I strongly advise you to get to a hospital or at least follow up with your healer in the next couple of days. This is a stopgap. It's not a permanent treatment, but it's all I can do for now. I'll be all right, Doc. I've been through worse, Remus assured him. He's in a lot of pain. He just fainted onto his knees. Do you have any pain relief potions? Sirius asked. Of course. Leo handed him another potion, still eyeing him with concern. Don't worry about me, Leo. I can take care of myself. I've been doing it for a while now. Leo shook his head but moved on. Who's next? Sarah pointed to Wilson, who had been hit with a jinx that weakened his arms, which Leo easily reversed. Are you bleeding? Leo asked Sarah, looking at her side where there was a blood stain on her shirt. Sarah reached over and raised her shirt to examine her side. I was, but Remus healed me. You should still take a look at her. The spell I cast was fairly rudimentary. There still could be some internal damage I wasn't able to heal. Remus insisted. Leo cast a diagnostic spell to see the extent of the injury and cast a second healing spell. You did a good job stopping the bleeding. There was just some bruising on the ribs that still needed healing. Yeah, I never did master how to heal bruised ribs. Remus sighed. Did you study to become a healer? Leo asked. No, but it was crucial to learn how to heal myself. Oh, why is that? I was a resistance fighter in the war and I'm a werewolf, Remus said flatly, annoyed at the young man's impertinent questions. Oh, Leo said lamely as he stared at Remus and the group around him. They all watched as he put the pieces together. Oh, are you all? He trailed off. Not all of us, Sirius said. Right. Leo finished putting his supplies back in his medic bag and called out to Natalie, who was at the door. Well, I'm done here. They're all patched up. Thanks, Leo. Natalie said as he walked out the door, and she shut it behind her. She walked over to the group. Now, it's time for you to answer my questions. Chapter 22 Interrogation The pack all took seats on the beds and sofas. Sirius helped Remus up from the floor and over to a bed in the far corner. He sat against the wall, and Remus leaned against him, resting his head on Sirius's shoulder. Let's start with you, Sarah. What happened here? Natalie asked. I'm not sure I'm the best one to start with. The pack all met up like usual last night and transformed for the moon. The events of the evening are always rather fuzzy after we transform back into ourselves, so I'm not quite sure what happened last night except that. What? Natalie prompted when Sarah trailed off. Well, when we transformed back into ourselves, I just remember feeling like the evening was somehow more eventful than usual. Sarah finished vaguely. This is ridiculous. You want to start with me? 
Sirius said from the corner where he sat on the bed with Remus. And you are? Natalie asked. You don't have to do this. Remus whispered to him. Really? I don't see as we have much of a choice. Sirius whispered back. Enough side talk. Do you know more about what happened? Aren't you a member of the pack? Natalie asked. No, I'm not a part of the pack. I'm Aster Lovell. I didn't start the evening with them. Sirius answered. There was a commotion outside the room, and an officer came in. Sorry to interrupt, Captain, but there's something in the back room, and it's making quite a lot of noise. I thought you said this was all of you. Natalie said. No, you asked if everyone here was with me, and I said yes. Sarah clarified. What's in that room, Sarah? Natalie asked pointedly. It's a wild hippogriff. I wouldn't open that door if I were you. Sirius replied. A hippogriff. Natalie couldn't hide her incredulity. Yes, he's with me. He's fine where he is as long as you don't go barging into the room. Sirius explained slowly. Fine. Patrick, post a guard next to that door but don't enter yet. I'll investigate when I'm done here. Natalie said to the officer. Now, as you were saying. She prompted Sirius to continue. I was at my cabin and just finished listening to the Quidditch Cup. Oh, absolutely terrible how that ended. Natalie interjected. Right. What a wild thing to do. Sirius agreed animatedly. I don't understand how something like that could still happen. Natalie said. Hey, some of us want to listen to it later without the end being spoiled. Wilson said from his seat next to Greta. Sirius cleared his throat and got back on track. Right, sorry. After the game, I stepped outside for a bit of fresh air. As I just mentioned, I travel with a hippogriff, and I went for an evening flight with him to try to relax a little. Near the end of our flight on our way back home these poachers attacked us. He and I fought them off, and they fled, but I heard one of them say. Leave them, the pack is worth more anyway. And then they disappeared into the forest. I wasn't sure if they were talking about this pack, but I couldn't take any chances, I had to warn them. I knew where the pack was, so I flew over here. What's your hippogriff's name? Natalie interrupted. Excuse me. Sirius was thrown off track. His name. If you travel with him and he lets you fly him, surely he has a name. He does. It's Witherwings. Sirius supplied with minimal wavering. Okay, continue. Natalie was jotting notes in her notebook as he talked. I should mention, when we were defending ourselves, there were two that unfortunately lost their grip on their brooms and fell. I don't know the extent of their injuries. Two, lost their grip. How many did you see apparate away? Natalie didn't look up from her notebook. Eight. Sirius paused, but when Natalie didn't ask any other questions he continued. We flew towards where I knew the pack was gathered. I wanted to see if there was a way to warn them or protect them. Hang on, Sarah, isn't there a dome that keeps people out of the area? Natalie asked. Yes. Sarah confirmed. Did you know about the dome? Natalie directed back at Sirius. Yes, but I knew that it dropped in the morning, and if no one warned them before they were attacked, they would be at their weakest, and wouldn't stand a chance to defend themselves. Sirius explained. Why didn't you go to the authorities? Natalie continued. I'm sorry, I'm a tourist and I've only been in the country for a short time, I didn't know how to reach out to the authorities, and I didn't know if the authorities would help a werewolf pack under attack. Sirius gave Natalie a pointed look. I don't know how it is in England, but we don't abandon someone when they need help. Natalie replied with just as much chagrin. I stand corrected, you bail them out then interrogate them as though they are criminals. Sirius countered. Aster. Sarah shot him a look. This isn't an interrogation. I'm just trying to investigate the shootout that happened just now. Natalie stated sternly. My apologies. They just look so similar. Sirius said quietly then plowed on before she could retort. Anyway, Buck, Witherwings and I flew here as fast as we could and waited out the night. Wait. If the dome was surrounded by poachers that you just escaped, how did you wait out the night outside the dome and avoid them? Natalie tried to understand. Easy. We didn't wait outside the dome, we waited inside the dome. Sirius stated simply. I thought it didn't let humans in. Natalie was still confused. It doesn't, Witherwings made it through just fine. And I, found a way around it. Sirius evaded. You found a way around it. What does that mean? Natalie shook her head a little in annoyance. I found a way to enter the dome and not be pushed out. 
Sirius replied. How did you do that? Natalie was getting annoyed. Aster, it's okay. You can tell her. Sarah said quietly. Tell me what? Natalie said. Sirius didn't say anything, just looked from Sarah to Remus. Remus looked at him as if he would give the world to get them away from here. Sirius could do it. He could apparate away before anyone knew what happened. Except they'd have Remus. And Buck Beak. And he'd be alone on the run again. He would have to say goodbye to the asylum plea. Right. Sirius said, taking his eyes off Remus and back to Natalie. Well, it was easy. I just turned into a dog and ran through the barrier. A dog? Natalie replied. Yes. You're an animagus. Natalie was finally catching up. Sirius paused before answering. Yes. Are you registered? Natalie asked. In Switzerland? No. In England? Natalie pushed. No. Sirius said simply. I see. She wrote something else down in her notebook. We will circle back around to that. Continue with your story. Right. Well, with the wings and I made it through the barrier and managed to make friends with the werewolves. You made friends with six werewolves. Natalie repeated. It was seven, actually. Weren't you concerned about being bitten? Natalie looked at him incredulously. No, werewolf bites don't infect animals or anime guy. Sirius paused waiting for another question. May I continue? Natalie found her voice. Please. Thank you. We eventually, through the course of the night, made friends with seven werewolves, and then they transformed back into themselves as dawn broke. I was still a dog because the barrier remained up for 15 minutes after sunrise. So it was a simple matter of communicating through barks and charades that they were in mortal danger. We set up as much of a defensive position as we could, and prepared for the dome to fall. That's when Sarah sent a Patronus for help. Then the dome fell, I changed back into a human, the poachers came, and attacked, and we defended ourselves. Then you showed up and rescued us. Thank you for that, by the way. Sirius added. You're welcome. Natalie said. You said seven werewolves, but there are only six other people here. Martin apparated away. He said we were all crazy for staying. Lena said from where she was lying on the other bed, leaning up against Greta. I'm a little surprised more of you didn't apparate away, if I'm being honest. Natalie stated. Aster was staying to defend Witherwings, and I don't leave Aster behind, Remus said. And Remus is a member of our pack, and we don't leave pack members behind, Sarah said. That's sweet, Natalie said sarcastically. Here's what I don't understand. She paused. Well, there is a lot I don't understand yet, but let's start with this. How did they know where the pack was? I thought this was an undisclosed location. It is. No one knows about it except pack members. Sarah replied. Aster knows where it is. Natalie said. It's a top secret location, but a random tourist knows where it is. He's not a random tourist. He's a... He's a client of mine at WIJ and a friend of Remus. Sarah finally said. What's the nature of your work with him at WIJ? Natalie leaned forward. That's confidential, Sarah stated emphatically. Right, we'll see about that. Natalie leaned back. Anyway, it's inconsequential to the matter at hand, Sarah assured her. I guess I'll have to take your word on that, she said, still taking notes. And Remus, are you a tourist as well? Yes, Asta and I are traveling together, and while in Switzerland I met up with Sarah, who I've known for ten years. So how long have you been a member of this pack? Two moons. Two moons. Natalie sat back in her chair and thought for a minute. Okay, so I'm just going to put together some pieces and see where it leads. Your pack meets in a secret location known only to the members here in this room. And Martin. Lena cut in. And Martin, right? No one else knows the location, but somehow the poachers knew. Why don't you ask them how they found us? Ian asked. We have, so far they haven't been very forthright. Natalie replied. So, the way I see it, Aster, knowing where the werewolves are and how to find them, leads the poachers to them and enters the barrier to attempt to chase them out of the dome. For some reason this fails, and rather than drop the facade, you blend in with your friend and warn them that the poachers are on top of them. That makes no sense. I was attacked by the poachers, they are after Witherwings. 
Sirius retorted. Why do you travel with a werewolf? Why do you have a hippogriff as a pet? Seems like behavior indicative of someone in the exotic pet trade. Natalie continued heatedly. Witherwings is not my pet. We travel together. I didn't purchase him. He saved my life three times and I would never do anything to hurt him. Sirius was insulted at the accusation. Wait, are you implying that Asta has collected me? Remus looked flabbergasted. We do travel together, but last I checked I am a living breathing sentient being capable of leaving any time I'd like. People have been brainwashed into doing worse, Natalie said. You're not listening. Sirius raised his voice now. This isn't the first time Witherwings and I have been attacked by poachers. Last month when I arrived in Switzerland, I encountered a group of poachers that followed my trail for two days. I barely escaped with my life. And anyway, that's not how the dome works. In your hypothetical you posited that Asta wanted to chase us out of the dome, but it wouldn't be much of a barrier if the werewolves could just leave. We're stuck in here till it drops in the morning. Ian explained. Natalie paused, mollified, then looked at the others. If Aster didn't tell them the location, who did? Any strife among the pack? We don't operate like that. We come together for the moons, that's it. Sarah said. There's no room for animosity. We don't even have a typical pack hierarchy. Sarah. Lena spoke in barely a whisper. What is it, Lena? Sarah looked at Lena, whose pale complexion was all the more extreme next to her short, dark brown hair. Her eyes looked large as saucers through her thick glasses. Well, I've been meaning to tell you. I just wanted to keep it private is all. Lena continued to whisper to Sarah, almost ignoring the rest of the room. What happened? Sarah prompted. Martin and I broke up. Lena finally said. You and Martin were going out. Natalie asked. Going out. Lena echoed her words almost wistfully. Finally forced to acknowledge the room. That makes it seem like we were teenagers having some fling. We were partners, mates. The only two at the bottom of the last pack we were a part of, then they kicked us out, and we only ever had each other. When we joined Sarah and this pack, they were so different from anything we had ever experienced. I still cared for Martin, but I realized some things about the world, and myself that made us staying together impossible. So I broke up with him. I tried to be as gentle as I could, but like I said, we were only ever the two of us, so there was bound to be some hurt feelings. When was this? Sarah asked. Three months ago. Lena said as she looked down at her hands in her lap. Three, Three months. months. Ian and Sarah said together. Three months ago this happened. Sarah repeated herself. How did I not notice? Like you said, we only come together once a month for the moons. Life has been busy these last few months. I know I've seen you outside of the moon, but when was the last time you saw Martin outside of the moon? Lena asked Sarah, with only the slightest hint of criticism. It's been a while, I'll admit. Sarah looked down at her hands. You knew him best. Do you think he'd be capable of this? Of turning us over to poachers? Lena didn't speak for a full minute. He was never able to accept this part of himself. Even after all Ian did to try to work with him. He stayed with the pack because of me, and then suddenly I didn't even want him anymore. Lena had tears in her eyes. He was angry at me. He said. Her voice cracked. He told her she should have realized this years ago. Then he could still be in the other pack. He blamed her for ruining his life. Greta finished for her. Greta had her arms around Lena. Which of course isn't true. If Lena had broken up with him while they were still in the pack, he still would be at the bottom of that pack. Alone. In my opinion, he's better off out of there than in. But no one asks me these things. So going back to Sarah's question, do you think he was capable of turning you all over to the poachers? Natalie spoke up. Half of them had forgotten she was sitting there during this revelation. I don't know. If you had asked me yesterday, I would have said no, but someone did this, and I don't believe it was this guy. Lena gestured to Sirius. Why not? Natalie pushed. Last night was a bit of a blur, but I do remember. I remember a confrontation, we were all surrounding him and the bird thing. Lena recalled. Hippogriff. Sirius muttered under his breath. Not to mention the fancy transfiguration of the silver shrapnel mid-battle. Ian added. He turned all the silver to dust in mid-act in a split second. I've never seen anything like that. 
He risked his life, he absolutely could have died and it wasn't to try to capture us. I don't believe it was to capture us. It only makes sense if it was to save us. Lena finished. What's more, if he had wanted to capture us, there'd be no reason to warn us. We were completely vulnerable. All he would have had to do was wait out the bubble and attack us while we were unaware. Greta chimed in. I'm going to need Martin's address. I'll send some guys over to pick him up for questioning. How quickly they turn. Sirius mumbled under his breath. Remus turned to him, wondering why on earth he would bring attention back on himself. What was that? Natalie asked. Nothing. He muttered again, trying to keep silent, but his disappointment got the better of him. You had a hard breakup. That's your motive. For this guy turning on the only person who he ever trusted. Where's the proof? Well, he's the only one who fled. Greta said defensively. He's basically still a kid. He's a werewolf who woke up at his weakest to discover that a group of poachers are on his doorstep. Yeah, he fled. He was scared shitless and he didn't want to die today. Not for a pack that in a 30-minute interrogation turns on him. Go ahead. Chase him down and interrogate him, but you had better have some goddamn proof before you pin this on him and lock him away. Sirius was shaking now. His eyes were glazed over with unshed tears. Asta, hush. Remus tried to reach out to run his hand through his hair but he flinched away. His hand stopped in the air and he withdrew, giving Sirius some space. It's okay, Martin's not going to be locked up if there's no proof, right Natalie? Remus asked Natalie pointedly. Again, I do my job, I follow the evidence, I don't chase people merely based on hunches. Natalie said, her steel gaze on Sirius. Sarah went over to Sirius and spoke softly to him. Aster. Sirius didn't respond, didn't seem to register her presence at all. Pads, look at me. This he finally responded to and looked at Sarah. He was taking shallow breaths and looked like a cornered wild animal. Take a deep breath with me, Pads. It's okay. We're going to get through this together, okay? She breathed in a deep breath, and Sirius did his best to mirror her. They did this several more times, and Sarah took his hand. It's going to be okay, all right. It's my job to make sure everyone in my pack is protected, that includes you, and that includes Martin. He's not going to go down for something he didn't do, I'll make sure of it. Sirius didn't respond other than a quick nod. He brought up his knees and lowered his forehead to rest on them. He was finally breathing normally again. Is that everything? Sarah returned her attention to Natalie, who seemed unfazed by Sirius's speech. For you, yes. Aster, I'd like to ask you some more questions. I really do have to assert that he is a client of WIJ and under my protection. He's answered more than enough of your questions, and the matter of his animagus status is already known to us. There's nothing else to find here. Sarah stood up as she was saying this. She didn't turn it on very often, but when she spoke with authority, everyone in the room listened. If there was nothing to find, he wouldn't need your protection. Natalie sighed. But seeing as he has it, I will drop it for now. Thank you, Natalie. Sarah said. Truly, thank you for coming to help us. We wouldn't be here now if it wasn't for you. Don't mention it. Natalie replied as she stood from her chair. Now, there's a hippogriff in the back room I need to see to. See to? You don't need to see to him. He's fine where he is. I really don't think you should open that door. Sirius was up in a flash and moved between her and the door leading to Buckbeak. His hands were still shaking, and his voice was hoarse. He cleared his throat and shook out his hands. Aster, I've dropped my questioning of you, and I'm already regretting it. Natalie sighed. I'm only trying to protect you. This hippogriff wouldn't hurt a fly really, the sweetest soul. Unless of course you approach him the wrong way, or he doesn't like you, and then he really is a wild animal after all, and you can't fault him for that. And he did have quite the eventful night being chased by poachers and then chased by werewolves, and then locked in a small room during a battle, so I don't think that he is going to be at his best right now. I'd be happy to introduce the two of you. Later. In a week or two, when he's in a better mood, but right now, I think it's probably best if I were the one to open that door, and even then, I am a little nervous about it. Not that he's dangerous, of course, no. He just needs to be respected, and I know him really well, and I know how to respect him. The words tumbled out of Sirius one after the other until he had finally said his piece. Natalie let out a deep sigh. Fine, you open the door then. 
Right. Yes, I can do that. Sirius said, and turned to the door then turned back. Could I just have everyone move back, like 30 feet, or maybe just hide, so he can't see you? Fine. Natalie said through gritted teeth. Everyone out. She raised her voice, and everyone listened. Soon it was just Sirius in the hallway leading to the door, and Natalie, Remus, and Sarah just out of view in the other room. Sirius drew his wand. What are you doing? Natalie called. I'm going to open the door from back here if you don't mind. Sirius called back. Another sigh could be heard coming from the other room. Fine. Remus and the others watched as Sirius opened the door and performed the proper greeting for hippogriffs. Then he moved forward and approached Buckbeak. There, there. We survived the night. Now we get to go home. Sirius cooed softly to the hippogriff. Fine. You can go. But I'm going with you. You said you left two poachers behind. If they're still there, we need to secure the crime scene. Natalie said. I'll join you. Sarah said. Remus could tell she was exhausted, but knew that she would stay up however long she needed to to ensure the protection of one of her clients. I'd like a moment, please, to talk to Remus and Sarah, privately. Sirius asked. Remus could tell he was still on the brink of another anxiety attack. Take all the time you need. I'll be right outside. Natalie said. The three of them watched her leave and shut the door so that it was just them. Remus cast Muffliato to ensure their privacy. Sirius immediately collapsed onto one of the sofas, anxiously hugging a musty pillow. This is a disaster. Why did I ever trust you? We asked you to call someone you trusted to help, not call the cops. I didn't call the cops. I called Eric and Eric called the cops. Believe me, I will have words with him about this. But I do trust Natalie. She's only ever been very kind to me. This, whatever this is she's been doing today, is very weird. I've never seen her like this. Besides, we didn't do anything illegal. You are under the protection of the WIJ, and she knows that. There's nothing she can do to you. Sarah responded, finally showing a little of her pent-up agitation. My application hasn't even been approved, Sarah. Do you really think that I'm going to be approved after this? And if they don't, your friend now knows that I am an unregistered animagius, which, up until now, I've managed to keep a secret from everyone but Mooney. And Albus. Remus interjected. Fine, Mooney and Albus. Sirius said. And Harry and his friends, and Snape knows now too. Remus continued. That's not the point, Mooney. Sirius responded irritably. Sorry. Remus said from where he sat next to Sirius on the couch. His hand rested on Sirius's back. Sirius turned back to Sarah. How much digging will she have to do to find out the rest? I trusted you, Sarah. You said I could trust you. Sarah knelt next to the couch where Sirius lay. She took a deep breath and answered in a quieter tone. You still can. I'm sorry about this truly. But you are not in trouble. You are not getting arrested. You defended yourself, and you saved the lives of my entire pack, and if it's the last thing I do, I will make sure you are safe. Like you're making sure Martin is safe. Sirius spat back. Sarah briefly closed her eyes to steal herself. Sirius, I know it was hard for you to hear us doubt him. I'm so sorry. I don't know if Martin had anything to do with this, but I will fight to make sure the investigation is fair. It won't be like what happened to you, I promise. Sirius was silent for a while. If she goes to the cabin, she'll know where we live. We'll have you relocated today. Sarah assured him. Will she search the cabin? Sirius asked. You said in your statement the attack was outside. I can make sure she won't search the cabin. Sarah answered. Because all of our possessions are in there. Everything. Sirius continued. Including a pretty questionable book collection. Remus added. She won't search it, I promise. Sarah said firmly. Sirius sat up and looked at Remus. Oh Mooney, what do we do? It'll be okay. We'll go together, she'll search the grounds, and then she'll leave, and we'll move out today, just like Sarah said. Remus reiterated. We can't move today. Look at you both. You're both dead on your feet. You should all be resting. The medic told you to rest. Sirius almost whined. We'll rest after. I've done more after worse moons. Remus brushed off his concerns. Remus is right. We can do this. Sarah agreed. 
Sirius looked from one to the other, and after a long sigh, finally agreed. Okay. Okay. Sarah agreed and stood up. Sirius got up and helped Remus up from the sofa. Chapter 23 News Ian and Natalie were chatting outside the ruins when Sirius, Remus, and Sarah joined them. As they approached, Ian looked up and moved to the side for Sirius and Remus to join them. Let's get moving, shall we? Ian said. Wait, how is Witherwings going to get there? Natalie asked. Asta and I will ride him back and meet you there, Remus answered. What? No, I'm going to take Witherwings, you're going to apparate, Sirius replied. I'm coming with you, Remus insisted. No, you're not. If you think for one second that I'm going to leave you alone after everything that just happened you are beyond help, Remus said, full of exasperation. And if you think that I would have you ride a hippogriff the morning after a full moon given how exhausted and in pain you are, you are the one that's lost it. Sirius rebutted. I'm not letting you out of my sight, Asta. I'll be fine. Oh for goodness sake, would you two stop? Ian said, rubbing the bridge of his nose as if they were giving him a headache. Sarah approached Remus, and gently took him by the arm to lead him to the side. Remus, you know he's right, she said quietly. I don't care if I'm in pain, I've been in pain my whole life, and it's not going to stop me from protecting. He broke off and lowered his voice. From protecting the ones I love. That's very admirable, but if you would allow, I could go with him. I'll protect him with my life, you know that. You're just as tired and just as in pain as I am. I am tired, but for whatever reason, I do not yet experience the level of pain you face day to day. Not to mention you fully fainted just half an hour ago, Sarah said. And Asta just had a panic attack. Leo gave me a strengthening elixir and my bad hip doesn't prevent me from spell casting. I'm not suggesting that it does, but I am suggesting that it prevents you from riding a hippogriff right after a hard moon. Remus looked down at his shoes, flexing his hand in consternation. When he looked up Sarah could see the tears in his eyes he had fought back. With your life. I promise. Remus nodded. They returned to the group and Remus approached Sirius. Fine, I'll go ahead, but Sarah is going to ride with you. Remus peers Sirius with an intense look as if daring him to object. However, he just nodded. Remus wanted so badly to kiss him goodbye, but there was still a crowd of other wizards milling around the edges of the crime scene. Instead, he gave him a quick hug and squeezed his hand tightly in goodbye. Thank you. Sirius finally said back as they parted. Sirius turned his gaze towards Sarah with a hint of mischief returning to his eyes. You ever ridden a hippogriff before? This will be my first time, she said. You said they fell mid-flight. Natalie approached them as they ready to leave. Yes, Sirius said nervously. I'll follow you on a broom. You can point out where it happened on the way. Sarah and Sirius exchanged a look, and then both nodded. Fine, Sarah said. Well, let's get going then. Ian broke the tension. Ian and Remus watched Sirius and Sarah take off on Buckbeak. Natalie followed behind on a broom. They made sure the others were safely on their way home, then they apparated away. The sharp pull of magic yanked him in every direction for a split second before he appeared next to their cabin just outside Gimmelwald. It was so painful that he nearly lost his balance as he landed. He doubled over, out of breath, as Ian appeared next to him. Gotta love apparating right after a moon, ha. He said as he looked over at Remus. Remus hid his concern behind a smile. Remus should have taken the time waiting for Sirius and the others to arrive as an opportunity to rest, but he was too worried about Sirius to allow himself to get comfortable. They were joined by everyone soon enough. Sirius had shown Natalie where the two poachers had fallen but they didn't find any bodies. They must have survived the attack and apparated away. Natalie did several forensic spells to document the evidence she discovered, and after a minute of arguing about the importance of investigating the interior of the house, Sarah won out and Natalie finally left without searching the cabin. See, what did I tell you? Nothing to worry about, Sarah said, but Remus could tell that she was extremely relieved that Natalie had finally gone. 
Sarah sent Ian out looking for a new place for them to stay. Remus had insisted it be done within the pack and not by anyone at the WIJ. He was falling into old patterns from the war. Trust no one unless you absolutely have to. Let's go inside and start packing. I'm sure we will hear from Ian soon, Sarah said. Remus and Sarah were moving slower than Sirius, but even Sirius was beginning to feel the effects of being awake for more than 24 hours. Maybe we should just rest for a minute, Remus suggested as he took a seat on the sofa. Okay, but just a short break, Sarah said as she leaned back on the sofa and closed her eyes. Sirius wanted to be upset at them, but his rush of adrenaline from the last nine hours of constant terror was crashing. He took a seat on the couch next to Sarah and said, Just a quick power nap. They all awoke with a start when a silvery owl came flying into the room and spoke in Ian's voice. I've secured a new place. I'll meet you at the cabin in a few minutes to help you finish packing. Oh goodness, how long have we been asleep? Sarah asked as she sat up a little straighter. Remus looked at the clock. It's already noon. Damn it. And we haven't packed anything. Sirius stood quickly looking around the room. It's okay, Ian is on his way. With the four of us it won't take very long. At that, there was a knock at the door. It's me, to Ian, a voice said from the other side of the door. Sirius quickly let him in. He came in slowly carrying four plastic takeout bags, which he set on the coffee table and took a seat on the sofa next to Sarah where Sirius was just sitting. He leaned his head back to rest it against the cushion. Sarah leaned over and kissed him. Thanks, Cersei, you brought food, Sirius said as he started looking through the bags. It was sandwiches and chips, nothing fancy, but they all started eating. You found a place, Sarah said around a mouthful of food. Yep, it's another cabin with room for the hippogriff, and it's out in the forest away from any town or neighbors. Perfect, Remus said. How's packing going, Ian said, looking around at the unpacked state of the sitting room. We were going to get started right away, but then we sat on the sofa to take a small break, and the next thing we knew, your Patronus was here. Sorry, Sarah explained. He reached out and grabbed her hand. Don't be sorry, we are all exhausted. I'm glad you are able to rest a bit. We can pack fast enough now that we are together. How are the others? Sarah asked. Lena is going to stay with Greta and Wilson at least for a bit. They all went home to get some rest. He paused briefly before continuing. You know, I don't mean to gossip, but I think that Greta and Lena, you know, might be. Dating. Sarah said. Yeah. Picked up on that, did you? Sarah grinned at him. Oh, come off it, you were just as surprised as we were that she and Martin had broken up. Yeah, and then I realized that she and Greta have been really close the last few months, and it all kind of made sense. Right, so what I'm saying is we both pissed it together at the same time. He playfully pushed her shoulder away. Yeah. She laughed. They finished lunch and started packing up as quickly as they could. With a few spells, it wouldn't take them too long. They hadn't accumulated many belongings. The furniture and appliances had all come with the furnished cabin. Remus was using his chair in hover charm mode to get around the house. This was much more activity than he was used to on the day after a full moon, and even with the strengthening elixir his body was shaky and his hip complained, especially after his fall. Hey would you mind if we turn on the radio, I want to see if they are doing any commentary on the cup, Ian said. Okay but you aren't going to like it, it was a bit of a disappointing game, Sirius said as he turned on the radio. We've had a long streak of sunshine, but we're expecting rain over the next week, so be sure to plan accordingly. Thank you, Augustus. Now let's return to the news. The Quidditch World Cup between Ireland and Bulgaria ended 170 to 160 after Crum controversially put the Bulgarians out of their misery by catching the snitch, but still losing to Ireland. What kind of a play was that? Ian interjected. I told you you wouldn't like it. Sirius called back. This was of course all overshadowed by the attacks on the Muggle locals in the night following the game. The record Remus had been levitating into a box crashed to the floor. Remus left it and went out of the bedroom as quickly as he could to get closer to the radio. Sirius. He called out, his voice panicked. Sirius came around the corner 
and joined Remus. I'm here, I heard. His voice was full of concern as they both watched the radio. The attack came amid the large wizard camping site where thousands of spectators were staying. Witnesses say it began around three in the morning as hooded masked figures attacked and levitated a family of muggles into the air. Damage was also done to wizard campsites as the attack quickly turned into a riot. The masses fled into the surrounding forest, while a group of wizards and witches tried to defend and save the muggles and bystanders. Witnesses say that during the chaos, the dark mark appeared in the sky above the campground and nearby forest. This is usually a sign of a lethal attack, although we have not had any confirmation that there were any fatalities. Soon after the dark mark appeared the alleged Death Eaters scattered and the Muggle family was recovered alive. The British Ministry of Magic has not made any official statement as of yet. We will be keeping you updated as we find out more about this devastating attack. Harry was there, what about Harry? Sirius clawed at the radio, begging it to answer him, but the news anchor had moved on to other stories. Sirius finally turned to Remus. Mooney, the mark, why would there be a mark if there wasn't a death? Someone died, and Harry was there. Remus was rooted to his spot, and it took a second for him to recover from the shock. He didn't know what to say, but he reached out for Sirius and brought him in close. He didn't have anything else left in him. He was so empty, but he had to find something to say to calm Sirius down. They wouldn't, he was with Arthur and his older boys. They wouldn't, they'd protect him, he's going to be, he's got to be alright. Sirius collapsed onto Remus's lap, unable to hold himself up through his shock. What's going on? You think Harry was at the game? Sarah was trying to grasp the seriousness of the situation, but was still a little confused. I know he was at the game. They got last-minute tickets. He was there. Oh Merlin, he was there. Sirius said before dissolving into a wave of fear. How can we find out if he's okay? Quickly. We don't have time to wait for an owl and it's too far for a Patronus. We could use a muggle phone. Who do we know that has one? Remus asked, grasping for any muggle-born whose phone number he knew. Oi, what about Mary? She's still around. Mary MacDonald. Yeah. Been a few years but I do know her number. But she's been living outside of the wizarding world since the war ended. She'd have less clue of what's going on than us and no way to find out if Harry is okay. Arthur. He's got to have a phone hasn't he? Sirius asked. Oh I'm sure he has several, but he doesn't have one hooked up properly. Oh. Mrs. Fig. Yes, but I don't know her number. Remus answered. What about the Muggle Studies teacher? She's a muggle-born right. Yes, but again, I don't have her number. Remus sighed. You should really keep an address book. Sarah said. The only thing I can think of is the payphone outside Hogsmeade. Remus finally said. Do you think someone would answer? Ian asked. Remus shrugged helplessly. It's the only number I can think of. You don't have a single phone number memorized but you know a phone booth number. Ian said quizzically. No, it's not the only number I have memorized, it's just the only one of any use to us, Remus said. Why? Ian asked. Because the others are actual muggles who don't even know who Harry is, let alone if he's dead or alive, Remus shouted in frustration. What I wouldn't give for James's compact mirrors now, Sirius said. Oh, I do have those, they're both in a box in our bedroom, Remus remembered excitedly. You have them? We should have given one to Harry at the beginning of the summer. They're no use to us when he doesn't have one. Sirius shouted, taking his frustrations out on Remus. I'm sorry, I didn't remember they were there, did I? It has been twelve years, and those were always a thing between you and James, so if anyone should have remembered them it should have been you. Remus took a breath. He shouldn't be shouting at Sirius right now, they had to find a solution. He had to be the sensible one. We have to try something. Sirius demanded. Okay, we just need to find a phone ourselves, and figure out how to call out of the country, Remus said, gathering the threads of a plan to try to keep them both from coming undone. I think I could find one at WIJ, we have a few muggle contacts that require us to use them, Sarah said. Let's go, Sirius said, standing and heading for the door. What about packing? Sarah asked. Who cares? Sirius said wildly. What about Buckbeak? There could still be poachers. 
Remus said. This did give Sirius a moment of pause. I'll stay and continue packing. I will keep an eye on him until you return, Ian offered. Thank you, my love, Sarah said as she kissed him goodbye. If you need to rest, please do so. You are just as exhausted as us, she whispered to him. I'll be okay, he said as he kissed her back. Go, he finished saying as Sirius pulled her away. Come on, he said as he pushed her and remissed to the door. They all operated into an alley a few blocks from the WIJ and made their way as fast as three people who had been up all night could manage. Sarah led them through the deserted halls toward the Muggle Liaison Division. We employ a whole division of magical-born muggles to liaison with the muggle community when necessary and to protect our secrecy from the public. Squibs, Sirius asked, bemused. Yes, although we don't use that term here, it's offensive and demeaning. Oh, I apologize. I meant no offense. Sirius said, mollified. Good. Ah, here we are, a phone. Sarah exclaimed as they found what they were looking for in the first of the many cubicles. Great. Now Remus, call the number quickly. Sirius said impatiently. Me? Yes, you. You're the one that apparently still has that number memorized from calling your ex every trip to Hogsmeade. Okay, first off, I gave him this number. I dialed his number. You don't even know how it works. Secondly, it's more complicated when it's out of the country and I've never done that before. Whoa, what is all the shouting going on? Sarah, is that you? An older man with thinning white hair and a full beard approached them from down the hall. Tim, I didn't realize anyone would be here on a Sunday. Sarah said. Yes, well I'm preparing for the town hall tomorrow. Members of the city have started a campaign to paint over our mural if you can believe it. Oh, that's going to be a nightmare if it happens. The charm work that went into the mural to make it a passageway was extensive. Yeah, which is why I'm preparing my remarks on why it should stay. Tim said, then glanced at Remus and Sirius. What brings you in on a Sunday, especially this one? We need to make a long-distance phone call to Scotland. I don't suppose you could help us with that. It's rather urgent we get a hold of someone. Of course, I'd be happy to help. He sat down at the desk pulled a booklet from a drawer, and picked up the phone. After punching in a series of numbers, he then asked for the number they were calling, which Remus supplied. He then put it on speakerphone so everyone could hear it ringing. It could take a minute, Remus said after a while. Ring. It's pretty far out of town, Sirius said. Ring. Yeah, but there's still houses and people around, Remus said. Ring. Do you think they're actually going to hear it? Sarah asked. Ring. There's also that pub, the Hog's Head. Remus went on. Click. You really think Aberforth is going to pick up? Sirius said incredulously. Hello. A gravelly voice came from the phone's speaker. All four had spun to face the device. Hello. Hello. Remus said after he came out of his stunned state. Who's this? This is Remus Lupin. May I ask who I'm speaking with? This is Aberforth, but it sounds like you might have been calling for me. He said, the confusion coming through the disembodied voice. What do you mean? Remus asked. When I picked up the phone someone was saying my name, they said, you really think Aberforth is going to pick up? Sirius put his hand to his forehead. Right, I was just not sure if anyone was going to pick up. It was a bit of a long shot. Remus said. Well, I did. Now what do you want? Aberforth said gruffly, obviously growing tired of this conversation already. Yes, it's a bit of an emergency. See, I am out of the country and I just heard the news about the cup. Yeah, that was a shame. What was Crumb thinking? Am I right? No. Okay, well to each his own, I suppose. No, sorry, I don't mean the cup. I'm talking about the riot after the cup. Remus continued. Oh yes, that's terrible news. Yeah, and we, I need to make sure Harry is okay. He was there at the cup and I know there was a dark mark over the riot and I just need to find out if, if he's... Remus couldn't finish the sentence. Harry who? Aberforth asked. Harry Potter. Oh, what makes you think I would know? This is the only number I had memorized. Could you go to Dumbledore and have him call me back? I'll give you the number. 
Remus explained. You already talking to a Dumbledore, Aberforth said, as though he'd had to say it a thousand times before. Of course, I'm sorry, he was my teacher, then my boss, it's what I'm used to calling him. Could you please go to Albus or send him a Patronus and give him our message? There was a long sigh on the other end of the phone. Hold on, let me find some paper. They could hear rustling on the other end of the phone. While he looked for paper, Remus mimed to Tim to write down the number to the phone. Tim took a notepad and a biro and wrote down the number as well as the instructions on how to call it from Scotland. Okay, I'm ready, Aberforth said. Remus read out what Tim had written down on the paper. Did you get all that? Yeah. Say, Remus, why are you in Switzerland? Remus looked up at Sirius. I took a vacation. Okay. Was his only response. Listen, Aberforth, this is a bit of an emergency. So you said. Could you get that message to Albus as fast as you can? There was another long sigh. I suppose. But you owe me. Absolutely. Anything you need. Right. Okay, I'm gonna hang up now. By Aberforth, and thank you again, Remus said as the phone cut off the connection. Remus let out his own sigh. Anyone going to stop and think about how we just gave Albus Dumbledore the number to the WIJ? He's going to know you are in Switzerland now, Sarah said. Technically we just gave Aberforth Dumbledore the number to the WIJ, Remus clarified. My own safety isn't really my priority right now, Sirius said, ignoring Remus's comment. Which is exactly why I'm bringing this up. It's my job to protect you, and you're giving them everything they need to come and get you. They aren't going to come and get us. Albus is one of the few people who knows the truth, Sirius said. His eyes were still on the phone. That and he's already found us once and let us go, Remus added. This is absolutely preposterous, Sarah said, almost under her breath. This is important. This is my godson, and he might be dead. I don't care if they drag me back to Azkaban. I need to know he's not dead. Sirius yelled as tears sprang from his eyes. Remus stood from his chair and brought Sirius into his arms. Albus is going to call us back and then we'll know. And nobody's going to come for us. Whatever his motivations, Albus wants us alive and out of Azkaban too. Sirius held on to Remus tighter. I'm here, we're in this together, and nothing is going to change that, okay? Sirius didn't reply but he nodded his head against Remus's chest. It took another twenty minutes for the phone to ring. By then Sirius had calmed down a little, and they had all taken seats around the desk, watching the phone. Remus picked it up on the first ring. Hello. Hello, this is Albus, with whom am I speaking? Albus said on the other end of the phone. This is Remus, one second Albus. He put his hand over the receiver and whispered to Tim. Can you put it on speakerphone? Tim quickly pushed a button on the phone, took the phone back from Remus, and put it back on the receiver. Are you still there? Remus asked. I am. Who else is on the line with us? I'm here with a few of my friends, Remus said, wincing. Perhaps you could be a bit more specific. The number you gave me is a Wizards for International Justice number, so you can understand why I'm curious. Hello Albus, this is Sirius. With us are Sarah Quinn and Tim who I just met and don't know his last name, Sirius said. It's Tim Myers, sir, it's a pleasure, Tim said, his face turning crimson. The pleasure is all mine, I'm sure, Albus responded. Great, now that we're all introduced, could you please tell me if Harry is alive or dead, Sirius said, losing his patience. Harry Potter is alive and safe along with Granger and all of the Weasleys at the burrow. I'm sorry I couldn't get a message to you sooner, but seeing as I didn't know where you were, it was difficult to get anything to you faster than an owl, which I did send the moment I knew he was safe. You'll get that letter in a few days. Sirius let out a sigh of relief, as more tears came to his eyes. Thank you, Albus. He croaked out. Could you give us any more information on the attack? The news story was lacking in details, Remus said. I can confirm it was Death Eaters. They attacked and tormented a family of muggles while setting fire to the surrounding campsites. There were injuries and plenty of damaged property, but no deaths. But the dark mark? Yes, that's where it gets a little tricky. Apparently in the chaos, Harry dropped his wand, 
and however cast the dark mark picked it up and used it for the incantation. Harry lost his wand, Sirius said incredulously. Yes, but he has it back now. Albus filled them in on more of the details from the night before. Then once that was done, he changed the topic to Sirius. I was surprised when Aberforth gave me the number and it turned out to be the WIJ. Have you made any new friends there? You don't have to answer that. Sarah interjected. Serious, curious things are beginning to happen here. It would be good if I could have your support. Albus pressed. I am so grateful for all you have done to look into my case and protect me from the ministry, and I want to do all I can to protect Harry, so of course, you have my support. Sirius said. Good, that's good to hear. I'd like to meet with you as soon as possible to discuss this in person. I don't like having this conversation over a pay phone. You don't have to do that, Sirius, and I'd advise against it. Sarah said. Are you his friend or his lawyer? As a matter of fact, I'm both. Sarah said. Sirius, it doesn't have to be in England. We could talk anywhere. I can grab a port key and meet you in Switzerland in an hour. We have a lot to discuss and I don't want to do it like this. Sirius looked from Sarah to Remus, who was shaking his head no. I'm interested in having that conversation, but I'm not making any promises that I would return to England. I'd like Remus and Sarah to be there as well, and I'm sorry but I'd like you to come alone. What, you don't want to bring Tim as well? Sir, please understand, this is very precarious for me, I trust these two with my life and I value their insight. Sirius said. Do you accept his terms? Sarah asked. Of course, just let me know where and when. Remus and Sirius looked at Sarah. At this, Sarah rattled off an address in Geneva. Okay, what time? Tomorrow evening, seven o'clock, Sirius said. I look forward to seeing you then. Albus, Sirius said. Yes. Thank you for returning my call, Sirius said in a softer voice. Of course, Sirius. Goodbye, Sirius said. Goodbye, Albus said and he hung up the phone. This time all four of them let out a sigh of relief. Remus turned to Sirius again and hugged him. He's okay, he whispered in his ear. He's okay. Sirius sobbed back. Chapter 24 Moving After they ended the phone call, they thanked him for his help and left the WIJ. They ducked into an abandoned alley and Sarah sent a Patronus to Ian to see what progress had been made. After about fifteen minutes, a silvery owl flew in front of them and Ian's voice came out of it with a message. Everything is packed up and ready to move. Meet me back at the original cottage. So they all apparated to the old house on the side of a mountain. Ian met them at the door. All of their things were in boxes and had even been shrunk down in size to be easily transported. Is he, is he okay? Ian asked after they entered the house. Yes, he was at the cup, but he wasn't hurt. Albus said there were injuries but no deaths. Remus answered. Good. Ian sighed with relief. Thank you for packing while we were gone. I really appreciate it, Remus said. Don't mention it. Are you ready to go? Ian asked. Yes, same traveling arrangements as this morning, Sirius asked, but Remus knew it wasn't up for debate. Fine with me, Sarah replied. Let's get going. After that Sirius and Remus said their goodbyes, and as Remus turned to Sarah he reminded her. With your life. I promise. Remus nodded. Ian and Remus watched Sirius and Sarah take off on Buckbeak, then they apparated away. The new cabin was closer to Geneva than their last one but still had plenty of land between them and any neighbors. Ian and Remus set down the boxes, then set to work casting protective spells over the new place. Once they were satisfied, they went inside to wait for the other two. It shouldn't be more than an hour by now before they get here. Ian said as he sat opposite Remus in his wheelchair. Sure, Remus said as he looked out the window. The events of the day were catching up with him. What had been a dull lake he had pushed to the back of his mind while dealing with more important matters was resurfacing in the still moment. The pain potion he had taken that morning had long since worn off, and he was tired and shaky as well. He did what he could to think of other things, of which there were plenty to choose from. 
He considered everything that had happened, and it began to weigh on him. After sitting in silence for several minutes, Remus finally said, Ian, I am so sorry. For what? For bringing this chaos into your lives. We shouldn't have. I shouldn't have involved anyone else. We are on the run, and I just dropped in on an old friend. Why did I not think this would drag her down with us? Remus, last night wasn't your fault, oh Siriasus. If it wasn't for you and Sirius, our whole pack would have been turned over to poachers, there's no way we would have been able to defend ourselves if we hadn't been forewarned. Even with us having that head start, you were the last one standing, Remus. If it weren't for you, we would have been defeated before Natalie showed up. Remus's head jerked away from the window to meet Ian's gaze. I wasn't, you all were fine, and we didn't lose anyone, I wasn't the last one. I came to consciousness and saw you standing near the window, volleying spells left and right. Everyone else was on the ground, you were it. This was unnerving to Remus, but he couldn't let himself think too much about it just then. He returned to his original thought. But all of it, not the poachers maybe, but all the rest, you haven't had a wink of sleep, you've been running around getting us new lodging and then we abandoned you to pack up our home and dragged Sarah back to work the day after a moon. She's going to be in a dangerous situation tomorrow, all in the name of protecting Sirius and me, and she's still out there risking her life for us. I can't, I should never have. Stop, stop it, Remus. This is what friends do for each other. You deserve to have friends. You are good, kind, and protective. You are a wise and a seasoned fighter. I am honored to call you a packmate, a brother. Don't for one second let yourself be fooled into believing that the world would somehow be better off if you were cut off from it. If it wasn't for you, Sirius would be dead a couple times over by my count, and so would our pack. If it wasn't for you, Sirius would still not know if Harry was alive or dead. You're the one that brought him to the WIJ and gave him a chance at freedom, real freedom, for the first time in over a decade. You've been a breath of fresh air to Sarah and me, we both value your friendship. You've helped me understand my wife's past a little better, and you've reminded me a lot of myself when I first met her. Without you, all of our lives would be a hell of a lot worse, and more importantly, you don't deserve to be alone. Even if it wasn't obvious, the ways you intertwine and create change for the better, you will still be worthy of love, friendship, and community, just by being you. You aren't broken, Remus, you've faced a lot of hardship, but it hasn't irreparably damaged you, you hear me. Ian had leaned forward in his chair and grabbed Remus's knee. Remus rested his hand on Ian's shoulder and used his other to wipe the tears from his eyes. He didn't say anything, he couldn't get a word out through the lump in his throat but nodded his head in answer. After a while, Remus composed himself. They both leaned back in their chairs. This time Ian broke the silence with his own inner turmoil. If this was Martin's doing, I of all people should have seen it coming. What do you mean? Ian sighed. I've worked with Martin a lot over the last year, one on one. We went over my meditation techniques and I just generally tried to help him reshape his view of the world. He'd been a part of one pack for, what, the decade, and they severely warped his view of himself and of the wizarding world at large. It had been an especially abusive pack and both he and Lena had been at the bottom of it. I thought we had made some progress, but maybe it wasn't enough. He came up with an excuse the last few times I asked to meet up with him, I should have suspected something was wrong. Lena was the one thing that tethered him to us. They formed a real bond in their old pack, it had been them against the world, and they fought for each other until they were kicked out. Then Lena found out about the WIJ and Martin trailed after her. Lena, she's really come into her own this last year. She's been working with Sarah and Greta, and she's embraced the new opportunities she's been given. It's so odd how the same event can shatter one person's world and mend another. It's not your fault either, Ian. You see the light in people, even when the only proof of the light is the shadows it casts. You saw the good in him and tried to make the light shine brighter, but it's his choice, in the end, to embrace the light or the shadows. Do you think we are jumping to conclusions? Sirius was so upset, it made me feel ashamed that we could turn on one of our own so quickly. Now I don't know what to think. Sirius and I saw a little too much of ourselves reflected back at us this morning. What do you mean? 
I don't know if you know the details of what happened, but Sirius was a loyal friend to the end, and he went down for the murder of his best friends, his brother, really, and he didn't do it. Everyone even I thought he did it, and no one even gave him the chance to defend himself. Given that, is it any surprise that he would try to stick up for Martin? I don't know Martin at all really, so I can't say one way or the other if you are right about him. Certainly, people have done worse over a broken heart. Even though I was wrong about Sirius, James and Lily were still betrayed by one of their closest friends, one that no one suspected. So if Sirius wasn't so clouded by his own hurt, he might realize that Martin may be a reflection not of himself but of Peter. Remus paused to gather his thoughts. All that to say, Sirius is right about one thing. You better be damned sure it's him, with solid evidence, and a fair trial before you let Natalie lock him away, or you will regret it for the rest of your life. And yes, I'm the one projecting now. Now it was Ian's turn to nod in silent agreement. They heard the sound of hooves in the field out back and both their heads swiveled to look out the window at Buckbeak Landing. Remus started towards the door as Ian got up from his chair and grabbed his cane as he moved to meet them outside. Remus was having flashbacks to the night Sirius landed for the first time in Switzerland, covered in his own blood. However, when he came back to the present, he saw Sirius and Sarah already dismounting Buckbeak, looking exhausted, but otherwise whole and unharmed. He let out a heavy sigh of relief as he hovered over to Sirius. They had just seen each other less than two hours ago, but they still embraced as if it had been weeks. They parted, but still held on to each other's hand. Safe and sound, just as promised, Sarah said to Remus. Thank you, for everything, Remus said packing the words with all the raw emotions he was feeling. Now you two should go inside and get some rest. I'm going to take Sarah home and do the same, Ian said. Of course, thank you both. Sirius said. Send me a Patronus when you wake tomorrow, and we'll get together before our meeting and discuss our strategy. Sarah said. We will, goodbye. Remus said. Bye. Bye. They both called as they apparated away. Sirius leaned in as soon as they were away and kissed Remus. Come to bed, my love. Lead the way, carry on. Remus said, and they made their way inside and crawled into the bed where they finally embraced sleep in each other's arms. Chapter 25 New Plans Monday, August 22, 1994 They slept long and hard and would have slept longer, but Sirius startled awake, shaking and calling out for Harry. Remus woke up with him. Sirius, it was a dream. He soothed, and as soon as it looked like Sirius was aware of where he was, Remus sat up with him, reached out, and rubbed his back. I know, Sirius whispered, but he was still shaking. You called out for Harry this time. Did I? Sirius said as his shaking lessened. He lay back down facing Remus, and Remus laid down with him. Want to talk about it? Sirius was quiet for a long time, and he moved closer, resting his head on Remus's shoulder. I dreamt of Harry running for his life through a forest, and there were people all around running. There were wicks in the distance fighting, and flashes of spells, and one of them hit Harry and then there was a dark mark, just like, just like. Like the one over James and Lily's place. Remus finished for him and drew him in tightly. I've never had a nightmare like that, about Harry. They've all been. He paused to consider if he wanted to finish his sentence. They've all been about the war or Azkaban. Plenty of nightmare fuel to go around, Remus said dryly. Yeah, Sirius said. They stayed lying in bed for a while longer in each other's arms. How are you doing? Sirius asked after a long while. Awful. Remus felt like he had a massive hangover, and his whole body ached. It feels like all the moons I spent alone. You used all the energy you gained from the presence of the pact to fight to protect us all. None of it went to healing you. Yeah, but the medic gave me a potion for that. Remus brushed off his explanation. He gave you a strengthening potion, and those effects diminish over time. It was enough to keep you moving yesterday until we went to bed early. It may have enough to carry you through till tomorrow, but after that, it will fade. Now you are starting to feel all the effects of the moon and the attack plus being active all day yesterday with little rest. It's all catching up to you. 
You were always better than me at potions, I suppose you would know. Remus sighed and closed his eyes. His legs and arms felt heavier and hard to move. Did you notice if the meditation helped at all? I know yesterday wasn't the best test run, what with all the other activity. Sirius ran his fingers through Remus's hair as they talked. Remus opened his eyes again. You know, I didn't even think about that until just now. He paused for a moment and thought through the last 24 hours. Everything was so hectic, it's a little hard to tell, but I think that in and of itself is an improvement on last time. There was no feeling of loss or loneliness, but I was with Ian or Sarah the whole day, so maybe that was why. I don't know for sure, but I think it helped, I really do. Oh good, I'm so glad. Sirius looked truly relieved that Remus might have some hope of a better full moon experience each month. He kissed him on his forehead. He was silent for a moment longer. Remus could tell he was debating with himself. About what the medic said. I'm fine. Remus cut him off. But if you weren't fine, if you needed help, we could figure it out. I've told you, I've been through worse. I don't need to see a healer. Can we move on? Sirius was quiet as he lay still with his head resting on Remus's chest. Okay, Mooney. Remus sighed. Thank you. They lay like that in silence for a long time, until finally Sirius broke it by changing the subject. I didn't get the chance to tell you yesterday, but seeing Mooney with the pack was magnificent, terrifying, but magnificent. Really? Remus asked, surprised. Oh yeah, you were so stunning, and seeing you interacting with the pack was incredible. There was this moment when you and I were facing off with the entire pack, and then Buckbeak reared up on his hind legs and scared them all off. But then by the end of the night, we were able to make friends with the pack, and they accepted me, just like you do. Sirius was staring at the ceiling, a huge grin on his face from the memory of last night. Remus looked at his joy-filled face, and something clicked in his brain that he never considered before. Sirius. Hmm. Tell me about Mooney. Sirius finally looked back at him. What do you mean? Is he like me? I mean, do you see him as a different creature, or do you see him as me? Oh. Sirius pondered that for a while before answering. He's you, to me. Of course, I only ever see him as Padfoot, so there's that filter, but when I think about how I see you as Padfoot and how I see Mooney as Padfoot, yeah, it's the same. Does that make sense? I think so, Remus answered. There is so much of you in Mooney. Sirius said affectionately. Like what? Well, take last night. The instant Mooney saw me you defended me immediately. And it was you and I, ride or die, even against your packmates. I don't know what I was expecting, but I don't think I was expecting Mooney to choose me over an actual pack. Sirius explained. Hem. Remus wasn't sure he liked where this was going. No, I mean, obviously you would, you have. But as a wolf, in the midst of your pack, all of a sudden I was there and you joined me. That's what I mean when I say he's like you, that's something you would do. Remus softened again at Sirius's explanation. And then at the end of the night, we met up again with the pack, and you nudged me, like you wanted me to be friends with your friends. So we tried again, and this time it worked, and I was there in the pack. That's so like you too. You just want your pack to be understood by the outsiders. You just want everyone to get along. Remus met Sirius's eyes again and finally smiled. Thank you, for telling me. Anything for my Mooney. They stayed like that for a while longer, willing time to stop moving. All I want to do is lay here all day. Remus sighed, his eyes were closed again. That's okay, you can stay here. But we have to talk to Sarah. Remus moaned. We'll have her come to us. They had gone to bed at five o'clock last night, but it was now past nine in the morning. Sirius made breakfast, and then sent a Patronus to Sarah, hoping he wouldn't wake her and Ian up. They finished their breakfast in bed and Sirius was just finishing the dishes when the luminous rabbit entered the kitchen along with Sarah's voice. I'll be over around noon to start preparations for tonight's meeting. Sirius took a shower, and they both changed clothes before Sarah showed up at their door at noon. Remus was seated on the sofa and didn't rise to greet Sarah. After they settled in the sitting room with tea, they got down to business. So where should we start? Sarah asked. She was met with silence as Remus and Sirius glanced at each other. We haven't really had time to think about it. I have no idea where to start. 
Remus said finally. Okay, that's fine. Let's start with what you would like to get out of the meeting. Sarah prompted. Right. Sirius said, but then paused again. I think the biggest concern now, and perhaps always, is Harry's safety. I'd like to know more details about what Albus is doing to assure his safety at Hogwarts. Right, because we didn't get many details over the phone, Remus said. It would be good to know if they have any leads on who the Death Eaters from the other night were. Sarah had brought out some parchment, and was taking notes. What about you and your case? Of course, we should ask him about Moody and what kind of steps have been made by Kingsley to prove my innocence, Sirius said. And what about your role with the WIJ? He now knows that you are working with us and he knows your lawyer's name. What do you want to disclose to him about our work together? Sarah asked. Knowing Dumbledore, if he hadn't already known who you were, he will know it by tonight. He'll know all about you and the work you do, Remus said. So he'll know I'm seeking asylum, Sirius said. I could be helping Remus, Sarah offered. No, he'll know it's for Sirius. He knows I wouldn't seek asylum while my fugitive boyfriend just hangs out. Besides, you already told him you were Sirius's lawyer on the phone. Remus rubbed his sweaty palms over his knees. He can know we are seeking asylum for you. He doesn't have to know you are going after Azkaban. Hasn't he spoken out publicly against the use of Dementors at Azkaban? Wouldn't he be in favor of our efforts? Sarah asked. Perhaps under different circumstances, but I think he has other plans for us. That's the real crux of the matter, Remus explained. What is? Sarah asked. We shouldn't be preparing for what we want to get out of the meeting, we should be preparing for what he wants to get from us, Remus replied. Oh, and what is that? Sarah asked. Remus and Sirius exchanged another look before Sirius spoke. He wants us back to help fight another war. Another war? What war? You aren't referring to the attack last night at the Cup, are you? That was just the last dying breaths of a movement that ended years ago. She looked at them both. Sirius shook his head. Voldemort's return is looking more and more likely at this point. What? How? Sarah didn't understand. We are talking about the most powerful dark wizard of our time, if not all time. He was always looking for ways to cheat death, and he probed deep into the dark arts. He's already tried to return twice, and I believe that was just the tremors before the earthquake. He's coming back, and it's only a matter of time. A matter of when and where, Remus explained. Okay, so let's say I believe you. That's all the more reason for you both to stay here, Sarah said. But Sirius was shaking his head. If only it was that easy. If only we could turn our backs on all of Wizarding Britain and run away together, actually have a life together, one not filled with fear. But it's not that simple. Harry is over there and there is nothing that Voldemort won't do to get to him. We can't just watch from afar. If we had been there, we could have helped protect him, or at the very least been within an operation trip, or range of a Patronus message. As it was, it was over 12 hours before we were able to get a hold of someone. Sirius ran his hand through his hair in frustration. Not this again, Sarah said, not hiding her disappointment. I, I haven't made up my mind, Sirius said quietly. Because it would be suicide, Remus shouted, glaring at Sirius. Some things are worth risking your life for, and Harry is absolutely one of them, Sirius said, returning the glare. Sirius. Sarah started and then took a moment before continuing. Think about this, you staying here, it's not just about your safety. We're working towards the reformation of Wizarding Britain's penal system. This work could save hundreds of lives and improve the conditions of hundreds more. I realize there will be sacrifices. Sacrifices? You want me to sacrifice Harry's safety? Sirius stood and started pacing. No, that's not what I was saying. The sacrifice would be your connection or vicinity to Harry. Yes, it will be harder to communicate and get news, but families have lived further apart and still maintained relationships. I know you don't trust Dumbledore's motivations, but you must see that he is the most powerful wizard of our time. Do you really think your being there will make any difference? If Dumbledore can't protect him, what makes you think you can? Sarah pleaded. Sirius looked as though his breath had been taken away from him. He was quiet for a long time before speaking and when he finally did, it was quieter than before. Sarah, 
I truly hope that you never have to see the things that I have seen. He paused again before continuing. But when you fight in a war, and see the overwhelming power of injustice swiftly decimate everyone you care about, when you cannot go a week without losing another comrade, you realize just how crucial and fleeting each person is, and you see how even the most important, most influential have little say in how things actually turn out. It was a fluke, Sarah. The defeat of the Dark Lord was a fluke. Nobody can really explain why it happened, maybe Dumbledore knows, but I certainly don't know why he died that night. I can tell you it wasn't Dumbledore who took him down, it wasn't strategic. I can also tell you that had he not gone down that night by some roll of the dice by who knows what power, we would have lost that war and... Sirius looked at Remus before continuing with a voice thick from holding back tears. Remus and I would have died trying to stop it, despite the fact that we no longer trusted anyone around us. Despite the fact that we were young and had the rest of our lives ahead of us. Despite the fact that we could have run, we could have dropped the war and escaped with our lives, but we didn't because when you are up against a force that you believe with all your heart is wrong, every person who stands up against it matters. Every single one. So yes, I may die, but it won't be because I was insignificant. None of those people who fought or died in that war, our friends, none of them were insignificant. By the end of Sirius's speech, Remus couldn't take it anymore. He tore his eyes away from Sirius's gaze which felt like it was staring into his soul. He stood up and stumbled towards the bedroom, barely containing the sob before the door was shut. He hugged the wall and slowly slid down to find the floor. Somewhere in the other room, he could hear Sarah and Sirius talking, but he couldn't make out the words. Finally, there was a soft knock on the door before Sirius poked his head around. Can I come in? If you must. Remus had recovered some of his composure before Sirius had come to find him, but he still couldn't meet his gaze. Sirius walked over, knelt, and sat next to him, leaning against the wall so they were shoulder to shoulder. Mooney, I'm sorry, I know you're mad at me for wanting to go back, Sirius said, looking at the wall opposite them. Mad, I'm not mad, I'm ashamed. Remus croaked out around the lump in his throat. Ashamed? Of me? Sirius said confused. No, I'm ashamed of myself. He sobbed. Ever since I saw you in that shack, all I could think about was how to save you. How to save us so that we could hold on to each other for as long as we possibly could. That's why I convinced you to leave England, and why I wrote to Sarah, why I didn't consult you before talking to her. It's why I was so opposed to correspondence from Dumbledore and Moody. I kept thinking to myself, how can I stop this from happening again, how can I keep from losing you again? I stopped caring about anything else. I convinced myself that Harry was safe without us, but you're right. Of course, you're right. There are things in this world, people in our lives more important than you and I, I thought, selfishly, that I had given enough, that it was someone else's turn now, but you're right. Every person who stands up matters, and if I am to be remembered at all, I want it to be as someone who stood up, not as someone who ran away. Mooney, you have nothing to be ashamed of. Your goal has been to protect me, that's not selfish. Maybe so. Remus leaned his head against Sirius's shoulder. How's Sarah taking it? Oh, she's livid. She thinks I'm making a huge mistake. She's trying to figure out a way to bring Harry here to Switzerland. Sirius raised the pitch of his voice to mimic Sarah. If I can't stop you from returning to Harry, I'll just have to bring Harry here. Really? Mooney asked, finally looking up at Sirius. But he was shaking his head. There's no way Dumbledore would let that happen though. A girl can dream, can't she? Sarah's voice came from the open doorway. Mind if I join you? By all means, Remus said looking up at her. She sat down on the carpet opposite them and leaned against the bed frame. I'm sorry for what I said in there, that was out of line. The two of you are the opposite of insignificant. Which is why I think we should all stop telling ourselves that getting Harry here is impossible. If you have a plan I would love to hear it. Sirius invited. I didn't get a chance to tell you this earlier because our conversation very quickly derailed, but I went into the office this morning before I came here. Sirius, I know you are worried that what happened yesterday will be a problem, but it isn't. You did nothing wrong and, in fact, saved seven lives. It put this seal on the approval. What? How? We have no proof of my innocence. Sirius was shocked. I have a few connections in Britain. I was able to get a copy of your case file. 
I told them it was for research purposes, becoming familiar with fugitives at large. I knew you never had a trial, you told me that, but they botched that investigation. They never even examined your wand for its last spell. Sure, there were witnesses, muggle witnesses. What muggle would testify that they saw a man turn into a rat, even if they had been able to see it? Their account is biased by their lack of understanding of magic. Your explanation is just as valid as theirs, and it was never investigated. Add to that your inhumane imprisonment, and there is quite enough reason for your asylum plea. Sarah, that's wonderful, and I'm so grateful for everything you've done to help me, truly from the bottom of my heart. Sirius paused. But this doesn't change the fact that Harry is still in danger. It absolutely does. See, given that we do not recognize you as a condemned convict, but rather as an innocent wrongly imprisoned without a trial, it also means we recognize you as the godfather and legal guardian for Harry. We just have to get him here, and he could be included in your asylum, not to mention he more than qualifies for his own asylum plea given all you have shared about his treatment at home and school. That's, that's incredible. Remus exclaimed. Okay, so that's great, but logistically speaking, how are we going to wrest him away from Dumbledore and all of Wizarding Britain? Sirius asked. We talk to Dumbledore tonight and convince him this is not only possible, but the safest place for Harry. The reality of asylum is, you don't have to get permission from the original country, and it is meant to be anonymous. Dumbledore brings him here, we don't have to tell Wizarding Britain. Under normal circumstances, sure but people are going to notice he's missing the second he doesn't show up for the train. They're going to investigate, Sirius argued. We'll figure something out, but by then he'll be here and under our protection. Unless they want to start a war over an asylum case, there's not going to be much they can legally do, Sarah responded. Can you imagine the profit headlines? Escaped convict kidnaps the boy who lived, Sirius quipped. Harry Potter snatched by Sirius in Switzerland. Remus countered. Oh, that one's good. Sirius chuckled. Asylum in the Alps for exonerated war hero and godson. Sarah interjected. Hmm, well, I like the message. Sirius said. But it could use some polishing. Remus finished his thought for him. All right, I get it, you're skeptical, but at least let me try. It's definitely not going to happen if we don't try. Sarah pleaded. Sirius and Remus turned to look at each other. All right, let's see what you can do, miracle worker, Sirius said. Chapter 26, A Meeting with Dumbledore After their meeting, Sarah returned to her office and set to work making arrangements to add Harry Potter to the asylum plea. Sirius and Remus didn't see her again until they met up at the prearranged location to meet Dumbledore which Sarah had decided to hold in a private conference room at the WIJ main headquarters. How are you feeling? Are you ready? Sarah asked them as they settled into the room. Remus had opted to use his cane. His chair would have been more comfortable, but he didn't want to get any questions about it from Dumbledore, and he didn't want to appear worse or weaker in some way than the last time he had seen him. He wasn't sure what Dumbledore's response would be and didn't want any other variables to affect this meeting. We're as ready as we'll ever be, Sirius responded. Remus searched Sarah's face with knowing eyes. How are you? It's been a rough few days for us all and then you went to work on top of that today. This is important, I'll rest tomorrow, she said then glanced at the clock on the wall. It's almost time. I'm going to go meet Dumbledore at the entrance and walk him in. Stay here. I'll be right back. Remus squeezed Sirius's knee under the conference table. A few minutes passed before the door opened again and Sarah led Albus Dumbledore inside. Sirius and Remus both stood and greeted him. Remus, Sirius, it is so good to see you both again. I hope you have been well. Albus greeted cheerily. We have, thank you, Remus said, decidedly not mentioning the attack they had just two days prior. How have you been? Oh, very busy. School is about to start, so preparations fill my days as always. Please, everyone have a seat. Sarah ushered them all to the round table with eight chairs around it. Dumbledore took a seat to the left of the door, and Remus and Sirius sat down in the chairs opposite. Sarah sat between them on the other side of the table, facing the door. In the middle of the table was a tea set, and a variety of fruit, cheese, 
and nuts on a charcuterie board. Please help yourself to food. Would anyone like tea? Yes, please, Remus said. His throat was suddenly very dry. Sarah levitated the teapot to pour them each a cup. Lovely, thank you, Albus said as he accepted the tea. No one touched the food. Thank you both for meeting me in person. Of course, Dumbledore. I'm glad we could meet, Sirius replied. Good. Well, as you know, there has been a recent Death Eater attack and rumors of further activity. I wanted to check in with you both to see how you were doing and to make sure I could count on your support if this disturbing trend continues. We're both shocked by this recent attack and that it was so close to Harry is terrifying. We must make every effort to get ahead of any Death Eater resurgence. Do you know who was involved in the attack? Sirius asked. Unfortunately, they dispersed before any could be captured. But there are a few usual suspects, if I was forced to take a guess. You mentioned other unusual activity. What does that include? Remus interjected. A witch by the name of Bertha Jorkins has gone missing, for one thing. Bertha, a few years ahead of us, never could stop talking. Sirius asked. That's the one. She went on holiday in Albania and never returned. Albania, you say? That's intriguing. Remus responded. Indeed. He and Remus shared a look, both knowing there was no need to elaborate further on the significance of this. Well, of course, we want to do what we can, and we have come up with a perfect way for us to help. Sirius started, putting on his best pureblood facade. Perfect, I'm glad to know you are on board. You know I am always open to new ideas, but I do have some ideas of my own on how you could be most useful. First, why don't you fill me in on what you've been doing with the WIJ? Remus caught Sarah's glance, and knew it meant a silence you don't have to answer that, but responded anyway. Oh, I know Sarah from years ago, and I wrote to her when we arrived in Switzerland. Once we met, she told me about her work at the WIJ. Remus paused and looked at Sirius, who picked up the train of thought. Yes, and through our conversations, Sarah let me know that I would qualify for asylum through the wizarding Swiss government. Asylum? Well, I suppose congratulations are in order, Albus said, smiling at Sirius. Oh, that's good to hear. I wasn't sure if that would go along with your plans. Sirius answered, taking another sip of his tea. What kind of friend would I be if I didn't congratulate you on finding safety? I must say I am a little surprised by this route. I would have thought, given the efforts you went through to find out if Harry was alive yesterday, that you would want to be closer to him, but if this is your decision, I won't stand in your way. You're absolutely right. Harry is extremely important to me. His safety is my number one concern. Well, you know he's safe under my watchful eye, so you don't need to be concerned about that. Oh, but I am. Sirius countered. Well, I suppose you have a choice to make. Stay here and plead asylum, or come back to Britain and be instrumental in protecting Harry. We've come up with a third option, Remus interjected. And what's that? Sirius cleared his throat and answered. Sarah has also let me know that since I was sentenced without a trial, the Swiss don't recognize my conviction and my legal status as Harry's godfather is still valid. Going over his history, and given my status as his godfather, he qualifies for asylum here as well. So, once he's here, Remus and I will protect and look after Harry with the full protection of the wizarding Swiss government. While that makes sense and would be ideal for you, Harry would be safer under my care at Hogwarts than anything you or the Swiss can provide. We beg to differ. Remus said flatly. Respectfully, Sirius added. Beg however you want, there is no place safer for Harry than Hogwarts. You're the most powerful wizard alive, and Harry still faced Voldemort alone twice inside Hogwarts. You may be powerful, but that means you're also busy, you can't guard Harry 24 hours a day, and one might argue it's not the best use of your skills. We, on the other hand, may not be as powerful as you, but we are committed to protecting Harry with our lives. We have the time and resources to keep him safe. Sirius explained. He must stay with his aunt and uncle until he turns 17. Why, Dumbledore, they abuse him, surely you're aware of that. Remus pleaded. I am aware that his circumstances there are less than ideal, but because he stays with a blood relative, he is protected through his mother's sacrifice. Remus and Sirius stared at each other incredulously before Sirius responded. You're keeping Harry in an abusive home so that he can have some basic level of ancient magical protection. It already saved him once his first year when he encountered Voldemort. 
He wouldn't have needed that protection if you hadn't lured Voldemort to Hogwarts by hiding the Philosopher's Stone there, or if someone had listened to Harry when he came to them for help, Remus said, trying not to raise his voice. I understand your original motives for placing him in his aunt's care, but once you knew they were abusing him, surely there were other options. And even if there weren't then, there are now. Sirius is ready, willing, and able to take care of him. I have already explained my motivations to you, the fact that you don't agree with them doesn't change that. Sirs, please, let's take a breath. Sarah said from her seat between them. Dumbledore, if you please, do you recognize Sirius's innocence? I do. So given that, you also recognize his position as Harry's godfather and legal guardian. I recognize he is Harry's godfather, but under British law, his aunt and uncle are his legal guardians. Britain unfortunately doesn't recognize his innocence. Fair enough, but you recognize that it was his parents' wish to have Sirius look after him and make decisions for him in the case of their death. Yes. So given that, since you recognize Sirius's innocence and his place as Harry's godfather, shouldn't his decision to take Harry out of Hogwarts have some weight? As his friend, I sympathize, much like I would with a friend who has lost custody in a divorce, but legally my opinion doesn't matter. But we in Switzerland do recognize his legal guardianship of Harry. I am still a British citizen living in Britain, as is Harry. You don't have jurisdiction over Hogwarts. Albus sat undaunted. Now, I have listened to your plan. Would you do me the same kindness and allow me to share my plan with you? Everyone at the table stared at him as if they had not fully processed what just happened. Albus continued to talk unabashedly. Harry will be safe at Hogwarts. I already let you know that none other than Alastair Moody will be there to keep an eye on him. I know you expressed a desire to be close by in case you were needed, so I was able to scout out a subterranean shelter in the hills beyond Hogsmeade that would offer you a place to stay. You want him to stay in a cave? Remus barked. I'm also looking into the possibility of you taking up residence at your house. Dumbledore continued. I don't have a house. You mean our old flat? Sirius said. No, Grimwald Place, of course. You are the last heir. The house belongs to you. The color drained from Sirius's face, and his eyes lost focus on the room. Remus reached over under the table and squeezed his knee to try to bring him back. With all the protective wards on the house binding it to the Black family lineage, no one has been able to repurpose it or even enter it. Undoubtedly some age-old magic, but you might just be able to enter and reclaim it. Absolutely not, Remus said. Sirius was still struggling to find words. Sirius hasn't entered that house since he ran away at 16. There's no way he can return to the house of his childhood abuse. Have you no appreciation for what that would do to him to be stuck alone in that place? He wouldn't have to be alone. If this develops like it did the first time, we need to be proactive. We must start now. We could make it a headquarters for any resistance or strategies we may need to make down the road. As for you, Remus, I know it was unfortunate that your status was revealed, but we can use that to our advantage. You may be able to reintegrate into werewolf society and finish the important work you already started years ago. Which was what, exactly? Remind me what that important work was, I'd like to see if you remember. Remus was barely holding back now. Remus, I realize the last decade has been difficult for you, but I know how much you still desire to break down the stigma around werewolves and increase their quality of life in Britain. All right, I think we should take a break, Sarah said as she watched Remus carefully. We don't need to take a break, I've already heard all I need to hear, there's no need to continue any further, Remus said. He wished he could jump up and storm out, but he didn't trust his legs to cooperate. I'm sorry to hear that but I'm afraid it's really up to Sirius. I'll leave you to think it over, but know this, if you want to have any kind of influence on your godson's life, you're going to have to be in England to do it, you know this to be true. Dumbledore moved to stand up from the table when Sirius finally found his voice again. Wait. Dumbledore sat back in his chair. I'm listening. Sirius squeezed Remus's knee under the table before responding. I'll go back to England. I'll live in a cave. Fuck it. I'll even go to grim old place if you want, he said, his shoulders sagging in defeat. Serious, no, what on earth? Remus sounded incredulous. If that's what it takes to be there to protect Harry, then that's what I'll do. What happens to me doesn't matter, this is all for Harry. Sirius responded, 
But he didn't even look at Remus. He kept his eyes on Dumbledore. Wonderful. I knew I could count on you, Sirius. Dumbledore said, sounding jovial again. Shall we be off then? No, I need to wrap up a few things here, but I won't be but a week or so behind you. Sirius said, his eyes already taking on the hollow appearance they had when Remus first saw him in the shrieking shack. No, what just happened? This wasn't the plan, Sirius. What is going on? Remus was shouting now. Stop it, Remus. Sirius finally whipped his head to look at him with a determined look. You know I'd do anything for Harry. What about this is surprising to you? If you go back there's nothing for you but misery, Remus said. You can't stop me. Sirius said it as a matter of fact. Remus held his gaze, then responded just as assuredly. If I can't stop you then I'll just have to go with you. Oh good. I'm so glad you came around to the idea. Dumbledore said, standing up from his chair in a move that let everyone know the discussion was over now that he had what he wanted. Sarah sat bewildered, unable to say anything of value. Dumbledore said his goodbyes, and Sarah escorted him to the exit. When she finally returned, Remus and Sirius were already outside the conference room. What in Merlin's name was that? She only just managed not to shout. Several heads poked up over their cubicles at the disturbance. Let's go to your office, Sarah, we'll continue this there, Sirius said, ushering her in that direction. When they entered her office, she opened her mouth to start her rant, but Sirius held up a finger to his lips. One more moment, if you please. Then nodded at Remus. Mooney. Remus nodded and cast several spells, then nodded again, and a big grin came over his face. We're all clear. Sirius started grinning too, and they both burst into laughter at the same time. What could possibly be so funny? Were we in the same meeting? Sarah said. Remus was leaning against Sirius's shoulder, doubled over in laughter, but he recovered at Sarah's words. He limped over to a chair next to her desk and eased himself down. Go ahead, Sirius, he said. Sirius went to the chair next to Remus and sat down as he started to explain. Yes, I was in the same meeting, and it was clear at the end that Dumbledore wasn't going to help us. Which meant we're going to have to get Harry out ourselves. However, if Dumbledore left the meeting today knowing we were still intent on getting Harry out of England, he would most definitely take steps to further protect Harry from our grasp. So, I realized that the only way we could get Harry would be if Dumbledore believed we had given up our plan and we were returning to England. So, I put on a little show for him. Thankfully Remus caught on. Let's just hope he bought it, and that he won't take extra security steps just in case, Remus said, sobering a little at the thought. Okay, so now what? Sarah asked from where she took her seat behind her desk. Now we go get Harry ourselves, Sirius said. Ourselves? How? Great question, I have no idea, he replied, sagging a little in his chair. Well, let's just take a few moments to think this through, Remus said. So they did. They talked for over an hour, considering different angles and different people they could try to enlist to help them. Each new idea a little more far-fetched than the last. They were all sitting in silence with their faces turned down in varying expressions of deep thought when a knock came to their door. Come in, Sarah said, not standing up. The door opened, and in walked Moody. Chapter 27 Allies. Sirius was on his feet in a flash, wand drawn. Remus drew his wand and jerked his body out of his seat only to get a sharp shot of pain through his hip and fall back into his chair with a groan. He still had his wand drawn and pointed at Moody. Sarah stood and drew her wand as well, but only in reaction to Sirius and Remus's response. Moody, Sirius said, still holding his wand. Moody raised his hands into the air, unarmed. Whoa, hold on, I come in peace. Sirius only lowered his wand an inch or two. What do you want, Moody? Moody took another step in and closed the door. I came to help you. Dumbledore came back from his meeting with you and told me his plan. I came to convince you not to return to England. Sirius lowered his wand a little more. Come again. He told me about your plan and then about his plan, and let me tell you this, if you come back to England, it will end badly for you. Is that a threat? 
Remus said, still pointing his wand at him. No, it's a warning. Dumbledore has a lot of plans, the majority of which he hasn't told anyone, but I know that you two coming into the picture has thrown a wrench into the machinery, and he doesn't like it when his plans get thwarted. If you come back to England, sooner or later, you will be removed, by the ministry, or in a battle, or some accident, I don't know, but he'll find a way of removing this obstacle from his path. Hold on, Dumbledore may have many ulterior motives but do you really think he would purposely put his allies in harm's way? Sirius said incredulously. Do you seriously not see how he's already done that specifically with the both of you? You aren't insinuating that Dumbledore was behind Sirius's conviction? Remus asked. Not directly, but he absolutely could have pushed for a trial or a cleaner investigation and instead pushed in the opposite direction. I am, however, absolutely insinuating that he had a lot to do with Harry's placement with his aunt and uncle rather than say, you, Remus. I don't believe you. Sirius spat. He could have had me back in Azkaban in May, but he sent Harry to rescue me. He sent Harry to rescue himself. He would have gotten his soul eaten by those Dementors if he hadn't rescued himself. You just happened to be there as well. If he had wanted me out of the way, why would he have hired me last year? I was with Harry all last year and even gave him private lessons. If Dumbledore was trying to keep me away from Harry he did a pretty poor job. Remus asked. Oh, come on. Think. He's had to cast a wide net every year to fill that position. It's cursed and everyone knows it. Do you know how many times he's asked me to teach and I've turned him down? So yeah he reached out to you when he had no other options. And once you were there, he might as well get as much good as he can from you before you go. Remus turned to Sirius. I'm trying very hard to find a way to not take offense at that, but I somehow get the impression that was an insult. Sirius would have laughed if his mind wasn't working overtime going over the events of his life from a new perspective. Remus turned back to Moody. I get it, you don't think highly of me or my skills. Guess what, I'm not some kid with self-esteem issues who needs a morale boost. I know my value, I don't have to prove it to you or anyone else. This has nothing to do with your abilities, Remus. Believe it or not, Albus and I both know the value of your talents. So you just want us to hang out here while Harry is still under the care of this man who clearly doesn't have his best interests at the center of his plans? Sirius finally found his voice again. No, I want to help get Harry here to you, where he'll be safe. Come again. This time Remus responded incredulously. Yeah, you heard right. I agree with you, Harry isn't safe at Hogwarts, especially this year. Listen, I've been close with Dumbledore my whole career. I was his student, his comrade, maybe even his friend, if he has such things. I fought alongside him, and strategized with him. But there are things about Voldemort and Harry that he's pieced together on his own and told absolutely no one. At first, this seemed wise, given our experience in the past with spies in our midst, but I've been growing more concerned that perhaps his interpretation of the puzzle may be wrong. He has no second opinions, no other voices in the room to strategize and bring new perspectives, that's no way to get anything done. Then you look at the events of the last three years, and if this is the result of the best mind of our time watching over Harry, you have to wonder, was there more he could have done? And the obvious answer in every scenario is yes. So then you have to ask yourself, why didn't he? And that right there is where I realized that whatever he's planning, Harry's safety is not his number one concern. His number one concern is defeating Voldemort for good so that he never returns, and he has himself convinced that somehow Harry is the only one who can do that. Everything he's done to and for Harry has been to that end. Then I had to ask myself if I agreed with this method, and of course, I'm not a sociopath, so I came to the conclusion that grand machinations be damned, we should protect this child first and foremost and find another way to defeat Voldemort if he ever returns. After all, if our only hope is creating a child soldier and pinning the entire wizarding world's survival on him, then Cersei help us, because we deserve to lose. No one said anything right away. Silently, Sirius walked towards Moody and held out his hand. Moody took it in his and they shook. Moody brought his other hand to Sirius's shoulder and gripped it tight. Wait, Remus said from where he was still seated. Everyone turned to look at him. 
Moody, I'd love to believe that after what, 40 years as allies, you're going to turn on the most powerful wizard of our age, making him into an enemy and sacrifice your entire reputation, all for Harry's safety. But you'll have to forgive me, I still have my doubts. How do we know you aren't here under Dumbledore's orders to feel out our plan and report back? I suppose you don't. Moody said. You'll just have to trust me. Very convincing. Remus rolled his eyes. Hold on, earlier you said. Harry's not safe at Hogwarts, especially this year, what did you mean? Sirius asked. Hogwarts is hosting the Triwizard Tournament this year. Now, there'll be age restrictions for those who can enter, but even so, there'll be all kinds of wizards from the Ministry and the other schools roaming around Hogwarts. There will be dragons, sphinxes, and all sorts of dangerous things for Harry to get all tangled up in, but my main concern is that Karkaroff will be there. I honestly don't know what Dumbledore was thinking, agreeing to let him loose in the castle for a whole year. Karkaroff? How's he involved in this? Sirius asked. He's the headmaster of Durmstrang. You've got to be kidding me. What are all these former Death Eaters doing to somehow get teaching positions? Sirius was beside himself. Listen, I know you have no reason to trust me, but I can and I will do everything in my power to help you protect Harry, and if I lose my reputation and I'm chased out of England, then Miss Quinn, you will have one more applicant for asylum. All right then, Remus said slowly clambering out of his chair to join Sirius. He made every effort to hide his pain and shakiness as he reached out his hand and shook Moody's, while in a calm low voice he said, if you do betray us, I'll finally make good on that jewel, and you'll finally know how greatly underestimated I truly am. Moody's smile faltered for a moment before he recovered. Well then, it's a good thing I'm not going to betray you. Remus let go of his hand and took a step back to stand next to Sirius. So do you have a plan? Sirius said, breaking the awkward silence. Because of course, we have ideas, but if you have a plan, we're willing to hear it out. Sarah cleared her throat to interrupt. Gentlemen, before we go too far down this road, I must tell you that this is getting far larger than it would have been if Dumbledore had agreed to help us. If he had done so, we would have been able to use him as a buffer with Wizarding Britain. As it stands now, we'll be kidnapping Harry Potter against Dumbledore's and the rest of Britain's wishes. This has gone from a possible international confrontation to a guaranteed international confrontation. With that being the case, I must bring this to at least my superiors, and they will most likely bring this before our governing body. I always say it's better to ask for forgiveness than permission. If you go to them now they won't agree to this, Sirius said. Mr. Moody, your backup plan for when Britain kicks you out is to have me help you with asylum. That's going to be difficult to accomplish when I no longer have a job. So which part of this will they have an issue with? Giving Harry asylum once he's here, or the part where we're involving you in the nitty-gritty details of how he gets here? Remus asked, his mind worrying. The latter, of course, Sarah said. She could tell he was already planning something. Remus stretched his arms above his head. Tell you what, it's been a long day for all of us. Why don't we call it a day? You can go to your bosses and let them know that Harry Potter will likely be on the doorstep before long, and we can reconvene tomorrow once we know what their response is. Sound like a plan. It certainly sounds like part of a plan, she said eyeing him suspiciously. Well then, the three of us will just see ourselves out. We'll be in touch tomorrow, Sirius said, linking arms with Remus as they moved to the door. Gentlemen. Sarah said, causing the three men to pause and turn back towards her. Good luck. The three men tried desperately to hide their smiles as they nodded to her and finished exiting her office. They stayed silent until they were on the streets of Geneva. Why don't we continue our conversation at your place? Moody suggested. Nice try, but no. Due to the limited options available to us, we're working with you, but on the off chance that you're lying to us and helping Dumbledore thwart us, we'd really like to not have to move. Again, Remus said. His arm was still linked with Sirius, and he was leaning heavily upon him as they shuffled down the sidewalk. Thankfully Moody didn't walk very fast. Moody smirked and nodded. All right then, where to? There's a muggle diner just there on the corner. With a muffliato it'll be a good enough place to talk, 
Sirius said, doing all he could to play off his grasp on Remus's arm as merely affectionate rather than vital to keeping him upright. I think the best bet is to get him in transit, on his way to the train station. I can orchestrate the travel plans, we've done it in the past, it won't seem out of the ordinary. I make sure he's in a vehicle with me, then I get him to grab a port key and he'll be in Switzerland before he even knows what's happening. Moody explained his plan over his plate of greasy 24-hour diner food. Listen, I understand the need for subterfuge, but I think Harry deserves a little more warning than that. If he thinks he's on his way back to Hogwarts, and then out of the blue we force him to come stay with us, without even a chance to say goodbye to his friends, without knowing that it will be his last moment in England, that's not fair to him, and it'll make the transition so much worse. Sirius said thoughtfully. Our options are limited, how do you suggest we warn him? Moody asked. We talk to Molly and Arthur, Remus replied. You really think that's wise? Moody looked skeptical. If it was just me, no, but I think if they know you're in on it, they'll be on board. Molly's one of the few people I've kept in contact with over the last decade. She hasn't been happy these last three years, between watching Harry go to live with his family who starve him, and all the danger he and her own son have gotten sucked into at Hogwarts. I know for a fact she offered to take him in when he was orphaned, and again each year of his schooling. Dumbledore insisted this was the only way to keep him safe, but I know she thinks that's hogwash. It's just she has no way to take Harry by force. If she sees a viable alternative that would keep Harry out of harm's way, she'll help, I know she will. Remus explained. Even if out of harm's way is under the care of his escaped convict godfather. Sirius eyed Remus doubtfully. It would take a lot of explanation, but if she knows that Moody, Exor and War Hero, believes he's innocent, I think there may be a chance. Let's hope you're right, Sirius said. Moody gave a curt nod. When do we do this? With Sarah bringing this to her superiors, and Dumbledore refusing to help us, I think we should go sooner rather than later. We've only a few days before school starts anyway. I don't see why we shouldn't just go tomorrow morning. Remus said. Great, Moody, do you have a return port key we could use? We, no, Sirius, you can't come with us. Remus exclaimed. Sirius groaned. Not this again. There's no way I'm staying behind. Harry's my godson, I should be the one to go get him. Sarah said you can't leave the country. It'll be exponentially more dangerous if you're with us. Sarah also said we shouldn't kidnap him, but we're still going to do that. No, she said she couldn't be party to it, not that we shouldn't do it, Remus argued. Well, didn't you say we're better together? When we're apart, bad things happen. Don't you think that applies especially to this? Sure, but you were the one that insisted we not ride Buckbeak together, because it would cause me pain, this is the same thing. I'm insisting you stay because you'll be in too much danger. All it would take is one of the Weasleys casting a Patronus message or apparating away for the entire force of the ministry to come down on you. We wouldn't have me just walk in there outright. You would explain the plan before we revealed anything. Listen to me Remus, we're asking Harry to turn his life upside down, yes, for his own safety, but I don't think he fully grasps the seriousness of the danger he's in. If it's just you and Moody, I don't know if it'll be as well received as if it was coming directly from me. And what if Moody is using this as an elaborate plot to get you into the country so that Kingsley can pop out and arrest you where he has jurisdiction? Hey. I'm right here. Moody said offended. Remus and Sirius ignored him and continued their arguing. He's had plenty of opportunity both now and when you were alone in Germany to attack and bring us in. You think a silly little thing like jurisdiction would stop him from bringing me down? Might I remind you they didn't care too much about giving me a fair trial? Why would they care about jurisdiction? Remus glanced at Moody and eyed him warily. Fair point. Thank you. Moody exclaimed. That wasn't a compliment. Sirius said. You would be under disguise at first. Remus's attention was back on Sirius. Of course. Sirius promised. As Padfoot. Moody interjected, and that got their attention. What do you know about Padfoot? Sirius asked. Fucking Dumbledore, Remus muttered under his breath. It wasn't Dumbledore, I saw you transform in Germany when I was tracking you. Just how long were you following us? Remus asked. That's not important. 
Let's get back to the plan, please. You're insistent on coming with us, are you planning on transforming into Patfoot? Yes, Sirius can come as my pet, then we both pull Arthur and Molly aside and explain everything to them, Remus said. Great, let's just play that out for a moment. Hi Molly and Arthur, here's my new pet dog, Harry is being abused, by the way, my dog is actually Sirius Black, don't worry though he's innocent. We're going to kidnap Harry and raise him in Switzerland, what do you say? Will you help us? Somehow I don't think that's going to go well, Sirius said. I think you may be surprised, Remus responded. I don't think that's the main problem here, Moody said. Molly and Arthur care for the boy. If we explain the situation, I agree with Remus, they'll come around. What we need is to come up with a way for the Weasleys to maintain their reputation. Chapter 28 The Shoebox the three men ironed out a few more details before calling it a night and going their separate ways. Finally, Remus and Sirius were back in their room, getting ready for bed. All of their things were still in boxes all around, as they'd had no time to unpack yet. Remus sat on the bed after brushing his teeth and changing slowly into his pajamas. It might have been easier on any other day to do those tasks with magic, but he felt so drained he wasn't sure if he could even perform these simple spells. Perhaps after a night's rest, he would feel better. Sirius, can you do me a favor and bring me that box on the top dresser? Remus asked, not wanting to get up again. Of course. Sirius picked up the old shoe box with its lid that never stayed on quite right. He brought it over to where Remus was already in bed. This is where I kept the mirrors. I know it was a special thing for you and James, but I was thinking, Remus trailed off, not sure if he should suggest it. What? Sirius prompted. It's completely understandable if you don't want to part with them, they hold special significance, but I thought it might make Harry's separation from his friends a little easier if they had these to communicate. Give them to Harry and Ron. Sirius contemplated the idea, eyeing the still unopened box. It was just an idea, it's okay if you don't want to. No, it's a good idea. Sirius said, with a twinge of sadness in his tone. I recognize this box. He paused, looking up into Remus's eyes. It wasn't just the mirrors you held on to, was it? Remus met his gaze with glassy eyes. He couldn't find his voice to respond, so he just shook his head no. Taking a deep breath, he turned back to the box and took off the lid to reveal artifacts from a previous life. A gold and crimson scarf. Journals filled with pranks and homebrewed spells, concert ticket stubs, pub coasters, and matchbooks. Magical photos with happy friends forever stuck in the moment, oblivious to what the future held for them. Birthday cards, letters written back and forth during holiday breaks, and later, when they were apart on long missions. Sirius reached out tentatively for an object. It was a rude figurine the marauders had picked up in a muggle shop and had passed around to each other hiding it on a bookshelf, or in a cabinet to be found later. I'd almost forgotten about this guy, Sirius exclaimed. Do you remember what we called him? Nicholas Flemmel. They both said it in unison, bursting into laughter. After a moment they returned their attention to the box. Sirius reached in and grabbed a soft blue rubber ball. This was my favorite chew toy. He looked up at Remus, his face filled with bewilderment. You kept my chew toy. I was mad at you, not Pads. I couldn't throw away Padfoot's chew toy, Remus said in a quiet voice, his cheeks blushing red. Sirius couldn't stop the smile that spread across his face. The last time I opened this box was right before I took the teaching job at Hogwarts. I almost sent an owl back that day to Dumbledore to say I couldn't do it. I couldn't imagine walking those halls again, without the marauders. They both looked in the box together as Sirius reached in, pulling out the beautiful gold cigarette case that Sirius had given him when they were younger. I gave up smoking when I went sober, but up until the last cigarette, I carried that around with me wherever I went. Sirius wordlessly put it back into the box and reached for a folded crimson silk handkerchief. This is the handkerchief you wore at James's wedding. Wait, Remus called out, remembering too late what else was in this box. The carefully folded handkerchief fell open and several small objects clattered to the floor, 
rolling in opposite directions. Oh, I'm so sorry, Sirius said, getting up from his seat on the bed to get down on the floor and stretch out his hand under the bed where two of them had disappeared. Wait, Remus half-heartedly tried again to stop him, but Sirius had already scooped back up the items from their hiding place. He popped his head back up with satisfaction, the items resting in his folded hand, still not knowing what he held. He held out his closed hand to Remus to return them, but Remus hesitated, so he opened his hand and looked down to see two rings. Realization dawned on him, and his face fell. These are James and Lily's wedding rings. Yeah, Remus said, his voice constricting. You have their wedding rings. Petunia didn't want them, so they came to me. I'm just, I wasn't sure what, I'm going to give them to Harry of course. Sirius hadn't taken his eyes off the rings he held in his hand. Of course. He echoed back softly. There's, fuck, there's something else that was in there, do you see anything else on the floor? Remus asked, his voice sounding anxious. Sirius finally came out of his reverie and looked up at Remus. He finally responded after fully processing what Remus had asked him. Oh, let me look he said, placing the rings back on top of the open handkerchief that was now lying on the bed. He bent over and rested his face on the floor as he searched, finally locating the last fallen object under the nightstand. It was another ring. Mooney. Sirius popped his head back up and looked carefully at the gold ring with an onyx stone, the sides engraved in filigree framing a moon and a star. What's, who's this belong to? He finally said. Nobody. It was. It's not important. It's stupid. He reached out to take the ring from Sirius, but he closed his hand. Hold on. Sirius was still kneeling on the ground in front of Remus, sitting on the bed. It has a moon and a star. Mooney is this. Was this. Did you. You kept it. Yes. You idiot. It is. I was. I did. Remus covered his face with his hand. Could you please get up off the floor and I'll tell you. Sirius silently stood up and sat next to Remus, staring at him with expectant eyes. I had this made to propose to you, Remus finally said. Sirius gulped. When? I had it commissioned in the summer of 81. The summer? When were you going to propose? I don't know, honestly. Whenever I finally got up the nerve. I carried it around for months. I, I wasn't even sure if I was ever going to propose. I was going to see how it went. I was really nervous about it, actually. I mean, we were so on the rocks, and I knew how you felt about marriage. But, it felt like, it felt like it might be the only way to show you that I loved you. That I was serious about us. It just never seemed like the right time. We were both being pulled in separate directions on missions, and all of our friends were, were. And then, I found out and, I, I was too late. Too late to save any of you. And you were already in Azkaban by the time I even found out about any of it. I didn't even know they were dead for three weeks after. No one could reach me. I found out from the pack. Remus stopped then. He couldn't continue through the hitch in his throat. Sirius just stared at him as if he'd been slapped in the face. But he reached out and wiped away his tears and said for the hundredth time, I'm so sorry. Don't be sorry. It was ridiculous. Mooney, nothing about this is ridiculous. You kept the ring. Even after you thought I. I couldn't bring myself to get rid of it. I tried. Several times I took it to the Thames and told myself to chuck it in and be rid of it. But I could no sooner chuck myself in, though I tried that a few times too. It reminded me of better times. Even after everything, I would still hold it sometimes and imagine. Imagine a world where you loved me, where there was no betrayal, and no one we loved died, and we were happy, and we got married, and well, even that was enough. It always broke my heart into a million pieces, because I knew none of it was ever real. That I hadn't ever even been loved, or at least that's what I thought at the time. It was all so distorted. I couldn't ever make it make sense. But somehow even though it always broke my heart, it also, I don't even know how to describe it. It wasn't hope, it was like escaping into a fantasy book, even for a moment to live in some alternate universe, it gave me a break from the reality I was forced to live in, and I would escape to that as often as I found the strength to endure it. Oh Remus, you were always a bit of a masochist, but that's on a whole new level.
Sirius gathered him in his arms and held him so tightly as he whispered in his ear. You do know now that I love you so much, right? And we are going to be happy again, I swear it, we will be happy again. I know we're both so different, and so much has changed, but I'll take us in any form we're allowed to be. Merlin, this is not how I wanted you to find out about this ring. Sirius nodded as he broke the embrace. It's okay, no secrets, remember. He handed Remus back the ring. So you can have this back for now. Just know that whenever you get up the nerve to ask me, the answer is going to be yes. Remus took the ring and looked at it for a moment. I always regretted not asking you before everything fell apart. But I'm glad now that I didn't. It would have been for the wrong reasons then. It was to try to patch up a gaping hole in the dam. It's different between us now. It's so much better. We got a new start, to which none of my wildest imaginings could have compared. I love you so much, and I don't want to wait for the perfect time. If I wait for our lives to be more put together or the most romantic scene, I might miss my chance again. I don't want to hold on to this ring for a moment longer. Remus got off the bed and took a shaky knee before Sirius could do a thing to stop him. I've waited so long for this, that I feel like I need to do it properly. Mooney, your knees, you don't have to do that, Sirius said, but he allowed Remus to take his hand, and his breath caught in his throat. Sirius Orion Black III, I love you with all the pieces of my broken heart. I cannot fathom going another day on this earth without you by my side. Would you do me the supreme honor of becoming my husband? Merlin, you always were such a sap. Yes, how many times do I have to say yes before this ring is on my finger? Remus laughed through tears and finally, finally after thirteen years of holding onto it, he slipped the ring onto Sirius's finger with his own shaking hands and let go. He kissed Sirius's hand and admired the ring on its new home. It looked like it was always meant to be there. Sirius reached down and helped Remus up. Remus's knee was screaming from being held in that position, so he gladly took his help. And then they were kissing. Long and passionate and hungry. Remus ran his hands through Sirius's tangled locks, completely overwhelmed with joy. Later, as they snuggled beneath the covers, Remus looked up to see Sirius examining the ring closely, twisting it in the light to see all the angles. He looked at Remus and saw that he had been caught in the act. He didn't seem to mind. A moon and star, Sirius said. I know, it's cheesy, and it's a bit dated now. Shame I couldn't give you a silver ring, you always did look better in silver. Bit selfish on my part. And it could do with a good polishing. Remus reached his hand toward the ring. Sirius yanked his hand away. If you think for one moment I'm letting this ring off my finger simply for a polish any time soon you are badly mistaken. And don't say anything bad about it. I love it so much. Did you custom design it? Look at the filigree. And how dare you say I look better in silver, proud Gryffindor as I am, I would never wear silver over gold, the very idea. Remus laughed at that and took in the picture of his fiancée. They were cuddled up under the covers in a new bed with boxes scattered around, barely unpacked. Are those lamps the same as the last house? Sirius glanced at the nightstands. Looks like it, yes. They both started to chuckle. Ian must have packed them thinking they were ours. We're definitely not getting our deposit back. Sirius sighed, but Remus was still laughing at the whirlwind the last 48 hours had been. Chapter 29 The Weasleys Tuesday August 23, 1994 Remus, Sirius, and Moody all apparated to a breezy hillside barely beginning to be touched by the sunrise, just beyond the eyesight of the burrow. Remus instinctually reached for Sirius as he came out of the port key transportation and nearly fell over. Sirius made sure Remus was stable, then transformed into Padfoot. Moody and Remus looked at each other and nodded before beginning to walk toward the burrow. Remus walked slowly, relying heavily on his cane. It had been a rough morning getting up and about. He already regretted not using his chair, but he wasn't sure he could explain that to Harry and the Weasleys as well as convince them of their plan. Rather, after he had woken, he had taken one of the pepper-up potions he had purchased on Iger Street. Moody trudged along beside him, matching his pace to Remus's without complaint. 
They had all been up late trying to come to some sort of strategy, but given the time constraints, they had opted for straightforward. Now, it was just past five in the morning, and Remus's stomach was doing somersaults. He glanced down at Padfoot and wished he had not agreed to let him come. It was too late now, they were already on the lane leading to the burrow. Just as they opened the gate, Molly appeared from around the chicken coop with a basket of fresh eggs. She jumped a little when she saw them. Oh my goodness! You gave me quite a fright. What are you both doing here so early? She sounded surprised, but not put out. Hello, Molly, I apologize for intruding so early and unannounced. We were hoping to have a conversation with you and Arthur before he left for work. Is he still here? Moody asked. It's a good thing you came early if you wanted to catch Arthur. Since the attack at the cup, he's been at work more than here. Come in, come in. Who's the dog with? He's mine, sorry to bring him along. I just got him and I didn't want to leave him alone. I hope you don't mind. He's very well behaved. Remus explained. Molly eyed the big black dog as he sat next to Remus and watched as he tilted his head to one side, big gray eyes staring at her. She broke out into a smile. Well, how could I refuse a face like that? Oh, come on in, and bring the dog too. Padfoot stood and panted happily as he followed Remus and Moody into the burrow. Arthur was seated at the table eating his breakfast and reading the Daily Prophet with a furrowed brow. Charlie was also awake, albeit just barely. He yawned and stared at his plate of toast and eggs until the interruption of guests woke him up fully. They both looked up as the door opened with surprised faces. Immediately Arthur stood and stuck out his hand to shake Moody's and then Remus's hands. Look who I found in the garden, Arthur. They said they wanted to talk with us. Molly said as she went around to grab the teapot from the kitchen counter. Tea. Yes, please. Remus said as he slowly eased himself into a chair beside Arthur at the table. He tried his best not to wince as pain shot from his hip and knees. Anyone else awake yet? Percy maybe. Moody asked. No, Percy is at work more than Arthur, if that's possible. Already left for the office. The rest of the kids are all still asleep. Molly said. Remus glanced at the clock on their wall. It confirmed that Percy was at work, and Bill was away as well. He then glanced at Charlie awkwardly. So, to what do we owe this unexpected pleasure? Arthur asked. I need to talk to you and Molly, privately if possible. Everyone glanced at Charlie and he squirmed under the attention. Charlie, be a dear and go start the dishes for me. Molly requested sweetly. Charlie cleared his throat as he got up from the table, taking his half-finished breakfast with him. All right, then, he muttered as he left the room. He shut the door behind him and they heard the sound of running water before Moody cast a silencing spell on the door. All right, what's all this about? Molly asked impatiently. What do you know about the events at the end of last school year at Hogwarts? Remus asked. Arthur and Molly glanced at each other, then back at Remus. We know that Sirius came after Harry, and in an attempt to get to him broke Ron's leg. But you and Severus were able to intervene and save the children, and capture Sirius. Molly said. But then he escaped again and is still out there somewhere. Arthur finished. Dumbledore said Kingsley had word he was abroad. Molly added. That's not the entire story. You know I was there. I'd like to tell you what happened firsthand if you'd allow. Remus said. Please. Arthur said. I found Sirius with the children, but he wasn't alone, and Harry wasn't his target. Peter Pettigrew was there. Sirius was after Peter. Remus explained. No, that's not possible. Peter's dead. I went to his funeral, I comforted his mother. Molly cried. They never found his body. Peter faked his own death and killed all those muggles the night Sirius went after him. Remus went on. What motivation could he possibly have had for that? Arthur asked. Sirius wasn't the spy, it was Peter all along. When Sirius found out, he went after Peter, and Peter framed him. Sirius went down for his murder, but he was innocent. Moody said. But where has Peter been all this time if he's not dead? Arthur asked. 
Right, this is where it gets a little tricky. Remus sighed before continuing. Peter was an unregistered animagius. He turned into a rat. He's been hiding with a wizard family unbeknownst to them all his time. Sirius discovered this and escaped to go after him again. Both times he broke into Hogwarts. He was after Peter, not Harry. Wait, you're not suggesting it couldn't possibly be. Molly stopped mid-sentence, eyes wide with horror at the realization. Be what? What am I not getting? Arthur asked, bewildered. Peter was hiding as a pet rat in Hogwarts. He was hiding as Scabbers. Remus explained. Scabbers. Arthur said just a little too loudly for 5.30 in the morning. Hush. Molly said, looking towards the staircase. But there was no indication that anyone was waking. She cast another silencing spell towards the stairs. Remus continued to explain. Right. Sirius was after Scabbers, which is why he... Why he attacked and broke our son's leg. Molly was the one raising her voice this time. That was an accident. He wasn't trying to hurt them. He was trying to get Scabbers away from Harry. Remus tried to explain. This wasn't going well. Moody took a turn. Think about it this way. Sirius, innocent and imprisoned for twelve years, discovers Peter's alive and living with a wizard family. He manages to escape and instead of fleeing, goes after Peter, because he knows that Peter, a mass murderer and spy, is living among children, next to Harry, his godson, and he's the only one who knows this. Sirius risks his life to try to bring Peter to justice. It's risky and complicated, and there's not a lot of opportunity to get to him until finally he finds a chance and he takes it. Unfortunately in the process, Ron's leg is broken, but it wasn't malicious. It was in an effort to protect not only Harry but Ron and your whole family as well. Moody explained. We lived with that rat for twelve years, and no harm came to any of us. Arthur pointed out. Yeah, Peter's good at lulling you into a false sense of security. Remus sighed. He was one of my best friends, and then one day he turns out to be a spy, James and Lily are dead, and Sirius is condemned for a crime he didn't commit. Sirius of all people knows how dangerous that rat is. So then why did you capture Sirius that night instead of Peter? Molly asked. Because everything went to shit, that's why. Remus glanced at Molly as she frowned at him. Pardon my language, Molly. We were in the process of capturing Peter despite an interruption from Snape, when I, I'm sorry to say I transformed into a werewolf. Sirius tried to subdue or distract me, and Peter escaped. Snape then captured Sirius, and brought the children up to the hospital wing. So then how did Sirius escape? Believe it or not, we haven't even covered the wildest part of this story. Did you know Hermione spent last year using a time-turner to take extra courses? Remus gathered from their shocked faces that this was new information for the two of them. Well, when Albus met with Harry and Hermione, he indicated to them that they should use the Time Turner to rescue both Sirius Black and Buckbeak the Hippogriff, so they did. They traveled back in time, entered the Forbidden Forest with a werewolf and a mass murderer, Peter, not Sirius, and Harry saved himself from Dementors, and helped Sirius escape. Dumbledore told them to do what? Molly was fully yelling at this point. Remus was grateful she had put up the silencing charm. That was my reaction exactly, Remus replied. This, along with the previous two years of danger at Hogwarts, combined with his neglectful aunt and uncle, have us very concerned for Harry's safety, Moody said. But what are we to do? I've offered over and over to bring Harry into our home permanently, but Dumbledore won't hear of it. I know you have, Molly, which is another count against him, Remus said. Against him? Against Dumbledore? What are you suggesting? Arthur asked, sitting a little straighter in his chair. Remus let out a sigh. He was about to speak when Moody beat him to it. We're suggesting that Dumbledore may have other motivations besides Harry's safety. We're suggesting that Dumbledore, like many of us, believes that Voldemort is not gone for good. It's Dumbledore's highest priority to stop Voldemort, and we believe that for whatever reason, Dumbledore thinks Harry is the key to that defeat. So he's using Harry as bait, shield, or sacrifice to bring down Voldemort. He doesn't have Harry's best interest in mind, and I think it's up to us to find a way to help protect Harry, even if it's from Dumbledore himself. 
I'm not sure I like where this is going, Arthur said warily. Dumbledore always has a good reason for what he does, he just doesn't tell everyone. A good reason to keep a child in an abusive home for 13 years. Molly, they deprive him of food, they insult him, they neglect him. I don't even know the full truth of what goes on there, and that's the scariest part, Remus said. Arthur, in second year, the boys went and took Harry in the middle of the night, they said there were bars on the window and he was locked in his room. Molly almost whispered. And this year, they didn't even say goodbye when I went to fetch him. I knew they didn't like Harry, I didn't really think, I thought Dumbledore would surely not put him somewhere he isn't safe. Arthur replied. That's what I thought as well, but it's worse than even that. I don't think Harry is safe even at Hogwarts. Think over the last three years, the danger he's been in there, the danger your son and Hermione have been in also. I talked about it with the professors while I was there. They said that Harry had tried to find help both times, but wasn't able to get it. Dumbledore isn't protecting him. He's keeping him close, but not protecting him. Remus said, desperate for them to understand the seriousness of the situation. So what do we do? Molly asked. We can't keep Harry here, or at his aunt's. We can't keep him from going to Hogwarts, we can't defy Dumbledore. I have a solution, but I need you to hear me out. Remus said. We've listened to you this long, we aren't going to stop now. Arthur said. After Sirius escaped, and I resigned, I wrote to him, and we met up. We actually left the country and traveled all summer together. He couldn't help the smile that crept onto his face as he talked about Sirius. While on the continent, I ran into an old friend of mine who has become a lawyer for Wizards for International Justice. She met with Sirius and me and helped him gain asylum after hearing his story. It's still in the works, there's still a lot of settling down to do, but it's something. It's real, and it's finally a place where he can be free. And if you're convinced as I am that he's innocent, then you know that Harry's proper place is with his godfather. Forget what Dumbledore wants for just a moment and think about what James and Lily would have wanted. They wouldn't have sent him back to Hogwarts given how much danger he has been in these last three years, and they absolutely would never have agreed to have Harry raised by Lily's hateful sister. You're right about that, Molly said. Let's say for a moment I believe you, that Sirius is innocent, he's still a fugitive. How is that safer than what he has now? He's still being chased by the entire ministry. Not the entire ministry, Kingsley's on his side. Moody spoke up again. But you're right, Harry will never be 100% safe. He's the boy who lived. He's always going to have a target on his back, even if Voldemort doesn't come back he's still in danger from Death Eaters, as we saw just a few days ago. But what we're saying is that Harry needs to be with someone who has his safety as their number one priority, not someone who uses him like some child soldier for the greater good. Sirius Black broke out of Azkaban, dodged the ministry, and broke into Hogwarts twice just to protect Harry from the danger no one else knew about. He put his own life on the line to save Harry, and he's perhaps the first adult to do that since his parents died protecting him. And you think he's in a stable enough place to raise Harry? Why are you talking to us? Did you talk to Dumbledore? Maybe he would agree with you. Molly said desperately. We took our idea to Dumbledore first. He came and visited us at the WIJ headquarters. I had hoped he would see the logic in our plan, but he insisted that Harry was safest at Hogwarts. He wouldn't even budge on his stance on having Harry go to his aunt's. This is our last hope of getting Harry to safety before the school year starts. Remus explained. What's your plan on getting him to Sirius? Molly asked. That won't be the hardest part. Remember how I said Peter was an Animagius? James and Sirius were anime guy too. They did it for me, so they could join me on my full moons. Remus explained. James transformed into a stag, and Sirius transforms into a black dog. Molly stood immediately, her wand already in her hand. Arthur wasn't far behind her. They stood defensively, but seemed more surprised than angry. At the same time, Charlie popped up in the window, holding his wand aimed at Padfoot as well. Charlie! Arthur shouted, but he was drowned out by Molly. Sirius, show yourself! Molly demanded. As soon as she did, 
The black dog that was seated next to Remus on the floor stood and transformed into Sirius Black. Hello Molly, Arthur, Sirius said from where he stood. He wore his best robes of deep blue velvet with gold beaded embroidery along the shoulders and trim. His long wavy hair was neatly resting on his shoulders, his beard trimmed short. Wand and drawn, he extended his hand as a gesture of trust, expectantly waiting for the same in return. Sirius, is that you? You look so different. Molly stood in shock. Different than I did the last time you saw me. That's what twelve years in Azkaban will do to you. Sirius said with a hint of sadness. No, different than your wanted poster. Molly replied. Ah, well that's what a summer abroad on the continent will do to you. He smiled with a glint in his eye. His hand was still extended, and Arthur finally noticed it and returned the gesture. He still held his wand, but he'd lowered it slightly. I'm so sorry to surprise you like this. I hate to arrive unannounced, but it was deemed prudent to remain in disguise until we were sure you would help us. Right, well I suppose that makes sense. Please, sit down. Molly said, looking torn between indignation and hostess duties. Charlie, what are you doing in the garden? You're supposed to be doing dishes, not eavesdropping. Charlie sheepishly let down his defensive stance and addressed them through the window. Sorry mum, I couldn't help myself. Right, we'll get in here and take a seat, and try not to be a distraction. At that, Molly and Arthur lowered their wands, but didn't fully put them away as they all took seats around the table once more, this time making room for Sirius and Charlie to join them. At the risk of opening old wounds, I'd like to personally apologize for Ron's broken leg. I had been around all school year, I hadn't gotten close enough to Peter. When I saw Peter going back to Ron, back within range of Harry, I felt it vital to take the opportunity to try to protect Harry from Peter. I didn't break his leg on purpose, and I am so sorry I did. I hope you can understand that my intention has always been to protect Harry. Molly fidgeted in her seat. I suppose I can understand that too, she finally said reluctantly. Now what? Arthur asked, looking at Sirius expectantly. Hold on. Don't think I'm going to accept your story that fast. If you aren't innocent, I've no idea why you would stop and have a conversation with us before just barging in and taking Harry, but then again whoever the spy was played the long game back in 81, and they could do it again. So, I'm going to insist you take Veritas Serum. I'm sorry not to trust you at your word, but this is my, this is Harry's safety we're talking about and I don't play around with that. Molly sat calmly as the men around her took in what she just said. All except Arthur who didn't look phased at all. Of course, I do anything to prove to you I'm telling the truth, but I don't have any Veritas serum on me, Sirius said after a pause. Not a problem, I happen to keep a bottle on hand, Molly said as she summoned a vial from a compartment behind the magical clock. Why do you have a bottle on hand? Moody asked, looking shocked. Back in the war, I was party to more than one interrogation. I had an extra bottle or two remaining after everything was said and done and I held on to it. I always thought in hindsight, I should have used it more often, then we might have avoided all our fears and whispered mistrust in each other. Holy shit mum. Charlie looked at her in awe. She pursed her lips at his swearing but held her gaze on Sirius and Remus. Sirius gave her a look of utmost respect, remembering that they used to be comrades and soldiers together. Let's not leave any room for mistrust today, Molly. Now, pour me a drink and ask me your worst. Molly smiled as she poured Sirius a cup of tea and put three drops of Veritas serum into it. She then looked at the other two and said, You as well, we aren't leaving anything to chance here today. Remus and Moody didn't say anything, just glanced at each other and slid their cups forward to receive their dose. All three downed the hot tea and presented their empty cups. Wonderful, now let's start with the big items, shall we? She turned and faced Sirius. State your full true name, please. I am Sirius Orion Black III, Lord of the Noble and Most Ancient House of Black. He pulled a face after that. Remus knew he hated saying that last part, but it was part of his full true name. Did you betray James and Lily to you-know-who? Molly asked. I did not know have I ever betrayed James and Lily. Sirius said straight-faced, staring directly at Molly. 
Did you then have or hold to this day any ill feelings or grudges towards James, Lily, or Harry Potter? Molly continued. No. James was my dearest friend, I loved him as a brother, and Lily as a sister. I was so happy and proud to be named Harry's godfather. Sirius adamantly stated. Did you at any point betray or conspire against a member of the order? Sirius cleared his throat, looking a little pained. He looked at Remus before words started to tumble out of his mouth. I betrayed the trust of Remus Lupin when I suspected he was the spy. I lied to him, and conspired against him in an effort to protect James and Lily, not knowing that he was innocent. Sirius looked away from Remus, shame covering his face. He took a breath but then kept going. I conspired against Peter Pettigrew the night of Voldemort's downfall when his betrayal became clear. I chased after him and tried to overtake him, but he instead framed me for his murder and the murder of a dozen muggles. I then conspired last summer to escape Azkaban and track down Peter to take my revenge, as well as protect Harry from him. He took another gasping breath before the potion forced him to continue. I am currently conspiring against Dumbledore to smuggle Harry out of the country behind his back. Remus reached out and held Sirius's hand on top of the table. These were old wounds they had already worked through, there was nothing he could say that could hurt them. Sirius squeezed his hand back in silent agreement. They looked up to see Charlie's eyes on their hands, but they didn't make any effort to move apart. Who was the secret keeper for James and Lily? Molly pressed on. Peter Pettigrew. James wanted it to be a show of solidarity, of trust in his friends, that's why he didn't choose himself. Who betrayed the Potters? Peter Pettigrew. I still don't understand why. Sirius answered. Who killed those muggles twelve years ago? Peter Pettigrew murdered all those muggles in an explosion to disguise his transformation into his animagious form as he fled. Is Peter still alive? Molly asked. As of the May full moon, yes. Last I saw him, he transformed into his animagious form and ran off into the Forbidden Forest. I have not made an effort to track him down again, I would have no idea where to start. Did you have any dealings with you-know-who, Death Eaters, or Blood Purists? The only dealings I had with them were in an effort to sabotage and defeat them. The vast majority of my family are Blood Purists and Death Eaters, but I cut ties with them when I ran away from home at 16. I did know and deal with Peter Pettigrew who was a supporter of Voldemort, unbeknownst to me. What are your intentions with Harry? I intend to make every effort to protect Harry from Voldemort, Death Eaters, and Blood Purists who may target him. I intend to shield him from anyone who may try to use him as a tool against Voldemort. Furthermore, I intend to protect him from any danger that may come his way. His childhood, what little is left of it, should be safeguarded, and I intend to do so by providing a family, something neither of us has had for over a decade. What are your intentions with Remus? Molly surprised everyone by asking. Sirius's eyes went wide, as his mouth answered without a filter. I love Mooney with all my heart, I always have and always will. I intend to stay by his side until I die or he forces me away. I intend to provide for his every need and desire, and grow old together. His cheeks were growing crimson with the blush that developed during his confession. His eyes darted to the newest onyx, and gold ring added to his right ring finger. Molly followed his eyes and noticed the placement of the ring, but said nothing about it. Very well then. Molly seemed satisfied by his answers. Her attention turned to Remus, who was staring at Sirius, both shocked silent. Old friend, I hope you won't take this line of questioning personally, but where Harry is concerned I can't leave anything to chance, Molly said. Remus shook himself out of his shock and returned to the conversation. Of course, I understand. State your true name please, Molly asked. I am Remus John Lupin. Did you then have or hold to this day any ill feelings or grudges towards James, Lily, or Harry Potter? No, James was always a good friend, he was the anchor of the marauders, the one that tied us all together. Lily was my closest confidant beside Sirius, and I have always loved Harry, even when I was forced to do so from afar. Did you work towards or have any part in their death? No, I didn't even hear of the death until weeks later, as I was undercover with the werewolves at the time. I had no part in the death, Remus said solemnly. Did you know Peter was alive? No, I had no idea. I believed he was murdered by Sirius. His voice hitched at the last line, 
filled with shame that he could have ever thought such a thing. Did you at any point betray or conspire against a member of the Order? As part of my undercover work with Greyback's pack, I was witness to and participated in discussions and planning of attacks against Order members. Remus didn't like where this was going, but he couldn't stop the words spilling out of his mouth. On multiple occasions, I disobeyed orders from Moody and Dumbledore in my dealings with the pack when I thought following those orders would have put me in danger, or compromised my position undercover. Often it was difficult to explain how my disobedience had been necessary, but in doing so I solidified my position undercover, while mitigating any suspicions Greyback had of me. This directly led to situations where I was able to protect Order members and Muggleborns from attacks, many of those instances of protection were also against the Orders of Moody and Dumbledore. Remus was able to pause for a moment before feeling the urge to continue. I conspired against Sirius Black when I discovered he had cornered Harry Potter, Ron Weasley, and Hermione Granger in the Shrieking Shack, until I discovered the truth of Peter Pettigrew's betrayal, then I switched to conspiring against him. I am currently in the process of conspiring to smuggle Harry Potter out of the country against Dumbledore's orders. You disobeyed Dumbledore's orders while in the pack? Arthur asked, his face covered in shock. Yes, if I had followed his orders, I would have been discovered and killed the first week I was there, Remus said matter-of-factly. What do you mean you protected people against Dumbledore's orders? Charlie asked cautiously, unsure if he was allowed to ask questions. On multiple occasions, I told Moody and Dumbledore about planned attacks, and they deemed it against the Order's best interest to stop them. I found ways to stop them anyway. Did doing so compromise your position in the pack as Moody feared? Arthur asked. Sometimes, yes. Most of the time I found ways to disguise my subterfuge, but it would have been easier and safer for me if the subterfuge had come from the Order rather than from me within the pack. I never knew that. Arthur said, looking stunned. There were a lot of secrets during the war. I don't think anyone knew the whole truth, not even Dumbledore. The air felt heavy after Remus's words. They all sat in uncomfortable silence for a moment as they processed the latest revelation. What are your intentions with Harry? Molly finally led them back to the conversation at hand. I intend to protect him from anyone who may try to bring him harm or force his hand into a battle he's not ready for. I intend to provide a home for him with Sirius, for as long as they want me. I want to help shape his perspective on the world so he knows good from evil, and the importance of defending good, when the time is right, when he's older. I also intend to find ways to prevent his participation in this fight from being necessary at all. It was Arthur who spoke up next, after a heavy pause. Fair's fair, tell us what your intentions are with Sirius. Remus expected the question after Sirius had received it. I intend to stay by his side for as long as he'll have me. I love him, and I have never stopped loving him, even when it tore me apart to do so. In my wildest dreams, I would love to see old age with him by my side as my husband. He reached over and took Sirius's hand again, running his thumb over his new ring. Molly smiled at Remus and paused before turning to the third man sitting across from her at the table. Moody. State your true name, please. I am Alistair Frederick Moody, often called Mad-Eye Moody. You are the one I least understand in all this. But before we get to your current motivations, let's have you answer the same question I posed to these two. Have you ever betrayed a member of the Order? I conspired with Albus to allow certain werewolf attacks on Order members and Muggleborns to go through. We conspired to withhold valuable intel from Remus while he was undercover with the pack. We told those who knew it was because he could be tortured or imperious to get information, but it was really because we suspected he was a spy. Albus convinced me of the necessity of speeding up the conviction of Sirius Black without a trial. He said there was evidence enough and we needed the matter resolved quickly so that the wizarding public could move on and heal. He didn't want the perpetrator to go free with a loophole or technicality like so many other Death Eaters, and I didn't stand in his way, neither did the Wizendermot, mind you. I am currently conspiring to smuggle Harry Potter out of the country. Did Dumbledore send you to us last night? Remus asked. Yes. Like the last time he sent me to you, he ordered me to follow you at a distance and find out your motivations and any plans you may have to take Harry. Sirius was on his feet, wand drawn and pointed at Moody. 
I knew we shouldn't trust you. Remus had drawn his wand as well, but stayed in his seat. He was trying not to move too much, conserving what little strength he had. Wait, Molly said. Her wand was still drawn from earlier, but she was still seated. Do you intend to tell Dumbledore of their plans, or work in a way to sabotage the removal of Harry Potter from the country? I do not. I intend to withhold this information from Dumbledore and aid in the protection of Harry by relocating him to Switzerland to live with Remus and Sirius. Moody emphasized. Switzerland. You're living in Switzerland? Molly asked. Yes, let's return our focus to Moody please. Sirius said, his wand still drawn. Once Harry is relocated do you have any intention to betray us in any way? Remus asked. No. If I am still free to do so, I intend to aid you both in the task of protecting Harry however I can. Dumbledore is right about the fact that Harry may still have a part to play in the defeat of Voldemort if he returns. I intend to search out any alternatives to his involvement, and if that fails, delay his involvement as long as possible so that he may have as normal a childhood as possible. I intend on training him not as a child soldier but to give him any tools he may need to protect himself if the need arises. All right, Sirius said. I have a question. What steps have been taken by you and Dumbledore to prove my innocence and bring Peter Pettigrew to justice? Dumbledore did reach out to me as soon as you escaped and told me everything about your innocence and Peter's escape. I have put out feelers into my contacts among the darker side of wizard society, but nothing has come of it yet. Kingsley pulled your old file, but little evidence remains that would be of any use to us. I'm sorry to say that the case has come to a bit of a standstill. I've spent the majority of the summer tracking you two and making sure your trail is covered from others searching for you. Sirius shook his head at this. That's disappointing. Hang on, I have another question. Remus interjected. Why were you and Albus opposed to protecting those at risk within the order from attacks? It was deemed a small price to pay for the continued benefits of having you in place as part of the pack. What was the point of having me in the pack if not to prevent attacks? Initially, the desire was to see if any of the pack could be swayed to join our side. Near the end of your time with the pack, we lost trust that you were still with us, so we believed it unlikely that any of your kind could be turned. Likewise, any intel you provided was seen as tainted and untrustworthy. We were building up intel on the movement and tactics of the pack to better prepare a counterattack to wipe the pack out with you as well if necessary, and any future pack we encountered that we deemed a public nuisance. Remus lunged furiously at Moody, forgetting about his wand, and punched him in the face before Sirius and Arthur could grab him and hold him back. I was helping you to protect innocents from being attacked, not to bring down all werewolves, you piece of shit. Remus said as he struggled against Sirius's grip on his shoulder. Yet another thing motivating me to help you now. Moody said as he touched his hand to his nose to discover it bleeding. I won't be part of your redemption arc, you blood purist. You're as bad as the rest of them. You used me. Remus's anger ebbed away only to be overtaken by a wave of bitter grief. His knees buckled and he would have fallen if he hadn't been held up by Sirius and Arthur who led him to a chair on the other side of the table from Moody. So much for conserving his strength. His hip was already complaining about the jarring movement. I'm sorry, I was wrong. I know that now. You're different from any werewolf I've ever met. Are you going to let your anger get in the way of protecting Harry? Moody replied. I'm different. Why? Because I was civilized by Dumbledore. I'm not the exception, Moody. There are good and bad werewolves, just like there are good and bad wicks or Vila. I'm never going to trust you around me, my family, or my pack. You're never going to get a single scrap of information about them from me. I don't care about your pack. You've demonstrated to me that you're made of better stuff than the rest of the order combined. Your willingness to sacrifice yourself to stop the attacks on innocent lives and your strategic ability to maintain your cover while doing so was unmatched by any of us. And when I asked you years ago to help lobby for changing werewolf legislation and you did nothing. Did you think I was made of better stuff then? The timing was inconvenient, I had other things I needed to accomplish first. That's it, we're through, after this, I don't ever want to see your face again. I hope you lose your reputation. 
I hope you're shunned from polite society. I hope you get just a sliver of the type of treatment my kind have had to endure for centuries because the timing was inconvenient for the likes of you to help us. Remus shook off the hands of Sirius and Arthur that still rested on his shoulders. Let me go. And with that, he stood and limped out the door with all the dignity he could muster. Remus shuffled into the garden still covered with morning dew. He made it to the far edge of the yard, where the path led to a gate and a wide field beyond, where Quidditch posts stood in the distance. He took a deep breath and let the fresh scent of zinnias blooming around the path fill his mind as tears burned at the corners of his eyes. His vision clouded over, whether from tears or lightheadedness he couldn't decipher, but he found a seat on a bench underneath a strong old oak that shaded this corner of the garden. He heard someone coming down the path, but didn't look to see who it was who interrupted his retreat. Mind if I join you? Molly asked when she was finally standing beside him. It's your bench, Remus replied. Molly sat next to him in silence for a long moment before finally speaking. That was certainly illuminating. You know, nothing he said was anything I didn't already suspect, so tell me why it hurts so bad to finally have it confirmed. I'm sorry, Remus. I truly didn't see any of that coming, or I might have thought twice about using the truth potion, Molly said. No, I'm glad it's finally out there for everyone to see, rather than festering in my mind for me to anguish over. I'm glad one of us finally got the closure they needed from that. What does that mean? Remus asked. I was finally going to get to the bottom of who was responsible for the prank that was pulled on my 30th birthday party, and now I suppose I'll never know. So the potion's worn off then? It only lasts maybe thirty minutes, Molly said. I suppose some secrets are better left uncovered, Remus said with a whisper of a smile. You know, Molly said, pointing ruefully at Remus. Tell me, Remus. I'm sorry I don't know what you're talking about, I was deep undercover that whole year. I had nothing to do with a pack of pixies being let loose at your birthday party, I only heard about it after the fact. But you did hear about it. You know who did it. It was Sirius and James, wasn't it? Molly guessed. I'm afraid the blame falls closer to home than that. It wasn't Arthur. He wouldn't have had the gall. Besides, he was home taking care of the kids. I suppose it won't hurt anyone to tell you now. Just don't think worse of them. It was Fabian and Gideon, Remus finally said. Molly had a mixed expression of pain, realization and fondness all at once. Oh. She sighed and shook her head. I suppose that shouldn't come as too much of a shock. The twins were always looking for ways to catch me unawares. Your twins take after their uncles a lot. It was quite the pleasure to teach your brood last year. I hope they didn't give you too much trouble. I was a marauder. I know how to hold my own. They both chuckled and turned to face the field as the dew evaporated off the grass. Back there, you mentioned you have a pack. Oh, yeah I did say that didn't I? Remus evaded. Is it like the ones in the past? No, it's nothing like them. It's so much better. It's not a permanent thing, we just get together for the moon. It's only been two moons now that I've been with them, but it's been really good to be around other werewolves who want the same things. For the first month or so, it was just Sirius and I, and it was amazing, but being on the run like that was so isolating. It was good to run into an old friend, and make some new ones as well. And you're feeling okay? Looks like you're limping more. Did you take time to recover from the moon? Remus averted his eyes from her motherly gaze. It's been a rough few days. The moon was a rough one, and then we heard the news about the cup, and then we rushed to find a way to contact Dumbledore to make sure Harry was all right, then Dumbledore wanted a meeting and then we had to plan a kidnapping, and somewhere in there I got engaged. You what? You're engaged? Oh, Remus. Way to bury the lead. That's so wonderful, dear. She had both her hands on his arms and was shaking him in her excitement. Remus laughed at her exuberance. Yes, well, it was unexpected, and there's been more pressing issues at hand to deal with. There will be plenty of time to celebrate and tell everyone. His face fell a little, realizing this may be the only friend from England he would be able to tell in person. Then the anxious thoughts crowded into his mind. He must not take time for granted. 
there's no guarantee of the future. Best to take it a moment at a time, and at that moment, Molly called his attention back to her as she spoke again, in a quieter tone, as if reading his thoughts. You know Arthur and I always have your back, don't you? Back then and now, we're truly honored to call you a close friend. I know you and Sirius have had your rough patches, but it looks like you've taken full advantage of this second chance, and I'm so happy to see you and him happy together. You know how much I care for Harry as if he was my own. If I could take him in I would, but given that I can't, there's no one I would trust more with his safety and well-being than you. And James and Lily must have known what they were doing when they named Sirius as Godfather, so I suppose I trust him too. The tears that had so far been held back now flowed freely from Remus's eyes as he turned to Molly. Thank you, it truly means the world to know that I can count you as a friend. He reached over and gave her a hug, which she returned with all her might. When they finally released each other, they settled in on the bench again, and Remus finally asked, What are we going to do about Moody, though? We know he has no plans to betray us, we use him for this and then we wash our hands of him. He didn't have any plans to betray us before I punched him in the face. He might have changed his mind in the last fifteen minutes, Remus said. Before I came out to find you, I asked him if his motivations had changed given the immediate circumstances, and he, to his credit, said no. So, for now, at least, I think he feels guilty enough to continue to help us. Remus heard the sound of someone else coming up behind them. Mind if I join the party? Sirius asked as he walked into view. Remus scooted over so that he was in the center of the bench and Molly was to his left. Then he patted the bench to his right. Of course, so long as you promise that old Bat hasn't been left alone. No, when I left he was getting quite the dressing down by Arthur. I must say I've never seen that side of him, and I didn't know he had it in him. Remind me never to get on his bad side. That's my Arthur, Molly said with a dreamy smile on her face. And of course, Charlie's there, so I'm sure Mad-Eye will think twice before trying anything. Sirius said sarcastically through a chuckle. The three of them joined in the laughter. You should have seen your face when he poked up out of that window, Remus said to Molly. Molly could only say, Yes, and that's my Charlie for you. He tames dragons, you think a few aging war veterans are going to intimidate him. I don't know, his eyes were about the size of saucers by the time we dragged Remus off of Moody. Sirius was still laughing. They all finally settled down after a few more minutes of giggling. Sirius sighed deeply and turned to Remus. So, how are you? Remus took a deep breath and sighed. I'm okay. That was difficult but somehow validating. So, what say you and I go talk to Harry? Sirius said as he stood to start walking back toward the burrow. He offered his hand to help Remus stand, and Remus gratefully took it. Just the act of standing sent shards of pain down his leg. Sirius was watching him closely, so he showed no trace of a reaction on his face as he walked slowly back to the burrow. Sirius stayed by his side and offered him his arm as support anyway. I think that will go a lot more smoothly, Molly said, already walking ahead of them. Oh Molly, I don't think so. Have you ever had to explain to a child that they're being abused and that the place they call home isn't safe for them? Remus asked. No, of course you're right, she said a little ashamed. It's okay, we'll all be there for him, Sirius said, still walking next to Remus. The main reason we're coming to you like this is because I'd like to explain the situation to Harry and give him time to understand why. We of course are so grateful for everything you've done for him. From what I understand, you've tried to make him feel like part of your family. As someone who was taken in by my best friend's family, I understand just how deeply impactful that is. I know if you're a part of this transition, it will go smoother for him. Are you planning on taking him with you today? Molly turned back to face them, tears welling in her eyes. By now they were at the door to the kitchen. Upon entering they found Moody and Arthur sitting at the table staring at each other in awkward silence. Charlie was sitting at the other end of the table, looking extremely uncomfortable. That's something we still need to decide. We'd like to do this in a way that leaves no suspicion on you or your family, but we're also concerned Dumbledore may try to secure Harry earlier if he suspects we're up to something, Remus explained. We could wait till the first and do it while transporting him to Platform 9 and 3 quarters, 
But if it doesn't work then we will have lost our window. Sirius said. No matter when we transport him, I'd like you to know that you and your family are welcome to visit any time you like. This won't be the last time you see Harry, but it will be the last time Harry and I are in England, at least for the foreseeable future. Sirius explained. Molly nodded, looking a little reassured. I agree that we should do this sooner rather than later. We can't leave this to the last minute. Molly said with a determined look on her face. I was thinking I could take the fall. Moody finally spoke again. Dumbledore will often use me to relay his messages. We could take Harry today, and when it's discovered he's gone, you could both say you sent him with me, and that I said it was under Dumbledore's orders. You would have no reason to doubt that, and you would pass without scrutiny. I think that could work, but why are you so willing to take the blame? You would lose your reputation, all for a boy and his outcast guardians. Remus asked warily. You all have forced me to realize I've still got some prejudices to unpack, forgive me in my old age. That doesn't change the fact that we can be united in our agreement that Harry is innocent in all this, and needs to be protected, and Dumbledore is failing at that task. I'm retired, and my reputation... I'm known for my eccentric paranoia more so than any wartime heroics. My time has come and gone. I realize that I may have blown any chance of further involvement in ensuring the boy's safety because of your damned truth potion, which by the way is why you should never accept a cup from a stranger, I break my own rule one time and this is what it gets me. But I can still make a difference in this moment. Have me take the fall for it. Everyone looked to Remus who finally nodded once in begrudging agreement. All right, then the only thing left to do is talk with Harry. I'd like to have as much privacy as possible, perhaps Mooney and I could talk to him alone. Sirius asked. Would it be helpful to have me there? Harry has barely met you after all. Molly asked. Mooney knows him well, but perhaps you're right. He does view you as a mother figure. You're welcome to join us. Where would be best to have some privacy? They all looked around the crowded burrow. We could go to Arthur's shop out back. Molly finally said. Perhaps you should disguise yourself as a dog again. Okay, I'll turn into Padfoot and wait in your shop, and you and Mooney can join with Harry when he's ready. With this agreement struck, Sirius turned into Padfoot and followed Arthur outside to his shop, where he was left to wait for Harry. Chapter 30 A Conversation with Harry Remus waited at the kitchen table and shared another cup of tea with Arthur. Moody had taken his leave to stand in the garden, and Arthur had asked Charlie to keep him company. Molly went upstairs to wake up Harry and Ron. A few moments later, Harry and Ron came down the stairs yawning and rubbing their eyes. What's the idea, getting us up at half past six in the morning? We're still on holiday, Ron complained. We have visitors who need to talk to Harry. And I'm sorry to say it can't wait, Molly said from behind the boys, ushering them down the stairs. At this point they both looked up to see Arthur seated at the head of the table, and next to him facing the staircase, Remus. Hello again Ron, Harry, Remus said, and in that instant all other concerns were pushed to the back of his mind, because Harry was there in front of him, safe and sound. He hadn't realized how much he had needed to confirm it for himself but he felt a release of tension somewhere deep inside him that he'd been holding on to since the news announcer had unceremoniously informed them that Harry was in danger. He didn't let any of that show on his face, but instead focused on Harry's reaction. Harry's face lit up at the sight of his former teacher. Professor Lupin, I didn't expect to see you. Remus's face cracked a smile. I'm no longer your teacher, you don't have to call me professor anymore. He stopped short of saying what Harry should call him, as the idea of what he was actually going to be to the boy was still so murky. Harry nodded at the correction. You wanted to see me? Harry asked quizzically. Yes, I brought a friend with me, Padfoot, and he wants to see you too. He's in Arthur's shop out back if you want to come out and have a chat. Molly's going to join us, but I think it should be just the four of us for now. Padfoot is here. Do Padfoot and Mrs. Weasley, do they know each other? Harry said, looking confused. Yes, I know Padfoot, we get along. Molly said as she led them out of the kitchen. Ron made to follow, but Molly stopped him at the door. Hey, why can't I come too? 
Ron gave his mother an annoyed expression. Ron, this is just going to be for a few minutes then we'll be back, all right. Padfoot needs to see Harry by himself first. She gave him a look that held a multitude of unsaid assurances, and he finally nodded. Fine, see you in a bit, Harry. Ron said and turned back around sulkily to join Arthur at the table. Remus led the way to the shop followed by Harry and Molly. They entered the shop's dim light, and after a moment their eyes adjusted enough to see a cluttered workspace with heaps of muggle paraphernalia in various states of disassembly. There in front of them with his head rifling through a box full of rubber ducks was a large black dog. Padfoot! Harry cried out, causing him to raise his head out of the box holding a rubber ducky in his mouth. He immediately dropped it, and ran to Harry who hugged him around the neck. When they parted, Padfoot transformed into Sirius Black. Wait! Mrs. Weasley's here, he said looking afraid he let out a secret. It's okay, Molly knows, Sirius said. Why don't we all take a seat? Sirius pulled out a work stool from under the counter. Molly turned over a couple of crates for Harry and herself, and Remus found an ice chest to sit on. What's going on? Is everything okay? Harry asked. He was clearly picking up on the seriousness of the situation bringing them all together. Harry, do you remember after we met in the Shrieking Shack, how I offered to let you come stay with me? Sirius asked. Yeah, I do, Harry said, looking a little disappointed at the memory. At the time it sounded like something you might have wanted. Of course, I wanted that. My aunt and uncle. He started but then cut himself short. It's okay you can say whatever you want about them, Remus said from his seat next to Harry. I was just going to say I don't like living with them, Harry finally finished. But I understand why I have to, that Dumbledore wants me to, and you can't take me in because you're still on the run. Well, during the summer Remus and I have been working towards a more stable place for me to live and we found it. Thanks to Remus's friend Sarah, I've been granted asylum in Switzerland, Sirius said. Asylum? What's that? When someone isn't safe in their own country for a variety of reasons such as abuse or persecution, political unrest, or if they are wrongfully imprisoned or targeted for something they didn't do, they can go to another country where they think they'll be safe and ask them to grant them asylum, which is protection from their original country and citizenship in the new country. Remus explained. That's fantastic. So you're safe now, in Switzerland? Harry said. Yes, I am and I have a house I share with Remus, and Buckbeak is there too, and there's another bedroom for you too, Sirius said. That is, if you want it. You mean I can spend my summers with you? And Christmas? Harry asked excitedly. Yes, but it would actually be permanent, it would be more than just summer and Christmas, Sirius explained. Right, any time I'm not at Hogwarts. Well, if you come and stay with me, you wouldn't be able to go to Hogwarts, we would take care of your education in Switzerland. Why can't I go to Hogwarts? Harry looked worried. There's a few reasons. First, Britain still doesn't recognize my innocence, so if you were to stay with me and then return, they would probably try to put a stop to you coming back to me. Sirius said. Oh, right. Harry mumbled. But more importantly, I know you aren't safe at your aunt and uncle's, and I know you haven't been safe at Hogwarts either. That's why Wizarding Switzerland is going to offer you asylum as well. What are you talking about? I'm safe at Hogwarts. Dumbledore says it's the safest place for me, Harry insisted. Harry, in the last three years at Hogwarts, you've been in danger multiple times, Sirius said. That's because of Voldemort, not Hogwarts. Voldemort was indeed targeting you, but in those situations did you try to get help from Dumbledore and the teachers? Yes, of course, I did, Harry said defensively. Did they believe you? Were they even around when you needed them? No, but they were busy, Dumbledore was at the ministry, and McGonagall, she thought everything was safe as it was. She didn't understand. Harry said trying to defend his teachers, but then realized all he did was reaffirm the point Sirius made. It's not like that, he finally said. Right, so you ended up trying to save your friends or save the world all by yourself. You should never have had to do that, Dumbledore and those teachers failed to protect you, it was never your responsibility to defeat a dark wizard. Sirius said. Okay, but those were weird situations, it's not like that's going to happen again. He paused and his face clouded over, as if he realized it very likely would happen again. I love Hogwarts, 
That's where my friends are, my only friends. Let's say you're right, that you aren't going to be in life or death danger anymore. Is Hogwarts still safe for you? Or do you have teachers who taunt and bully you, who mistreat you? If you bring up this behavior to other teachers, to Dumbledore, do they step in and protect you, or do they defend that teacher instead? Remus asked. Harry didn't say anything, he just looked down at his hands. Harry, I don't know if you know this, but I didn't grow up in a safe home. I was abused, and I went to school every year at Hogwarts and tried to hide that because I was ashamed. But over the years it was harder to hide, and in fact, I'm sure some of my teachers knew, that Dumbledore knew, and none of them did anything. They just stood back and let it happen. I ran away at 16 and was taken in by the Potters. I had to get myself out of danger because no one was there to defend me. I don't want that to be the way it is for you too. I'm not, my aunt and uncle aren't nice, but they don't hit me, Harry said. I know how to handle it, I can put up with it if it's what I need to do. They don't have to hit you for it to be of use, Sirius said as he reached over and rested a hand on Harry's shoulder. Harry, I know from your letter this summer that they sometimes withhold meals. Do they ignore you, shout at you, insult you? Do you have to hide part of who you are from them because they don't approve, or think that part of you is bad? Do they ever lock you in your room? If you have a problem or a bad dream, can you go to them for help? At the last question, Harry's head snapped up and he looked at him with a mixture of surprise and fear. I ask because those are all things that happened to me before my parents started being physically abusive. Those were all the signs that looking back, I now see as red flags but at the time, I blamed myself, or I thought they were just strict, or that it was normal, but it's not. It's not normal to be afraid in your own home. I loved Hogwarts too, it was where I was safe. However, those teachers should have helped me get out of that but they didn't and that was their failure, not mine. Have you talked to Dumbledore about why you have to stay with your aunt and uncle? He said that when my mum died I was protected by some ancient magic, and that continues through my aunt, but if I were to live with someone else, I wouldn't be protected anymore. Remus shook his head. If you were safe in that home, then sure, that would be worth the ancient magical protection, but you aren't safe there, and I think living there even just for the summer does you more harm than good. I think anyone who says something different doesn't have your best interest in mind. But what if Voldemort comes back? Then I won't be protected by my mother's magic. Harry whispered. No, but you will be protected by Remus and me, and not to brag, but we can both hold our own. We're putting our house under every protection possible, and you'll be under the protection of the wizarding Swiss government, which is pretty powerful. More importantly, if you encounter something you think is dangerous, Remus and I will be right there to protect you. If you have a bad dream or have a problem with your friends, we'll be there to help you with that too. Then there's everything else. If you get good grades we'll be there to celebrate with you. We'll celebrate birthdays and holidays together, we'll go on vacation together. If I don't go to Hogwarts, where will I go to school? We would tutor you at home, and bring in a tutor for anything we didn't think we could cover. Remus has some experience teaching, and again, not to brag, but I'm pretty clever myself. But you won't be all alone, we've already made friends there, and Sarah's promised to put us in touch with families with kids your age. I know it'll be different, it will be an adjustment, but your friends can still come and visit you there and you'll make new friends too, I promise. We'll come and visit you, and write letters endlessly, Molly added. So what do you think? Will you hate us forever if we become your guardians? Remus asked. No, I won't hate you forever, Harry said, but Remus could tell he was still unsure. I wish I could say that you aren't still in danger. I wish I could say that Hogwarts is safe for you. I wish I could say that Dumbledore has your best interest at heart, but I can't say any of those things. Unfortunately, you do continue to be in danger, and despite Hogwarts' many defenses, danger continues to find you there. Dumbledore, I believe, has the greater good as his motivation, but if that greater good comes at the sacrifice of your safety, then it's not good enough. I think the people who care for you should have your best interest at heart and I know for a fact that Sirius and I have that, as well as the capability to make that happen, Remus said. I just, what if Dumbledore is right? What if I'm an important part of defeating Voldemort? Wouldn't it be selfish, would it be evil of me to run away? The future isn't set in stone. I truly believe there's more than one solution to every problem. Maybe you are going to play an important part in this war someday but it's not something you should have any part in until you're grown. The weight of the safety of all wizard kind should never be placed on the shoulders of one person, whether that be an old genius professor or a child, 
It's too much. No one can carry that alone. Anyone who expects that of you, they're the one in the wrong. It's not selfish to want to live a normal life, Harry. But we can't just, does Dumbledore know about this? He's the only thing keeping me safe. And he defended you, he's been looking for a way to prove your innocence. And you're talking about doing this behind his back. If we go against Dumbledore, then he's not going to be happy, does that make us his enemy? He's not the only one who wants to keep you safe, and what we're saying is he hasn't been doing a very good job of it. There are a multitude of things I agree with Dumbledore on. We both agree that blood purity is ridiculous, and Voldemort should be defeated for good, we both love books and knowledge and sweets. But there are things we disagree on too, and that's okay. The world isn't made up of good people and death eaters. There is light and dark in all of us, what matters is the part we choose to act on. Dumbledore and I disagree on the best way to protect you, but that's a little bigger than a disagreement over what the best flavor of jelly bean is. It's too important a disagreement not to act on. Dumbledore and I have talked and he refused to help us, so we're acting without his help, but that doesn't mean what we're doing is wrong. Dumbledore isn't a saint, he makes mistakes too. Sirius explained. Harry looked at Molly. What do you think I should do? Do you think I should go against Dumbledore? I think Dumbledore has other things at the center of his focus than your safety, and Remus and Sirius, they're making your well-being and safety their focus. If I could keep you in England and take you into my home and shield you myself I would, but that's not possible. So I think going with them is the best thing for you. She tried to keep the tears from her eyes but didn't quite succeed. Harry reached over and took her hand. When do we have to go? Harry asked. Today would be the best. The longer we wait the more likely our plan will be discovered, Remus answered. Today? Now? Can I say goodbye to my friends? Of course you can. We can take some time to say proper goodbyes, Sirius said. Harry was about to turn to leave but Sirius stopped him. How are we explaining this to the rest of the Weasleys? They all looked at Molly. Sirius, maybe you could be in dog form, and the rest of the kids will just be told that Harry is being escorted back early by Remus and Alistair. Harry can explain in more detail to Hermione and Ron privately. I think the whole truth will need to be explained after you leave. But we'll see you again real soon, I promise. Of course you will. How does Christmas in the Alps sound? Sirius asked. That sounds just perfect, Molly said. Oh good, Sirius said then reached into his pocket and brought out the pair of compact mirrors. They were a matching set. One had a black cover with a gold art deco sunburst and a mother of pearl inlay in the shape of AP in the center. The other was a gold cover with a black sunburst in the same style. One more thing. These belong to James. He gave me one and kept the other. They're enchanted for communication. You can open it up and talk to whoever has the other one. I think it's time to pass this on to you. You can give the other one to your friends, and that way you can communicate more easily. Serious, this is incredible. I don't know what to say. Thank you. Harry stuttered out his thanks, examining the mirrors closely. He reached out to hug Sirius again before leaving the shop and leading the way back to the house. Sirius followed as Padfoot. Chapter 31 Harry Potter Interlude Harry entered the burrow again and pulled Ron up the stairs with him without a word of explanation. They woke Hermione on their way up to Ron's room. Now they were alone, staring at him, and he still didn't know how to tell them, or what to do. What's going on? Hermione asked as she rubbed sleep out of her eyes. When Harry still said nothing, Ron answered for him. Professor Lupin and Sirius are downstairs. What? Sirius is downstairs. But your parents? Hermione said, shocked. Yeah, well apparently they're in the loop now too, they seem pretty chill about everything. Ron said. Why are they here? Hermione directed her question to Ron, as Harry had yet to find his voice. I don't know, they took Harry aside and talked to him for a while, and then he came back in and pulled us up here. I'm right here, you know. Harry finally spoke. Right mate, sorry, you were just being really quiet so I thought I'd fill her in on what I knew. Ron looked at Harry with a hint of bewilderment, unsure of what exactly was happening. Yeah Harry. Sorry, Hermione said. What did Sirius want to talk about? He wants me to come live with him, Harry answered resigned. 
Really? That's such good news. Hermione looked at Harry's expression and her confidence faltered. Isn't it? Yeah, it is. It's just, he's found a place in Switzerland, so it's really far away, and he says I'm not safe at Hogwarts either. If I go and stay with him, I can never come back to England again, and I can't go to Hogwarts anymore. Oh my gosh, that's terrible. Hermione and Ron's faces fell as he explained. Yeah. They said, they said I was being abused and Dumbledore doesn't have my best interest in mind, that he's not doing all he can to protect me. What? That's ridiculous. This is Dumbledore we're talking about. Ron exclaimed, but Hermione shot him a look. I take it you disagree, Harry asked. Hermione looked down at her feet. I don't know, it's just that you have had to do some pretty dire things all on your own because Dumbledore wasn't around, and this year he even expressly sent you into danger to save Sirius. Yeah, but like, that was different, he had other things he was doing, I had to do those things. Harry couldn't even form a complete thought anymore. Exactly, you had to do those things because Dumbledore had other things he was doing. Maybe if you're with Sirius and Remus it will be better, and you won't have to go back to your aunt and uncle, not ever. Hermione pointed out. But I won't go to Hogwarts anymore either, and you guys, I won't see you guys every day, and Quidditch. I won't get to play Quidditch. Harry kept thinking of things he wouldn't get to do, like visit Hagrid, or eat in the Great Hall. Yeah, but it's not like you're going back to the Muggle world. You're still going to learn magic, and doesn't Sirius fly? I bet he'll play Quidditch with you. And we'll write to you loads and loads and visit you, I promise. Hermione said. You really think I should go then, don't you? You think I'm in that much danger? Harry was finally grasping the seriousness of his situation. Yeah mate, I reckon you are, Ron said. But I can't just run away. I have to face this, don't I? It's my responsibility to face this. Your responsibility? Who told you that? The safety of all of Wizarding Britain shouldn't rest on your shoulders. Hermione exclaimed. That's what Sirius said. Harry threw up his hands. He was so confused. Forget responsibility, what do you want to do? Ron asked. Harry paused to think. I want to live with Sirius and Remus. I don't ever want to go to my aunt again, even if it means I can't go to Hogwarts. I, I don't want to fight Voldemort. Harry admitted finally. But I have to, I have to do all those things, and I can't just run away. You think you have to do those things because Dumbledore said so, but Sirius and Remus want you know who defeated just as much as Dumbledore, they just also happen to care a great deal for your safety. If they think there's a way to defeat you-know-who without pulling you into it, then you should go with them. Hermione said. But that's just it, isn't it? They don't know how to defeat Voldemort, they're putting my safety above the defeat of Voldemort, which is only going to get them hurt. Voldemort is still going to rise to power, and I'm still going to have to defeat him, only I'll have to do it without Dumbledore's help, and he's the only one Voldemort's afraid of. No. None of that is known, you're just letting fear take over. It's just as likely that you going with Sirius will save lives. Dumbledore's a genius, sure, but he doesn't know everything. He didn't know that Sirius wasn't guilty, he didn't know he was an Animagius, and he didn't know how to get into the Chamber of Secrets. Don't you think that he may also be wrong about your role in defeating you-know-who? Hermione persisted. It just doesn't feel very courageous, running away. Harry slumped a little as he said it. I don't know, leaving Hogwarts and Britain, maybe forever, that's pretty brave. You're gonna to be going into this completely unsure of how it will turn out, and going with new guardians too. Just think about how your mum and dad wanted you to be with Sirius this whole time, it's almost like you are honouring him, or something, Ron said. Hermione was staring at Ron strangely, as if she wasn't sure if he was helping or hurting their argument. She finally looked towards Harry. At least try it. I'm sure Dumbledore won't hold it against you if you change your mind later and end up coming back. Okay, I'll go. Harry straightened his shoulders in determination, reached into his pocket, and pulled out the mirror Sirius had just given him. Sirius just gave these to me. They belong to my dad. He said they're magical communicators that we can use to keep in touch. Harry held out one of the mirrors between them. They both stared at it with wide eyes. Which one of us? Ron started but Hermione interrupted. You should take it, Ron. Wait, why, are you sure? Ron said. Yes, it makes the most sense for you to take it. 
Hermione insisted. Well, all right then, Ron said as he took the mirror in his hands, trying and failing to hide a smile. Harry got up and moved to his trunk. He rummaged around in the detritus until he pulled out a folded piece of parchment. Walking back to Ron and Hermione, he held the parchment out. You should take this too. I won't have much use for it. Harry, no, Hermione said, but Ron was already reaching out for it. It was your father's, you should keep it. She went on, glaring at Ron. Sure, but it was also Fred and George's last, and it really should have gone to Ron next. Harry tried to pass off this as the reason. In truth, he thought Ron and Hermione might still be in danger at Hogwarts, even with him out of the picture. Knowing they had the map would be of more comfort to him than watching their footsteps as they walked the halls of Hogwarts without him. Blimey mate, this is too much, Ron exclaimed, still holding on to the parchment. Yeah, well, just use it to keep yourselves safe, okay, Harry said. Oh, Harry. Hermione had tears in her eyes as she suddenly pulled him into a hug. Harry was surprised, but glad for the comfort, and Hermione reached out and pulled Ron into the hug as well. When they finally parted, Hermione wiped away the tears and they all headed back downstairs to join the adults. Remus watched as Harry and his friends came downstairs together, looking somber. It struck him just then just how hard this was going to be for Harry. They had joked about him hating them, but he now saw that as a very real possibility. He silently promised himself to do everything he could to make sure that didn't happen. Okay, I'm ready to come with you. Harry looked much more determined, or perhaps resigned to his decision now. Remus did his best to maintain a positive air. Of course, they didn't leave right away. Arthur had to set off for work, but Molly insisted everyone else stay for breakfast. Slowly the other kids woke up and joined the group. It was explained to them all that Harry was leaving with Moody and Remus to go to Hogwarts early, just as they had agreed on in the shed. They seemed to cotton on to the fact that something more serious was afoot when it came time to say goodbye and Harry and his friends were so upset, but nothing was said in the moment, and they were on their way out the door before noon. Before leaving, Moody and Charlie pulled Sirius aside, but Remus could still hear what they said from where he stood with Harry. I understand if you don't want me to join you, but if you agree, I'd like to send your cousin to you, Moody said. Andromeda. Sirius asked, surprised. Almost. Her child, Tonks. I trained them as an oar, and they just graduated. They're about to start at the ministry, but I think I could convince them to take a gap year. You're talking about Nymphadora? Sirius asked. Yeah, but they don't use that name anymore, they're just Tonks, and they use they, them pronouns. Charlie explained. Little Tonks all grown up and becoming an oar, huh? Sirius's voice was softer, as he remembered the last time he'd seen them. You think they'd come around to believing I'm innocent? I do, Charlie said, and Moody nodded beside him. Well, we could use all the help we can get, and I always got along with Andromeda. If you can convince them, have them send me a letter and we'll arrange for them to get to us. Chapter 32 Back Home When they finally arrived in Switzerland, Remus and Sirius gave Harry a tour of the house, ending in the sitting room. So what do you think? It came pre-furnished, so it's not really our usual style, but we've got time to fix that. Sirius explained. Oh, it's really nice. He paused awkwardly. Something wrong? Remus asked, picking up on his discomfort. No. Nothing, I just, I only saw two bedrooms. He finally said. Yeah, one for us, and one for you. Sirius said, not understanding the problem. Oh, you don't have to do that, I can sleep on the couch or something. Harry said awkwardly. What? Remus and Sirius said, and both looked at each other in confusion. You don't have to share a room just so I can have my own room. Harry repeated. Oh. oh. They both realized it at the same time. No, Harry, no. We like sharing a room. Remus said by way of explanation. Oh my god this is the worst way to do this. We should have explained sooner, Sirius said, rubbing his hands over his face. Explained what? Harry asked, still not getting it. Sirius cleared his throat. Right, okay. We're gay. And we're together. 
Remus added, gesturing between himself and Sirius, and when Harry still stared at them blankly, he added, Like, a couple. Oh. Harry finally understood, but obviously didn't know what to do with this revelation. Of course, he said, as his face blushed in embarrassment. We perhaps should have told you that before you left Hogwarts to move in with us, Sirius said regretfully. To be fair, we had other things we were worried about explaining. This one just kind of slipped our minds. Remus added with a nervous chuckle. Don't even worry about it, Harry said, looking as if he very much wanted out of this conversation. So the second room is mine then? Yes. All yours, Sirius said. They both watched as Harry exited the room and entered his new room, closing the door immediately. Well, that could have gone better. Remus said as he led a slow retreat to their own bedroom, his prominent limp worse than ever. I thought it was obvious. We said come live with us at our house in Switzerland. Over the summer we traveled the continent and decided to immigrate to a foreign country together. What about that reads? Just friends? Sirius asked, shutting the door behind him. Remus crawled into bed and tried to find a comfortable position. It was barely afternoon, and he was exhausted. Apparently it's not obvious. We could be two bachelors in our thirties living together. Just close friends. Roomies. Besties. Pals. Comrades. Definitely nothing romantic. Don't be so ridiculous. The very idea. Sirius laughed, and Remus joined in. Harry had been quiet since they brought him home. It was a big adjustment and they both gave him some time and space to process. They were both in the sitting room reading when Harry poked his head around the corner that evening. They put down their books and looked over to him. Can I talk to you about something? Harry said as he came around the corner and stood awkwardly just inside the room. Of course, Sirius said, trying to be casual, but still coming across too excited. Anything, Remus added, not helping to keep it casual at all. You had said, back in the shed, you mentioned coming to you about bad dreams. He paused for a moment. Remus was just about to encourage him to continue when he did so by himself. I had a bad dream. Come here and tell us about it. Sirius put a bookmark in his book, set it on the side table, and shifted on the sofa to make room for Harry to join him. Remus closed his book as well and leaned forward as Harry walked over and sat next to Sirius. He didn't even bother putting a bookmark in, he hadn't been able to focus on it anyway. It was the same night I woke up with my scar hurting. I didn't include the dream in my letter because I didn't want you to worry. It was about Voldemort and Wormtail. I don't remember all the details, it all kind of slipped away when I woke up, but I remember there was a giant snake, and they were talking about someone they killed, and they were. Harry trailed off, as if he couldn't bring himself to share the rest. It's okay Harry take your time. Sirius soothed. They were planning on killing someone else. It was me. They were planning to kill me and... Harry sighed as he continued. I'm pretty sure I watched him attack an old man in the dream. The old man overheard them and Voldemort attacked him and he fell to the ground and then I woke up. Remus and Sirius made eye contact over Harry's head who was looking down into his lap. That's awful. I'm so sorry you had that dream. That must have been very scary to wake up from that. Sirius finally said. Did you tell anyone about that dream? Remus asked him softly. Ron and Hermione, after the cup, Harry said. I didn't want to write to you about it because I knew you already had a lot going on and I didn't want to worry you. That's okay, I understand. I'm just glad you told me now. I know how hard it can be to talk about bad dreams, Sirius said. You get bad dreams too. Sirius took a deep breath before answering. Yeah, I do. All the time. Do you think it's just a dream? Or do you think, you don't think what I saw actually happened, do you? Harry asked, but he looked like he already knew the answer. Is this the first time you've had one of these dreams? Remus asked. Yeah, but my scar hurt, and the last time my scar hurt like this it was because Voldemort was possessing one of my teachers. It could be a coincidence, or it could be that you glimpsed into something real. Remus said finally. But if it's real that means he's back. It means he's still after me. Harry brought his knees up to his chest. Sirius wrapped his arms around him. We're going to figure this out together, okay? We're going to protect you. Sirius almost whispered. 
The last time Voldemort came after me outside of Hogwarts, both my parents died. Harry whispered. That's not going to happen this time, okay. Sirius whispered back. Holy hell, Remus said as he sat on the edge of their bed later that night. Sirius was pacing the room, full of nerves. Remus put a silencing charm on the room. He didn't want Harry to hear them talking about him. They would still be able to hear him if he knocked. Or if there was a sudden attack and he was kidnapped the day they brought him home, just as an example. Why did you tell him it was real? Sirius said exasperated. I didn't say that. I said it may be real. We can't lie to him about this. That's what he expects. That's what Dumbledore's been doing. We have to prove to him that we're different, that we know the seriousness of the situation. If we play it off as nothing and he disagrees, he's not going to come back to us with any new concerns, he's just gonna go solve it himself. Remus gestured toward the door, and Harry on the other side. Right. You're right of course. We have to make this place unplottable. We have to contact Sarah and get him started on asylum right away. We have to get help protecting him, but we can't trust anyone. Sirius started counting off each point on his fingers as he spoke. What if we're betrayed again? Harry's right, this is a disaster. We can send Sarah a Patronus, she'll handle the asylum, and she's got connections to help with protection. We can't think like that, we trust each other, and we'll keep as much as we can private, but we have to trust people, we can't cut ourselves off from the world. Weren't you the one who said that just a month ago? Remus tried to calm Sirius, to be the voice of reason. Yeah, when it was just us, now we have Harry who we know is in danger. Sirius argued back, then paused his frantic pacing abruptly. Do you think he's a seer? Maybe, but I have a feeling the magic at play here is much darker and more nefarious than that. Remus had theories or hunches percolating in the back of his mind as to what type of evil might be at work here, but none that would do anything to help calm Sirius down, so he kept them to himself, for now. That's what I was afraid you'd say. Sirius came and sat down next to Remus on the bed. Do you think we did the right thing? Remus reached over and took Sirius's hand in a calming gesture. Look, the way I see it, if we hadn't taken him, Harry would have kept that dream to himself, and no one would know about it. At least now we know where Pettigrew went. And it's the worst case scenario. I should have killed him when I had the chance. Sirius almost growled. We can't let ourselves get distracted by Pettigrew. They're after Harry, what's their first move? Remus asked. Well, they think Harry is going back to Hogwarts. So they either have to wait for him to go on holiday or somehow infiltrate the school. Sirius answered. Harry would normally spend Christmas at Hogwarts, so unless they are waiting till next summer to try their plan, it would have to be at Hogwarts. Remus hypothesized. So, how would Voldemort infiltrate Hogwarts? Sirius continued. Well, he's already done that once, in first year by possessing the dark arts teacher. Remus recalled. Right, but surely he wouldn't do that again, right? How many times can you pull the same trick? Sirius said as he dismissed the idea. Well, there is the Triwizard Tournament this year. That introduces a lot of new faces to Hogwarts. Or old ones. You think it's Karkaroff, don't you? Remus asked. It makes sense. It does at face value, yes. Don't you think Voldemort would want someone who isn't as big of a suspect? Karkaroff is a known Death Eater, Remus pondered. So was Snape, but he's still teaching at Hogwarts, Sirius pointed out. Remus sighed as their conversation lulled. We aren't going to solve this tonight, that's for sure. Tomorrow we'll get the ball rolling, message Sarah, and brainstorm allies we can trust and who might believe you're innocent. Sirius looked up at him at that. Did you overhear my conversation with Moody before we left the borough? I did, yes. Do you know much about them? Tonks. Honestly, no. Like I said, up until last year, I was barely ever in the wizarding community. I didn't keep in touch with very many people after the war. Sirius was quiet for a minute. I don't know if it's entirely wise, but I want to meet them. I want to meet them so bad. Let's reach out to them, and see what we think of them. Yeah. Sirius said, hopeful. Yeah, any help we can get would be great. August 24, 1994 Remus didn't sleep well that night. 
It felt like his pain was increasing by the hour, and he couldn't find a comfortable position. Sirius even woke up and transfigured a heating pad for him in the middle of the night. He finally fell asleep around five, dreading the morning. Consciousness suddenly returned to him when a sharp jolt of pain shot through his leg. It was so painful and startling, he cried out, trying to find relief, trying to stretch the muscles or find a different position. Sirius came running into the room at the sound of Remus's shout, holding his wand aloft. What happened? Are you okay? Seeing no danger in the room, he lowered his wand and rushed to Remus, who was still working through the pain as it ebbed and flowed like the tide. It's okay, he grunted, trying to sit up, but easing back down when it put too much pressure on his hip. I, I'm just, it's just my hip, he grunted out, breathing heavily. Sirius was at his side with a worried look on his face. Remus wished he hadn't been quite so vocal, he hadn't wanted to upset Sirius. His ebony wand appeared again and in a flash two potion bottles whizzed across the room to him, and he handed the pain relief potion to Remus and held up the sleeping potion. Remus took the pain potion immediately, but shook his head at the other. I can't go back to sleep, we've got too much to do today. What time is it? You were tossing and turning all night, it's not even eight, and you've gotten less than three hours of sleep. I've already sent Sarah a Patronus, she's coming over first thing to meet Harry. I definitely need to be awake for that, Remus said trying again to sit up, but Sirius rested his hand on his shoulder, gently holding him in place. Remus didn't have much in him to fight back, so he sank back into the mattress. I've got this, Sirius said gently, as he took Remus's hand. You haven't had a chance to rest since the moon. You've been rushing around, full of stress, and not using your wheelchair, even though I know you're in pain. I didn't want Dumbledore or Moody to. I know. I understand. I'm just saying it's time to rest now. Sirius ran his hand through Remus's hair, and Remus's eyes closed. He was so tired. But, Harry. Harry's fine. He and I will meet with Sarah, and we'll tell you all about it when you wake up. Did you write to Tonks? Remus persisted. Yes, I wrote to them. I just need to ask Harry if I can have Hedwig deliver it for me. Sirius replied. We have to arrange schooling. We don't have to do that today. Sirius cut him off. I'll mention it to Sarah, see if she has anyone in mind who can tutor him in our less than stellar subjects. You have to warn her about. I will. And ask her about the investigation. Remus insisted. I will. Sirius repeated. You should be writing this down. Mooney. Sirius chuckled. I have it handled. The same questions are racing through my head nonstop too. We'll figure it all out, and you'll help. But first, you need to rest. Please Mooney, for me. Remus sighed. Fine, but I'm only sleeping in because I love you. No other motivations. Sirius laughed again. Only as a favor to you, and don't you forget it. Remus said as he cracked a smile. You'll do anything for love, Harmony. Even this. Remus said as Sirius leaned in for a kiss and placed the second potion in his open hand. Need another heating pad? Yes, please. Remus tried to reposition himself, and another twinge went through his hip. He stifled a groan and stopped moving, resigned to being uncomfortable in whatever position he was in. Soon he had his heating pad, and he drank the potion, willing it to work quickly to take him into the blissful emptiness of sleep, even though it never lasted long enough, and the pain was always there waiting for him to wake. The sun was ebbing lower in the sky when Remus finally woke up again. As always, the pain instantly enveloped him in its grasp. His eyes fluttered open and he shifted positions, trying and failing to break free from its clutches. When he rolled over, he was suddenly aware that he wasn't alone. Harry sat next to him in the same chair Sirius had been in hours before, imploring him to rest. He was reading a book, but as soon as Remus started to move, his eyes shot up and met his, in awkward nervousness. Hello, Harry. Remus croaked sleepily, then cleared his throat. Hi, Professor, I mean hi, hi Lupin. He remembered his request not to be called Professor a little too late, and stumbled over his greeting. Remus smiled. How about we stick with Remus for now, hm? Subject to change if a better name comes along. 
Harry smiled back at him. All right. I hope it's okay that I'm in here, Sirius said you wouldn't mind, and I didn't want to be alone. Alone? Where's Sirius? He's in the other room with Sarah, they said they had to talk about some things in private. Ah, I see. It's fine that you came in here. I'm glad for the company. Oh. Harry shifted in his chair and produced two bottles from the nightstand drawer. Sirius also said to offer you these when you woke up, and let you know there's some food under a stasis charm, I can bring to you if you want. I'll take the pain potion, but not the sleep potion. If I sleep any more today I'll have none left for the night, and I'll become fully nocturnal, wandering the house like Mrs. Norris. Harry's concerned face broke with a chuckle. I'll take you up on the food as well, if you don't mind fetching it for me. He didn't even feel up for a summoning charm at the moment. Of course, Harry said as he exited the room. While he was gone, Remus rearranged his pillows and came to a sitting position. The sleep did do him some good. He could at least sit up without gasping in pain. His energy levels were still low, despite all the rest. His head felt fuzzy and tingly like he wasn't fully conscious. Soon Harry was back with a bowl of hearty beef stew with large chunks of carrots and potatoes. Thank you, Remus said as he took the hot bowl from him. He was starving. He hadn't eaten since dinner the night before, and it was evening again. He took several bites before returning to their conversation. I'm sorry I slept through your meeting with Sarah. That's okay, Sirius explained that you had a rough few days. I suppose I'm to blame for that. I'm sorry for all the trouble you went through. Oh Harry, you aren't to blame for this. I just pushed off recovery a little too long, and there were other things we were dealing with that caused it, it wasn't you. Remus thought to himself that Harry was worth any trouble they might face. Right, Harry said. Remus could tell he was working through everything that had happened in the last 48 hours. If you want to talk about anything, I'm here, Remus said, not knowing what else to say. Nothing. It's just, it's not just you that's gone through trouble, is it? The Weasleys are lying for me, and so are Ron and Hermione. Moody's taking the fall, and Sarah's talking about the Swiss government, and there's probably going to be an international incident when everyone finds out, all because I'm running away from the real problem. I should have stayed, I should have been a bloody Gryffindor about it. I should have listened to Dumbledore. I can't run away from this, people tend to come to serious harm when they try to protect me. If I just face it alone, then no one else has to get hurt. Harry began to fidget in his chair with nervous energy. You shouldn't have to face this at all, Remus said, exasperated. It doesn't matter if I should have to or not, I am facing it. Just because it's not fair doesn't change that it's happening. It is happening. The only thing I have any control over is how I react, and if by facing it head-on I can have any better chance of beating Voldemort for good, isn't it selfish for me not to do it? Harry was leaning forward in his chair now. No one really knows how best to defeat Voldemort. Even Dumbledore is just making educated guesses. Harry didn't seem convinced, but Remus continued. Look at it this way. If it wasn't you, but instead was Ron, or Hermione, or someone younger than you, Ginny. If one of them was the target of all of Voldemort's wrath, would you think them a coward for finding a safer place to live? If one of them was living in the same conditions you were in at your aunt's and uncle's, would you advise them to stay? Harry didn't respond right away, but he could tell he was working through that change of perspective. No, there's no way I'd have them stay in that. So why do you think you deserve less than them? Because a dark wizard is fixated on you. No, that doesn't make any sense. So let Sirius and me help you, please. Trust us when we say you don't have to do it that way. You don't have to face this alone, Remus implored. Harry met his eyes and held his gaze for a long time, before looking out the window. I just can't stop wondering about what my dad would have done in this situation. I can't imagine him running away from his problems. Remus sighed. You're right about that, he had a tendency to run right into danger, and if there wasn't any around, he made his own. He chuckled a little. He loved Hogwarts and loved his friends but he was never in any danger at Hogwarts. Even so, I do know exactly what he would have done if someone he loved was in danger from a dark wizard, because it happened. When James figured out that Sirius was in danger at home from his parents, he did everything he could to try to get him out of there before it got bad. 
And then when Sirius ran away and appeared on his doorstep, James didn't send him back and tell him to be a bloody Gryffindor about it. No, he and his Gryffindor parents looked at that runaway and said you're my brother now, you're my son. You don't ever have to go back to your abuser again. Harry looked back at Remus with watery eyes as he continued. Sometimes running away from a dangerous situation is the bravest thing you can do. Harry only nodded with a quivering lip. There was a quiet knock at the door before Sirius and Sarah opened it further to enter the room. Harry quickly wiped his eyes and cleared his throat, but Sirius didn't notice. Instead, seeing Remus was awake, he came over to the bed and took the empty bowl from him, setting it on the nightstand. He leaned over and quickly kissed his forehead, then sat next to him on the bed. How are you feeling? He asked quietly. Better, Remus said with as much pep as he could muster. It wasn't a lie, he was able to sit up, and he was much more rested than he had been that morning. He was still in a lot of pain, and his head felt like it was floating above his body, but he didn't mention that. During his conversation with Harry, he had been able to distract himself, but now with the focus back on the pain, it sprung to the forefront of his mind. Sirius made eye contact with him, with a studying gaze sizing up if he believed him. Remus glanced for a moment at Harry, then back at Sirius as if to communicate he didn't want to complain too much about it in front of him. Sirius gave a slight nod in understanding. Remus turned his attention to Sarah. Sarah, I'm sorry I missed the meeting this morning. Nothing to apologize for, I of all people understand. These last few days have been exhausting, Sarah said. I hope you and Ian have been able to rest as well, Remus asked. Yes, we're doing much better. That's good to hear. Thank you again for all you are doing for us. We can never thank you enough. Oh, don't mention it. Is everything settled? Remus asked. It's getting there. We reached out to the powers that be and so far there has been little resistance to accepting Harry's plea for asylum. I think the recent attack by Death Eaters at the Cup was fresh in their minds, highlighting the danger still present. Remus let out a sigh of relief. That's wonderful. Yes, we still need to come up with a strategy to protect against the backlash when it's discovered he's missing on the first. We've got a little time to figure that out, though. Have you heard anything from Natalie? Not personally, but Ian has talked with her. The investigation is ongoing, I don't know much else. It's only been a few days, I imagine it may take a while. Right, Remus said. I'm going to go check on Buckby, care to join me, Harry? Sirius asked somewhat abruptly. Remus gave him a curious look. Oh, sure, I'd love to. Harry perked up a little at the mention of the hippogriff. The two left the room, leaving Remus alone with Sarah, who took the seat Harry vacated. As soon as they heard the back door close, Sarah spoke again. So how are you, really? Remus sighed and leaned his head back against the pillow. I'm. He stopped short of saying I'm fine. He couldn't hide anything from her. She knew the game too well herself. I've certainly been better, he finally admitted. Sirius is concerned after what the medic said after the moon, and frankly, so am I. I'll be okay. I just need to rest a little, recover. I pushed myself too much, and I'm paying for it now, but... Sarah cut him off. Remus, he said it was your magical core. That's not something you can ignore. What do you want me to do? Remus finally broke. Go to the hospital. Just walk in and give them the whole medical history. I can't do that. You know I can't do that. Remus, this isn't England. You don't have to live in hiding anymore. I see a healer. Ian sees a healer. There are even specialists. I've heard of what the specialists do. They study us. They try to work out ways to control us, to protect the general population, but never help us. We're a curiosity at best, and at worst, an experiment. I'm not interested. Sarah took a deep breath. When she finally spoke again, it was calmer, softer. It's not like that anymore, Remus. Not with my healers. I'll be sure you get the best of care. Please, you can't go on like this, and you don't have to. Remus's face crumpled from anger and frustration to fear in a flash. Sarah, I cannot do that. I will not do that. Sarah stood suddenly. God damn it, Remus. 
If you'd rather suffer than accept the help that is right in front of you, that's your right, but I won't watch you do it to yourself. She didn't give Remus a chance to respond, but quickly rushed out of the room. Sirius came back into the bedroom not long after Sarah left the house. Sarah had to get back to the office. Right, Remus sighed. Next time you want to say something to me, you can come say it to me directly. You don't have to send a courier. I didn't send her in here. I actually tried to convince her you wouldn't listen. What? Sirius sighed. Yeah, we talked about you. We're worried about you. But I've known you long enough to know that the more I fight you on something the more you dig your heels in. I don't want to fight you on this. But I've also known us long enough to know that as long as we are fighting for each other and not against each other, we'll be okay. What's that mean? Sirius actually chuckled a little. I tried so hard at the beginning of this summer to not fight with you. I was so afraid we were going to fall into old habits, or whatever. That didn't last long. No, it didn't, but do you know what we fight about now? We fight about protecting each other. We fight about keeping each other safe. I am fighting so hard for you and you are fighting so hard for me, and we disagree sometimes about the best way to accomplish both of those things simultaneously, but we still trust each other. I don't want to fight with you ever again, but I'd gladly fight for you for the rest of my life. It's not fair for you to say those kinds of things when I can't jump you, you know that right. Sirius smiled. You want to jump me, right now. Harry is just in the other room, you know. Get the fuck over here and kiss me at least. So he did. Chapter 33 Facing Fears Remus had finally gotten to sleep around two in the morning. He had taken another sleeping potion in an effort to avoid a recurrence of the previous night. This did mean that it was well into the morning by the time he finally woke. He was still exhausted. Two sleeping potions and a full day's rest should have had him well on the road to recovery, but he felt absolutely terrible. It wasn't just the pain, which was a constant at this point. It was a weariness, an atrophy of his very being. He had pushed his body beyond its limit, and then with the help of the strengthening elixir and the pepper-up potion, he had continued far and away from what he could manage. There was nothing else left but to face the truth of it, and with it the dread that he was finally beyond his own capabilities of healing. It was in this state that Sirius found him after knocking on their bedroom door. Remus called out some sort of grunt as an indication he could enter but made no effort to sit up. Sirius came over without a word and climbed into the bed to lay next to Remus so they were both lying on their sides, facing each other. Remus opened his hand and slid it on the bed toward Sirius who took it in both of his. I'd ask you how you're feeling, but I think I can deduce it for myself. Sirius looked at him with deep concern in his eyes. I look that bad, do I? Remus managed a sad smile. Sirius shook his head almost imperceptibly. Handsome as ever, just a little green around the gills. I don't know what to do, Sirius. I, I can't. His voice cut off as tears sprung to his eyes. Sirius sighed. You know, a wise wizard once told me there's no shame in asking for help. Can I tell you a secret? Always. That wizard was talking out of his ass. They both broke into laughter and tears. Sirius finally spoke. Yeah, I suppose that's true most of the time, but in this case, I think it's exceedingly good advice. Remus took a deep breath and released it. I'm so fucking scared, Sirius. What are you scared of, love? That it'll be too late. That I've put it off too long. That they'll judge me for my condition. That they'll treat me differently. Remus paused for a moment before finally continuing. That they'll rob me of my dignity. Hmm. Sirius listened to him and paused considering his response while running his thumb over the top of Remus's hand as he continued to hold it. Those are all extremely valid fears. But we won't know unless we try, and I'll be there with you every step of the way. There was silence again as Sirius formed his next thought. I think this is one of those times where you don't have the luxury of turning away help. There's no shame in being a werewolf or asking for help, but even if there was, take help anyway, dignity be damned. Remus sighed deeply and almost chuckled. Oh Merlin, why does that exceedingly handsome wise wizard you get all your quotes from have to make such damned good points? Remus closed his eyes and tried to think. He thought of Madame Pomfrey 
and how caring she had always been to him, even though he was the first and only werewolf she'd ever treated. He thought of dodging the registry when he turned 18, and how that cut him off from seeking any professional medical care ever since. He thought of all the scrapes, bruises, broken bones, and bites he had healed on his own and every scar they had left behind on his body. It had been enough to survive. That's what he was good at, surviving. Maybe it was time to strive for more than merely surviving. If not for his own sake, for the sake of being here as long as possible with Sirius and Harry. Besides, Sarah was right, this was beyond his capability to heal. It was likely beyond Poppy's capabilities as well. He finally nodded his head. Dignity be damned. That's fucking right. Sirius grinned at him and squeezed his hand. Tears welled in his eyes. Sirius left the room to start to gather what they may need for the trip to the hospital, and when he returned a moment later, in walked Ian and Sarah behind him. When did you get here? Remus asked bemused. We arrived about a half hour ago. I'm going to stay with Harry. Sirius and Ian are going with you. Sarah said matter-of-factly. Did you have a whole plan? What if I'd said no? Ian would have come in here and gotten all philosophical on you. Sirius waved a floppy wrist hand in Ian's direction. I'm a bit sorry I missed out on that, Remus said, resting his head back on the pillow. Me too, I had a whole speech prepared, Ian said. I tell you what, I'll fill you in on the good bits once you've recovered. We've got to get you moving. Right. Remus took a deep breath and let it out. He thought of trying to get up himself but quickly dismissed the idea. Well, what are you waiting for? Come over here and help me up. Sirius cast a levitation spell to bring Remus gently into his chair. Thank you. I need my wand. Sirius grabbed his wand from the nightstand as well as his glasses. And my book. Sirius grabbed the book on top of the pile next to his bed. No, not that one. I don't want to scare the healers if they see the title. The next one down, the novel. Sirius looked at the title of the book he held. The Forbidden Magic of Defying Death. Yeah, best leave that one here. Strictly for oppositional research, I assure you. Sirius passed Remus his copy of Le Miserable and rolled his eyes. Yes, this one's far less depressing. Remus managed a chuckle. They made their way to the sitting room, where Harry was waiting with eyes wide. Hello, Harry, Remus said. Hi, Remus. His eyes darted from Remus to Sirius. Don't worry about a thing. Mooney is still under the weather, so we're going to take him to hospital. Sarah's going to stay here with you. I know you're much too old to need a sitter, but most 14-year-olds aren't refugees in a foreign country running from dark wizards so there you go. No, I get it. His eyes darted back to Remus, and his voice was a whisper when he asked. Is Remus going to be okay? Of course he is. Just needs a little more help than we're capable of on our own. Sirius whispered back. If you need anything at all, send a Patronus message. Harry nodded his head and the crew parted ways. As soon as they were outside, Sirius turned back to Remus. How are you feeling about upper rating? It's not going to be comfortable, but if you take me side along, I'll be okay. Okay, we'll be there lickety split. Three, two, one. Sirius held Remus's hand tight and counted down. Instantly, his body felt like it was crushing in on itself as he spun magically forward. His grip grew slack on Sirius's hand, but Sirius held fast and didn't let go. Thankfully, he hadn't tried to do it himself. There was no way he would have maintained focus. The pain was worse than any other time he'd apparated before. It felt like he was being ripped in half. Finally, they landed softly at the doors of the hospital, but to Remus, his whole world was still spinning. He closed his eyes and tried to take deep breaths. It was all he could do to keep the contents of his stomach down. He broke out in a cold sweat. He flailed his hand around searching blindly for Sirius. Sirius, Sirius, was all he managed. Sirius was right there and grabbed his hand. I'm here, I've got you, Sirius said from his side as Ian was pushing his chair into the building. We need a healer. Ian yelled out from behind Remus as they came into the atrium. All around him, he heard bustling and wicks calling to each other. 
Sirius was talking hurriedly with one of the healers at his side, but it was difficult for Remus to focus on what they were saying. He was still trying to get the room to stop spinning. It was a great accomplishment that he was still seated in his chair. The word werewolf came to him over the din somewhere in the conversation Sirius was having with the healers, but he couldn't pick anything else out. He felt a hand on his shoulder and through the haze, he heard Sirius saying his name. Mooney. Remus. Are you with us? Sirius sounded scared. He didn't want to scare him. Remus tried to answer him. Hem. Was all he could manage. We've got to get him to a room. You, page healer Hunziker. Someone was saying. Remus, I'm healer Coke. We're going to get you onto a stretcher. You can relax. We're going to take care of you. Sirs, you can wait here. We'll update you as soon as we can. One of the wicks said to Sirius and Ian. No. no. All three of them shouted at once. He's afraid of healers. He's not used to being at a hospital. I promised I wouldn't leave his side. Sirius pleaded. I'm sorry, only family are allowed. Are you family? The healer asked. I'm his fiancé, and this is his brother. Sirius answered. All right, you can come. Just stay out of the way. She acquiesced. There was no further discussion as Remus was levitated onto a gurney and whisked down the long corridor toward a room with bright lights shining down. Sirius and Ian followed close behind, talking to the doctors and answering questions. Healer Coke turned her attention back to Remus, trying to get him to focus. Remus, Remus, can you tell me what day it is? I, I can't. Remus couldn't focus enough to remember. He was freezing. Why was it so cold in here? Why were the lights so bright? Why was the stretcher so narrow? He felt like he was going to fall off. Why were so many people in this room with him? It's okay, Remus. We're going to start casting some diagnostic and healing spells. We aren't going to hurt you. We just need to stabilize you. Remus flinched as several wands were raised and multiple spells went off. Sirius took his hand and brought his focus to him. Look at me, Mooney. You're going to be okay. You've got to survive this, you hear me? Remus tried to say anything in response, but it was freezing in the sterile room he was now in. Cold. He's cold. Look at him. He's shivering. Sirius called out to the healers. Somebody do something. As healers called out to each other in the frenzy of the room Remus tried to focus on Sirius. Tried to get the room to stop spinning long enough to say something. Tried to keep his eyes open despite their heavy lids. However try as he might, his eyes blinked shut, the grip he held on Sirius's hand went slack, and he lost consciousness. The sound of beeping and hushed voices broke through to him as he slowly returned to consciousness. He didn't open his eyes just yet as his lids were still too heavy, but he tried to decipher what the voices were saying. Did you see there's cake in the break room? No, just clocked in. What's the occasion? It's for Gila Koch's retirement. Oh, that's right. I hope it's chocolate. They were right next to Remus's bed now. He stirred in his bed and finally opened his eyes. One of the nurses smiled down at him. Well, good morning. I'm Violet, then this here is Jessica. Remus breathed in deeply and exhaled slowly, trying to bring himself out of the stupor. There you go, that's a good breath. Jessica praised. Remus hadn't ever been praised just for breathing before, but something in the nurse's tone was comforting. How are you feeling, hon? Cold. Almost as soon as the word escaped his mouth, a heated blanket was draped over him and warmth spread throughout his body as Violet cast a warming spell on the bed. Better. Violet asked. Remus nodded. Wes. I'm here, love. Sirius answered from the other side of the bed. Remus turned to see him sitting up from a recliner where it appeared he had been trying to sleep. He reached out and took Remus's hand. We'll go page the healer. She wanted to see you when you woke up. The two of them left the room, leaving Remus and Sirius alone. Remus rolled over to face Sirius, and was surprised at how little it hurt. Where's Ian? He went to get some coffee, Sirius answered. Remus started to sit up, and Sirius helped him adjust his pillows to support him. Here drink some water, Sirius said as he offered Remus a styrofoam cup with a plastic lid and straw. Remus took it gladly. What happened? Remus asked after taking several sips. 
the operation spell sent you into shock. They tried to stabilize you, but had to do an emergency procedure to restore your magical core. Procedure? What did they do? It was non-invasive. It was pretty complex healing magic though. I still feel funny, Remus said, leaning his head back to rest against the pillows. Yeah, they have you on some pretty powerful painkillers. Hmm, the good stuff. Yeah, they were pretty appalled at the state of your joints. They didn't understand how you were still functioning through all that pain you must have been in. Remus's forehead creased at this. He didn't know what to say. It felt like the healers had uncovered a secret or blown his cover. He didn't want Sirius to worry about him. I can handle it. You shouldn't have to handle it. It doesn't matter if I should have to or not. Remus started to chuckle. Shit. What? What's so funny? Nothing, it's not funny at all. Harry said something similar to that to me yesterday, or the day before. I've lost track of time. We came to the hospital yesterday morning. Sirius explained. What about Harry? He's still with Sarah. She sent a Patronus yesterday and she said Harry is fine. Just then Ian walked into the room holding a tray with two coffees on it. Remus, you are awake. That's great. Ian, thanks for staying with us. Of course. Anything for you, brother. He winked at Sirius as he handed him a coffee. Sorry I didn't bring you one, they have you on a strict hospital food diet while you're here. Before he could respond, there was a fast knock at the door, and a moment later a middle-aged woman with graying brown hair entered the room. Good morning, Remus. I'm Healer Hunziker. I'm a lycanologist. Healer Koch brought me in on your case, and I assisted in the restoration of your magical core yesterday. She walked up to the bed and offered Remus her hand to shake. Remus took the offered hand and quickly let go. Hello. Healer Hunziker went to sit on the swivel chair next to the window and produced a clipboard on which to take notes, before looking back at Remus. It's good to see you awake. How are you feeling this morning? Fine. He suddenly felt unable or unwilling to answer with any more detail. I've talked with your family members here, Astor and Ian, and gotten the basics, but I'd like to get a thorough picture of your medical history so we can find the best way to manage your lycanthropy together. I understand that you haven't had any formal treatment, and I'm sure there are ways we can manage and mitigate your condition. Are you comfortable having this conversation with them present, or would you like them to step out? No. Remus had a wave of nausea at the idea of being left alone with an unknown healer. Hunziker raised her hands in surrender. That's completely fine. I just wanted you to have the option. You don't have to worry. They can stay. Remus let out a sigh of relief. Sirius gripped his hand tightly. Hunziker continued speaking after it was clear that Remus was calm again. Right. Before we go into your history, I'd like to get an understanding of what happened to damage your magical core. Remus looked away from the healer to Sirius. They were still holding hands and Sirius was watching him anxiously for any signs of discomfort. He didn't want to have this conversation, but he didn't want to disappoint Sirius either. He took a deep breath and tried to clear some of the medicated fog away from his brain enough to formulate a response. Right. Well, immediately after the last moon, the pack I was in was attacked. We had to fight to defend ourselves. After the battle was over, I fainted. The auras called in a medic there, Leo, who was able to do some basic healing and gave me a strengthening elixir, but said something was wrong with my magical core. He told me I would need further medical attention that he couldn't provide, and offered to take me to the hospital then, but I refused. I haven't felt right since then. The healer sighed deeply and shook her head a little. I'm so sorry to hear that you were attacked. Were they targeting you because of your lycanthropy? Yes, they were poachers, Ian answered. Disgraceful. Were any others in your pack seriously hurt? We all suffered minor injuries, some concussions and hex damage, and we are all quite a bit shaken, but no permanent physical damage other than Remus. He and Asta both are the reason we all survived, but it was a lot of exertion right after we transformed back at dawn. Ian continued. Could you pinpoint anything in the fight that might have affected your magical core? Remus had only a vague idea of what might have contributed to it, but couldn't think of how to put it into words. 
There was a pause as everyone waited expectantly before Ian interjected again. If I may. Please. Remus granted, relieved. I'm sure you're aware, but werewolves are at their most vulnerable right after they transform back at dawn. They're exhausted from running all night and the transformation itself is excruciating. The werewolf persona or altar is retreating while the human persona is reclaiming consciousness and bodily control. If a werewolf is part of a pack, there's a period of time right after sunrise where being near other werewolves creates a bonding, healing magical aura. Yes, the effluer, I'm familiar. She interjected. The what? Sirius asked with a furrowed brow. The technical name for the powerful magical aura after a full moon experienced by a pack is called the effluer. Right. Ian quickly continued his explanation. Under ideal circumstances, the pack would remain together, resting and recovering until all of them are fully healed. Usually, it takes about an hour, depending on the size of the pack and the activities from the full moon. This time there was no downtime to recover. We were thrust into a stressful, life-threatening fight immediately after the transformation. Most of us were never trained to fight or duel. The magical core is so fragile during this time, any interruption of that magical flow or overexposure to it could fracture the core. Sirius was staring at Ian with wide eyes. Despite studying werewolves since he was in Hogwarts, and spending countless moons with one, he had never heard the transformation explained like this. Were the other werewolves affected in this way? Healer Hunziker asked. No, not that I've had. Ian answered. Remus, did you experience anything during the fight that might explain this fracture? Remus was quiet for a moment. After listening to Ian's explanation, he knew exactly what had caused this. When the battle started, I was shaking. I was so weak and unable to focus on anything other than the pain and exhaustion from the night before. Then I felt my pack's healing aura surround and permeate me, the effluere as you called it, and I focused on drawing in as much of that magic as I could to get me through the battle. I had to protect everyone, and I knew they didn't have fighting experience like Asta and I do. I wasn't trying to take more than my fair share, but I knew if we had any chance of surviving, I would have to be able to fight with all of my being. So I pulled as much as I could into myself until I felt I could face the battle. Remus was concerned now that he thought back on it. You don't think by taking in more of the aura that I somehow deprived the rest of my pack from healing properly. We were all so drained after that fight. The healer shook her head. No, I don't believe so. From what I understand of the effluer, this type of magic is flexible. That way if one pack member is hurt more than the others, they draw what they need, and there is enough there for whatever the need of the pack if one moon is worse than another, there is always enough to go around. However, it's only around for a short time, so after a certain point, the pack is unable to draw on it. It sounds like the pack drew off of this magic, and instead of healing, used it to stay actively in the fight. This meant in turn that when the fight was over, the window for this magic had closed and there was nothing left to use to recover. You somehow tapped into the effluer and drew in more than you normally would need resulting in temporary speed, increased agility, and powerful spells. However, this extra pull of magic would explain the fractured core. Incredible, Remus muttered under his breath. Indeed, the effluer is incredible. Healer Hunziker looked up from what she was jotting down on the clipboard. Were you able to completely restore my core? Remus asked. Yes, but you should take it easy for the next couple of weeks. No strenuous activity or complex magic. I also want to see you immediately following the next transformation to make sure that the recovery is complete and no further damage is done. Remus nodded, thinking of all the things he needed to do in the next few weeks, and Harry who was now their responsibility. Sirius gave his hand a squeeze. We'll make sure he takes it easy, Sirius replied. Good. Now, would you mind giving me a bit of a history of your condition and how you've managed it in the past? Remus sighed again. Where do you want me to start? Let's start with when you were bitten. How old were you? I was five years old when I was bitten. The pen on the clipboard faltered for a moment at this, but Healer Hunziker remained stoic when she looked up at Remus. What kind of care did your family provide for you, given your young age? Remus immediately looked away and didn't answer. 
What bearing does that have on my current treatment? I'm sorry to ask such personal questions, but it's crucial for me to understand what kind of care you've had in the past. If nothing else, it shapes my approach to your current treatment, but it also gives me a picture of the course your condition has taken over time. It provides me with an understanding of what approaches have been used and not worked, and what should be avoided. Remus ran his hand over his face and through his hair. All right, fine. You want the history. Here it is. Let me know if you need me to slow down so you can take better notes. I was bitten by Fenrir Greyback himself as retribution for my father's anti-half-breed stances in the ministry. When my father heard I was bitten, he offed himself, and my mother who was a muggle, tried to care for me as best she could, but after the first moon watching her five-year-old son turn into a monster, she dropped me at a home for boys. I was raised there for the next six years, spending my transformations locked behind a silver door in the basement until I was told that I'm actually a wizard, and Dumbledore took me to Hogwarts. Remus paused here, taking a deep breath and trying to steady his voice. After finishing her notes, Hunziker looked up at him. Take your time, Remus, I know this is difficult. After the initial outburst and her response, he was feeling calmer. He continued to explain his history from Hogwarts's transformations in the Shrieking Shack to going undercover for the resistance in the war against the very man who bit him. He covered the few packs he had spent time with, and the few instances he had anything close to professional medical care, namely from Madame Pomfrey and Marlene McKinnon. Despite her initial open tone, Hunziker couldn't stop her agitation from showing a little as his story continued. So you haven't seen a healer since before you were infected with lycanthropy? I've seen a school nurse and a med school student, and I have some experience in healing magic. I may do. He looked at Sirius. It wasn't his fault he couldn't see a healer before now, so why did he feel so guilty about it? Sirius looked at Remus, and squeezed his hand again. Healer Hunziker, we understand that this is unusual here, but you must understand that in England as a werewolf, he did what he had to do to be accepted into wizarding society. If he had registered, he wouldn't have been able to attend school or get a decent job. He wouldn't have been free. This was the price of it. Hunziker's face softened a little as she listened. I apologize for my agitation. I hope you understand I'm not upset with you. I'm upset with a society that would suppress a people group based on outdated stereotypes and invalidated fears. I'm sure coming here was terrifying for you, but you did it anyway, and it looks like just in time to save your life. Some of the anxiety that was building in Remus's chest was released. In the initial examination, we discovered an acute degradation of your joints, especially your hips, but all of them are in poor condition. When did you start experiencing pain? She continued. Remus laughed a little. I'm sorry, that's just such a funny question to ask a werewolf. Immediately after my first transformation. You're right, that was poor phrasing. How about... Can you describe how and when your pain has worsened over time? She corrected herself. Sure. Obviously, I've had a lot of pain around transformations all along, but at some point in my fourth year at Hogwarts, I had a hip dislocation that never really healed properly. I don't know, over the years it's hard to pinpoint specific injuries, but they accumulated, and I had more and more pain. There's not much to say other than that. In our diagnostic scans, I pinpointed 23 healed limb breaks, as well as numerous healed fractures. Does that sound accurate to you? Probably. He looked away from Sirius. The number of dislocations is probably double that. She nodded. That matches what we hypothesized, yes. We noticed damage to your muscle tissue and tendons that match up with scarring on the skin, possibly from numerous animal attacks and bites. Remus only nodded. Sirius's face had gone pale. Ian tried to be stoic, but couldn't mask the concern on his face. Hunziker continued. Now that I understand how young you were when you returned, the numerous injuries and degradation of the bones and joints make more sense. That, in culmination with your separation from any pack for the majority of your time as a werewolf, means you haven't been able to gain the cumulative healing effects the effluor has over time. In my research, I've found that those werewolves who are able to transform with a pack 
over the majority of their time as a werewolf show fewer signs of degradation and injury over the same period of time as those werewolves who are nomadic or solitary. Add on to the, the wool, Sirius whispered, almost to himself. Yes, I'm sure the injuries you sustained during the war did not improve the matter. Remus shook his head. That means that the British registry not only marks us with a stigma and forces us away from social contact with our own kind, it actually decreases our quality of life physically as well. He was incredulous. Do they know? Sirius asked, his face covered in the anger he was holding at bay. Do they know what they are actually sentencing them to? Hunziker shook her head. It's hard to say. This connection has just been proven in the last five years or so in my research, but it's not hard to deduce the difference in quality of life between the two. I would be surprised if they didn't have some kind of idea of the effect. Remus had a hand to his temple and his eyes were closed. His anger was just below the surface, and if they continued to talk about the registry he wasn't sure if he would be able to contain his emotions. Can we, can we move on to the next question, please? Of course, and if you need a break, we can finish this later. I know this is a lot. No, let's just get this over with, please, he said quietly. Do you use any mobility aids? Yeah, I've used a cane for ten years or so, and I just recently started using a wheelchair for my worst days or long trips. Good, I'm glad you're taking advantage of those. How have you managed the pain? Over-the-counter healing potions, mostly. There was a brief stint there where I self-medicated with alcohol. Okay, it wasn't brief, but I'm sober now. I use basic healing spells, pain potions, heating spells, and chocolate. If I need to be active right after a moon, I may take a pepper-up potion. I've tried almost every herbalist in Britain and any home remedy I heard about, but none of those did much of anything to help. I tried acupuncture for a while but stopped going after I didn't see any lasting effects. I went and got a massage once, that was nice, but it was too expensive, so I didn't go back. I even tried muggle over-the-counter pain medication. Oh, they also have this thing called a foam roller. Not sure if you're aware of it, it doesn't matter. It didn't do much. Nothing seems to do much these days. Hunziker nodded. How often do you use pain potions? Most days, I take one in the morning and continue to use them all day as they wear out. Have you ever used Wolfsbane? Yeah I did, all last year, but it was not an enjoyable experience. I found it to make the recovery worse. Hunziker nodded. Yes, it's not always the best treatment. I respect that you tried it and found it didn't work for you. Remus nodded. How about your mental health? Do you experience anxiety or depression? Did you just hear my life story? Yeah, I experience anxiety and depression. Remus couldn't hold back the sarcasm. Understandable. In the past six months, have you had thoughts of self-harm or suicide? In the past six months? Remus paused, thinking. No. Hunziker looked up from her notepad. But you have in the past. Oh, yes, multiple times. Remus chuckled a little. Believe it or not, what we just covered isn't even the most depressing thing that's happened in my life. Remus glanced at Sirius, who was holding fast to his hand and watching Remus closely. Hunziker nodded slowly. Thank you for your vulnerability. I know it's not easy, and I'm grateful for the trust you're putting in me to handle your case with care. I hope that we'll be able to expand that trust as we see each other more. Thank you. Remus said, not knowing how else to respond. Okay, so now that we have a comprehensive picture of your condition, I have the start of a treatment plan. I'd like to go over it with you, she said. Okay, Remus sighed, hoping the hard part was over. Before you leave, I'd like you to have the first of several treatments that will begin to restore some of the cartilage in your joints, as well as your bone density. It won't bring them back to 100%, but I believe we could see up to a 75% restoration of the cartilage and bone density with this treatment regimen. It will take time to get to that, probably eight treatments over the course of eight weeks, then we will see how you're responding and go from there. This should help with the pain, 
but I'm afraid it won't go away entirely. Remus was too stunned to speak, but Sirius responded. That's still a great start. Anything to lessen the pain would be wonderful. Yes, to that end, I'd like to get you set up with better pain relief. But given the history of addiction, we need to be purposeful in the method we select. There is a prescription pain relief potion that isn't addictive. I'll set you up with a script for it. Thank you, Sirius replied. Remus finally found his voice. What does the treatment entail? It's a cartilage growth potion paired with an incantation that lasts for about 10 minutes or so as the healer focuses the potion on the specific joints where it is needed the most. We will also use a variation of skelly grow to restore bone density. It's a slow process, but worth it for the results. How's that sound? Let's do it, Remus answered, determined to see this through. Hunziker went into detail about what the treatment would entail and the risks involved, then after answering all of Remus's questions, left the room saying it would be a bit before they started the first treatment. It was now just the three of them in the room together. How are you feeling? Ian asked. He had taken a seat in the plastic chair by his bed. Remus sighed and rubbed his hands over his face, resting his head back on the pillow. I don't, I don't think I want to talk any more about how I'm feeling right now. Sirius nodded, his face grim. I'm sorry. I'm so sorry I made you come. Don't be ridiculous. If I hadn't come I would have died. Besides, you didn't make me come, I came of my own free will. Remus replied. You really gave me a scare there. I don't know what we would have done if that had happened at home. Sirius choked out. Now that the healer was gone, he was able to let go of his projection of calm. It's good that I came, Remus said, more for Sirius's sake than his own. Besides, after you turned my own words of wisdom against me, how was I supposed to refuse? This is why I don't say anything wise. Sirius finally cracked a smile around the tears in his eyes. Oh, this is why. Remus chuckled softly, clinging for dear life to the brief moment of levity. Remus closed his eyes and tried to rest while they waited for what was next. I hope Harry is okay. This must have been frightening to witness. He'll be fine. Sirius comforted. I wish this hadn't happened this week. It would have been better if it had happened before Harry came to live with us. These things happen, and we don't have any control over when or where. But we're all here together now, and we're going to support each other through everything that comes our way. That's what family is for. Family, Remus repeated as he closed his eyes again. The treatment was uncomfortable, but thankfully it didn't take long. Shortly afterward, Remus was discharged with a new prescription pain potion, strict instructions to rest, and return immediately following the next moon's eighth flu for another examination of his magical core. This as well as an appointment to continue the skeletal treatments going forward. Sirius sighed along apparated with him again, this time with no signs of shock. They entered their home to find Sarah and Harry playing wizard's chess. They both looked up as the door opened. You're back. Harry immediately smiled. Yes, safe and sound, as promised. Sirius replied. Are you feeling better? Harry asked. Remus was growing tired of this question but smiled amiably. Yes, much. The healers were able to restore my magical core and set up a treatment plan to help restore my cartilage and bone density as well. It's not going to be 100%, but it's at least something. It's a start, Sirius assured. Right, Remus agreed. However, he's been given instructions to rest, so no more broom rides. Sirius teased. I'm not sure I can stay away, Remus bantered back. He kept up a happy face for the sake of Harry. He was feeling better. His pain was much less now that he had new medication, and he could feel his strength returning because of the restored magical core. His emotions on the other hand were raw after a deep dive into his history much of which was new information to Sirius. He hadn't had a moment to himself since he had left for the hospital, and all he wanted was peace and quiet, and no one asking him how he was feeling. He had been asleep or in bed for much of the last twenty-four hours, but somehow he was still tired. Sirius saw the tiredness in his eyes despite the mask he wore. Yes, well, we must all make sacrifices. Now, let's get you to bed, I know you're still tired. 
Remus didn't argue. He thanked Sarah and Ian for staying and helping them and hovered his chair into the bedroom. Sirius helped him into bed and sat on the mattress with his arm crossing over him, his weight held by his hand resting by Remus's shoulder. He ran his other hand through Remus's hair and leaned down to kiss him softly. I'm so proud of you, he whispered. Why? You were so afraid of the hospital, but you went anyway. You chose to take a step towards a better life despite it being hard and terrifying. You put your trust in me and your friends to watch over you when you weren't able to do that for yourself. You asked for help. You were so vulnerable with a healer, and I know none of that was easy for you. Okay, that's enough. You can stop listing things now. Remus's cheeks were red in embarrassment. Okay, I'll stop. Sirius paused and watched Remus for a moment. How was that for you? Was it better than you were expecting? I don't. Can we not talk about it yet? Remus said, and his face crumpled with all the emotion that he had been holding in check at the hospital. He couldn't hold it back anymore, and he didn't want to hide it. Sirius scooped him up until he was holding him in his arms tight against his chest, his jaw brushing against Remus's hot tear-streaked cheek. Oh, Looney, I know, was all he said as he ran one hand through his hair and the other over his back to soothe him as the dam finally burst, releasing all the pent-up emotions Remus had been holding in check. I'm here, I've got you. You don't have to be strong all the time. I can be the strong one sometimes. That's good because I'm not sure how much I can take right now, he sobbed. You don't have to take it. I'm going to help you. We're going to get through this together. Remus clung to him tightly, until finally, his breathing grew more steady. He felt better, now that he had let that out, now that Sirius was helping him carry it. They finally parted as Remus took a deep breath. Sirius helped him lay back down and resituated the covers over him. He ran his head through the sweaty hair that framed his forehead. Do you think you can get some rest now? Remus nodded, still hiccuping occasionally as his breathing leveled out. Sirius bent down and kissed him softly on the lips. Remus already had his eyes closed, exhausted after everything he had been through. Rest now, we'll see you in the morning, Sirius said, and before he closed the door behind him, Remus was already asleep. Chapter 34. Rest More or Less The next morning, Remus felt much improved, although he wasn't sure if it was the treatment or the prescription pain potions that he should credit. He got up from bed and for the first time in days reached for the cane instead of the chair. He was still stiff and definitely didn't feel 100%, but he never felt 100%. He wasn't even sure what it would feel like to be 100%. Even so, whatever this was, it was better than he had felt since before the last moon. He looked at the clock as he left the bedroom. It was half past nine. Sirius was already up, but he didn't see him when he entered the living room. He heard voices coming from the kitchen and paused to listen to Sirius and Harry. Then we ran around the corner as fast as we could, all trying to huddle under the invisibility cloak, and there in the middle of the hall is Mrs. Norris. Sirius excitedly told Harry. I swear she can see through the cloak, Harry interjected as he laughed. Right. It's freaky, Sirius agreed. So what did you do? I turned into Padfoot and chased her away while the others escaped, Sirius exclaimed. What? And Filch didn't catch you, Harry said in awe. Course not. As soon as Mrs. Norris was chased off, I took a hard turn into that secret passageway under the tapestry and transformed back. Then I laid low until the coast was clear and went back to the dormitory, no one was the wiser. Sirius laughed along with Harry. Oh no! It's burning! Harry's tone changed to fearful. There was a small commotion and a clanging of a pan. I'm so sorry. I should have been paying closer attention. I didn't mean to, I? Hey, hey, slow down, it's okay. It's just a flapjack, the first one's always a loss anyway. Sirius soothed. I'm sorry, Harry said again but calmer now, almost like he didn't know what else to say. Harry, it's okay, you didn't do anything wrong. Sirius tried to quell Harry's nerves. Right, okay, Harry said, taking a deep breath. Remus rounded the corner then, and they both turned to see him. Sirius sat the pan to the side of the burner, and came over to Remus. You're up. I am indeed, 
Remus said as he leaned over to kiss Sirius. Remus noticed Harry watching them intently as he absentmindedly stirred the remaining batter. Here, have a seat. We're just getting breakfast started. He pulled out a chair at the kitchen table for Remus to sit down, which he took without a fuss. Flapjacks, my favorite, Remus said a little too cheerily, trying to lighten the mood. Yeah, Harry wanted to make a special breakfast for you, Sirius said jovially. Oh, that's so kind, thank you, Remus genuinely responded. Harry was blushing, whether from his reaction to the burned flapjack, or the praise from Remus, he wasn't sure. It's nothing, really, Harry finally said, as he put the pan back onto the burner and ladled out another portion. After fiddling with the temperature gauge, he stepped to the side, watching the pan intently, determined not to let this one burn. Remus wasn't sure how to put him at ease, but he eventually decided that fussing would only make it more awkward, so he let the kid be for now. Sirius brought his focus back to Remus. How are you feeling? Sirius said in a quieter voice, though still loud enough that Harry could hear. I'm feeling much better, Remus said, and he found he didn't have to put up a fake smile to back it up because it was true. Sirius studied his face and seemed to be satisfied with what he found because his shoulders relaxed a little. That's great. So, what's on the agenda for today? Remus asked, wanting to change the topic away from his health. Sarah and Ian are coming by in just a little bit. Sirius replied, as the tension in the room slowly melted away. That's good, I need to talk with her, Remus said, as he glanced back at Harry, who was trying to flip the flapjack over in the pan. Hey Sirius, do you still know how to do that fancy flapjack flip? Sirius grinned as he stood up. Do I still know how? Of course I do. He came up to stand next to Harry. May I give it a go, chef? Course. Harry gladly handed the spatula over to Sirius. Thank you, chef, but I won't be needing that. He took the handle of the pan and lifted it out in front of him, making sure there was plenty of room so as not to burn Harry. He tilted the pan forward until the flapjack sat at the very edge of the pan and quickly flicked the pan upwards. The flapjack went up into the air flipping once, twice, and then coming back down, completely missing the pan and landing sticky side down on the kitchen floor. Oh bugger! Sirius exclaimed, but he was laughing uproariously. Remus almost fell out of his seat, he was laughing so hard. Harry blinked once and then his stunned face broke into a laugh as well. Yup, you still got it, Remus said as soon as he was able to catch his breath. I just got to do a little fine tuning, it's this pan. First, it burned the tester jack, then it threw mine on the floor. Sirius explained in exaggerated exasperation. Definitely the pan, Harry said as he took the pan back from Sirius and portioned out more batter. Sirius waved his wand and the flapjack on the floor disappeared. Just to be on the safe side, I think I'll try to flip it with the spatula this time, Harry continued. That's a good call, you can never be too careful with those Swiss pans, Remus said from his seat, wiping his eyes as tears of laughter ran down his cheeks. You know what, it could be the altitude, Sirius continued. The air is thinner here, I'm not used to it yet. Absolutely, it's a well-known phenomenon, the change in flapjack aerodynamics relative to the altitude. Remus bantered. Read it in a book, did you? Sirius quipped. Yes, I believe it was a quantitative report on the fundamental concepts of the physics of breakfast food. Sirius sighed. It's a shame you didn't warn me before I dropped the flapjack on the floor. I'm so sorry, I just assumed you were well versed in. He couldn't finish his sentence because he had started laughing again. In the physics of breakfast food, Sirius still held on to the thread. Yes. Remus said, still giggling. No, I was more interested in the physics of dessert and snacks. Sirius continued, finally cracking a smile and joining Remus in his laughter. Oh, my mistake. That's right. So really it's your fault I'm not eating breakfast yet. Sirius couldn't continue and dissolved into another fit of laughter. They looked over at Harry, who was watching the two of them banter back and forth with a huge grin on his face. He glanced back at the pan and used the spatula to cleanly flip the flapjack over in the pan. Look at that. The perfect flip, and he hasn't even studied any physics. Remus laughed as he said it. The kids are natural, Sirius replied. 
Just like his mother, Remus said, which earned him another small smile from Harry. Eventually, the remaining batter was safely cooked into more than enough flapjacks for the three of them, and as Sirius was gathering dishes, the doorbell rang. Remus got up out of his chair and shuffled over to open the door. Sarah and Ian were on the other side, with smiling faces. It's good to see you up and around, Sarah said. How are you feeling? Ian asked. Remus stifled a sigh. He was really tired of answering that question. I'm better, thanks. He stepped aside and ushered them into the sitting room. Sarah, before we continue, I'd like to tell you how sorry I am for shouting at you. You were only trying to help, and it was wrong of me to snap at you. Sarah sighed. I get it, Remus. You were scared, and I pushed you too far. It was understandable. Remus shook his head. That's kind of you, but even so, I hope you will accept my apology. Of course, I forgive you. Sarah said softly. Sirius and Harry came around the corner from the kitchen to join them. Hello Sarah, Ian. Sirius greeted. Hi, Hi Sirius. Sirius. They both said in unison. I thought I could take Harry on a walk while you two and Sarah catch up. She has some news from Natalie. Ian offered, still standing near the door. Oh. Sirius said, surprised, and suddenly nervous. Harry, do you mind? Ian doesn't bite. There was a moment of silence as the three werewolves looked at Sirius. In retrospect, that was a bad joke, and that's on me, sorry. Sirius said, cheeks going a little red. Ian was the first to break the tension as he started to laugh, and the other two joined him. I mean, it's a true statement. He turned to Harry. What do you say? It's a beautiful day. Yeah, let me just grab a jacket and my wand. Harry said as he went towards his room. As soon as the door closed behind Ian and Harry, the three remaining took seats in the sitting room. Tea, Remus offered. No thank you, do you have coffee? Sarah asked. Of course. Sirius waved his wand and a coffee tray with cups, sugar, and cream appeared. How do you take it? Black. The carafe magically poured itself into a cup which floated over to Sarah. Two more cups floated to Remus and Sirius as well. The former with cream and two sugars, and the latter cream with no sugar. So, you have news, Sirius prompted. Sarah finished her sip and set down her cup in the saucer. Yes, I accompanied Natalie in her questioning of Martin. His story, of course, corroborated ours. Natalie asked him about his breakup and any affiliations he may have with past pack members or motivations he may have to see our pack come to harm. None of it led anywhere. Martin was taken aback that he was a suspect and defensive that he would be accused of turning on his own pack. At the end of it, Natalie seemed satisfied with his answers. How is Martin doing? Remus asked. He's shaken and angry, but I think he's going to come around. It's been a hard couple of months for him. Sarah explained. So they didn't arrest him? Sirius clarified. No, Sirius, they didn't. Sarah assured him. Good, Sirius finally said. I heard from Natalie again last night. Sarah continued. A couple of the poachers they have in custody agreed to a plea deal and trade for confessing. Turns out it was about me. What? Sirius's head whipped up from his coffee cup at this. The poachers said they were mad at me for what I wrote in my book. Turns out some of those nasty letters I failed to read actually had threats in them from the poachers. Natalie showed me a few of them, and it was terrible pure blood bigotry at its very worst. Sarah shook her head as if to clear the memory of those letters away. Oh, Sarah, that's horrible. I'm so sorry. Remus reached over and rested his hand on her shoulder. Sarah took a deep breath. Sirius broke the silence with another question. How did they know where to find you? They had a connection to the Land Registry Authority. While we never disclosed our location to anyone, we did legally purchase it, so there is a record of it in my name. They paid someone off to tell them the location. Simple as that. Sarah explained. I'll help you make it unplottable, Sirius said, his eyes still somewhat glazed over, the simmering anger just below the surface. I've already laid the groundwork for this property as well. Thank you, that's a good idea. But what does that have to do with Buckbeak? Remus looked confused. Sarah shook her head. 
Nothing. They happened to see Buckbeak and Sirius in the sky as they entered Switzerland, and then again the night of the full moon. They were after the pack, but they were also poachers after all. They targeted Buckbeak because hippogriffs are also sought after on the black market. So that's it then. Any more of the poachers still out there? Remus asked. Sarah shook her head. The informant told them where the other poachers were located. They raided the place last night and caught any of them that remained, from that ring at least. As far as I know, that settles it. That's such good news. Remus sighed as some of the tension released from his shoulders. Now, about Harry. I know Sirius said the powers that be are open to the idea of granting him asylum. Remus asked. Yes, with the recent attacks, they recognize that he's at risk. Although him being who he is does complicate matters, politically. It would be one thing if you were his uncontested guardian, but the fact that you're also an asylum seeker, an escaped convict, and his legal guardians are muggles, it's not an easy package to wrap. Sarah answered. I can see how that would be complicated, Remus replied. It'll come together, we just have to iron out the details. Remus woke in the middle of the night, and after laying awake for what felt like forever, he finally got up and used his wheelchair to hover into the kitchen. He put on a teapot and left the whistle off so as not to wake anyone. While he waited for the water to boil, he went over to Harry's door. He told himself he was just going to listen, to hear his breathing with his keen hearing, but the door was open and the light was on, so he peeked his head around the door, figuring he'd turn off the light. Instead, he found Harry awake, sitting against his headboard with a book open in his lap. He looked up in shock at Remus. I'm sorry. I'll turn my light off, I know I shouldn't be up this late, it won't happen again. Harry explained hurriedly, fear in his eyes. Remus held up both his hands. Whoa, hey, it's okay, you aren't in any trouble. I apologize, I didn't mean to startle you, I just didn't want to knock in case you were asleep. You didn't break any rules, we didn't set a curfew. His brow furrowed with realization. Wait, should we have set a curfew? The fear drained from Harry's eyes and he let out a small chuckle. I think we're all taking time to adjust. Anyway, I couldn't sleep, I put some tea on, you want a cup? I might even be able to scrounge around for a tin of biscuits, Remus offered. Oh, all right then, he said and followed Remus to the kitchen. Here, let me help you, you're supposed to be resting, Harry said offering to take over. I'm fine, I'm feeling better, Remus sighed. Thank you for the offer, but I can make a cup of tea. He hoped it didn't come off as too stubborn. All right, Harry said and sat at the table. He was still holding his book, but it was closed. What you're reading? Remus asked as he took out two cups and found the tin of biscuits. Oh, I was just, it's silly really, I was just looking through my defense against the dark arts textbook. Mrs. Weasley picked up our supplies while we were at the cup, and I hadn't had a chance to look at them yet, Harry said sheepishly. Remus set out the cream, sugar, and biscuits on a tray and hovered it over to the table and poured the tea, then eased his floating wheelchair down to the floor. That's not silly at all, Remus assured. I'm sorry you won't be at Hogwarts this year, but I still have year four defense coursework fresh in my memory from last year, so I'll be teaching that, and history of magic. I'll try to make it more interesting than Professor Bin's. Sirius will naturally take care of transfiguration, possibly potions as well. We still need a care of magical creatures instructor, and let's see, herbology, charms, and astronomy. What other classes were you taking? Divination and muggle studies. Hem, did you enjoy those much? Remus asked. Honestly, no. I lived with muggles my entire life and Professor Trelawney kept trying to predict my death with the Black Grim or whatever. Remus chuckled. That's rather ironic, isn't it? I suppose in hindsight she was right about the big black dog bit, just not the dying bit. Not yet at least. Right. Other than predicting your death, did you enjoy it? Remus asked as he sipped his tea. Harry shook his head shyly. No, I didn't seem to be very good at it. It's one of the most mysterious branches of magic. It's not the easiest to decipher, and as you've seen it's prone to be taken to its most extreme. 
Especially with someone like Trelawney, it's best not to put much stock in what she says, Remus said. I don't know, she did a pretty good job of predicting Peter's return to Voldemort and the contents of my dream, Harry answered. What's that mean? Remus looked at him with a confused expression. Harry filled him in on the details of her last interaction with him. You mean to tell me that old charlatan gave a true prediction? Remus was flabbergasted. Yeah, but she didn't even realize it after the fact. Well, I suppose even a stopped clock is right twice a day. Remus seemed deep in thought for a long moment until he finally returned. If you would like to continue your studies in the subject, we'll need to find a good tutor. Neither Sirius nor I ever took it. You could of course go in a different direction. I'm an excellent read at ancient runes and arithmancy. Harry scrunched up his nose at the suggestion. I'm not overly attached to divination. I kind of picked it up on a whim, but I don't really have an interest in either ancient runes or arithmancy. A little too academic. Remus smiled. Harry nodded. Hem, I have an idea of an alternative. I would need to run it past Sirius, see what he thinks, but we could start to instruct you in occlumency. And by we I mean Sirius. What's that? Harry asked. It's a defensive practice of magic which closes the mind and protects it from anyone who might be accessing or influencing them by the magical practice of legilimency. Whoa. Harry looked intrigued. Yeah, it's just an idea, it may not even be something Sirius would want to teach. Remus tried not to promise anything. Why not? Hmm, well, he didn't learn it in the classical sense, it was more a case of necessity being the mother of invention. Or in other words, he taught himself while living in an oppressive environment. Remus hedged. You think it would be hard for him to teach something he wasn't formally taught? Harry asked. Maybe, but from what I understand, it's a complex practice, which necessitates the teacher to attempt to penetrate the mind of the learner. In his case that was unpleasant, to say the least. Remus explained further. Would it be like that in every case? Harry suddenly looked worried. Remus considered his response before answering. Theoretically, it can be taught without that oppressive style, but even under the best circumstances, there is a good deal of sharing of thoughts and memories both ways. A lot of times it's not easily controlled what the other will see. It's vitally important that the participants be willing to be vulnerable with each other. Okay, so you think he might not want me to see something? Sirius has faced more than his fair share of hardship. I think you both share that in common. So you might understand why there could be memories he never wants to see or think of again, let alone share those with anyone else. A look of understanding came over Harry's face. I think I do understand that. I thought you would. It doesn't change the fact that it might be an important skill for you to learn at some point. We'll have to think about ways to make sure you're safe and supported through the process if we go forward with it. I wouldn't want to just throw you into a room with just anyone. Thanks for that, Harry said, half sarcastic, half genuine. By now they had finished their tea. Harry stifled a yawn. All right, back to bed. I don't know what your curfew is, but you're definitely past it, Remus said. Harry chuckled as he carried his and Remus's cups to the sink. He cleaned them and placed them on the drying rack before walking down the hall with Remus. Thank you, Remus. You're welcome. Good night. Good night. Remus watched as he climbed into bed and turned off his light. Then he turned around and hovered back to his own bed to try to sleep again. Love. Lunch is almost ready, why don't you go find Harry? Sirius called out to Remus from the kitchen. Remus set down his notebook and shuffled outside to look for Harry. He had seen him leave the house a while ago and assumed he was going to visit Buckbeak, but he wasn't near the paddock. Harry! Remus called out as he walked in the opposite direction of Buckbeak's enclosure. I'm over here! Harry called back from closer to the lakefront. Remus found him under a tree, holding a book. What are you reading now? More defense against the dark arts, Remus said when he was close enough to be heard without yelling. Harry shook his head. It's a book of pictures from when my mom and dad were alive. Hagrid sent out letters to his friends, and they all sent back pictures for me. Remus nodded. Yeah, I remember that. I sent back a few myself. Remus was next to Harry now, 
and transfigured a chair for himself so he wouldn't need to sit on the ground to be closer to Harry. I wondered if a few of these were yours. Harry held the book so that Remus could see the pictures on the page. This particular page had several photos of the marauders during their school years. James and Lily sat on a sofa in one of them, James's arm draped around her shoulders, and Lily was laughing and pushing his face away as he tried to lean in for a kiss. Another had Sirius and Remus at a party. Remus was holding a hairbrush as a makeshift microphone and standing on a coffee table in the Gryffindor common room. He was singing passionately towards Sirius, who was singing back at him, holding a cigarette in his hand. Who sent this picture in? Honestly, what a bad influence. Remus chuckled. Must have been Mary. Did my parents know? Harry asked. Remus struggled to find context to the abrupt question. Know what? That you and Sirius were together. Harry asked sheepishly. Yes, they did. Remus smiled. James was completely oblivious to the whole thing for the longest time. We finally told him in the seventh year. Once he finally knew, he was a consummate ally. I think he did a lot behind our backs to make sure our other classmates were supportive. Lily, on the other hand, figured it out herself. And by, figured it out, I mean walked in on us. Remus cut off as he realized what he was saying and who he was saying it to. He coughed before continuing. On a chaste walk holding hands. Harry laughed. Lily was always very supportive. Remus continued. We weren't the only ones in our year who were gay either. There was Dorcas and Marlene as well, who we were all friends with. They were in the war too. Did they? Yes, Remus said sadly. Harry's eyes furrowed. I'm glad they were supportive. Remus met Harry's eyes and smiled softly. Me too. Hey, what are you two doing? Lunch is getting cold. Sirius called from the porch wearing an apron, oven mitts still on his hands. Whoops, I was supposed to be fetching you. We better get inside. Harry laughed and closed the book as he stood to head toward the house. What was taking so long? Sirius called as they approached. Sorry, Cariad, you were always better at fetching than I was. Remus called back, and Harry laughed again. Chapter 35, September 1st Remus was sitting on the deck surrounded by cushions, watching as Sirius and Harry flew on their broomsticks. As soon as Harry had settled, he had asked to fly with Sirius, but Sirius didn't have a broom. Naturally, he ordered one the same day, and it had just arrived, rather fortuitously, that morning. The two had immediately run outside to fly together. They laughed as Harry tried to demonstrate the moves that Crumb had used in the World Cup. Eventually, they landed, rosy-cheeked and winded, Sirius slapping Harry on the back and telling him what an amazing flyer he was. They joined Remus on the porch and Sirius produced a water glass for both of them. Good to see you back on a broom, Remus said to Sirius with a mischievous wink. Oh, it was marvelous. I haven't been on a broom in well it's been a while, Sirius said and a little of the light faded from his eyes. Hello. A muffled voice came from Harry's jacket pocket, drawing all of their attention. Harry pulled out the compact mirror and opened it. Hello, Harry. Instead of Ron, it was Charlie peering at them from the small frame. Yes. Yes, it's working, it's working, Charlie said, apparently to himself. Harry, is either Sirius or Remus nearby? I need to speak with them. Sure, they're right here. Harry handed the compact to Remus, who was sitting between him and Sirius. Hello Charlie, what's the news? Where are you? Remus said, holding the mirror so that all three of them could see him. I'm at Tonks's place. Don't worry, I can talk candidly, they know everything I'm about to tell you. Charlie was sitting on a sofa in a messy sitting room filled with plants of all kinds in various stages of dying. Okay, how did today go? We've been waiting for the news to break. Remus asked. Right, well it's been chaotic, to say the least. Charlie answered. Tell us what happened. Remus responded. Charlie sighed in contemplation before starting. Right, well I'll start with this morning. As always it was chaos in the house trying to get everyone ready and on the way to King's Cross. 
Dad received a flu call from Amos Diggory saying that Mad Eye was in trouble, that he had been attacked in the night and sent flying dustpans as some sort of protective measure, causing all sorts of ruckus in his muggle neighborhood, and the police were called. Dad was going to go down there and see if he couldn't straighten it out. He was supposed to skip town so that he wouldn't be arrested, since he was taking the fall for everything. Dad said he needed to get him out of there before it was discovered that Harry was missing. But I offered to go help Moody since we needed to get the kids off to the train. So I arrive, and there are muggles all over the place, but I manage to get in there finally and see Alastair pacing anxiously. I go over to him and try to see what happened. He says he was attacked last night, but that he was able to fight off the attacker, what with the dust bins, and I say, that's great Alastair, but we need to get you out of here, you aren't supposed to be here. Then he says, I know, I need to get to Hogwarts. Dumbledore will be wondering where I am, and I stare at him for a split second, completely confused. So I say to him, Hogwarts, no, you need to get out of here. If you go to Hogwarts you'll be in danger. Then he says, sure, it'll be dangerous, but someone's got to be there to protect Harry. What the fuck? Sirius exclaimed, and Remus glared at him for cussing in front of Harry. He immediately covered his mouth and whispered his apology. Right, so now I'm extremely concerned, thinking either Alastair had his memory wiped, or maybe something else. So I remembered the trick you would use in the war and I asked him a question only he would know, even if he had his recent memory altered. What did you ask him? Remus asked. I didn't ask him a question, I brought up Tonks. Charlie said, obviously proud of himself. Who's Tonks? Harry asked. They're my cousin, and friends with Charlie. Moody is their mentor. Sirius answered. I think I see where this is going, what happened? Well, Mad I used the wrong pronouns for them. And I thought well maybe that was a slip up, but then he called them by their first name, and I know Mad I has his faults but he wouldn't call Tonks by the dead name, he's not an idiot. Charlie explained. Very clever, Remus said, almost sounding professorial again. It probably didn't even tip him off that it was a test either. Right, which gave me a split second to raise my wand and cast a stunning spell on him. Thankfully it wasn't the real Moody, or I wouldn't have been able to get a shot on him. Charlie was practically beaming, as he told them what happened. So you stunned him. Good on you. Sirius clapped his hands together, and grinned down at Charlie. That's brilliant. So Alastair really was attacked last night. Is he? Remus finally realized that Alastair may be dead, and he immediately thought of their last meeting. No, no he's alive. Charlie assured. Remus and Sirius released a relieved sigh. Thanks, Cersei. Sirius whispered. Where was he? How did you find him? Well, I had to think fast what to do, because there were still muggles all around. So I covered up the impersonator in a blanket, locked the door to the room, and started searching all over for any clues of what happened. Then I saw his chest there, and wondered, if I was to impersonate someone for a whole school year, I'd need him to be around for the polyjuice potion, and a charmed chest would be a good place to keep him. I went back to the stunned body and searched it for a key, and eventually found it, and got the chest open, and what do you think I found but an extension spell opening into a room and Moody looking up at me. Fantastic! Remus exclaimed. Right, so I yelled down to him. Hey! You talked to Tonks recently. And he yells back up. How would I talk to Tonks from down here? I couldn't very well send him a bloody owl, could I? Then he says. Remind me, what's their name again? And I yell back. It's just Tonks, they don't need anything else. And he says. That's right, now get me the hell out of here. Sirius and Remus cackle at this exchange. So I get him out of there, but by then, muggle coppers are banging on the door trying to get in. Moody opens the door to them, tells them he was mistaken, and they all can go home now. He even recognizes one of them who happens to be a squib who he's worked with before he retired. The two of them convince the coppers to pack it in. Now it's just Moody and I, and the impersonator. 
Moody chains him up and makes sure I have my wand out and we reverse the stun spell, and just as we do, it's been about an hour and the polyjuice wears off, and it's Barty Crouch. No, that's not possible, Remus said. Junior. What? How? He's dead, Sirius said flabbergasted. It's a long story, but he faked his own death with the help of his mother, and has been living at home under the imperious charm ever since. He escaped at the World Cup and stole your wand, by the way, Harry then made his way to you-know-who. It was part of a plot for him to impersonate Moody, and get close to Harry. Sirius was out of his chair now, pacing. See, this is exactly what we were afraid of. This is exactly why we had to do this. He was gesturing broadly to nothing in particular. Remus was speechless for a moment, but finally spoke in a tone that was almost defeated, like he didn't want to know the answer to the question. How were they going to do it? It was an absolutely ludicrous plan, to be honest. Charlie responded. They were going to get him into the Triwizard Cup as a fourth champion, and then at the very end, if he won, the final trophy would have been a port key to you-know-who. It really made very little sense, but the point is, you were right. We were right. Sirius was still pacing and pointed to Charlie in the mirror, as he repeated it back. So, okay. Remus was trying to piece together all the information he had just received into anything logical. So you and Moody discovered all this, but Harry was still missing, so what did Moody do then? And what did you do with Barty Crouch? Right. Well, that was sticky, because Moody was about to leave when he was attacked. He changed his mind though, because he needed to bring in Barty Jr., and he decided to go to Dumbledore and tell him about Barty's plan, and use it as proof that he did the right thing in helping you both. Charlie explained. He went to Dumbledore with it. Do you know how that went? Remus asked. Well, first Moody sent a Patronus to Tonks while we stayed with Barty, Charlie said. Once Tonks arrived, the two of us secured Barty while Moody went to Dumbledore. He said he could very well run, but wanted to give Dumbledore another chance to come around now that we had even more proof that Harry was in danger at Hogwarts. Tonks and I called in the ministry who took in Barty, to everyone's shock. Then they came down on Barty Crouch Sr. pretty hard, what with aiding in the escape of a prisoner. I don't know exactly how all that's going to play out, it's still being investigated. Mum and Dad and I got called to Hogwarts to meet Dumbledore and he asked us what happened a week ago and we stuck to the story. Then he turned to me and asked me about this morning and I did so well. I told him what happened this morning. Then he paused as my story came to a close and his eyes narrowed as if he was trying to decide something. Then a moment later he sighed and told me I did a good job. So I asked him where Moody was and he told me that he had helped you two kidnap Harry, and we acted shocked. Merlin, Charlie, there's no way you acted your way through all that with Dumbledore, he had to have known you were lying. Remus had his hand on his temple. I honestly don't know what he believes our part in it was, but I think if he does know, he's choosing to let it go, at least for now. Anyway, he told us he wasn't happy about it, but I think he realized Moody believed he was protecting Harry, not trying to betray him. It also didn't hurt that Moody was correct in his fears and that he had just been the victim of a crime, and I had helped thwart the attempt. He tried to assert that he would have been able to discover the imposter without it getting far enough to cause any harm, but it was a weak argument, and I suppose we'll never know how far it would have gone. So he's coming around to our way of thinking? Sirius asked. I think your father along in convincing him than you were a week ago. Charlie assured them. Where's Moody? Remus asked. Right, well Dumbledore didn't turn him in for kidnapping Harry, but he couldn't exactly just go free, so they agreed it was best for him to still go on the run. I don't know where he is, but I'm sure it's far away and somewhere safe. So, Moody's on the run for kidnapping Harry? Barty Jr. is back in Azkaban for kidnapping Moody. Meanwhile, Barty Sr. is under investigation for aiding and abetting the escape of his son. Sirius summarized. What's everyone's reaction to Harry going missing? Do they think he's with Moody? Surprisingly, a lot of them do, Charlie answered. 
There are a lot of theories, some people think it was Voldemort returning, and your names come up quite a bit, but no one knows where you are, and the last person who has been seen with Harry is on the run, so most people are just under the impression that he's still with Moody. I'm glad you're safe for now, but I'm afraid this paper-thin cover-up is going to break at any moment. It might be time for you and your family to get your affairs in order. Remus sighed. We're already on it. Charlie responded. Dad's on the lookout for work abroad. I'm helping with my contacts in Romania. I'm leaving here soon enough. I'm lying low at Tonks's place now. Why do you have the mirror? Harry asked. Oh, I borrowed it from Ron when I was at Hogwarts. I said I'd send it back to him after I got in touch with you. I didn't want to call from the school, in case anyone overheard. Is Tonks there? I'd like to talk with them if they're willing. Sirius had taken his seat next to Remus again. Yeah, I'll go get them. They want to talk to you too. Charlie got up and was carrying the mirror at an odd angle as he walked down a hallway calling for Tonks. All they could see was his legs and the wall. Soon enough, the mirror went up in front of Charlie again. All right, here's Tonks. Tonks, this is Remus and Sirius. A young wix looking to be about the same age as Charlie peered into the mirror. They had short tousled hair the color of bubble gum and dark eyes that almost sparkled. Tonks smiled brightly at the three of them. Watcher Harry, Remus, Sirius, nice to see you again. Sirius had a strange expression on his face, as if he was torn between deep sadness and overwhelming joy. Nice to see you again, cousin, he finally said in a quiet voice. See you again, cousin. You're related, Harry said, trying to keep up. Yes, last time Mooney and I saw you, you were what, seven? Sirius asked. Let me see, it was 1981. I would have been eight or nine, Tonks recalled. I'm surprised you remember us, Sirius said. Are you kidding? Me mum's cool younger cousin who fought in the war with the motorcycle, and the leather jacket, and the werewolf boyfriend. Yeah, I remember you, Tonks exclaimed. Well, when you put it that way, Sirius chuckled. Admit it, the most memorable part was the werewolf boyfriend. Remus teased with a grin. They all erupted into laughter, including Harry. Your cousins? Who's your mum? How are you related? Harry was still trying to connect the dots. Me mum's Andromeda Tonks, maiden name's Black. Remus leaned closer to Harry and said a little quieter. You might have heard of her siblings, Bellatrix Lestrange and Narcissa Malfoy. Harry's eyes grew wider. Malfoy. Yes, my dear cousins. Sirius said bitterly. If you look at my family tree, you'll recognize a lot of unsavory names, I'm afraid. But my favorite of which was Tonks's mother, Andromeda. She was kicked out of the family for marrying a muggle-born, Ted Tonks. She was part of the resistance during the war, that is, until she had to go into hiding. Sirius explained. Yeah, my family was notified by a reliable source that we had been marked as a target by Fenrir Greyback, Tonks said with another knowing grin. What? I didn't know that was why, Sirius said. You didn't tell me that. He looked at Remus, annoyed. Yes, well, I wasn't supposed to tell anyone, was I? Remus answered. Tonks was serious for a moment. My mum was always so grateful for that. She said she always wished she had done more to help you after the war. It was the very least I could do, really, Remus said. I wasn't much fun to be around after the war. I mostly kept to myself. I don't know if I would have accepted her offer, to be honest. One of these days, we best let her in on the truth. I'm sure she'd love to see you again. To know she wasn't the only good apple, Tonks said. I'd like that a lot. So what do you think? You seem to have accepted my innocence quickly. Sirius smiled at them. Moody reached out to me right after he talked to you last week, and explained it all to me. I nearly slugged him for what he said to you. Tonks rolled her eyes. What? What did he say? Harry asked incredulously. It doesn't matter, after what happened today, I think we're even, Remus said. Right, so he explained everything to me, about the farce of a trial and Peter. If you were really a Death Eater, Harry would have been dead twice over last year. If that wasn't proof enough, the fact that you've gone through so much to escape Britain, then turned around to come back for Harry when you knew he would be in danger at Hogwarts is enough in my book. I mean, you took on Dumbledore, that's bravery right there. 
You're obviously trying to do what's best. Tonks said. I appreciate the vote of confidence. Sirius said. Of course. They smiled into the mirror. So, when can I come join you? Moody talked to you about that too. Sirius replied. He didn't have to, I asked before he could even bring it up. Tonks said. Didn't you just qualify to become an aura? You've worked so hard, we wouldn't want you to sacrifice your career. Remus said. Hey, I'll take a gap year. Isn't a gap year before your university starts, not after? Harry asked. Right, and I didn't get one, so I'm taking it now. She explained sarcastically. Remus had a small smile on his face as he glanced over at Sirius, who replied. Hey, I'm all for it, but I think you should tell Andromeda. I wouldn't want to do anything to go against her. First, I'm a grown wix, I can make my own decisions. Tonks said with a wag of their head. But I do actually think that's a good idea because she'd be super mad at me if she found out I was helping you and didn't tell her. She misses you. What are you talking about? She thinks I'm a murderer. Sirius dismissed. Maybe, maybe not. Either way, when you went to prison she was the last black sheep standing. Any time she talks about you, it's the funniest story I've ever heard followed by, I don't understand how he turned like that. It doesn't make sense to her because she knows you. She knows you wouldn't ever do that. Tonks insisted. Sirius looked away with glassy eyes. He cleared his throat before speaking. All right then, go ahead and try to convince her. But don't tell her where I am until we know she'll believe you. How would I tell her where you are when I don't even know where you are? Tonks pushed. All in good time, Remus said. Charlie's face showed up in the mirror again. What about me? I'm about to flee the country and all. I could come help you. I could be a care of magical creatures tutor. You aren't going back to Romania, to the Dragon Refuge? Remus asked. Yeah, I could, but Dad says it might be better to go somewhere they don't know to look for me, just in case Dumbledore decides to hate us or whatever. Sirius chuckled and looked at Remus this time. Fine with me, but we're going to need a bigger place if we're going to house all these runaways. Charlie made little effort to conceal his excitement. Don't worry, I can pitch a tent if need be. I've been thinking we should find a proper place. This is just a rental we got last minute. We'll have to keep our eyes open for the perfect place. It's got to have lots of land for Buckbeak. Sirius pondered. And lots of spare bedrooms, apparently. Remus added. Right, well you get started on that, and we'll pack our bags. Tonks said. Not before you talk to Andromeda. Sirius instructed. Of course. Tonks said matter-of-factly. All right, we'll talk soon. Charlie, return this mirror to your brother. Remus added. Of course. Charlie mirrored Tonks's inflection. Remus finished saying goodbye and closed the compact. He handed it back to Harry who pocketed it. Sirius looked at Remus. They remembered me. Course they did, you had a werewolf boyfriend. Remus quipped, and they all burst out into laughter at that. Harry Potter missing, Moody suspected in kidnapping. The headlines stared up at them from the Daily Prophet. Extra edition when it arrived later that day. Oh for crying out loud, Remus said as he scooped up the paper. I know, what a terrible excuse for a headline, honestly, Sirius replied. Ours were much better, Remus started reading the article. I think we missed our calling, Sirius sat next to Remus, whose expression grew more sour the longer he read. Utter garbage, as always, completely missing the truth. Remus briskly folded the paper and tossed it onto the table with a little more force than needed. Of course they are, but we don't really want them to know the full truth, do we? We want to keep our anonymity a little while longer. Sirius reminded him. Remus sighed. I suppose. Sirius picked up the paper and read the article for himself. Yeah, you're right. That's terrible. Sirius said when he finished. Remus just laughed at him. Remus and Sirius were lying in bed after finally winding down enough from the excitement of the day. They lay on their backs, Sirius's head nestled into the crook of Remus's arm, their legs intertwined. Remus's fingers ran through Sirius's hair. They lay there in silence for a long time, enjoying the stillness. Sirius sighed deeply, then said in a whisper, So, you want to talk about it? Talk about what? I don't know. Whatever it is you've been rolling around in your head the last few days, 
Sirius answered, still so quiet. There was no anger or hostility in his voice. Just an understanding. He didn't say anything more, just patiently waited for Remus to answer. I don't know if I can pinpoint it either. Remus sighed. It's just so different now. What? Having Harry here? No, well, yes that is different, and we should talk about that too, but that's not what I'm talking about. There was another pause as Remus tried to organize his thoughts. I just, it kind of feels like things are happening around me, but not with me. What do you mean? Like with the poachers, there was a time in our lives when we would have been the ones to chase them down and fight them. We would have been the ones to solve that puzzle. But it all just kind of came together without us even doing anything. Then there is everything with Sarah and the asylum for Harry, and I don't even know what's going on with that, I've been so sick and out of it. Then there was everything with Moody this morning. Sirius was quiet for a long time, before finally giving an unsatisfactory reply. Ha. Huh. What? I'm sorry, I just, I don't I don't think I understand. Sirius stated, genuinely trying to grasp where Remus was coming from. We just had one of the most stressful weeks. We were in a battle a week ago, then we moved, then we kidnapped Harry, and then you were hospitalized. You were there for all of that. Sirius wasn't angry, just very confused. No, no you are right. I'm being silly, just feeling sorry for myself. Just ignore me, I'm fine. Remus shook his head and sighed. Now wait a second, I didn't say you were being silly, I just said I didn't understand. Remus sighed. I know, I think it's just flashbacks to what it was like over the last decade. What was it like? I watched all the people I knew pick up the pieces after the war. The first few years we were all facing the same things, the same grief over the ones we lost, the same flashbacks, the same pain. But then something shifted. At some point, they moved on. They found lovers and got new jobs, and they found purpose and had kids. They traveled to exotic places and showed me the pictures as we sat on my sofa. As we sat on your sofa. It wasn't their fault. I was so happy for them, truly, I was. For the longest time, I thought it might be my fault, but I know now I was just doing the best I could. Sirius leaned over, wrapped his arms around him, and pulled him closer, kissing him softly. Their lips parted and after a moment Remus continued, I know I've been here with you for everything this past week. It just felt like since I was getting sicker, since we brought Harry home, I've been kind of in the background, watching everything happen. I'm sorry if I made you feel you weren't important. Sirius finally whispered. Remus shook his head. No, no you didn't, love. Like I said, sometimes I just get into my head about things. That, I can understand. Thanks for helping me see things from your perspective. I know things have been hard. Remus leaned over and kissed him again. I'll do everything I can to make sure you feel like things are happening with you and not around you. Sirius said as they parted lips. You're so good to me. Remus replied as he closed his eyes and brought his forehead against Sirius's. What did you want to say about Harry? Sirius said after they lay there for a while. Hem. Remus opened his eyes. Earlier, you said we should talk about Harry. Oh, that. Remus paused. I was up late the other night and went to make some tea and discovered him awake reading. The rebel. Sirius said sarcastically. Indeed, just like his father. Remus chuckled. No, that's not what I'm worried about. When he saw me in the doorway, he was frightened. He didn't know what my reaction was going to be so he frantically apologized. I quickly quelled his fears and we had tea and we talked about other things, but I didn't like to see him so scared. Then at breakfast the other day, before I entered the room, I heard you two interacting, and he did the same thing. He burned the flapjack and panicked. Yeah, I remember. Sirius had concern in his voice as he spoke. This is all so new to him. We don't know the full extent of how the Dursleys treated him, but from these reactions, the way he always picks up the dirty dishes and washes them without complaint, the way he's so quiet around the house. He's walking on eggshells. I just wish there was something we could do to show him we aren't going to hurt him. I think part of it is just time. He'll eventually see that there's nothing he can do that will cause us to lift a finger against him. Remus replied. The other part of it might be setting some proper boundaries and rules. Ugh, yuck. 
Sirius made a disgusted sound. Remus chuckled. I know, it's terrible, but I think it's the best way. If he knows what we expect from him, and knows that all that will happen if he breaks a rule, is he can't fly on his broomstick the next day, he might not be so afraid to breathe. I think you might be underestimating how attached he is to his broomstick, Sirius replied. That was just an example, I don't know, Remus said defensively. Sirius chuckled a little before sighing. You know, I hate to admit it, but I think you might be right. It's big of you to say that, Remus said. Yes, well, one of us has to be the mature one. Sirius sighed. It's a good thing I'm around then. Remus bantered back before yawning. Sirius kissed him again. You're so exhausted, why don't you try to rest now? Remus sighed. I'm so tired of being tired. I know. But for me. Can you try to sleep for me? You're so demanding. Remus smiled as his eyes closed again. They both started laughing. After another kiss, they snuggled closer together and drifted off to sleep in each other's arms. Chapter 36 Redemption They're here, Sirius called from the porch. Tonks and Charlie had said in their letter that the three of them would be arriving at ten in the morning. Sirius had been so excited that he had taken up a post on the porch well before the selected time. Remus smiled to himself and put down his book. He shuffled to the door using his cane for support. As soon as he opened the door, he saw three figures walking up the lane to the cottage. One with long, wavy, red hair messily blowing in the wind, and a large and stocky build, the second, shorter, slender figure with short bubblegum pink hair, and bringing up the rear, a middle-aged woman with graying auburn hair. As soon as they spotted Sirius on the porch, they all smiled and waved. The pink-haired figure broke out in a sprint towards Sirius, and once they were close enough, they engulfed Sirius in a strong hug, nearly knocking him over. He laughed in surprise. Remus watched from the doorway as Sirius's happiness overwhelmed him to the point his eyes welled with tears. Charlie stopped behind Tonks, patiently waiting as the two cousins met again. Sirius, Tonks said as they parted. Tonks seemed not to notice Sirius's emotional response but instead began to talk excitedly to him. It's so good to finally see you again. Tonks turned to Remus in the doorway and walked over to offer him a hug and greeting as well. Watch a Remus. Remus chuckled as he gave them a swift hug. My, how you've grown since we last met. They were a petite five feet five inches even in their combat boots. Remus had to bend over just to give them a proper hug. Tonks laughed in response to the gentle ribbing. My how you've grayed since we last met. They shot back. Remus smiled as he subconsciously ran his hand through his sandy brown and gray hair. Charlie hung back and let Andromeda through next. Her stride was slow and steady, leading straight to her younger cousin, Sirius. He closed the distance between them and they embraced. Sirius's tears finally released, and Andromeda's cheeks were wet as well. I'm so sorry, she whispered in his ear. I'm so sorry I ever doubted you, that I didn't do more to help you, she continued. Hush, don't, Sirius whispered back. You didn't know, how could you know? It's okay. Forgive me, she begged, still holding him tightly. There's nothing to forgive, Sirius answered immediately. At this, they finally parted. Andromeda came to Remus next and gave him just as big a hug. Thank you, I never got a chance to thank you for all you did to save Tonks. It was nothing, Remus said as they parted. It wasn't nothing to us. It was everything to us. They're alive now because of you, she insisted. It was the very least I could do. I was just doing what was right, Remus said dismissively. There are a lot of people who wouldn't have had the gall to do what you did. Ted and I are forever in your debt. Whatever you need, you tell me. Remus blushed as he just nodded his head in response. Charlie approached them in Andromeda's wake, shaking their hands in an awkward overly mature manner. Remus caught Sirius's eye and had to school his face from breaking into laughter. Charlie, good to see you again, Remus greeted. All right, where's Harry? He's the whole reason we came all this way, he couldn't bother to greet us, Tonks said. I'm sorry, I thought you came here for my werewolf boyfriend, Sirius joked. 
I'm not nine anymore, you're going to have to do more than just be a werewolf to impress me. Tonks answered sarcastically. Remus chuckled and muttered under his breath. Noted. Loud enough for Sirius to hear. Now it was Sirius's turn to reign in a smile as he replied. Harry is in a lesson with Ian at the moment. Ian's covering his herbology lessons. They should be wrapping up any minute. Speaking of lessons, Charlie. How's the lesson planning going for your exciting new career as care of magical creatures tutor for Harry? Remus asked brightly. Charlie laughed. It's going well. I took the fourth year handbook that the twins used last year, so I have a place to start. Although, Hagrid had quite a unique teaching style. I think I'm going to make a few major changes to the curriculum. Remus laughed. I think that's a good idea. Ooh, do you need a defense against the dark arts teacher? Tonks asked cheerily. So sorry Tonks, but that role has already been filled by someone quite a bit your senior. Sirius said pointing to Remus. Lots of practical experience in the field as well. Remus smiled sheepishly. We're still looking to fill the position of charms or astronomy professor. And potions. Sirius added. I thought you were teaching potions as well. Remus looked at him. I'm rubbish at potions. Sirius replied. Says the man who got an outstanding owl and a newt in potions. Andromeda said. I cheated. Sirius joked. Liar. Remus scoffed. Okay, fine. I'm good at potions. I just don't want to teach potions. Sirius said defensively. Why? Tonks asked. Because I hate potions. Sirius answered. Okay, now that's the truth. Remus said satisfied. So, Tonks, you can have your pick of charms, astronomy, or potions. You're an aura, auras have to be good at potions. Hmm, I'm afraid I have to side with Sirius on this one. I hate potions too, barely scraped by with the mark one needed to pursue becoming an aura. I always enjoyed charms though. Charms it is, Sirius said. You know, I'm pretty good at potions, and any good black was tutored religiously in astronomy. Andromeda said. Yeah, I never was a good black. Sirius laughed at his cousin. I could take on those two if you would like. Andromeda offered. Sirius clapped his hands once. See, I knew it was going to come together. There was a rapid banging on their door, and Harry called out through the wall. Sirius? Remus? He started, but before he could say anything more, the door was swiftly opened, and he was yanked inside and pulled behind Sirius and Remus. Both of them had their wands out in defensive stances, scanning the room for trouble. What is it? Is there someone attacking you? Are you hurt? Remus was asking quickly as he scanned Harry for any injuries. Harry's eyes were wide, and he was shaking his head. I'm sorry, I'm sorry, no, it's nothing like that. I just, I just got a call from Ron, and he got the paper and it's good news, and I wanted to tell you I didn't mean. Harry looked so remorseful. Remus lowered his wand and took a deep breath. He willed his heart to come back down from the adrenaline high it just received. He opened his eyes and looked around for Sirius. He had gone into the other room and had begun a sweep of the house. Remus went after him to try to calm him down. Sirius, it's okay, it's okay. You don't know that. Sirius yelled. I do, I do know that. Harry's just excited to tell us something, that's it. No one is in danger. Remus trailed after Sirius as he finished his search. Sirius finally turned around to face him, his chest heaving with anxiety. Harry just wants to tell us something. Sirius repeated, taking a deep breath and grabbing onto Remus. Yes, Remus answered. He's not mortally wounded. The wards didn't collapse. The world isn't ending. He asked, with just a hint of a smile as he said the last sentence. No. The world isn't ending. Remus nervously chuckled. As he grabbed onto Sirius, and they steadied each other. Sirius joined in the nervous laughter. Great. He took a deep breath. Great. Let's go find out what he wants to tell us, and then ground him for life for almost scaring us to death. I think that might be the opposite of what we talked about the other night. Remus responded. They walked back to their room. Upon entering, they didn't see Harry anywhere. Harry. Remus called out. No one answered. Harry, it's okay, we aren't mad. Sirius joined in when there was still no response. Listen, kid. 
I'm sorry we reacted like that. We didn't mean to scare you, we aren't going to punish you. Could you please come out now, or we'll start to panic again, thinking you've gone missing or something. I'm not missing. Harry's voice came from the wardrobe. See, he's not missing, he's just transformed himself into a wardrobe, Remus said lightly. A talking wardrobe, that's some advanced magic, Sirius responded. The door of the wardrobe opened and a sliver of light fell on Harry's face between the hanging clothes. I'm really sorry, I didn't mean to scare you. His face was full of guilt. Sirius took a deep breath and rubbed his face. You didn't do anything wrong. We reacted poorly. But we're a little on edge as of the last 15 years. We don't do well with surprises, as you may have just noticed. I know it's a bit of a buzz kill, but could you try your best not to startle us unless you're actually in mortal danger? Remus asked calmly. If you had actually been in mortal danger just now, we would have been ready to go. We would have been very useful in that situation. Sirius pointed out. We'll just call that a surprise drill. We passed with flying colors. Remus spun. Harry was finally cracking a smile. I promise not to surprise you unless I'm in mortal danger. Thank you, that's very considerate. Remus said then took a seat on the bed, and pulled Sirius down by his hand to sit next to him. Now, how about we start this day over again, shall we? Harry nodded and stepped out of the wardrobe. Good morning Harry, lovely of you to come visit us from Narnia. Have any good news you want to share? Harry laughed. Sirius looked at Remus quizzically. Narnia. It's from a muggle book. There's a magical wardrobe that leads to a different world called Narnia. Remus explained. Harry got the reference, didn't you? Yeah, sadly this wardrobe didn't lead to Narnia. Harry replied. I should hope not. That's quite the security risk if it did. Sirius said. Anyway, the news. I'm burning with anticipation. Remus directed them back to the real issue. Right. Ron just called and he said there was an article in the paper about the attack on Moody by Barty Crouch. They didn't get him to turn on anyone, but he did accidentally let slip where their safe house was. They caught Peter Pettigrew, and Peter flipped almost instantly. They're still searching for Voldemort, but they know you didn't kill Peter. You're exonerated. Harry finished. Sirius's face went blank. His eyes lost focus, and he sat there in stunned silence. Sirius! Did you hear me? You've been proven innocent! Harry repeated. Remus squeezed Sirius's hand he was still holding. Sirius squeezed it back in response. He suddenly moved to wrap his arms around Remus, and turned his face away from Harry to rest it on Remus's shoulder. His body began to shake in silent sobs of relief. Remus whispered in his ear. You're free, Carrion. You're finally free. The sobs came harder after that. He gripped tighter to Remus, who returned the strong embrace willingly. He looked over at Harry and held out his arm to him. Harry stood rooted where he was for a moment longer before finally walking over to Remus and Sirius. The sobs were lessening now, and Sirius shifted to look at Harry. He was still hiccuping, finally able to speak. You were right, Harry. That was very good news. Harry smiled, and let Sirius pull him into a quick hug. After they separated, Remus reached over and wiped Sirius's eyes with his handkerchief. Remus and Sirius sat on the porch later that day watching Harry, Tonks, and Charlie fly on their brooms chasing after a snitch. Tonks wobbled a little, nearly falling off their broomstick in an effort to reach the snitch, before leveling out. Andromeda had taken a trip into town to gather groceries and other supplies. Remus sighed a little, before breaking the comfortable silence between them. So, we can go back to England. Sirius's head snapped over to him, but didn't say anything for a long time. He finally returned to watching Harry before he responded. Suppose that's true. It's what you wanted, right? You wanted to be exonerated in England, raise Harry there. A few weeks ago we had to convince you not to return before that even happened. You gave a whole convincing speech about how every person who stands up against evil matters, blah, blah, blah. Remus reminded him. Sirius sighed. I suppose that's true too. When he didn't say anything else, Remus prompted him again. But. We started something here. We found ourselves again here. You have a pack now. If we go back, your moons will be worse again. 
Sirius said. I'm not going to make you stay here for me. I'll be fine in England. We can go back to having the moons to ourselves. You heard what the doctor said. If you are with the pack it's better. Sirius insisted. I'm not going to be the only reason you don't return to England and reclaim what your life should have been. Remus reiterated. It's not like that. That's not the only reason. Sirius sighed. Then what? Remus responded softer than before. I'm scared, okay. What if all of Britain can't get over their misconceptions of me? They saw my hysterical face on wanted posters plastered all over every street corner. They heard from my alleged victims' families, they wanted me dead. Do you think they'll forget that? What if I don't want to go back to the country that betrayed me? What if they come up with some other reason to recapture me? Like, what if they find out about my efforts to bring down Azkaban? And what? Am I supposed to just give up on Sarah? She believed in me when no one other than you did. She gave me my life back. I can't just abandon her in the middle of her fight. I want to see this through. Isn't that still standing against evil? The air was still as Remus regarded Sirius closely. We don't have to go back, Remus said finally. Sirius scoffed and shook his head. What about Harry? Well, the way I see it, he's still in danger from Voldemort. He's still out there somewhere. Even if he is captured, they'd likely be stupid enough to kill him instead of keep him in prison, Remus said. What does that mean? Sirius looked at Remus quizzically. Remus paused before looking over at Sirius again. He's come back from the dead two times, you don't think he can do it again? Anytime you want to fill me in on your little research project I'm all ears. Sirius looked at him expectantly. Remus looked around as if to see if anyone was listening in. But they were alone of course, and the three younger wicks were still flying high in the sky out of earshot. I suppose it's well past time, actually. Come on, follow me. He stood before he finished his sentence, retrieving his cane from where it leaned against the porch railing. Sirius followed closely behind him, unable to keep his excitement disguised. Fucking finally. Remus led him to the desk tucked in the far corner of their room. Books and journals were stacked precariously upon the surface and floor. Remus lowered himself to the desk chair and whispered an incantation. A secret compartment opened up, and he pulled several well-used journals from inside. As he did so, he began to explain his research. I didn't start my research right away. I was in no fit state, really. I ran from any thought of what happened that night for as long as I could. But the questions were never far from my mind. They ate away at me, gnawing on my conscience. Eventually, I had to do something to find any answers I could, though any satisfactory answers were few and far between. They usually left a deeper sense of apprehension rather than give any closure. Remus fumbled through his journals, looking for something specific. As he looked, he continued to explain while Sirius watched him closely. It just didn't make any sense. How could Voldemort, at the height of his power, lose everything to a baby? There was no body, no remains of any kind. Not even dust or ashes. And even more shocking, Harry survived, nothing but a cursed scar across his forehead as proof, or so it seemed. Remus's fingers slowed as he found the notes he had been searching for. I told you how I started looking for any sources I could. I scoured Nocturne Alley, looked through estate sales and police auctions. Pointless of course. All of the good sources were already weeded out. So I found a few sellers who could cater to my needs, and what they couldn't find, I, acquired by my own means. You nicked banned books. Sirius translated. Yeah, I might have nicked a few here and there. Remus smirked. I'm in Azkaban for a crime I didn't commit, meanwhile you're a serial larcenist. Sirius muttered. I do recognize the irony. Remus nodded. Sirius pulled up a chair. All right then, enough backstory, what did you find? Voldemort, even at his height of power, was afraid. Remus started. Why was he even after Harry? Sirius's face fell a little. You know, don't you? There was a prophecy. I don't know what it said specifically, but it led Voldemort to believe that Harry was some threat to him. Sirius answered. That's about all I could find out about that as well. Although recently, I came to wonder if I might know who made the prophecy, Remus said. Who? Trelawney, Remus answered. Sirius laughed, but Remus held his gaze. 
Sirius cut his laughter short, and Remus continued. Dumbledore hired her for a reason, and she did make a true prophecy just this year, regarding Voldemort. Anyway, that's not important now. My point was, Voldemort feared Harry because he feared his own death. That got me thinking, if I were a dark wizard, afraid of death and willing to do anything to prolong my life, what would I do? So I pursued that line of research to its inevitable result. What was it? Horcruxes, Remus said simply. He held out his journal to the page where he had organized his notes on the subject. Sirius's face fell as he reckoned with the implications. He stared at the journal as his already pale complexion faded even lighter. He finally gave the slightest shake of his head. No, Sirius whispered, and it sounded like a plea. No, that's, that's. His words ran out of steam as he realized how much it made sense. He closed his eyes as he processed this new revelation. So you've heard of them, Remus gathered from his reaction. I grew up with a household library full of books on every evil and taboo subject known to wizard kind. There was a point in my life where I was brazen enough to peruse them. It didn't take long for my stomach to turn sour at the idea of continuing. Sirius looked back to Remus. You're sure? Remus nodded. There was the diary that brought back Tom Riddle that Harry destroyed in his second year, using a basilisk fang, one of the only things that can destroy a horcrux. But there's got to be at least one more that is still tethering him to life. I'd hazard a guess that there is more than just one more. More than one? Sirius gasped out. Remus took a deep breath and sighed. It's what makes the most sense, although each fracture would weaken the stability of the soul. It explains why when the killing spell reverberated back onto himself, he didn't just die. It also explains how his soul was especially vulnerable to the ancient magical force of love specifically. When you've embraced hate, bigotry, and narcissistic ambition so entirely, you become even more repulsed by the opposite force. Sirius surmised. Exactly. Sirius sighed and closed his eyes. How many? I don't know. But you have a guess. It wasn't a question. I would guess seven in total, Remus said. Seven. It's a nice, magically significant number, Remus explained. The cocky bastard would think himself capable of such a thing, Sirius said. Do you know what they might be? I have a running list of possibilities, but the truth is, it could be anything. Anywhere, Remus sighed. All that to say, if they ever do capture him, I would hope they would find a safe way to imprison him alive, or he'll just use one of his seven lives to come back and torment us all over again. Unless someone tracks down and destroys all of his horcruxes. Cersei have mercy, Sirius whispered. I was almost to the point where I thought I might go on a scavenger hunt for them last year. Then Dumbledore came knocking and offered me a teaching job. I figured I'd postpone it a year. Now I think my efforts are best focused on keeping Harry safe. Sirius nodded as his gaze shifted to the window where they could see Harry flying in the distance. Remus thought he recognized the look in his eyes. It was the same look he got back in the war when he would steal himself up for a particularly dangerous mission. Remus reached out and grabbed his hand as if to keep him from running away. He could feel the onyx ring around his finger. Carry on. Sirius's gaze snapped back to Remus. Hmm. Remus wanted to say something, anything to try to convince Sirius this wasn't his responsibility. He needed to stay here, to be with him and Harry. To be safe. Instead, he took a deep breath and sighed. He stood and pulled Sirius into a tight embrace, clinging to his clothes to get as close as he could, breathing in his smell, bringing his lips in close to taste. He desperately wanted to freeze time to keep them together like this for as long as possible. But this summer had taught him he sometimes had to let go. He had to trust that Sirius's instincts and motivations were good. I'm sorry it took me this long to tell you all this. I didn't realize, I didn't know until now why. I thought I was waiting until I had more proof, but that's not why. What are you talking about? I just realized the reason I didn't tell you was out of fear you would believe it was up to you to go destroy them. I didn't want you to leave, not after I just found you again, Remus admitted. Oh, Mooney, Sirius sighed. There's not a magical force in the universe that could pull me away from you. I'm not going anywhere. Remus kissed him again and sighed with relief. 
good. We should still try to reach out to Dumbledore or Moody to let them know. Dumbledore already knows, Remus replied. You've spoken to him about this, Sirius asked. Heavens, no. I know that I've done extensive research into this, but if I could figure it out, Dumbledore with his considerable resources and knowledge absolutely could, and has. Well, that's good then. He's probably on top of it. We can leave that to him while we keep Harry safe, Sirius said. Remus looked at him in shock. You're satisfied to just leave this up to Dumbledore? Well, we already agreed that we can't do it, and Dumbledore's motivations for protecting Harry may be conflicted, but his motivations for destroying these Horcruxes certainly aren't. Remus shook his head a little, but said, I suppose that's true. We're protecting Harry and reforming Azkaban, we have to leave something for Dumbledore to do, Sirius said. Remus laughed as they walked out of the room and back outside. So we can stay in Switzerland, then, Remus said. Suppose that's true. Sirius smiled, reaching over to take Remus's hand as they shared a moment before turning their attention back to Harry. Chapter 37 Epilogue The sun was setting earlier each night now. It was the middle of September, and still nice enough to be outside even in the evening. With this many people, it was difficult to comfortably fit them all in the sitting room. Usually, Harry, Tonks, Charlie, and Sirius would fly for a bit, but tonight, they all sat on the porch watching the sunset. The view wasn't quite as good as at their house in the mountains, but it still left an impression. Remus and Andromeda were playing wizard's chess, while the others were playing exploding snap. At least they were trying, but the cards kept getting blown away by the breeze and Charlie was accusing Tonks of cheating. They finally decided to call it a draw after a fit of giggles and shouting. As the game was breaking up, Remus heard someone approaching down the path. He looked up to see Sarah and Ian, and he waved to them. They had been coming by occasionally in the evenings. There was always something new to talk about, what was schooling, the asylum case, and finding a permanent place for them to stay. This house was much too crowded now. It had been perfect when it was just Harry and the two of them. Now, Charlie was sleeping in a tent outside, and Andromeda and Tonks were sleeping in the sitting room. Harry had tried to offer them his room to share, and he would sleep on the couch, but everyone agreed he needed his own room. Besides, this was just temporary. They just had to find a place big enough for all of them. As soon as they did, Andromeda would send for her husband, and they would all be together. Sarah and Ian were now making the rounds, saying hello to everyone. They held out a newspaper to Sirius, once everyone was settled again. It was a copy of the Prophet, from yesterday. Sirius took it from her and unfolded it on the table so Remus could read it as well. Protests in Diagon Alley, a call for accountability after the mishandling of Sirius Black case, I'd say this is perfect timing for our push for reform in Azkaban with Sirius Black as our star witness, Sarah said with a mischievous smirk. Brilliant, Charlie said. I also heard from Natalie again. She's concerned for the security of the pack now that I'm a notable author, or so she says. I don't know how notable I am, but I can't argue with her much about our vulnerability. No, it would be hard to argue after what happened last month. Sirius agreed. Yes, but she wants to put a patrol on the outside of our barrier. I don't know how I feel about that. Remus looked at her with concern. Hmm, yeah, it would feel a lot more like a cage than a barrier if we were being guarded. Even if she said it was for our protection. I hate the precedent that sets. As do I, Ian said. Right, so I had another idea. Sarah began. You always have the best ideas. Sirius grinned at her, recalling her last idea and how it had led to them getting Harry here. Sarah laughed before continuing, looking at Sirius. I thought it would be good if we invited you to join our pack. Join the pack? For full moons? Sirius asked, surprised at the offer. Yes, it went so well the last time, I thought we could make you a permanent member. She was smiling again. I think it prudent to remind you that you all nearly attacked me. And the only reason why you didn't was because I had Buckbeak by my side, Sirius said. Sure, but by the end, all of that was forgotten, wasn't it? Sure, 
For the last 30 minutes or so we came to a tentative understanding. Sirius acquiesced. I know how much you love to spend the moon with Remus, and I don't want you to lose that. Besides, you'd be doing us a favor, really. You could do patrols around the barrier, and even leave the barrier if necessary. You could see if anyone was trying to approach. We could set up a faster system for you to call Natalie for backup if you needed. What about Harry? We're more than capable of ensuring Harry's safety while you're away. Andromeda spoke up. Looks like you've run out of excuses, cousin. Tonks said brightly. Sirius shook his head a little, but he was grinning from ear to ear. Really? I get to join you for moons? He was finally letting himself believe that it might happen. Really, Sirius? You've already proven how much you are part of our pack. This will just make it official, Ian said. Sirius leaned over to hug Ian and Sarah. That's incredible. As they wound down for the evening, Andromeda found Sirius and Remus in the kitchen finishing the dishes. Hey, Andy. How's it going? Sirius asked, drying his hands and turning his attention to Andromeda. I've been thinking about our housing conundrum, and I have a proposal. Uncle Alfred had a few properties scattered over Europe, and one of them happens to be in Switzerland. It wouldn't surprise me, but wouldn't that be an obvious place to look if they were searching for me? Sirius asked. Sirius, you've been exonerated and granted asylum. No one's looking for you, or at least, no one with any legal standing. Remus reminded him. True, but I understand your concern. The property, like all black properties, has been highly fortified. It's likely already unplottable, and as far as I know, this particular property isn't even known to our remaining relatives. He was disowned before he purchased it. How do you know about it then? Because he passed it to me. You own a house in Switzerland. Uncle Alfred left you a house. Don't look so surprised. Alfred had a soft spot for the black sheep of the family, and while you certainly qualified, I was the original. Why didn't you mention this sooner? Sirius asked. I've never been to the property. I inherited it as well as a fair bit of gold after we already had our place in England. It always seemed like too large a project to try to tackle, especially when I was raising tonks. I kept putting it off, and eventually forgot about it, until now. I wanted to make sure it was suitable for our needs, still standing, and all the legalities were ironed out before I told you about it. I went out there last week when I was running errands and checked it out. It needs a thorough cleaning, and the grounds are a mess, but there's enough room for all of us, and then some. If you would like, we could move anytime. Andy. That's brilliant. Let's start packing. Sirius couldn't stop his joy from bubbling over into laughter as he gathered his cousin into a hug. Great Cersei. Tonks rang out as they all took in the view of their new home for the first time. You've had this place for how long and we've never been. I honestly didn't know it was this large. I was quite surprised myself when I came out here last week. Andromeda explained. Before them, stood a large Swiss chalet, spread out on overgrown grounds with no neighbors in sight. It was on the side of a steep hill, overlooking the Alps. How many bedrooms? Sirius asked. Fifteen in the main residence. In the main residence, Charlie repeated. There are several other houses and outbuildings on the ten-acre property, presumably for the staff, when there was one. The main residence itself is broken up into apartment-style dwellings, so a few families could live there comfortably. Sounds like the perfect place to start over. What do you think, Sirius? Remus asked with a glint in his eye. Sirius took a deep breath of the fresh mountain air and reached for Remus's hand. I think that's a great idea. They headed towards their new home followed by their friends and family, all chattering with excitement and joy overflowing. Tonks ran up behind Sirius and jumped on his back. He gave an exaggerated grunt, but quickly scooped them up and gave them a piggyback ride. Harry and Charlie were discussing Quidditch strategy and Andromeda appeared at Remus's side. She looked at him and smiled. I don't know how, but you managed to do it again. Do what? He slowed to a stop and turned to look at her. Save my family. Look at them. She gestured to Tonks and Sirius ahead of them now. We've been reunited, against all odds, because of you. My cousin is safe now, because of you. Remus shook his head and looked down at the ground. 
I had very little to do with it. Andromeda chuckled a little. Remus, stop being so modest and take the win. You've had so few in your life, you deserve it. Yes, mom. Remus replied half sarcastic, but couldn't stop the blush from the attention. Remus, you coming? Harry called back to him. At that, the group made their way slowly toward the house and their new life together. Chapter 38 Bonus Epilogue This just came for you, Harry said. Remus looked up from his book to see Harry walking into his new office carrying a letter. Oh, uh, who's it from? Remus asked as he put down the book and took the envelope. It says to Remus from Dumbledore. Harry said as he sat on the sofa next to Remus's chair. Remus broke the seal, opened the envelope, and quickly read the letter. Remus, a muggle rang the payphone outside my bar asking after you. I told him last I heard you were in Switzerland, then he asked me to pass along a message to you if I could. He said that Grant would be in Zurich on Saturday, and to meet him at the Grossmannstair Church at three in the afternoon. I informed him that I don't much appreciate being used as a messenger on call, but he seemed a decent fellow, and I felt bad after hanging up on him, so I thought I should pass along this one last message, along with my own, I must ask for this to desist or to be compensated for my services. Dumbledore, you know which one, you idiot. Remus immediately stood upon reading the letter. Harry looked up at him startled. Everything all right? What did Dumbledore say? Harry asked. Grant's coming. Remus looked at his pocket watch. It was already Saturday. His watch read 2.35. Shit, Grant's here, now. Remus quickly shuffled out of the room, Harry following closely behind him. Who's Grant? Is that bad? Are we in danger? Grant's an old friend. He's not bad. He's, he's great, wonderful, kind, self-sacrificing. These were all ways he could have finished that sentence. But none of them came out, because in just that moment he ran into Sirius in the hall. Whoa, where are you going in such a rush? He asked. I, I. Remus gave him a pained expression but handed over the letter without further explanation. He watched Sirius's face as confusion turned to anger, turned blank as he pushed down those feelings and turned to Remus. He was still standing in front of Sirius, still unable to form a sentence. I take it you didn't tell him about your summer plans, Sirius said, with a hint of a smile. I've been a touch busy, Remus replied, with too much agitation in his voice. Sirius pulled out his watch, then looked at Remus again. Well time's a wasting. You better get going if you're going to make it to Zurich by three. Remus closed his eyes and sighed. You're sure this is all right? Of course. We don't want him thinking you're dead, do we? Sirius considered that. Unless we do, in which case? Sirius, Remus said indignantly. Just kidding. Sirius held up both hands. Well, get going then, and bring him back for dinner, if he's up for a visit. I'd love to see him again. Are you serious? Remus asked as he walked to the door. He had to leave the considerable grounds to exit the anti-apparition wards. Sirius cocked his head. I'm always serious. Remus wanted to respond, but there was no time. He made it just over the property line and apparated to Zurich. As he landed, he could hear the bells ringing out the new hour in the church tower behind him. He ducked out of the alley he had landed in and rounded the corner of the church. He entered the first door he came to, which seemed to be a side entrance. The main entrance looked to involve a sizable staircase. Remus sought to avoid stairs wherever possible. To his surprise, the side door led to a peaceful courtyard. He could still hear the bells, but from this angle, they were softer. He took a deep breath for the first time since reading the letter from Aberforth. Walking further into the cloister, he observed the gargoyles mounted from the archways, watching over the sacred space. From the center, he took in the full effect of the greenery with the architecture framing it, all around a central fountain. Remus! Grant's call broke through Remus's contemplations. He spun around just in time to see Grant run at him and pull him into a hug. Grant continued to hold on to him as he spoke. Oh, thank God. I thought you were dead. You weren't at your flat and none of your usual haunts. 
They all said they hadn't seen you since last summer. I knew you were going to that teaching job, but when I didn't hear from you afterwards, I was so worried. I thought maybe you were dead in some forest somewhere, and I'd never hear from you again. He pushed back from him as he continued, growing more annoyed. But you're alive. Why didn't you call me? You idiot. Remus lowered his head, feeling guilty for not telling him he was leaving the country. I thought about calling. I even picked up the phone before I realized I didn't know how to call you internationally. And there was a paper and ink shortage. Grant replied sarcastically. It's been a busy summer. Remus answered lamely. Grant sighed, running his hands over his face and through his hair. He took a step back, then turned to walk to one of the cloister walls, taking a seat on a bench there. Did you fall off the wagon? You certainly don't look it. You look. Grant paused mid-sentence as he was finally getting a good look at Remus since his arrival. Despite leaving the house in a rush, he was in a new sweater and slacks with not a hole in sight. His mustache was well trimmed, and his hair neatly parted and combed. The cane he had used for the last decade still accompanied him, but it was recently polished. Damn, you look good. Remus walked over to him, and though he still had a subtle limp, his gait was much improved since the last time Grant had seen him, and there was no shadow of pain behind his eyes. You look really good, Grant said, blushing a little. Remus joined him on the bench, sitting at an angle so he could look him in the eyes. Grant, I'm truly very sorry I didn't call or write. I'm still sober, I didn't intend to make you worry, and for that, I apologize. He paused to see if Grant would say anything, and when he didn't, Remus pressed on. I owe you an explanation, I know that. I just ask that you keep an open mind. Remus, what happened? Grant asked. I know you're well aware of Sirius's escape. Yeah, I'm the one who rushed to you when you called me with the news. Grant stammered. Wait, you didn't track him down, did you? Remus, tell me you didn't. No, I promised you I wouldn't and I kept that promise. Sirius found me instead. Remus went into the whole story, giving as much detail as Grant would understand. He's innocent. Grant whispered when Remus finished his story. Yeah. You're sure? Grant insisted. Yes, I'm sure. He used a truth serum in front of me. I'm very sure. Remus explained gently. Oh, great. Bully for you, Grant said in mock cheer. He stood from the bench. Grant. Remus sighed as he watched him walk to the fountain, with his back turned. After he composed himself, Grant turned back around to face Remus, but didn't move any closer. He's treating you okay. I see he's buying you fancy clothes, but you're not falling into old patterns. The two of you weren't always great together, especially toward the end you'll remember. No, we've both learned from the past. We've worked through a lot of our previous failings, and we've started fresh. We're making a proper show of it this time. Remus leaned forward resting his elbows on his knees and clasping his hands together. Grant took a deep breath and nodded. Well, that's great, then, he said calmer, with an air of genuineness. You seem to be doing a lot better. I'm happy for you. Thank you. Remus finally stood and joined him at the fountain. How's Fitz? He's great. He's home with the kids. I'll have some explaining to do when I get back. Grant sighed again. I'm sorry, Remus repeated. It's okay. I'll tell him it was AA business, and he'll understand, Grant said. Let me pay you back for the train, Remus offered. Don't. Don't do that. Grant shut his eyes and sighed again. Okay, Remus nodded. Look, you came all this way to check up on me. The least I could do is invite you home for dinner. Won't Sirius mind? It was Sirius's idea, Remus replied. Grant rolled his eyes. Please, Grant, you've held me together when I was in pieces. At least come and see what all those pieces turned into. Grant nodded. Okay. They had a lovely dinner politely catching up on each other's lives as if they were just three friends meeting again after too long apart. It was more than just the three of them at the table, of course. Everyone wanted to meet Remus's old friend, so it was quite the party once all of them arrived. Grant, can I talk to you privately, for a moment? Sirius asked, looking pained. All right, then. Grant looked a bit bewildered, but followed Sirius into the other room. You do know that he can still hear us. 
Grant reminded Sirius. Yeah, I'm aware. I just didn't want to have to look at his face when I said this. Sirius replied. Okay, Grant said. They both stood in awkward silence. Listen, I know you were never a big fan of me. I get it. You don't have to tell me off. I'm not going to get in the way of whatever this is. I wasn't going to tell you off. Just shut up for a minute, would you? Sirius looked like he was building up the courage to say something. Finally, he spoke again. Thank you. I'm sorry, what? Grant looked like he would have handled a slap to the face better than hearing those words coming from Sirius. I said thank you. Were you listening that time? Because I'm not going to repeat it again. Sirius said, a little perturbed. No, no. I heard it that time. Can't say I understand, though. Grant looked at him with suspicion. You took care of him when I couldn't. Sirius explained. I didn't bloody do it for you. Grant replied indignantly. I know that. Sirius took a deep breath before continuing. You did it for him, and I'm so grateful he had someone as good as you to give him the help he deserved. I know you and I never got on, but I don't want it to be like that anymore. Are you apologizing? Grant couldn't believe what he was hearing. Fuck no. Sirius said. Okay good. I was going to have to get Remus in here to do some hocus pocus to make sure you were still you. Grant said. Hocus pocus. Sirius was confused. It's a regular people word for magic. Grant said. It doesn't matter. Right. Sirius looked at Grant quizzically before continuing. Remus still needs a good friend like you, and I know you're going to love Harry. And you. I promise to behave and not punch you in the face. Sirius said. I appreciate that. Mighty big of you, mate. Grant said sarcastically. Doesn't change the fact that you're an absolute idiot for leaving him. Sirius couldn't help saying it. Don't I fucking know it. Biggest mistake of my life. They both laughed. Eventually, Grant grew serious again. No. Honestly, I, I loved him. I would have done anything to make it work. But at the end of the day, his heart was always yours, even when he thought you were a traitor. It nearly killed him, but he couldn't ever get over you. I tried. I tried to help him, to love him, to make him find a way out. Eventually, I realized that by being there, I was actually hurting him more than helping. He couldn't love me, and we both knew it, and the more I tried to hold on to him the more the pieces just broke even more. I had to leave him. It wasn't even for me, I would have taken any bit of him I could get, but I had to leave him before there wasn't anything of him left. It was better when we went back to being just friends. It's what we were meant to be. Just like you two were meant to love each other. Grant, I don't know what to say. I'm not finished. Grant went on, his voice dropping to a whisper as he took a step towards Sirius and crossed his arms over his chest. I meant what I said, I'm not gonna stand in your way. But if you break his heart again, I don't care that you can do magic, you'll wish you were still in prison when I'm done with you. Grant, if I ever break his heart again, I'd let you do whatever you want to me, and I'd deserve it. Sirius sighed. One of these days we'll make it through a day together without it devolving into insults and threats. Grant took a step back and gave a small smile. Maybe next time. He nodded once and led the way back to join Remus, and the rest of the party in the sitting room. Finite. Thanks for listening to this text-to-speech podfic composed by Burning Aurora.